to be on the calendar. Yeah. Uh, others come and go, yeah. and uh, this is the big one. This is the double points. This is the one that everybody wants to win. Yeah. Sebastian getting a bit of an update from one of his engineers there. And, uh, do we have any more uh, animated radio calls from Sebastian through the night, or was he relatively controlled? Well, I didn't. I was sleeping. So, he's still still further updates there with Sebastian and his engineer. From and, uh, at the back, do you think? Would you say this, or not? this mist now is really coming down here on on the front straight and into uh, you know, the four chicanes and up into Dunlop. I think that. Um, well, it appears that Toyota do have a bit of a feeling for what uh, the issue is with Nakajima. They are monitoring. They're not necessarily going to be saying exactly what it is, but it's something that's being monitored at the moment for the Nakajima car. We heard the radio, uh, Kaz Nakajima, saying that uh, there was a vibration from the engine, he said, but he wasn't really 100% sure, and they said, yeah, we know about it, we're on it. Yeah, and again, that, that just, it, it, it's obviously taken a step now that the driver is reporting it, and uh, but they've most probably known about it for some time. Well, with eight hours to go, then, uh, it's something that they'll be monitoring, and I'm sure very closely as well. The 51 car has just left the pit lane. It's uh, P1 in GTE Pro, uh, the uh, AF Corsa Ferrari, and uh, the, the, the number 63. The, the 83 has just done its drive-through as well, Francois Perodo. Ah, okay. Remember, he got a, a drive-through for speeding in the pit lane at the last pit stop, and now he's just done that drive-through. And uh, what's the gap now to the uh, to the 33 CF Sport? It's still, an, it's still a lap, isn't it? Yeah, we still Thank need to see how it, yeah. it's going to be a lap. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, the, the 51 AF Corsa uh, Ferrari is... Uh, working its way through the first chicane and then the 63 Corvette I think is some uh, 17 seconds back and, you know this is going to go back and forth now for uh, the next number of hours 92 coming in from, yeah, throwing it over the curbs there at the four chicane I do like the sparks underneath the Porsche when it hits those curbs <laughs> does look good I don't know if it's fast I'm sure, I'm sure they the engine, yeah but it, it does look good it's full We'll rally spec. So do you want me to suggest that to Corvette? I they think do. we should suggest it to everybody. It should be mandatory. OK. Yeah. 92 car. It's had a troubled time at the uh, uh, hyper pole, but it's, it's been pretty quick uh, in the hands of Kevin Estra, and he's just done his fastest lap of the race, and he's gone a, a, and done in his fastest middle sector. And into the pits. Ah. Yeah. It's going quicker now, you can't see. Now, now the mist's come down. Yes. It's got to use his imagination more. <laughs> Morning, David. Morning. How, How are you? I'm great. Good to see you. Yes. All breakfasted, all rested. Turner has been dispatched to his caravan or whatever. And um, the battles carry on. Number eight Toyota, then, the, the big talking point in the last half an hour since I've been away. Yes, it seems that um, there's something some brewing there. Something, definitely something mm -hmm. brewing. Yeah. They won't tell us what it is. It won't be very specific what it is, but they certainly know what it is. Yeah. Uh, that came over the radio, but Sebastian Boemi was in a bit of an exchange with one of the engineers yes, we saw, was. and he turned round uh, to Duncan, who sort of gave him the thumbs up, and uh, I think Sebastian suggested it was maybe not quite as thumbs up as thumbs up. <laughs> OK. Did he, was he gesticulating with sort of one finger? No, it was a shake of the head. No. OK. A little bit of frustration. I think there, oh, eyebrows. you have yeah. got uh, two points. One is potentially if there's a problem with the car. Second is they're 40 seconds or so behind their team car anyway. Yeah. And their team car seems to have the legs on them overall. Yeah, and I think the conversation that Boemi was having with his engineer was his engineer most really telling him, unless something goes wrong with the seven, you're not going to win. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. I think he probably knew that about eight hours ago, though. When <laughs> yeah, most probably. Yeah which might throw a lifeline if eight has got a problem to the Alpine, although that's four laps back, but the Alpine is back on pit lane, Nicolas Lapierre at the wheel of it. And all they can do, as we keep saying, is be reliable themselves and hope that there is some frailty in the Toyotas. Yeah, they've just been listening, missing a little bit of performance, haven't they, Alpine? They've been able to kind of do the lap time, but not consistently mm. 
thing they can't do is they can't do the stint lengths. They're one lap less than Toyota and also Glickenhaus, and the reality is they don't have the performance we maybe saw at Portimao in the first round of the WEC yep. or uh, in some of the other races to try to get that back. They've been kind of just on the same sort of performance levels right. at best. Yeah. So it was always going to be a tough ask for uh, Alpine Elf Matmut, but Nicolas Lapierre still involved in that fight for third against Olivier Palau's Glickenhaus, and 36 is good to go again. Last out. It is impressive that the Glickenhaus is still running, mm. is still out there, still competitive. Both and are. It's, Both yeah. still going, yeah. Yep. You know. Yeah, we were saying a little while ago, Ollie, that it's it's not amateur hour. You know, these cars might not have the budget, might not have the experience necessarily of Toyota, but there is a good brains trust for operating them. But even so, they're still going strong. Now, um, weather update, Alan? Yeah, fog. Thanks. It's like being at Knock Hill, isn't it, this? So, well, funnily enough, that is exactly where I'll be tomorrow afternoon, <laughs> as it turns out. But, uh, yeah, just getting prepared for the weather. But, uh, yeah, it's gone very, very foggy, as you saw up there. That, this has only came down, though, David, in the last sort of eight, nine minutes. Yeah. Before that, the sun was out and Darren was saying how beautiful it was. And then yes. suddenly Ollie comes into the booth and he pressed, oh, there's fog everywhere. Yeah, I just bring it. It's one if, of my talents. If it gets worse, could that be a slow zone? We'll discuss that in a second. Let's uh, a quick look at the classification. It's Toyota's first and second to us ever thus, but now there's this question mark over number eight. Alpine third, Glickenhaus fourth, fifth and sixth. It's still Team WRT ruling the roost in uh, LMP2. And then seventh is 709, Glickenhaus ahead of Will Stevens, who is up ahead of Tom Blomquist, who has replaced Sean Galal. So those cars have switched. And tenth overall, Renga van der Zander, up to fifth in LMP2 for Inter-Europol competition, doing a really good job. In GTE, Pro, Alessandro Pierguidi, a Spa 24 winner, is 22nd overall but leading the class, ahead of Antonio Garcia in the Corvette. And then the Porsche battle for third, Michael Christensen has jumped ahead of Richard Leitz in AM. Francois Perodo, despite that uh, recent penalty, leads the class ahead of Ben Keating. And third in the class is Matteo Cressoni in number 80 Ferrari. And we've got a yellow flag out of Marshall's post 26. Which is Arnage. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. the fog continues to close in as well on certain sections of the circuit. Looks like it's number 48 LMP2 car that has caused that, which is the IDEX Sport of Lafarge at the moment. And uh, that car is not moving. OK. Tom Blomquist for Jota has just done that car's best lap of the race. There is the EDEC entry, which has got going again. Yeah, Tom will be trying to make up that uh, that time that he lost mm. to Will Stevens in the pits with that uh, problem at the, at the pit stop. They couldn't get the door shut or there was some, some issue with the driver change. And here we see oh, the yeah. IDEC car. Lock the rears? Yeah, lock the rears and sort of half spun into it. And that's exactly what we saw with Aoki in the innovation mm, car earlier right. on. Yes. So there's the EDEC team awaiting. Uh, we've been talking about how well the Dickens houses are going. Fourth and ninth they are at the moment. Olivier Plow in 7.08, Richard Westbrook in 7.09. Um, the thoughts of Jim Dickens right now? Well, let's find out because he's in the pits with Duncan Vincent. First of all, Jim, it's morning in Le Mans. You've got through the night with two cars still running. How, as a team principal, team boss, owner, do you feel? Oh, I, I, I feel great. I mean, you know, we're here, we're running well, we have a few minor issues, uh, but we've worked through them, and uh, we're going to give it a fight right up to the end, and we hope we can be on the podium at the end. The cars are showing good pace. That Obviously, you've got to be in it to win it, and Toyota might have a little problem brewing. It does give you great hope. Um, look, we never wish problems on anyone. Toyota is an incredible company, and their car is incredible. But this is a BOP class, and they're too fast. There's no question about it. Now, next year, when Michelin has more time to work with us, the rear-wheel drive tires might be faster. But as it stands now, they're much faster than we are. And uh, But we're going to try as hard as we can. Jim, thanks for your time. Charming as ever. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. They might be much faster, but they're more experienced. They've been to Le Mans more. There's greater experience, perhaps, within that team. It's not 
just pace. Yes, they are quicker, but there's a bit more to winning Le Mans than pace. Yeah, I think when you sit down, you do the analysis, you actually look at uh, time spent in the pits. Mm. You look at uh, all the areas that uh, you were spending energy on trying to rectify or gain and learn experience through the course of the week as well. Never mind just the singular lap times. And there's parts of it you can control mm. and parts of it you can't. But uh, certainly for the team, they've done, I think, uh, generally a very good job over the course of the weekend. And the car that's fighting uh, for this podium position right now is the car that got into incident in the first corner as well with yes. Sebastian Buemi. So it may actually be part of the reason that they gain from it. However, maybe 20 hours later or something. But uh, yeah, I know that I know Jim Glickenhouse's point about it being BOP. However, I think there that uh, you know you have do have to lift your Glickenhouse hat towards Toyota yes. and say the job that they have done. No doubt, no doubt. I mean, it's, Glickenhouse have got some very experienced drivers. Yeah. They've got some very experienced crew. Yes. yes. They're, they're, they're pulling it all together. And there's, there's multi sort of nationalities mm. working within that team and the engine department on, 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 on the race team and the design team. You know, so it's it has been a multinational effort, but it's it, it's and it's sometimes hard to get that all to yeah. gel together. But, but it, as we've been saying, it's a, a good, solid effort. There have been bigger teams, bigger reputations that have come here and look like a bad joke. Yeah, yeah, you know, true. Retiring after a handful of laps. Very, or very true. Spending every pit stop with, with more and more smoke and steam coming out of it and the car plummeting down the oil. They haven't. They've looked very, very good. The biggest problem they've got is that Toyota is better. Yes. So the 52 AF course of Ferrari. Uh, what Suspension. What? Oh. Left rear suspension failure. And they lost a lot of time when Daniel Serra was at the wheel early hours of this morning, about 5 o'clock-ish, uh, trying to sort that out. Okay. And uh, we can hear about Ferrari with Sam Bird, because Sam in the pit lane is with Duncan. Sam, thank you very much for joining us in the, in the, in the pit lane. Can, can you hear? I can't hear. OK, he's just going to... First of all, Sam, it's good to see you um, dropped back into the team. How does it feel to be back in the AF course of 52 car? Yeah, it feels great to be back in the car. Um, unfortunately, we, we've had an issue during the night, which has set us back as we were fighting the Corvette for P2. Um, good news is the sister car is having a great run out there, and let's see if uh, they can hold on to that. There's a bit of a repair job on the front right. Is that what the, the issue was? Could you talk us through it? I'm finding it difficult to hear. Um, I think you said about the front right, yeah. Um, in my second stint, uh, Anam didn't see me and turned in into, into the Ford chicane, so... But it, it's not cost us any time or it's not cost us any performance. What cost us performance was some uh, suspension failure. Yeah, it, it looks more cosmetic than anything, just, just bodywork and cosmetic damage. Yeah, it's just... Um, It's just cosmetic damage, so, yeah, it's, it's OK. Thank you very much Cheers, for your time. Thank you. Cheers. Well done, Duncan. So, uh, yeah, the, the first incident was at the chicane with Brendan Areeb, wasn't it? Yes, 71 it was. that turned in on it. And then there was the, the left rear suspension failure as well that they had to sort out. So, so the two aren't linked? Don't think so. OK. No, no, no. different corners, different incidents. Yes, yes, yes. But okay. um, added all together, a lot of time lost. And so, as we were saying a little while ago, it's left now 51, upholding Ferrari honour, but you've got one Ferrari ahead of one Corvette, the other one having had problems, and then the two Porsches that are perhaps being more reliable, but not as quick. Yeah, Puegridi in the in the 51 AF of course, a Ferrari has uh, just set its fastest lap of the race, and he's just gone personal best in that first sector on the next lap. So he is uh, certainly uh, in the zone. And also just had a pit stop as well, because he's just taken the car over from James Collado, so he'll be on a new set of yep. tyres as yeah. well. And uh, with the track temperature and everything coming into the zone, good time. Now you see the gap between the Alpine and the Glickenhaus. Only 8.9 seconds between the two. It's been going back and forth all race, yeah. hasn't yeah. it? Yeah, it trades on the pit stops, doesn't yes, it? it does, when yeah. the Alpine comes in. Well, the Alpine should be in, in uh, sorry, the, the Glickenhaus should be in, in a couple of laps. It owes us a pit stop relative to the Alpine. The Alpine was in two laps ago. And uh, so we're going to see that extend back out again. But it is trading, it's just swinging back and forth. It's too early, really, with eight hours to go to see what the stint lengths are going to be towards the end of the race. Yeah. But in maybe another three or four hours, halfway 
getting through this last part of the race, then you can start to predict what they'll do and how they'll I'm uh, sure, split the last. I'm stage. sure that uh, the bigger teams will will be having uh, a guy sitting there working their way, you know, from the end of the race back into sort of seeing, okay, if it was to go green all the way. You get to a point though where you would say, for example, you'd do 10 laps. Do you then split it into equal stints of nine, for example, all the way yeah. through or something like that? Yeah, it's uh, just trying to work through exactly what uh, what is going to be the best for your car with the tire allocation you have left uh, for the driver driver stints and just trying to work your drivers through, feeding them into the car and trying to get your fastest guy or the guy that's been the most comfortable in the car and the quickest through the race, lining him up for the end of the race. Yeah, or the one if you need to, the the one that you know will scrap it out to the end. Yeah. Because we have seen races come down to the last couple of laps yeah, and yeah. someone that is just going to fight it out tooth and nail to the end. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Your finisher. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Nicolas Lapierre definitely would be the guy I would throw in in that situation in, in the Alpine lineup. No doubt. He has been a, a battler for many, many years and, and just know, always delivers. He also he understands this race. He's delivered on it. He's won it many times in LMP2. Yeah, yeah. But you're talking about fast lap times coming in. Uh, Will Stevens has also done his fastest first sector and four seconds behind him. And catching in four seconds behind him was Tom Blomquist in the Jota car. Now, we saw it the other way around when Sean Galil yep. was sort of just holding off Stevens for a long period of time. And now that's reversed round after a long pit stop by Jota. But uh, Blomquist is marching back in on the back of uh, the I Paris racing car. Blomquist is on the new tyres. I'm not sure Will is. Whether Will, Will was on different tyre strategy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so he's uh, maybe on a, a stint old or a couple of stints old. So maybe that tyre performance isn't quite as good for Will. But yeah, Tom is making some headway on him and that battle's going to continue for the next number of hours. Which is great to see. But, uh, 11th and 12th in uh, GTE Am here. Dempsey Proton racing car and uh, the Herberth Motorsport car battling it out. And just another quick update on uh, quick sector times. Nick De Vries in the G Drive, 10th overall in LMP2, uh, 15th overall in the race, has just thrown in that car's fastest middle sector which runs from the Est de la Farages before Tetra Rouge all the way down to Moulsan. Yeah, and the, at, at the front of a GTE Pro, we've got the AF Corsa Ferrari, and he's just done, the Pere Gris, he's just done his fastest lap of the race. But Antonio Garcia is, is holding that gap. It's around about that yeah. 19, 20 seconds, and it's been like that for the last number of laps. And uh, so they're going back and forth here. And as hard as uh, Puer Greedy is trying to get away from Antonio, Antonio is just desperately trying to hang on to him. It's a great race. Yeah, it is. He's, they're keeping each other very, very honest. Yeah. Yeah, you which know. you would expect. You know, two guys absolutely at the top of their game for their manufacturer, slugging it out. This is what we're... what they're paid for. Blomquist has just done his fastest lap, so he's now down to 1.1 seconds. Oh, he's taken a big chunk, hasn't he? Yeah. He was four seconds on that previous lap. This Herberth Motorsport car went a little bit wide there coming into Porsche. Drop right back. Another pit stop for the Innovation car. And uh, Nigel Bailey's at the wheel of that at the moment. Yeah, they went in the box, didn't they? Yeah, they did, yeah. Well, did we find out what that was for? Nope. No, we didn't. They went in nose first into the box as well. Normally, it's tail first yeah, into the box. Yeah, we'd seen that. We'd yep. seen that yep. with them earlier on in the week. Uh, I think that must be for driver change yep. and uh, getting the guys in and out. Second placed LMP2 car. There's no innovations on its way again. Kubica back out of the pits. WRT car, yeah. 41. Well, this fog has uh, somewhat lifted, hasn't it? It's, uh, it's not, it hasn't uh, got any worse, let's say. 
we can see the, still see the racetrack. Yeah, it's lifted. Now the, the regulation is that the marshal's supposed to have to be able to see from one to the next. Yeah, yeah. And uh, from that perspective, then it's deemed to be in the correct sort of levels. But it's not lifting. It's lifted from that dense fog mm -hmm. that we had, but it's certainly not lifting. But this is the battle for third place as it's resuming. Uh, Tom Blomquist in uh, the Jota Sport car, the second car in that lineup, and Will Stevens is now, he was the hunter, now he's the hunted. Yeah, and uh, Tom is clawing back that time that was given up in that last pit stop, and he's uh, also got that new set of tyres on, and so he's using all of those resources to try and get himself back onto the gearbox of Will Stevens, and uh, this is quite the fight. It's a quick view of Charles Malesi, who is waiting to get into the WRT car at the next stop, which yeah. would be Robin Frins, uh, will be coming in in the next four laps. He will, Robin's done a triple stint by then, and then Malesi would jump in before Ferdy Habsburg would uh, take over duties later on. Yeah, the, uh, the 31 uh, WRT car is uh, with Robin Frins on board. Is, seems like it's got that class sort of under control. You can't ever say it is fully done. But it, it's, yeah, very quick and consistent. Eight into the pit, pit lane. Nakajima coming to the end. And, 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 you know, we'll have to see if there's been any update on this uh, little issue that they have. A small vibration that sort of crept into the system being monitored by the engineers. The driver's now able to sort of feel it and feed back. It's fuel on. Kind of yeah. looks like a standard stop there. Yeah, full Are service. We? Full service and... Uh, Boemi, I believe, is going in. Yeah. Here we go. After his little uh, update from the engineer, he's now in the car. Fuel is done. I'm going to go four tyres. Activity there on that right-hand side of the car, wasn't there? They were, I'm not sure if that is a standard thing. They were yeah, most of the most of uh, things like charging the oil is on the right-hand yeah. side okay. for ease of mechanics being able to access yeah, it's, it. It's right there. And uh, there's quick sectors coming in now. Uh, Will Stevens, as we see the Toyota just going slowly down the pit lane. Will Stevens has done the quickest first sector. Norman Natto in the real team racing car that's in eighth and leading Pro Am in LMP2, quickest first sector. Renge van der Zander's just done the quickest middle sector for his car as well. And so there's blue popping up in our timing screen. Blue means the quickest of the car. And then if uh, there's purple, then it's going to be the quickest overall in the category in the race. Yeah. So certainly the track looks good, S still evolving. And uh, drivers out there, oh, this is the Will Stevens, uh, Tom Blomqvist battle here that we're watching. And uh, Tom has managed to haul himself up onto the back of, of Will Stevens. Dragon speed car could get into the mix. Henrik Hedman is uh, in that car at the moment. It's second place in Pro-Am in LMP2, and it's only 32 seconds behind uh, the leader in Pro-Am as well. So he'll not want to sort of get out of the way too much. Yep. He's he'll need to sort of keep it, keep it real. No doubt. And Will Stevens has just gone his fastest second sector for that car. And uh, Tom Blomqvist is just matching him. It's and they're using that uh, the Dragon Speed car as, uh, as sort of like a slingshot, using it to tow up behind them and through and off. And as they come down to Indianapolis, the two of them are uh, almost you know, as one. Yeah, I think uh, it's going to be a brave maneuver if it's in this lap for. Tom Blomquist to have a look at Will Stevens. There's no traffic up ahead to try to create that sort of speed differential that you take the you take the chance of the opportunity to sneak down the inside or yeah. the outside. I'm sure Tom was hoping that uh, the Dragon Speed car was going to sort of get a little bit more in the way and, uh, and create an opportunity for him, but uh, didn't happen. But um, he's still on him. Let's just see how they come through the Porsche curves here. And, uh, these two guys are very experienced in these cars now and uh, they're certainly showing it the performance is fantastic and it seems like will has 
really nailed it through the Porsche curves. Yeah, he has. I think this will be his quickest lap and the car's quickest lap of uh, the race so far. As Robin Frins has done exactly the same for WRT 31, the class leading 31. Yeah, getting low on fuel, Robin is. 7.08 back into the race, so losing its third place back to the Alpine as the LMP2 fight comes over the line. There you go, Alan. I'll name that tune in one, a 3.33-0 <laughs> for Will Stevens, which is eight tenths quicker than Frins, who just did uh, his car's quickest lap of the race. Yeah, but and, uh, Tom Blomqvist was only three tenths behind Will Stevens on that lap. Well, and so. the Glickenhaus has got in the way coming down the hill a little bit. This is a car that just came out of the pits, Ooh. Olivier Pla. He's, uh, this could be the opportunity yeah. Tom's been looking for. Pla's not very quick on the start of this. No, he's not. Uh, this is definitely the opportunity right now. Exactly. Double toe. So Will Stevens trying to get through the traffic, trying to defend from Tom Blomqvist. Suddenly life has become very, very busy as they come down towards the first of the chicanes. And Blomqvist is right there. Stevens has to go defensive. Blomqvist sitting in the draft goes to the outside line, gets a face full of Glickenhaus. And can he go all the way around the outside? Yes, he can. He's got his nose in front. And so Tom Blomqvist takes the place. Good move. Absolutely. All set up from the Glickenhaus just coming out of the pits, just in front of Will Stevens. And Will Stevens is almost powerless there, really. Now, can Will Stevens do the same to Blomqvist? Because now Tom's got to clear the Glickenhaus. Yeah, but the Glickenhaus is not going very quickly. No. That's the first thing that I just noticed about it. It looks as if it's uh, slightly under par and under weather. Mm. Well, now Blomqvist is extending that margin, and Olivier Pla perhaps is getting up to a proper pace now, but Tom Blomqvist up to third within LMP2 for Jota. Maybe Pla had been snoozing and he was just trying to wake himself up. <laughs> he's not quick in the corners, he's pretty quick no. on the straight, but he's not quick in the corners. This is his second stint oh. for Olivier Pla, so the tyres will have done 13 laps, and he's going on to his second 13-lap stint, so he'll be full of fuel. Yellow MP3. Is that somebody off at Dunlop. Follow the 34 car out here, we might see. 72. So it could be the Hub Auto Racing Dries Van Tor GTE Pro car that uh, may have an issue up there as 22's back in the pitch. United Autosport oh. once again. They thought that they had solved all the problems, but being in the garage, and there it is, yep. the Hub yeah. Autosport car. This is the car that started in pole position in GTE Pro. Brilliant lap by Dries Van Tor but uh, now it looks like the race is coming to a sticky sort of situation. Oh, straight That's through, straight That's a, that looks like a bit of a failure issue to... Yeah, that grinds to a halt, doesn't it? Yeah. Yes. That's not what you want. Initially, you would think he was just aborting the corner, maybe locked a brake or something, but then to grind it to a halt. And uh, that could bring out a slow zone mm. in that area to recover that car if it cannot move in its own steam. So rocking backwards and forwards a little bit there. So he'll be on the radio, presumably to the team, trying to explain what he's just felt and, and get some guidance. 33 TF Sport, Aston Martin in for another stop. And we're going to see a driver change here. Ben's going to be jumping yeah. out. Second in class, Ben Keating to get out of the car. There you go, well done, Ben. He's 50. He, was, he turned 50, didn't he? Uh, a few days ago. Recently, yeah. It's a great age, if you ask me. <laughs> Maturing. You, you get quicker, do you? Yeah. Yeah quicker you think you were anyway. True, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the driver chain cycles through. This is chasing the Francois Perodo Ferrari. And uh, that car will cycle through the full service of fuel tyres and driver before going back into the race with seven and a half hours to go. OK, seven and a half hours, it's a long time, David, but uh, when you talk about the battle the TF Sport car and the AF Cor Corsa have been in, right now you have to say that AF Corsa seems to have it under control. It's penalties and mistakes and things that will take it away from them. And uh, we've seen that happen. Francois Perot served to drive through penalty for speeding in the pit lane. It's that sort of thing you've got to be careful of. Yep, you do, but it's TF Sport's job to just keep that pressure on, keep yep. executing, keep delivering, keep their drivers focused and uh, just, they've just got to stick to their plan and just hope that that pressure keeps building on that 83 car and they make another mistake. And AF Corsa, of course, leading two classes here because they're leading both of the GT elements, Pro and Am. Yeah. 
they are an exceptionally good team. Now, Will Stevens here coming back at Tom Blomqvist, isn't he? So the gap is down again. This is the fast food battle, and it's KFC ahead of McDonald's at the moment, but Will Stevens much, much closer, ready for a move. And that Glickenhaus is, is still there, the Olivier Plar car. Mm. Yeah. And it's... Um, it's not got away, has it? No. And a yellow flag is out, and it is because of the Hub Auto Porsche. So that car brings out a yellow flag. Big disappointment for the, the Hub Auto team, the Taiwanese team, because they've been so good through qualifying. Yep, they'd had a very strong uh, practice sessions and, uh, and, and qualifying sessions, but really, from lap one, turn one, they've had problems and issues. And drivers jumping out. And uh, the 72 car is... looks like... So the that, driver gets out of the car, the 72, and he's, he's, he's running to the right-hand side of it. And we just wait to see what exactly he's doing. Well, that was the replay of the car going off. Yeah. But the driver is over on the right-hand side mm. of the car. He's got to be very careful because you can't go away a certain distance from the car yeah. or then officially you have left the car. Exactly. Which so means that you would be out of the yes. race. So Dries has, has stayed close, uh, but he's over on the right-hand side looking at something. Uh, sort of looked, looked, looked like he was over by the, the, the passenger door. Yeah. So the plot thickens, but it's losing more and more time. It's falling further and further down the order. But uh, retirement might back him for that. But the slow zone is called for to try and get that car out of the way now. Tom's managed to pull away a little bit from Will Stevens. He's, uh, he's just managed to capitalise on something there, and he's just eked out, you know, a mm. second or so. As the leader in, number seven Toyota is in. Mike Conway's brought the car back to the pit lane. Cleaning the screen, also clearing out any rubber pickup that's been thrown up into the wheel arch areas as well. And uh, those things can sort of build and create their own little dramas. Yeah, it's 251 laps now down by that car. 3,200 kilometres. Now think about driving 3,200 yeah. kilometres and the distance it is. This doing Le Mans is like 17 Formula One Grand Prix back to back. Or driving from New York to Los Angeles. Or the other one I worked out one day was from London to Russia. Uh, run London to Moscow Crikey. and back. And back. <laughs> In a day. In a day. Are we nuts? <laughs> <laughs> we'll get back to you on that. Right, away goes the leader, but straight into a slow zone here. Yeah. So that car back onto the circuit, and uh, it's a gentle way of restarting a stint, isn't it? You just crawl back onto the circuit there. Yes, it is, and uh, they've got the uh, Manitou up there uh, to lift and crane away the 72 Hub Auto car. Whatever the problem is, it's... Uh, it, it is kind of stuck, and yeah. I think it must be some sort of transmission issue. Yeah, as Alan said, you know, if you if you miss your braking point and had to cut the corner, you just blast out the other side and yeah. carry on. You wouldn't stop, and you certainly yeah. wouldn't get out and run around it and have a look. So there is clearly an issue there. Yeah, so. and the, and it was sat there, and then it rocked sort of backwards and forwards, and it's almost like the uh, the car is stuck in gear, mm. or, or the gearbox has, has had some sort of failure, so it's now uh, can't move it. So. Do you think it could have gone into a semi-neutral type of state? And that's why he then careered off? Yeah, maybe. And uh, with a paddle shift gearbox, you know, he needed to sort of rock it to try to get it back into a gear. Yeah. If it was stuck between gears, then that may be something, to, the reason why he, he just went, careered off and yeah. could, uh, only had the brakes to slow the car down. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a good point. Certainly a possibility, isn't it? So the team will want the car back, but at the moment it's being retrieved. The slow zone is called for, and it's still operational, as you can see, because the 28 comes back out into the fray and slowly up towards the uh, first corner. So, so, in fact, Stevens and Blomqvist have both just pitted. Yeah, so if the 72 car has been lifted away like that, then is that them done? Yes, yes. There it is, behind the barrier. Oh, but so. he's still in the car. Dries is still in the car. Interesting. So... As long as he is there, then he can somehow, if he can work on it, then he can uh, then he can get it going and back to the pits somehow. If he thinks that there is a way to, to get it fixed, get the regs out. One moment, caller. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Talk amongst yourself. Coke. Right. Charmy Lacey has taken over the uh, LMP2 leading number 31 car, and Charmy uh, Lacey. Still battling with the sister car of Robert Kubica, but Team WRT having a very, very good showing here at the moment. Yeah, they are. They are um, sort of 
taking control of this race in LMP2. And uh, they've got both cars right up there at the front. It's Robin Frines just uh, sorting his stuff out, getting his uh, helmet and, and bits and pieces on the dryer. I'm sure he's going to be called on again to, uh, to do some more work before the end of this race. But yeah, he's had a, he's had a really solid run. One of the stars in that team. Mm. But, uh, the sister car is some minute and 12 seconds back in the, the number 41 WRT car. But, uh, Charles Malacy just works his way through that second chicane, keeping that speed up. And uh, what's his next target? He's some. He's a lap behind. Olivier Pla in the Glickenhaus, who still doesn't look like he's going very quickly. No, it's a kind of halfway house. It's not full pace and it's not limp home mode. Yeah. But it's it's feeling a bit lethargic on a Sunday morning, isn't it? Like yeah. it's like it's been up all night. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So they, they said with feeling. Right. So, so have you found the? Now I've got to page seventy-one, um, uh, and I'm trying to find specifically about retirements from races. Okay. So. I think the team have said to him, stay in the car. Yes. Uh, yeah. Because if you're in the car, we've got more of a chance of getting you back out. Well, yeah, so they've just taken it. it to a point of safety so that he can yeah. work on it. And uh, it was obviously, it couldn't be pushed anywhere. Um, and that's the reason why they had to lift it. Um, so to me, that sort of says it's some sort of no. gearbox issue. I think you're right. Um, and I can't find anything in that document, I'm afraid to say. So I'll have to do a bit more Googleage. 38, that's the second Jota entry, isn't it? Anthony Davidson into the pits. We've gone green again, now the car's out of the way, so yep. that slow zone is lifted. And the slow zone procedure under investigation. So is, is somebody sped in that or...? I, I think, to be honest, it's become a standard message now okay. that at the end of that, or a full course yellow or a safety car, all the GPS data is looked at just to make sure. So it's not one specific car that's okay. being looked at. They're just going to check everybody. The teams are aware of that, and then... That's all fine. We can move on. Yeah. Just make sure because you know, if somebody gains even a few tenths by yeah. not slowing at the right time. Yes. When the when the slow zone system was first introduced, that was one of the things that um, so many teams mm. did have an issue with. Yeah. Was that you know, certain cars and certain teams are really exploiting it. Yes. And yes. Uh, gaining a big advantage in certain spots. And so, you know. Eduardo and, and the ACO and, and everybody's sitting there working to, to make the system as fair as possible yeah. so that you can't cheat the system. Exactly, and police it properly right. as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I know it's a different championship. By way of example, Spa 24 hours during the practice sessions, lots and lots of drivers were being done for speeding in the pit lane. Speed limit was 50 kilometres an hour, and there was 50.1, 50.9, and the race director said the limit is 50. 50.0, not 50.1. Yeah. 50 yeah. Just because there's a 50 in your speed, that doesn't make it right. You should be setting that that that, that um, delta, your limiter, at 49.9. Yes. Not 50.1, and trying to play it because if you gain a tenth on that pit stop and a tenth on that, yes. over 24 hours, that's yeah. an advantage, it isn't it? It all adds up. Yeah. It certainly does. Yeah. So that was clamped down upon. And, and again, you know, the teams will push, whether it's with, with the, the regulations, whether it's with the, the, the technology side of the car. Every single grey area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're looking for yeah. all of those things just to try and sneak something here or there. Exactly. And, and the race officials will get wise and they'll clamp down on that, getting a replay here of number 80, which is Matteo Cressoni, who is currently third in some, GTE. And this is second, some, Dylan Pereira. It did have some, some damage there on the right front. The bodywork was sort of a bit had been kicked up. It yes. maybe had a puncture. We, I don't think it was a puncture, but we had seen that flick up a while ago. It was yesterday evening. Okay. Um, and they obviously left it because it's it's not having a, a, a big impact in any way. It seems. But yeah, the, I mean, the car's pace is, is pretty much undimmed, isn't it? Yeah. They're in third in the category. Iron Lynx car. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a team that's made a big name for itself in a short space of time, and with a link with Prema, the single-seater operation merging with it, and yes. it's got big plans for the future, and um, wealthy investors who are petrol heads, it's it's going from strength to strength. Yes, it is. It is. Now that's your uh, WRT LMP2 leading car, Charles Malaisi at the wheel, powering his way now up from Bullsan Corner. Is that the Jota car behind him? It is a Jota car. Yeah. And is it? 38 or 28, because I think it'll tell you on your track map, won't it? Yes, it will. If 
weren't so close and be one hidden behind the other, we yes. could see, but um, overlapping on our I track map. It is the um, it's a 28 car, I think. Right. Which means, therefore, that 31 has been caught by a car that's on a different lap, admittedly. Yeah. But Malaysia's look good. Now, uh, we've been talking about this GTE AM battle. Uh, ben Keating has been involved in it and has got his Aston Martin up into second in the class. Let's hear from Ben after a good stint. He's with Duncan Vincent. Yeah, Ben Keating has just stepped out from the number 33 TF Sport Aston Martin after a triple stint. That's a long, long way around, Lamar. How are you feeling? I'm feeling very good, actually. So, uh, you know, Lamar is one of those tracks that you can do a triple. It's nice and cool this morning. Nice and cool in the car. You got some long straightaways to kind of relax a little bit. Uh, I did uh, the second stint on Felipe's set of tires, and then I got a new set, and I did two stints on uh, the new set of tires. Uh, I can tell you it's really nice to have uh, a new set of tires around here. Uh, so I got one of those. Uh, I'll be out for a couple hours, and then I'll go back in the car to uh, finish my time. It's all about getting through the night, getting into the morning, and you know you're keeping yourself in the right position here, Ben. You're in the, you know, you're in the top five, top three, almost. Yeah, I'd hate to uh, wish anything bad on anybody, but uh, I, I wouldn't mind if uh, something happened to that 83 car right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's your thoughts on the rest of the race? Uh, the, the plan, uh, the other drivers are they giving good feedback and helping you every time you get into the car? Yeah, uh, I mean, I. I I backloaded my time. So I did one stint yesterday afternoon. Uh, I did three just now in the morning. You know, uh, with the mist coming down, you didn't really get the sun coming up really bright on the track. Uh, it was kind of foggy. You didn't really get what you would normally call happy hour. You know, it just didn't really feel that way. Uh, uh, or maybe that was just being on uh, old stint tires, but uh, uh, I'm excited to get back in the car in a couple of hours and uh, go try it again. And finally, how did you cope with the very changeable conditions? You know, it's, the, the conditions have been all over the place. They have been all over the place. Uh, I feel like we've timed my stints extremely well. I, I haven't had to deal with too much of it. Uh, I've really enjoyed having the in-car camera in the, uh, in the car this year uh, because you know, I don't have to tell them what's going on on track. They can look in the TV and see it. Uh, but uh, it, it's also nice to know what's going on with my co-drivers. So uh, I've been able to watch those guys, you know, drive through the rain uh, uh, or mixed conditions, changing conditions, and uh, learn a little bit from them as I watch them drive around. Ben, lovely as always. Thank you very much. You bet. Here we go. Thanks, Duncan. So good to hear from Ben Keating. And just one point on the back of that is it's interesting to see how the Pro-Am teams have, have treated the race because they've understandably tried to keep the Am out in the tricky conditions, but also in part keep them out from the night where you need your Pro to do the hard yards. So now coming to the end of the race, actually there's a lot of driving still to be done by the Ams. You know, they've got the, the, they have a minimum of six hours to do. We've got seven hours and change to go. They'll have done a bit, yes, but now we're going to see quite a chunk of driving from the Ams. Yes, so, so Ben, I think he's got two more hours to do uh, in the car. But uh, Tom uh, at TF Sports, Tom Ferrier, has, has, has been sitting there looking at it and going, all right, we, we know we need to get, you know, been through the car but you know they've absolutely seems like right now they've nailed it you know because yeah. they, they didn't have didn't expose Ben to all that danger and the car to all that danger when the, the, the conditions were so tricky and so difficult and and Tom had got his 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 faster and more experienced drivers in uh, in the car in, in those conditions and sort of saved Ben and so let him have a decent night's sleep let him sort of sit there and look at all the data look at all the, the onboard camera because that, that seems like another point is that they've they've actually got some live onboard camera feed from mm. that car mm. that they're monitoring and that they're able to use and Ben's able to use and the team are able to use and so that it's um, it's another little tool and device that's just helping that less experienced driver get that, as much performance out of the car as he possibly can and so that they're losing the least amount of time from that am 44th they started 28th they run so 
good solid job. Absolutely. This is seven, the race leading Toyota, working its way through the traffic once more. That blue light to back up the marshal's flags. And is that the 83? Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. Of so. Was that was that there? We're just going by. Maybe not. Um, it's the really dirty one. That's <laughs> that's which Ferrari it is. Okay. <laughs> They are getting very, very grimy now, aren't they? But a lot of that was down to the bad weather early on in the race. Yes, it was. It might have been uh, 80, the Crisoni Mastronardi Islet Ferrari. OK. However. Well, Mike, Mike Conway just uh, cracking on in the seven car. He's, uh, he's done the, the most driving in this car. We just had the drive times flash up there on the display, and he's, he's done, he's done about six and a bit hours so far. And he's due a win, isn't he? I mean, he's had... Pretty rotten luck here, yes. that, that car has. Yes. Seven always used to be the, the lucky number for Joost, but it's it's been the unlucky number at Toyota, seemingly. Yeah, see, I don't, I don't want to jinx Mike. <laughs> but... No, I mean, he has, he's, a, he's a phenomenal talent, and I, I saw him a number of years ago, and we had a bit of a chat about things, and, and I said to him, you know, you're in a brilliant position. You know, it will come. Mm. Your, your, your success and your opportunity will definitely come. And you just, I'm just hoping it's, it's this year for him, you know. Yeah. So we are, here we are with Nicolas Lapierre. And his uh, last pit stop was 11 laps ago. So it's going to be very soon, I'd say, that... Yeah, it should be this lap, shouldn't it? He yeah. should be in this time because he's been doing 12 lap stints and he's done 11 here. So, yeah, we expect a pit stop this time. So, uh, Nicolas Lapierre, who's been busy. And uh, Olivier Pla has uh, now fallen, what, a minute and 15 behind Nicolas. Yeah, his last lap was, was, was a 3.33. It's, it's like that car in this stint, is the Glickenhaus, that 708 car, has just lost a bunch of performance. Mm. Oh, like I said earlier, it's not limp home mode, but it's it's clearly lost pace somewhere, like the handbrakes on, or you know, yeah. like being flippant. But it's 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 not massively troubled, but it's troubled. Yeah, it's just all walking in treacle. You know, it's yeah. not very free. No, that's right. And again, we're getting to that point of the race where these problems start to manifest themselves. You know, we've heard about number eight with the vibration and the, yeah. and the, the, the concern over that. So is this the start of something more sinister for the 708 Glickenhaus? Yes, yeah, so, so the 708 had that contact with the eight car, didn't it, on lap yeah. one, turn one. And are both the issues that those two cars are seeing, is it from that? Is mm. it from that contact and the, the incidents that happened through? You just never know. Oh. Oh, it's taken a long time. Yes, but of course. Makes sense. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, yeah. here's the 83 car leader in uh, GTE Am. Is there a driver change going on there? And they're going to do a full service here. Fuel and tyres, and a very w well drilled squad. And this is uh, the eight car, also in for a stop. Uh, Sebastian Boemi is at the end of his first stint. He needs to be taking a bit of a drink. Have we heard any more about the vibration problem for no, that car? Uh, not, uh, no, not in not the lately. last... No, uh, but I think he's getting an update there um, from the engineer. He, he, Sebastian was sort of sort of talking and sort of shaking his head. Mm. And uh, so there's... Maybe we'll get some team radio in a minute. I mean, he will be able to bring back data from that stint and, and, yeah. and offer suggestions yeah, again, or at least a proper analysis. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see his read on it and is it the same as Nakajima's? Mm. You know, has it, can he now feel that vibration or that sort of odd feeling that Nakajima was reporting in, the, in his last stint? And, and could it be that one driver can cope with it better? You know, it's more of a, an issue for one style of driver than it is for another. Yes, it's possible. It is possible, but... Um, you know, that's usually some sort of setup issue, or there'll be usually some sort of uh, handling characteristic that one driver can deal with better than others. Yeah. Um, when it's, uh, you know, an engine issue or a, a power, you know, a powertrain or a, a drivetrain issue, that that's something that's more fundamental and not something really a driver can change his style for. Yeah. 
Alpine is in, as we were predicting. Yep. So uh, in comes Nicolas Lapierre, and he should bail from the car this time, shouldn't he? And he does seem to be constantly behind the wheel oh, of this yeah. car. The, the one name we haven't talked a lot about is Andre Negrau. So we've had Vesivier in early this morning, then uh, here, Nicolas uh, Lapierre. So I think Negrau probably is due I to think, go. I think he does cycle through next yeah. if, it, if it's the same rotation. So there is Andre Negrau. Yep. Runs round with his seat. Jumps in. Yeah, and there's a driver helping there to get them in. Mm. Oh, he's getting a tear off. Look at that. Now, now that is something special. Clear vision. Yeah, when you get a tear off, <laughs> when the team gives you a tear off, you know you're in 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 the money, because it just is. It, it is. It's like if you wear glasses, cleaning your glasses thoroughly, or yeah. it's just a, a way of it's just your vision. All of a sudden, there's so much more that you can see, and uh, you feel like you've been sort of. Uh, trying to look through all kinds of debris and, ish and, and, and stuff all over the windshield and give you that tear off and it's brilliant. Now also, of course, the Alpine squad will have been monitoring what's going on with their main on-track rival, which is the 708 Glickenhaus. They would have seen that car's pace starting yeah. to drop and they will have realised that it is. this is the golden chance now to really take advantage. So new driver, new tyres, as you say, new visibility, clearer screen, but this is a chance to really try and push and, and break away from 708 if Olivier Pla is in trouble. And look, oh. the Alpine comes out just ahead. It's going to lose that as it gets up to speed and he now can accelerate. But this is game on for third place now. Yeah, it is. Let's see how uh, Negrau gets up to speed. And how quickly he can get on to the tail of uh, Olivier Pla in the 708. So that last lap from Pla was a 3.33 again. So they're OK laps. But Richard Westbrook's Glickenhaus did a 3.30, which was its best of the race. This car three seconds down. So it's just not really at the races anymore. Yeah, and it's almost like they've flip-flopped. You know, the, 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 the 709 car has battled and chased its setup throughout the week. And the guys just didn't look like they can uh, get on top of it. But now maybe it is coming into uh, a nice window. There is something actually uh, uh, coming adrift on the 708 car, just on the uh, rear bodywork. Well, keep, keep an eye to that, Glickenhaus. You're right, there is something not quite right. Uh, so the fight's on for third place. Andre Negrau hunting down the Glickenhaus. Nicolas Lapierre has just got out of the Alpine, and uh, Nicolas is in the pits with Duncan. Yep. Yeah, Nicolas Lapierre, a good triple stint there. That's a long one. I can see in the eyes that that was a difficult stint to hang on to the Alpine there. Yeah, I mean, it was OK. Um, it's pretty cold out there, so it's hard to warm up the tires. We are fighting a bit with the, the car. We are lacking a bit of rhythm since the beginning of the race, but um, apart from that, the car is, is going good. Andre is in the car now. Um, we will fight for this uh, position to get this podium. It's really important for us. Spoke with another driver, and he said happy hour didn't really happen. It, it wasn't really there today. Did, did you feel happy hour was good, or did you think the conditions kind of made it disappear? Um, yeah, it didn't feel as strong as usual, for sure. Um, I don't know really why. The car doesn't feel fast since the beginning of the race. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I don't really know why. I don't have an explanation, but it's true that happy hour was not as strong as usual. But you're still very much in contention for a podium and actually overall honours as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, the car is going good. We have no alarm yet, so we are just sticking to the plan. And uh, let's hope we can get this podium, yeah. Nico, thank you very That's much. Not me. Thank you. Thanks very much, Duncan. So, yes, the uh, effort is on. Alpine hunt down third place, and on this outlap, Andre Negrau pushes, pushes, pushes. There is Will Stevens coming towards us. Tom Blanc is clearing the traffic as well. So the fight continues. They are still at it, aren't yeah. they? I was just wondering if there wasn't a fraction of damage on the Blomquist's right front left corner of that car, but it might just have been something he's running over more than it was coming off the car. Yeah, the boys there working all the data in the uh, Jota pit. They've got a great team there. Well, seriously hard. Sam runs a brilliant, a brilliant operation, Sam Hignett. Yeah, and, and this year also adding a GT element to it, running yeah. the McLaren in, in yeah. GT World Challenge, for Absolutely, example. Yeah. yeah. Oh, here we go, the wheel to wheel now coming down to Indianapolis, and it's almost like the wheel's got a problem. Yeah, because Blomqvist's got a much better turn of speed, hasn't he? He's going to go round the outside here, which is brave, brave stuff. He's got his nose just in front. Will Stevens has enough room on the inside line to fight back, but Tom Blom gets it done round the outside, heading towards Indianapolis, and 
We've heard from Alan McNish earlier on that you wouldn't go around the outside there because it's too quick a place, but Blomqvist had a go he and he makes nailed, it work. Nailed it. Brilliant. Really nailed it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's it's it, Tom's been clawing that time back to Will Stevens ever since that uh, slow pit stop, and he's finally got himself back in front. And uh, now he's starting to pull away. And, 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 and I'm not sure how many stints Will has on his tyres, and I think this could be his final mm. one. So he might be jumping out at this next round of stops. Why did Bronquist lose time in the pits? Um, it was it was there was something was the going door? on with the door. And yeah, yeah, I think that there was something going on with the door and, and it was reopened by Tom. There was some some confusion there with the team. Right. And so they just lost him. I think it was about 16 seconds. OK. Longer than, than a normal stop. Sure. Yeah. So we've got the 709 car in here. And there's, there's Richard Westbrook. Yeah. There's one of the mechanics there. He's got his hand right inside the car in just behind the front wheel, the, the, the uh, left front wheel looking and, and doing something. Is that trying to get rid of any pickup? Possibly, that, you know, yeah. Rubber has been yeah. flailed and stuck to the arch. Yeah, and it might well be that, uh, that, that after testing, they know that that's mm. where a, a, a problem area where they get a lot of build-up of pickup. Yeah. And uh, he was just trying to clear that out. Richard Westbrook looking very regal on that photograph. Yes, yes, yes. Lord Westbrook of Glickenhaus. Yes. Indeed. There's the car coming into the pit lane in replay. Does that show us anything? Oh, a lock-up, that's yeah. what it shows us. So, no, so we're just yeah. getting an update from Duncan on, on what the delay was for Tom at the uh, at the pit stop when he got in, and he, was, he actually hadn't got his radio plugged in, and he, he, he couldn't find it and locate it, and it was actually still stuck to the top of his helmet on the Velcro. Uh, but these things can happen when you know it's <laughs> you haven't had much sleep, a bit fatigued, and you're just maybe just missing just one tiny little part of that routine that you've done a hundred times. You know, getting in and out of the car and, yeah, just missed that little bit, but it cost him that 16 seconds. It's like, where are my glasses? You know, they're on your head. Yes, thing. yes, yes. So, exactly. <laughs> oh. A delay for Tom Blomqvist. Cheers, Dan. You're a star bringing me a cup of tea. That looks lovely. Thank you very much. And uh, the delivery to the pit lane for the next cup of tea is required. I oh, know he's, he's about to sit down, Duncan. I'm afraid you missed your chance. So yeah, Sorry about that, Duncan. Yeah, yeah. Hey ho. Um, away goes 91, so back into the fray blasts Richard Leitz. And still the Porsche fight, a bit like we're talking about for third and fourth with Alpine and Glickenhaus, you know, that's trading on the pit stop. So we need to really fast forward to the last stop because whoever stops last is, is going to lose the place. Yes, absolutely. And, and they're trying to sort of make some some ground on the 63 Corvette with Jordan Taylor behind the wheel and the, uh, the 51 with we're greedy behind the wheel, uh, but they're not really making any, they're not really denting it, you know, the, the lap times uh, between the 51 Ferrari and the 63 Corvette are almost identical. Yeah. They're just trading backwards and forwards and it's, it's sort of stuck. And, and with a 70 second gap between Ferrari and Corvette anyway, it's AF Corsa's race to lose seemingly in GTE yeah. Pro. Yeah. Uh, with Darren Turner, we've, we've effectively lost a Corvette with, with dramas. We've effectively lost a Ferrari with suspension dramas. See, so it's one of each now, one Ferrari versus one Corvette. But, but so you know, what happened reliability is key here. Uh, about an hour or so, yes. maybe an hour and a half ago, there was only, I think, Garcia was closing in. He was about 21 seconds off the lead. But that was because he was out of sync on the pit stops. Right, okay. So after the Ferrari had pitted, that brought the Corvette right back into the game. Yeah, but they're okay. stopping at different, you know, different laps. So the gap had widened again on the, the last stop from the, the Corvette. It's very much advantage we... Ferrari. Let's see. And again, when I left, there was the battle between 28 and 65. It looks like that's still going strong. It does. It's just traded moment. back. Yep, Tom Blomqvist was ahead, lost it on the pit stop. KFC's just got it back. Got the upper hand at this point. Absolutely. Yep, told you it was fast food, that <laughs> fight. The uh, KFC uh, Orica ahead of the McDonald's backed one. And a great battle with 36 and the, the 708 Glickenhaus at this point as well. Presumably the loser in the fast food battle could be described as wimpy. <gasps> Could be, yeah. <laughs> but for older <laughs> listeners yeah, that remember yeah. what a wimpy was. Yeah. <laughs> In the halcyon days. Yeah. Ollie, Ollie shakes his head, heads wow. for the door. Yeah. They are right. still going, aren't they? I don't know, really. I don't see many of them. No. No. When was the last time you had a wimpy? I don't think I had it. Our local one used to be called Grandma Buggins. That's where everyone Grandma used to, Buggins. <laughs> that's where everyone used to <laughs> hang out for their burgers. We're watching a 
<laughs> We're watching the 30, 36 car get past the uh, the 708 Glickenhaus. And that was very strange how all that happened. Getting held up by the Porsche, wasn't it? Yeah, but it was almost like uh, Olivier just sort of like was half asleep. Yes. Yeah, Which is what the car has looked like. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe actually the problem's been with Olivier. <laughs> Not with the car, I don't know. <laughs> that last pit stop didn't have enough espresso for him, clearly. So, uh, I, I mean, he might be genuinely flagging. They've kept him in the car for how many stints now? I mean, is he starting to get tired? I know that might be a facetious way of describing it, but there is something not quite right. He's a lock up there. Yeah. He's lost the place on the road to the crowd. The car hasn't had the pace since it came out of the pit lane. And it's got something going on with the, uh, the bodywork on the left rear, just in front of the, yeah. the, the yeah. Uh, left rear wheel. He's coming back, isn't he? He is. Now, has that woken him up? He has been woken up, and he's going to have a go. So this is the modern hypercar against the grandfather version, and Olivier Pla goes back through. So take that, everybody, he says. I'm still here, and I can still deliver, and the Grau eventually has to slot in behind him and give way, but this is a really good fight now for third place on the road. Yeah, it's great stuff. Glickenhaus just absolutely... <laughs> It's like a rocket off of Mulsanne Corner, wasn't it? It was. Just hooked up but, and off it went. But it had lost time to get the Alpine into the fray. It then couldn't respond initially, and all of a sudden, Olivier Plart can deliver. Yeah, oh. Maybe he just had a little small technical problem towards the end of the lap, as he was trying to get through the forged cane with the, yeah, with the GT yeah, traffic yeah, as well. He's got a, maybe he has got some sort of transmission issue, or maybe there's a small misfire yeah. uh, that's just yeah. intermittent. All of this started, Darren, when, when Olivier Pla came out of the pits at the start of, of his stint, it looked slow, and he rejoined ahead of LMP2 cars, wasn't able to pull away, and we were saying it wasn't quite like limp home, though, but it wasn't full race pace, it was this halfway house, and, and the cars just looked lethargic, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. Now it looks like it's, it's turned on. Whatever the issue is, yeah. it seems to have disappeared, but... Finally, yeah. But Negrau is equal to the task, look, as they come out of the Ford chicane, over the timing line, past our window, up towards turn one. Race leader on lap 260, just under seven hours of the race to go. There, the gap widens markedly up towards the first corner. Yeah, but they're still um, they're in that sort of three, three, three minutes 33, three minutes 34. Not, not really pressing on that hard. No. It's, um, it's strange. But the Alpine team knows that if that car has got a problem, this is the opportunity to exploit that and try and clear it and pull away. Well, they had got ahead briefly, uh, and then the Glickenhaus comes back, retakes the place. So Olivier Pla being oh, given the hurry up almost. Yes, he is. I'm just trying to, I'm just going back to the GTE Pro battle, and I'm trying to figure out um, how the 63 car has has lost time to the 51 Ferrari and I'm just looking at the pit stops here and they are almost on the same strategy now the 51 and the 63 but the but 51's last stop was only 56 seconds wasn't it so yeah yeah a, but, but they 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 might be on the same strategy but they're stopping you know laps apart so the gap stretches and falls depending on when the Ferrari comes in yes and and the last stop for for Jordan Taylor was what a minute 43 so that's a good chunk of time some of it is compared to the 56 yeah. seconds for, for the 51 car sure no the corvette needs that ferrari to, to have some strife doesn't it really to, to come back into the mix yeah it does or a, a, a safety car that helps it rather than hinders it which is the other element of all of this you know if you've been in the wrong safety car uh, yeah. pack you can lose time yeah, well, you just need a, a slow zone to go your way mm. where it slows up the Ferrari but doesn't it disappears then when you arrive. Sure. Michael Christensen in, now 92. So the works Porsche down the pit road. Michael Christensen, who's only really done the Portimao race uh, by way of driving with Estra and Yanni in practice for this weekend. But the WEC class champion comes to the pit lane then and uh, comes to get the screen cleaned. Engineers, of fuel. that uh, technician there just looking at the brakes, just uh, seeing if that's uh, something that they need to do, just making sure that they're all within the tolerances and, and, and they're wearing in the, in the, at the rate that they, they predicted. And we also know that car had a, a data issue because they couldn't get the tyre data back. We heard Adam Hardy talking to Kevin S, didn't we, earlier on, saying okay. there was a, a problem that they didn't have the tyre information anymore. Yeah, I wonder if that got fixed at one of the pit stops and they're back to having uh, full telemetry throughout the 
throughout the lap. I mean, it is pretty crucial for the teams to understand where the next tyre pressure should be when yeah, they come true. out of the tyre ovens. Yeah. Um, and it really helps the team understand how sort of uh, to get the maximum performance in the next stint. So. There has been a lot of communication issues here yes. over, over this weekend, or over this race. Mm. And, we've seen a lot, and maybe that's one of the things that the 92 has been struggling with, just getting that, that telemetry data back so, with yeah. the radio waves. I mean, you're used to having the radio issue, which generally starts after the second chicane on the Mulsanne and then comes back mm. uh, when you come out of Arnage. But that, over the last few years, most of the teams have got on top of that in terms of having that sort of uh, dark zone uh, around the circuit. Just repeaters that have put up. Yeah, and, yeah, that usually is the thing that it's, it's fixed that. I'm trying to think who it was, but there was one driver this weekend who said to his team, radio's good apart from that section, so no radio traffic there, thank you, but elsewhere it's good. Yeah, them. and that'd be, a, that'd be a repeater problem. Yeah. Oh, Ben's getting ready again to get back in the car. Blimey, he's only been out for an hour. I think this might just be a replay of, of earlier shots from the pit lane, because you've oh. seen people brushing their teeth, you've seen battles going on on track, and Jim Glickenhouse looking happy. Jordan Taylor here in the Corvette. This is back live, hustling on, getting up past the D station, Aston Martin, which is being driven currently by... Satoshi Hoshino down in 34th place. It'd be great to know right now how many of those AM cars, uh, their AM drivers, and what time they have left. Mm. Uh, we've just under seven hours to go. Well, we know Ben Keating's got to do at least another two stints. Yeah. And Francois Perodo will be the same, won't he? Because he's not done a huge amount yet. Right. But at the moment, it's Nicholas Nielsen, the pro in the leading Ferrari, and it's Dylan Pereira, who's effectively the pro in the 33 Aston, chasing after him. And then the third is Matteo Cressoni in uh, the number 80 Ferrari. Just riding on board there with Antonio Garcia. Oh, we've got... Um, this is the 80 car coming in. It is. That's Cressoni. Just mentioned him, and he's had a big, big lock-up. And, in fact, he's got damage on the front, hasn't he? Yes. That's a big lock-up. Yeah. Is that into the first chicane? Yeah. 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 Great shot. Yeah, I was just thinking that. Super slow mo. Yeah. That little damage with the, the bodywork sticking up, that was sustained last night, but there's a little bit more uh, of an issue around that you corner. Certainly damaged that tyre. Uh, you're yeah. not wrong. Yeah. <laughs> but like a 50p coin now, ain't it? Rattling his fillings coming into the yeah. pit lane. And the problem is, once you've got one flat spot on the tyre, it tends to always lock up again oh, at that yeah. point, and mm. you just. Uh, it's, uh, one of those spiralling out of control yeah. situations at that point. It's not self-healing, is it? No, no. <laughs> well, unless you're really talented and you can start to do it, you know, all the way around the tyre, you know, just a little flat spot and just... <laughs> just balance it all out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just bring it back to being round again. I've never actually seen a driver do that. But, no, you know, I was going to say, in all my experience, yeah. that's never, ever happened. In theory, that <laughs> might be potentially possible. <laughs> you had a dream, yes. Yeah. Uh, Racing Team Netherlands, we understand, is one of the teams that still has communication issues to the car. So it might have been improved generally here, but it can still be a problem for some. Yeah. Whenever Fritz was in the uh, the gravel trap, though, he was, didn't seem to have much of a problem communicating with the team or getting his, uh, point, his point across. No. no, he had a very good command of Anglo-Saxon, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, yeah. The team was struggling to, to hear, or the, he couldn't hear the team, everybody that's else the, could hear that's him. That's the problem, yeah. yeah, and that was one of the reasons why he actually had a, a couple of his issues, because mm. the team couldn't advise him on the weather. Yeah. So he was just arriving blind. Or, or the team was advising him, but he couldn't hear, yes. and was therefore saying, why didn't you tell me? Right. Well, we did. Yes. Um, yeah. Which made him even crosser. So, yes. <laughs> and crosser. So within the last... And he was very cross. Oh, yes, we got the point, didn't we? Yeah. Yes. Within the last seven hours, there's the leading car. Mike Conway still clear now by the best part of a lap, two minutes and 40 seconds, effectively. Getting away further and further and further all the while now. But Sebastian actually did have quite a good stint, and he, he got a couple of purple sectors during that stint, but it's... Um maybe this, this issue that the, the eight car has got is, is, is intermittent. And it's clear and clean for maybe a lap or two, but then mm. it comes back and causes a bit of a performance issue. I don't know, we'll have to see how that develops and grows. Yeah, we need to start looking at, at lap times in this stint. It's on this out lap, so not this one, but the next lap is going to give us a bit of an idea about pace. Others are still improving. Paul de Resta, 11th United Autosports, car's fastest lap of the race, and that's still sixth in class. And number 22 for United Autosports that uh, has finally gone back out, is due back in for a routine stop. And a new rear end is ready for Felipe Albuquerque's car that's down in 49th place now. 
to 22 when I left was having the wiring issue, so mm. they've obviously uh, got on top of that. Did they come back to you and let you know what, what that situation was in there and what part they replaced in the loom? Don't recall. No, Duncan. Don't Duncan can do that. Yep. Go on, Duncan, tell us, tell the world here. OK, well, they replaced the bell housing with the alternator. They then replaced the complete gearbox loom. They then replaced the loom which goes from the engine area in towards the actual cockpit. They changed a few sensors in the cockpit. And then eventually they changed the battery, and the <sighs> battery had gone faulty. So that was the main problem. Now it's, yep, now I Thanks remember that. that. And actually, yeah. Alan did tell me it was the battery. So they got there in the end, but that cost them so much time as into the pit lane now comes number 70. This is Loic Duval bringing the real team racing car in. This is one of the Pro-Am entries within LMP2 and running in 13th place overall, 8th in LMP2, but the leading Pro-Am car. Right. Duval stays behind the wheel, as you see. He's, a, he's another talent, isn't he, Loic? Yeah. And he's yeah. he's going to be Peugeot. Indeed. So that car cycles through its next stop. And for them, it's not about winning LMP2, it's about being top in Pro-Am for that yeah. sub-championship. And uh, we're just looking a little bit uh, further up in the uh, P2, in, in fourth place, the Panis racing car. Will Stevens is still behind the wheel. Mm. And he's, um, he's just gone fastest in the first sector for him, for his car. So the track is still strong and it's still improving and guys are yeah. still gaining time. And, Now, at the moment, talk about Will Stevens, he's trying to get back onto terms with Tom Blomqvist, uh, and a pit stop is under investigation for 7.09, so that's Richard Westbrook, so the, not for the first time, a Glickenhaus pit stop may not have been quite right. Yeah. They've had a few, haven't they? Yeah. yeah. Too many people, possibly, or... Was that the car we saw that was locking up as it came across I mean, the line? Yeah. So maybe yes. it's a speeding... I think it would have said, it would say, wouldn't it, if it was a pit lane speeding thing? Yeah. Well, I, I don't the, know. The, yeah. It could have been, but the, 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 the whole pit stop from line to line is under investigation. So whether that's, whether that's personnel, speeding, yeah, so it'll be looked at. We'll get to the bottom of it. So Andre Negrau is, is just shadowing Olivier Pla, and it's whatever's happened with the, the 708 car and Olivier, he's, uh, he's got going again, yeah. and he's now back up to speed, and... It, it, it's like the car's woken up. Yeah, it's like he's been spurred into action, having suddenly got a, a, a fight on his hands with the Alpine. It was so strange how he got passed, though, by the Alpine here mm. into this final corner in Chicane. It was very, very strange how it all happened. And then finally, as you say, that, that, that spurred was, him on. Uh, yeah. and he was just like yeah. the slap around the face mm. that the, he or the car needed, and it just like, OK, let's go. And it's now he's in the pit lane. That's right. So in comes 708. So that stint has, has been the lethargic one, hasn't it? From the moment he came out, yeah. couldn't really clear the LMP2 cars. So let's see what they do, if anything, on the stop. Is there anything more than just fuel? He's staying on board. Yeah. There's no tyres being offered. No, there are tyres there. Oh, yes, you're right. There are tyres there. and it's um... Thumbs up from the Michelin technicians. Hmm. Oh, he's getting a tear off. Glorious. OK. Certainly looking at the averages for the last, I'd say, eight or nine hours from that car, that was the slowest stint mm. uh, for mm. that car. So he must be carrying some sort of uh, some sort of problem. Uh, it's a good three seconds off the averages. So, uh, yeah, interesting to, could to be, be a, seeing could that be, at this yeah. stage. Misfire or... Well, he's not going to have new tyres, that's for sure. So maybe, maybe, maybe he goes. Maybe Dunk can go and find out for us. Yeah, it's, it's a mystery, and the Alpine... Uh, no, not the Alpine, sorry, the real-time car, Loic Duval, goes back out. So, 708 Glickenhaus, Dunk, is the one with the, the question mark over it, because that last stint of Olivier Pla, as we've been saying, just looked a little lethargic. This was how he lost the place at the Alpine, caught up in traffic. So, he went one way, realised the gap was closing. Good opportunistic move by Negrau, wasn't it? Because he yeah. found the gap and went for it. But then he towed right back by him from Mall's yeah. corner in, down into Indianapolis and actually just made it look quite easy mm. in the end, really. Yeah. Certainly, the Glicken House is very strong in that area, isn't it, in terms yeah. of top speed? It's, yeah. it's got some healthy, uh, healthy power behind it and... Uh, Plenty of ponies. Yeah. Yeah. 708 to the pits in replay. The uh, Alpine on track in replay. So that's got its third position back now, Negrau 
pitting on a different lap. And 48 to the pit road as well, which has had a, a busy race. Two offs on the first racing lap, of course. This is, Will, is that Will Stevens? Yep. Yeah. Has he jumped out? Didn't see. New tyres on, so yeah. I would say that he is out then. He's certainly been in for a long, long well, period. It had been a, yeah, a long stint. Well, Tom Blomqvist has just left the pit lane. He stayed at the wheel of the car. So, we'll see what they do with Will Stevens here in the Panis Racing entry. Solid, solid effort from Will Stevens there. Great stuff. Goes through pit out. Now, back onto the circuit. Looks like he stayed in there. Oh, James no. Allen takes it over. So, the Australian single-seater racer, who was very impressive here last year. Right. And it's time for food at Jota. I wonder what that is. Does it look nice? Yeah. Should we have a wander down? <laughs> Duncan Benson, who's down there, says it smells amazing. Can you bring three up? Yes, <laughs> There was three in that tray as well, look. Just grab the tray. Yeah. yeah. Don't get down to Jota and get that tray away. Uh, it looks a bit healthy for Duncan, that. <laughs> it's no deep-fried Mars bar. He wouldn't like it. Charles Milazzi, in the meantime, is at the wheel of the LMP2 leading car. Running rather wide there, coming out of the first chicane, but uh, still he's hanging hustling. on to the advantage. Yeah, he is. And he's being hustled by Robert Kubica. Uh, it's the gap is, is two minutes and 19. Mm. If he is there, being given his massage, former resident of Le Mans, and he lived with the Yanis. He's managed by Neil Yanis' father. And uh, if he a former French Formula Renault champion. Yeah. WRT are quietly confident. I mean, it's still six hours and 44 minutes to go. Still plenty of stuff can happen. But WRT knows how to win long races, whether yes. it's in a GT yeah. car or a yeah, prototype. Yeah. You know, there's a huge brains trust in there. There's Vincent Vos, there's Pierre Giudone with a yeah. stellar CV, you've got Thierry Tassin, you've yeah. got Kurt Mollikens. Yeah. You know, it's, a, it's a who's who of Belgian motor yeah. racing now running the team. Yeah, yeah. Vincent has, has, has sort of gathered together all of that, bra all the brains mm. from like Belgium. Yeah, exactly. Anybody that's ever won anything out of Belgian racing, yeah. come and join the yeah. team. Come and join the yeah. team. And, and oh. What's the damage down on the bottom of 23? That's when it was harpooned, I think, last night uh, by, okay. by its, two by going its over other the gravel. Yeah, yeah. Sister, other sister car. car. Yeah. Right, here is the Tom Blomqvist Jota car. Brilliant camera shot, that. Right up close to the car, no debris fence in the way. And the wheels aren't locked up, unlike <laughs> Ferrari. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's how it should be done. Yes, exactly. Tom's showing us how it should be yeah. done. That's Robert Kubica, who's also going well in uh, LMP2. What did we got? 17 former Grand Prix racers in LMP2 alone, which is uh, pretty impressive, isn't it? As far as 708 is concerned, the, the news from Glickenhaus is no dramas, all is good. We would beg to differ, wouldn't we? Yeah, uh, so then you just then put that down to Olivier. Well, yes. Yes. Really, you know, if they're saying that there's nothing wrong with the car, then the only other thing that it could be was the driver. I mean, it, on board, it looked like he was just outfoxed with the position of the GTs he, he, as he came into the Ford chicane. But, but when you looked at the averages, yes, you know, that stint in particular was some three seconds off, and it was just sort of like he needed a kick up the backside, and then all of a sudden he just started going again. But is that because he was being lethargic, for want of a better phrase, or because the team have said, right, we're not going to catch these Toyotas, let's concentrate on the third place battle, but let's get the car home, so let's go to a given pace. You don't yes, have to be going flat it, out. Again, that's, that's very, very possible. So, you know, to give him the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, no, of course, and um, I, don't, I don't want to pile in on Olivier. No, but, sure. But, but um, you did. I, did. I suppose <laughs> I did, actually. That was a bit harsh. Um, very harsh. <laughs> Good job you're not the team manager. <laughs> Get him out! Give him the hook! <laughs> well, can you imagine it in a few years? Team Gavin arrives at Le Mans. Oh, horrendous. <laughs> It'd be no fun at all driving for him, would it? No, after you're in the merch queue. <laughs> Not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no, it could be, joking apart, that the, the team have now said, right, let's run to a pace, let's get the car home, because, all right, we've still got a long way to go, six hours, 40 minutes, but it's important for Glickenhaus to, to, to get the data and to learn from all of yeah, it. Absolutely. No doubt, no doubt. So, yes, it could be that it's an instruction yeah. and they don't want to relay that relay that to us no indeed it's just yeah. you know. so in their world there is no problem of course we're doing what we want yeah. yeah number seven is in so this is the leading car and 64 corvette oh, which is weeks behind now i'm afraid to say tommy milner at the wheel oh, going back into the garage diffuser change clutch change and um, yet more dramas yeah the boys there at corvette on that side of the garage just had such a rough run for the last couple of years really and it's just corvette, nothing eh? nothing was really gone their way and this year they've had uh all numerous incidents and problems and 
and uh, you know I was hoping for those guys that they were really going to be able to turn the corner mm. with their fortune and, and uh, you know get a result here but it's just not run for them at all again so yeah right. it's a tough one there's new boots for seven then Mike Conway brought the car in again there's a lot of brake dust that comes yes. off every time when they Left, they just do left side. So 709 has got a 10 second penalty for the next pit stop for whatever that infringement was. Okay, we'll try and chase that in a second. Um, it looked like they'd only done one side, but. The left side. Yeah. Flicking house stop infringement, get to the bottom of. And uh, number 64 with an oh. alternator issue we're hearing now, Ollie. Yeah, that's from Chuck, Chuck Houghton. Okay, so, so the 709, their penalty for uh, for that last pit stop was basically the mechanics were working on the car while the engine was running. Oh. It's quite hard sometimes because the people that go to the go to the car, but with the noise that's going on yeah. around you, uh, with other cars up and down the pit lane, you don't always know if your car is off or no, not. No, no, you, sure. know, you just start yeah. going straight out there and and start the work that you're planning to do. We talk about the car controller, who is normally the guy that releases it, but is he also in charge, or is there somebody that's in charge of saying to the mechanics, yes, now you can work, or do you have to be self-policing in that respect? I think basically it's like it's a scripted mm. uh, role that you're going to do. As soon as the car stops, you, you're running, but you're with, right. with everything on, the helmets they've got on, and obviously they're all connected up to the radio, you literally won't often be able to hear no, if the sure. car is running, so yeah. you're just going to run out yeah. anyway. So it's as much dependent on the driver killing the engine it is, yeah. immediately as it is on the mechanic. Well, well it's, yes. it's, it's, it's usually there. now, it's a system, so when you've engaged the pit lane speed limit, once the car drops below, say, 10 kilometres an hour, that the, actually, the engine actually turns itself off right. as it's rolling to a stop to make sure that the engine is always off. To so get rid of that, that to get rid of, that, of risk. So you're not yeah. then relying on the driver. Because <laughs> who would? <laughs> yes. <laughs> the, the teams have realised not to rely on the driver. Yeah, you just drive. You don't do clever bits. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Don't switch stuff off no. or turn stuff on. But maybe with the Glickenhaus team, because it's it's still fairly new in development, they haven't got to that stage of refinement in terms of optimising. Was it Richard? It was. Yes. He just forgot. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Well, he's a driver, you see. Yeah. He doesn't do switches. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm being mean to Richard. Yeah, having a right. And Olivier all of the, Yeah, oh. all of these guys. I'm trying to leave the booth now, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's, a, he's a big lad. He can look after himself. <laughs> so. If oh. they start coming down here. Am I getting grumpy? <laughs> Does someone need to sleep? Oh, which means getting. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right, so the two Toyotas on an outlap. We're on lap 265. And uh, it's getting brighter, down. It's going to be a cracking day. I said that from about I don't know, four hours ago, five hours ago. You did, you did. With yes. the, uh, the, the And then the mist coming. came, because, again, you were spot off there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm good at that. <laughs> now, it's a uh, talent. <laughs> indeed. That's the one. 51 Ferrari, uh, GTE Pro leader. Amato Ferrari looks on. The AF of AF Corsa. And uh, Amato Ferrari looking at a gap of over a minute over the Corvette. Former racer himself, a long, long time ago, Marto Ferrari had a few races in the British Touring Car Championship and a Sierra Cosworth. Fascinating fact, 37 of the morning, but uh, now very much the go-to team for Ferraris. Thanks for that. Thanks for that, David. That's great. <laughs> Getting cocky now, isn't he? <laughs> yeah. I think he's, I need to get off. He's starting on you, isn't he? <laughs> it's like literally it's gonna... happened, it's going to at some point. Yeah. yeah. We'll talk about early 90s Formula First in a minute, in embarrassing. Right, so Alessandro <laughs> Pierre Guidi leads the class from Jordan. Race Formula First, Darren. I was about to say, weren't you late 80s Formula First? Oh, that's cutting. <laughs> 1991. Yeah. Thank you very much. He did all right. I mean, he was no Eugene O'Brien, but you know, he did all right. <laughs> 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 to the plot. Um, TF Sport, you're riding on board. Luxembourgish driver Dylan Pereira here, and he's hunting down Nicholas Nielsen. Oh, awesome. But the gap between them is still a minute, but it's coming down a little bit. Yeah, well, it was uh, over a lap, wasn't it, that they were behind, and then the, the 83 car had a, a drive through issue, had a, had a penalty, didn't it? And uh, so they, they had to, to serve that, and so then the TF Sport uh, 33, Aston Martin, has been slowly gaining. Uh, so let's see, let's see if he can uh, catch him. Oh, he's coming in for a pit stop now. 
Yes, indeed he is. So the TF Sport Aston down the pit lane. So again, the gap's going to stretch out again now, isn't it? And where does this put Matteo Cressoni with the Iron Lynx Ferrari? That's third and should be making a little bit of progress back towards. Uh, the fourth car in Pro-Am, Francesco Castellacci for AF Corsa. Fifth is Raffaele Giammaria for Iron Lynx. And then sixth, Matt Campbell, who we've not really spoken much about, but the Australian we know is very, very fast. Another Porsche factory driver, and he's in the Dempsey Proton car pounding along, trying to uh, bring that car back up after earlier delays. So 33 into the pit lane, Dylan Pereira stays behind the wheel. And I wonder if uh, he'll do one more stint here and will they get Ben Keating back in again to get his next... They need to, don't they? Yeah, yeah. his next two stints out the way and then it'll be... Um, I mean, that'll be a two-hour gap for, for Ben. Yeah. Rest, recharge, get back in the car and uh, try and complete that and full six hours that he has to do. And then it'll be um, it Dylan Pereira to then finish it up with, um, with Fraga. Yeah, because ideally you would try and keep your gun driver in for the last stint just in case there was a safety car, yeah, yeah, just in case absolutely. you need a, a, yeah. a, a, the fastest of the, of the trio. He's just stalled just it, leaving, well. leaving the box. That's not good, that's time lost. Gets away now, but it's little things like that that, that soon mount up. It's normally like a stall like that is probably about three mm. to five seconds uh, lost when you uh, when you sort of just get away and then you have to reset everything to, to start the car again and, and uh, that just uh, sees the, the time ticking away at that point. Mattia Cressoni you saw in slow-mo there running third. This is Dylan Pereira in replay because he's just left the pit lane in the uh, turquoise pale blue TF Sport Aston and the class leader Currently 83, Nicholas Nielsen, part of that Spa 24-hour winning combination for Iron Lynx, drafted across to AF Corsa for this event as a Ferrari factory driver and uh, doing a very good job. So as I said a little while ago, AF Corsa leading both of the GT divisions at the moment, both Pro and Am. I saw that experience from doing the British touring car racing in the Cosworth. It's obviously... Uh, you remember it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I remember it. Yes. As a British touring car driver yourself, yeah. of course, yes. <laughs> what year was it? Was it, was oh, it 18? Four, five, so, what, you or him? No, 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 the, 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 the uh, Sierra racing. Uh, 1990. Oh, was it? OK. Right. Yeah, the last days of, of multi-class or then two-class touring cars, I'll get my coat. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone thought, who's this funny bloke from Italy called Ferrari racing a Ford in the British Touring Car Championship? And then years later, AF Corsa becomes this global Ferrari team. And it's him. So the cameramen are hard at work and uh, giving you some great shots. They've been out in all weathers and uh, still delivering fabulous footage around the circuit here in France. Good work, boys. And there's another army of people editing highlights and producing interviews in the uh, pits and paddock as well. Yellow flag at Marshall's post three. So up at the start of the lap through the Dunlop S's, we've had a drama somewhere. Uh, we'll get to that in a second, try and piece together who it is that's gone off the road. Oh, I think this is, is this maybe the car that's had the issue and got going again? Yeah, we've gone green, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. it's gone green yeah. again, and this is the Dempsey, uh, car. Dempsey car, yeah, 86, 88, 88. sorry. Yeah. So that's... Don Bastian, this is the oldest driver uh, in the race at 75. The youngest is Franco Colapinto uh, at 16 years of age, but uh, Don Bastian is the oldest driver on the grid. Comes down now towards Tef Rouge, and it was indeed Don Bastian that had a spin. Yeah, just coming off of uh, the Dunlop chicane. Mm. Was that on his out lap, was that? Um, he just done a lap? No, he just done a lap, haven't right. Who's this look? This is one Pablo Montoya behind this, the wheel of the uh, Dragon Speed car. Yes, it it is. is, yeah, chasing Roberto Gonzalez, now at 38 Jota's helm. So these two are for 16th and 17th overall, 11th and 12th in the class now. Yeah. And of course, that Montoya car had a big impact during the practice sessions, didn't it, earlier yeah, on in the weekend? He had a left front failure, I think, the yeah, upright failed. Right. But they went off yeah, coming out of turn with, one. With Mon Montoya behind the wheel. That's right, that's right. But Montoya back to Le Mans, pressing on, former Grand Prix racer. One of the 17 in LMP2 alone. Whoop, ran the outside of Don Bassett. That was a bit close. That was close. It wasn't going to take much to get a bit of a tag there. No. Francesco Castellacci into the pit lane. Former competitor in British Formula 3. Fuel and tyres, and off he will go. What, their P4, is it? In, uh, yeah, their P4 yeah. In, yeah. In, in AM. 
they're usually they're usually a reliable, fast, solid car, aren't they? They're yes. the jet car. Yeah, Castellacci. GT3 European champion going back a decade. Okay, so, wow. You know, he's in the early days of, of, of that standalone GT3 championship yep. that ran alongside GT1, you know, he was a champion, so he knows what he's doing. Yeah. As he's just swapped out for Fisher Keller. Right. He's uh, Montoya just trying to hunt down the Jota car. Gonzalez. But when you've got quick drivers, well-run cars, and it's the same chassis, you start to appreciate just how hard it is to get that time back because they're so evenly matched, which goes back to the key point in all of this, you cannot afford to lose time. No, no you are really punished for any mistake yeah. Yeah. when it's this competitive and there's so many cars in it that can all win, being run by really good teams. And that's where WRT have really, you know, killed all, the, all of the composite competition so far in, 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 in P2 in, in today's race because they've just they've just executed and not made those mistakes that you know United have or, or Jota have or you know that have taken those those really quality cars out of the race with whether it's a uh, going off on on a wet surface or colliding with another car or just being unlucky you know WRT have just navigated their way through yeah. it and, I'm struggling to find anything I've written down about either car. You know, they've just gone round and round and round. There's and, nothing to say. And actually, that's the thing that you want. Yes. You, you, yes. you really just want to just be under the radar, just quietly getting on with your job, keep executing, just and they're just boring. It, yeah, it is. It relatively, it is. A, Are you talking you about boring? boring? <laughs> yeah. I noticed how he was looking at me yes, exactly. when he said that. <laughs> I was actually talking about, you know, the perfect race would right. be a boring race. Right, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, well recovered. Yeah, 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 well done. Yeah. Yeah. The safety car was on well, stand he stood up. Yeah, yeah, he stood up. I thought, oh, this, this could easily go very wrong for me. <laughs> right, driver change in 51. This is the leading GTE Pro car. Alessandro Pierguidi uh, brought it in. Driver change now. Can't see who's jumped in to take that position. Just waiting now for the fuel to come off. The Lance in the back of the car, car jumping up. Probably only jumps up six, seven inches. Enough room for the guys to get the, the wheels out from underneath the wheel arch. And a quick tire change and away he goes. Last down the pit lane, so this car hanging on to its advantage. And A, of course, we're looking pretty confident about yeah. this. 63 in as well. Now. So that's coming in as the Ferrari goes, so that's why the gap keeps being rather elasticated. Yeah. So briefly it comes down because one stops, then it stretches out as the other one stops. Yeah, and they obviously are completely on the same lap when they do it, so it's not yeah. like it's going to play out towards the end out. of the race. Yeah, and equally, because they're doing that, last pit stop, if things stay as they are, Ferrari stops, gap comes down, then the Corvette comes in, so the Ferrari has got the advantage. Yes. It is, yeah. whichever way you cut it, leading the class. The only way that it may be different is if the last pit stop is less than an hour, mm. uh, and then maybe someone can do a bit more of a short, short fuel Possibly. and uh, just uh, sneak away uh, the final pit stop. Yeah. But, you're right. I mean, at the moment, it definitely looks like um, 51's got the advantage of, of mm. over a minute, mm. which is a, a healthy lead at this point. Yeah, they can do a pit stop and keep the class lead on, on the yeah. current yeah. margin that it is. Uh, number eight, then, back into the race. So Sebastian Buemi staying at the wheel as they're running a little bit wide. Dylan Pereira, as the Alpine is about to get past him. So Negrau, having cleared Olivier Pla, has pulled away, but now comes into the pit lane. So it'll be interesting to see whether he's able to keep the place or falls back. It's going to be close, given the gap that he had. So a minute and 24 seconds was the last pit stop for the Alpine, and it's a minute and 26 ahead. It's going to be tight, this, isn't it? Very tight. I mean, uh, the, the Glickenhaus and the Alpine have been swapping positions pretty much every time there's been a pit stop. Um, it all really depends on, on how this stint has gone for Olivier uh, in the 708, um, and if he's had a, a, a stint where he's had, actually got a higher average uh, in the lap times because uh. the, the last full 13 lap stint wasn't particularly fast. So uh, hopefully uh, I'm just having a little look and it, it is quicker. Uh, Olivier didn't take any tires on that last stop, uh, but the actual averages of, of this run with the last five laps is around the 34, which was uh, two seconds quicker than the, okay. the averages for his last stint. So uh, 
this may have given him the uh, the upper hand at this point after the pit stop. Now they're not going to do a driver change, and if they don't put tyres on, it's going to be a quicker stop anyway, which will help preserve that gap over the Glickenhaus. So yes. he should be on here, Andre Negrau, to hang on to the play. So he was new into the car, so they did the fuel and the tyres and the driver change last time around. So this now should keep the car in third, and that will be significant because normally it only gets third on a pit stop from the Glickenhaus. But here, if it can keep third, that genuinely puts it ahead. Yes, yeah. Let's see, down the pit lane, and the Glickenhaus has not yet broken the beam, so the Grau's pit stop and the there. The is just coming into right. the Ford chicane now. OK, so that was a minute and 17, and the gap was a minute and 26, so he's kept the place and yeah. built on it. Yeah. It's still going to be fairly close, isn't it, when the, uh, by the time he gets his uh, tyres up to the temperature, I'm guessing at this point he must be coming through the uh, towards Tet Rouge as the Glickenhaus is going into the, Ford, uh, into the Dunlop chicane. That's right, but also not only does the Glickenhaus have to catch the Alpine, but it's also got to clear some of the traffic. So you can see back markers are up the road as well. But Sebastian Buemi and Andre Negrau both leaving the pits on that lap. And there you can see what the uh, tyres have been like for the two cars. So Alpine third, Glickenhaus fourth, and then fifth and sixth, the WRT car, Charles Malaisi and Robert Kubisa. There. The Brains Trust at Glickenhaus with all of those laptops to study all of that data. And this then the car that is now down to fourth in the hypercar category. I do like this shot coming into it the first shot. Great shot, isn't it? Yeah. I always feel though when we come to this shot, it's going to be showing someone locking up. So it's nice, nice that it wasn't the case for the Glickenhaus on that occasion. No, that's the good news. 709, Louise Beckett tells us he's getting ready for a pit stop. So that's Richard Westbrook's car, which is down in seventh place. And hopefully they uh, a couple of laps down on the sister car. Hopefully the engine gets turned off this time. Yeah, yes indeed. In time. There's still that little bit of trim flapping towards the rear of the 708 Dickenhouse House under the A Clark at the wheel of the car. Patrick Pile for EDEC, 12th overall has just done the car's best lap of the race. So Patrick Pile, who you still associate more as a GT star than a prototype star, but proving he can deliver and making amends for two offs on that first racing lap yesterday afternoon in the wet. For the car or for Patrick? Was he? He was, was he, the title driver. He was, was, he he was off, yeah. Right. And he got caught up at the first chicane and then he ran off again later in the lap. And also, Combe Ledegar, who's just taken over 51, has done the car's absolute best in the first sector. So if it wasn't looking strong enough already, Combe Ledegar has just been released and is on the money straight away. They're not letting off at this stage, are they? There's, no. sti there's still the risk, isn't there, from 63, um, with maybe a safety car falling in the wrong direction and... Uh, that gap that they've got, that over a minute they have at the moment, could easily disappear. Mm. Tom Christensen, nine times a winner, comes to have a look at the event and uh, doing a tour of the garages. Great ambassador for the event. And uh, Tom Christensen sitting, uh, watching the action all through the weekend. 38 just run over a bit of debris there. Yeah. Hopefully that's not going to cause an issue for them as they go around the remaining part of the lap. So the last laps from the Toyotas around the 3.30 mark, the fastest lap set by Brendan Hartley at 3.27, so they've slackened off the pace markedly now, and understandably because they built the gap to five laps over the third-place car. When was that 27 done? When was the 3.27 done? Was that uh, lap 60, so you're going back to yesterday evening. Right. It, it had dried and it was getting cooler, and Brendan Hartley was relatively fresh into the car. You still think, uh, you know, this time of day, 9.30, the ambient temperature hasn't, hasn't really shot up too much so far. You still think the track would be in a, a good position for some fast lap times. Mm. Uh, and like Pile, obviously, has just banged in the fastest one for, for car 48. Um, so there is, some, uh, there is some speed out there. And uh, how many cars are now out? 11, 11 cars are out? 12, maybe? 12-ish, 12 yeah, yes. So again, yeah. as, as I said uh, earlier, you know, Less cars, less traffic, just makes it a bit easier to put, put laps together. And of course, the cars in LMP2, you could argue, are doing these quick laps because they've got to, because they're fighting. Yeah. Whereas in the hypercar class, without trying to downplay this, they're getting to the end. They don't have to be fighting, they don't have to be pushing, they have to get to the end and have a, a safe run to the end of the race. But from the Toyota's point of view, that they've got to have a, an agreement of that um, at this point, because otherwise they would just push on. Yeah. Uh, and keep pushing each other um, and pushing the lap time. So there must be something within the team that they've said, like, you know, go to us, uh, this. We don't want you going faster than 
a 3.30 yeah. or something yeah. like that. And then if that's agreed between both cars, then yeah. then that's fine. Yeah. But Because Toyota is here to win the race. Yes. It is not here for one given driver or one given combination of drivers. It's Toyota to win. That's yeah. the reason of the investment. Always the case with any any team, sure. any yeah. Uh, yeah. works entry. It's, uh, it's about the, the manufacture. Oh. Yes, I seem to recall when Fernando Alonso was here, there was some um, uh, effort made to make sure that the investment was returned. Shall I yes. phrase it like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's quite a nice way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> or the right way of putting it. Well, indeed. So <laughs> six hours, 20 minutes of the race remain. And uh, we've still got Toyota 1-2. We've enjoyed a great fight this morning within the LMP2 category. Uh, GT is going the way of AF Corsa, whichever way you look at it, really, because AF Corsa leading in both Pro and in AM. Uh, but uh, we never know what's around the corner, and we've had some really good battles this morning. We've actually had relatively few incidents since about 4 o'clock, but even so, we've had some very, very good battles out on track. Good morning, Graham Goodwin. Good morning. I feel that Le Mans morning feeling, which is looking like I'm enjoying life, but slowly dying inside. <laughs> <laughs> um, you yeah. sound like the surviving cars as yeah, well. It, yes. it sort of feels like the excitement is is what might be still to come. There's something yes, looming at Toyota without a shadow of a doubt. Yeah, there's eight with its vibration that, that yep. they're not being terribly um, they're not good open vibrations. about. No. They're not. No, we're not getting good vibrations about it, and they are not being loquacious in their in their. Um, Storytelling, let's yeah, put it that the, way. I think the latest uh, line out of Tota is uh, we're trying to work our way around the problem, which sounds very convincing and looks like a pie to anything else in humanity. Mm. Global catastrophe uh, uh, on a climate basis, we're trying to work our way around the problem, it sounds that, a little less convincing. They didn't say problem, did they? Teams say issues these Issu days. Issue is a good issue, word. That ghastly word. Issue is a good word. Issue yes. should be banned. The, and, and, so should going forward... You've been watching the news over lockdown, oh, haven't you, David? <laughs> issue going forward and loved ones. <laughs> loved ones is a phrase that ought to be given a 12 ball. Well, I think we can all phrase. agree yes, that if, sorry. If, if Alistair Moffat at uh, Toyota Kazoo Racing does use the phrase thought, uh, thoughts and prayers, we yes. know they're in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, if, yes, anything comes with the loved ones, it's going straight in the bin. But uh, the uh, team is pretty tight-lipped about it. But yeah. the car is still doing good lap times. I mean, its last yeah, lap was a 3.32. A lot of teams will be delighted with the 3.32 <laughs> lap, wouldn't they? They would indeed. But uh, 72 car, I believe, out of the race. And that, uh, I'm told, is Gearbox Electronics. Oh, OK. Done. So that, if you didn't see it, Graham, was, was Dries Van Thor at the wheel. It was up at the Dunlop S's. It went straight on yeah. through the gravel. And instant thought was, he's missed his braking point. He'll just carry on. Right. And he didn't. It came to a halt. There you go. That was okay. that. So the marker of doom, if it hasn't been employed, can now be employed on oh. that car. I will have a go. And it was, sorry. 72. No, 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 the problem was... It was Gearbox Electronics. Right. Uh, on that one. The electronics break in the gearbox. That sort of combination. Uh, I think possibly something broken off, smashed the gearbox to pick. No, you know the usual thing, Darren. You've used these excuses before. You and I have talked <laughs> a familiar race. About how Darren's co-drivers broke the car. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I, all the Gavin at Cota, that happened. <laughs> <laughs> now LMP2 did. <laughs> is, is looking very, very good at the moment for WRT. Fine wood to touch in all of this, but you've got Charles Melesi ahead of uh, former resident of Le Mans, Yiffy Yi, as the top two. There's the best part of a lap between them, I'll grant you. Uh, Yiffy Yi has just taken over number 41, in fact, but WRT has kept out of trouble. We were just saying a few minutes Absolutely. ago that of all the cars, there's something about everybody, but there's nothing written about 31 nor 41 because they've done exactly the right thing. Other than the fact that since I uh, left for the fabulous internals of an empty caravan, um, Yife Ye was leading that, that oh. pair. Oh, oh slow Toyota, Toyota slow Toyota. Toyota. Trouble, and it's for number eight. Number eight Toyota has slowed right down, so Sebastian Buemi brings out the white flag, the slow-moving vehicle flag. Number eight Toyota slowly makes its way towards the end of a lap. It's going at a half decent pace, but it's a slow pace nonetheless. It's passed by the number seven car um, on the road, so white flag's being shown to protect the number eight, it makes its way back towards the pit lane, David. Yeah, this was the one we were saying a minute ago was uh, Absolutely. having the vibration problem, but it's not even going to get it's to the pit stop. lane unless he can stop it and do a reset. But this is looking more engine-related, isn't it? Oh, it's not, it does not go... Is he back? This is, this is the replay. replay. So he comes out of Mulsanne... And dies. Blah. So that is an issue. Uh, they're not going to be... Well, they could that's a, that's a problem. That one. Not just an issue, that's a problem. Yep. And there's not much going forward at the moment. 
engine was a drive, isn't it? Yeah. And the drive just ebbed away. So the car, we're being told, is slow on track. Now, is that it that's got going again? That looks like it is car eight running again. It has got going again, yeah. so they have been able to do a reset. At speed, so... Yeah. Now, that is the second time we've had, effectively, a Control-Alt-Delete for that car. One came soon after the major impact That's on right. that one. Yes. But you look at this and you think, well, there's nothing wrong with that car. Right. You know, I must have dreamt it. There's seven just going through for chicane. Right. Um, well, eight is back to a proper pace, isn't it? Yeah. It is. But it's a lap down now, isn't it? Is that yeah. the first time it's gone uh, a full lap down? Well, it'll, it'll, when it crosses the beam, it will get itself back on the, on the lead lap. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's yeah. only shown as a lap down because it has yet to complete this lap. It's not been overtaken by seven. But I think we can all agree that this issue is not a good issue. I think you're right. So over the beam now will go Buemi. No. He's a full lap down. He's a full lap down. He's a full lap down. Because he was already, seven was already in the lead, and then seven must have passed him when he was well, going. As, as he stopped, slow. you saw the seven come by. So yeah. Sorry, so he's out of out of Yeah. yeah. So. What we're hearing about number eight is that they can't use the fuel properly, so they've uh, had pit stops because of a, a, a fuel-related problem. Uh, Louise doing her best to translate this from, from what the team are telling her and then relay it to us. But, uh, yes, you're quite right, Darren. They have now gone a lap down because of having to stop trackside. Forgive me. I wonder if the, the fuel issue is fuel pumps and the different collectors that will be in the Possibly, bottom yeah. of the yep. fuel tank and maybe... Uh, they're running only on one of, of potentially they have two in there, so this could be one of the issues. It's not getting all of the fuel into the collector. Well, um, he'd been out just for three laps on that stint before grinding to a halt briefly. So if that is a fuel collection issue, uh, they're doing it three laps. They're in serious trouble. It's going to be a lot of pit stops to the end of the race, yeah. now, isn't it? But it's been cured by not a pit stop, just by stopping and Indeed. resetting something. That looks so, very different. That looked yeah. like an electronics problem. So maybe there's more things lurking in the system there. I mean, there could be an automated system that is going between the two pumps. So mm. I'm, I'm sort of guessing there could be two pumps in there. But uh, And then now he's having to do something more manual. Yep. You know, maybe there's a manual control that engages fuel pumps at all times. So uh, um, sometimes there's, there's things in the car that you can do that is you're taking control of it once the engineer's... Uh, let you know that information. Uh, that cost the car, by the way, uh, over a minute. Uh, four minutes 53 was the last lap time through. That's about a minute and 20 seconds over what we'd be expecting from a lap time for the car at the moment at full speed. Yeah, because there was the limping bit and then the stop, wasn't there? Yeah. So, yeah, all combined against it. Good little battle going on here, look. 21, uh, Juan Pablo Montoya has caught up to Roberto Gonzalez as we get some super slow-mos and more gravel being thrown onto the circuit. It's the 44 car. <laughs> Rally cross comes to Le Mans. Slovakia. Yeah. Look at that. See the mirror, the right mirror really bouncing around as the car lands again after yeah. the ground. Oh, trouble for the Ferrari. Now, which one is that? Is that 51 or 52? That's 52, isn't it? So that's not the class leading car if it's 52, but it is 52. You're quite right. Sam Bird at the wheel and the bodywork ripped apart, the tar flailing, doing more and more damage. Sam limping back, but that's let go spectacularly. It's sparking from the bottom of that wheel as well. Let's see how it happened. Comes out of the bullseye corner. Looked like he'd been off there. Looked like he'd been wide. And then as he accelerates away, all Bang. of a sudden it lets go. But he, he'd been off the road, hadn't he, coming yeah. out of Mulzan anyway? But maybe there's a huge um, like lock-up on the way into Mulsanne. Mm. There's even, oh, look, there's he's even wiped off the his, mirror as well. He's run over wow. his own mirror. <laughs> that, that takes some doing. Yeah. Oh, you said yesterday we don't use them anyway anymore, so that's fine, <laughs> isn't it? So there's debris on track, there's a slow car on track. The teams now get ready for pit stops. The leader, leader is in the pits, Kamui Kobayashi for yeah. what will be the 23rd time. And, of course, Corvette thinks, oh, why couldn't it have been the other Ferrari? Give us a chance. But uh, there's a lot of debris. So yeah. this zone now, OK, yeah, just literally, as I said, it, the zone's uh, going to appear, zone six, just for the marshals to be able to have half a chance to, to uh, recover some of that debris. Well, it's going to be a very, very slow inlap now for Sam Bird. I mean, he's only got half of it to do, but even so, with the amount of damage, that's going to be a long, long, slow return to the pit lane. 
Number seven has served its stop, so back into the race goes the leading car with this comfortable advantage. Briefly, eight is back on the lead lap, but of course will drop off it again when it makes its next pit stop. Indeed, and uh, Sebastian Boemi back up to full speed, 3.31.8 last time around. So, was that just a simple electronic reset? Or is there more? There's certainly looming probably, issues. I think it probably was, but that's in addition to oh, what we've been hearing right. about the vibration of that car. And and is, is it, is it cause or effect, that vibration? That's the, yeah. that's the issue. Sam Bird has got a long way to come back with a wounded Ferrari. And at a high-speed section like this, Darren, you would not want to be Sam Bird. No, it's horrendous trying to bring a car back along, along that stretch of road from uh, Molsan down to Indianapolis. Uh, the car speed of everyone coming mm. past you is really high, but the nice thing is it's, you've got the, the racing track, but you've also got that extra bit of verge on the, on the left and right-hand side of the track where you can um, try and get across and, and stay out of the way. But if you've got um, like a, a gaggle of cars coming behind you um, and you're unsighted, you're suddenly in the, in the danger zone at that point. At least it's not the driven wheel. Mm. Yeah, that, I'm, I'm sure that must be far trickier. I think with that... That's not that, great. No, with a tyre in that condition, trying to get back with that on the rear would yep. be really, really difficult. Yep. And so, at the moment, he's, he's coming through the, the right of Indianapolis, which means the steering will be working reasonably well. But when he tries to turn to the left for the second part of Indianapolis... That can be tricky. It, it does become a little bit more awkward trying to get the car around and um, keeping it out of the gravel there. Carl's, the being, Carl's being told to bear left at slow zone six to avoid the debris. And the marshals with the flags, both yellow and white, the white flag saying there's a slow moving car on the road, dodging past him. He's done a great job there. He has. But as if life wasn't tough enough being so many laps down because they had a, a rear suspension failure during the night. Now the car losing yet more time. And there is the sister car about to breeze past. It's just in the slow zone, isn't he? So there goes 51 and uh, 52, having had that puncture in the practice sessions and bodywork repairs and suspension failure in the race, back in the wars, whereas 51 has the charm of life and carries on in the lead. I'm trying to remember the incident that car had where they had to replace all the front bodywork as well, because that car certainly came back pretty badly wounded at some point this week. Whether or not that is the same incident that uh, was the rear puncture. That car came back in some disarray. I wonder if we'll get a replay of of how that happened uh, for Sam into Molsan from a different camera angle. The team here getting all the spare parts ready, so it's going to take the car a long time to come in, but when it does get there, they'll be ready. They'll have the replacement bodywork, the replacement parts, obviously the replacement uh, tires, well, so they can go to work. Good news is uh, that's a bit that was completely floating about has detached. And... He's also one up on Ben Barnico, because at least he's got a wheel. Ah, Ben had three when oh, he got back, didn't he? I missed that. Yeah. Uh, the wheel, he left the pits without the front left being properly attached, and the wheel parted company at the first chicane, and it was a 16-minute in-lap for Ben Barnicote for the inception car last night. I should say that's a less than optimum solution. It was slow, that's what it was, yes. It was a, it was the, a pain in the whatnot. The repair for inception was a lot easier than this repair will be. Uh, I think yeah. they just had to do the, the front splitter and, mm. and the wheel, and away they went right. again. Yeah. Well, so yeah. it wasn't too long before they were back out on track, but... Uh, I, of course, have got some work ahead of them to, to repair that car with that much damage to the bodywork. Sure. Meantime, uh, the only factory team with two bullets left in the gun is Porsche. And uh, that's a driver change yeah, uh, for Richard, uh, Richard Leeds. Fred Macko. Fred Macko, yeah. Yeah, that Porsche battle has been an interesting one, but they've never really got back onto terms with the Ferrari or the Corvette ahead. No, um, you know, the Ferrari and the Corvette both dealt uh, one midweek, one late week, balance of performance mm. change. Uh, Porsche were left alone, and Porsche have been pretty dominant. Did not look, not just not look part of this race. It's as simple as that. They've, they seem to have been chasing it from the off. Yeah, I mean, they were. So I was going to say, weren't they a little bit unlucky early in the race with, with where the safety car came out? They had a bit of that. The 92 um, had a problem as well. Of course, the 92 is effectively a brand new car. Yeah, but but the reason that they lost out on those safety cars were because they were behind anyway. Yes, you know? yeah. So that but you'd only have to be maybe 10 seconds behind and suddenly True, true, get, true. You know. but they, they, they'd started to lose, let's put it yeah. that way. Yeah. yeah. Right, Sam Bird limps on. You see, he's certainly picked up speed. Not that he's going to continue like this, of course, but uh, he's getting back in... Yeah. 
quicker order than we otherwise would have expected. Most people pouring into the pit lane because they are expecting this to be a long slow zone, I anticipate. So pit stops being cycled through. Olivier Pla comes back in. On the Glickenhaus 708. Which, Graham, you missed it, but its last stint, not the one it's just finished, the one before that, was really best described as lethargic. The oh, car really? never really seemed to have proper pace, but we were then starting to debate whether that was because they'd decided to give Olivier Plara Delta pace to run at, just to make sure the car kept out of trouble. But it, it came out of the pits and couldn't clear away from LMP2 cars that were instantly behind it, and it then looked lethargic. It wasn't in a limp homo, but it didn't seem to be as quick as it had. Anyway, it's still going, and the team have said no problem, which makes one think... Do you think they're working around an issue? <laughs> well, they're certainly working to what they want to do, their pace, and, and in that respect, there's no problem or issue. Two United Autosports cars, or the two remaining United Autosports cars, back into the fray. Uh, why did 23 lose time yesterday evening, apart from the incident up at the Dunlop Curves? Uh, why did 23 lose time? That's a lot of Sam's coming past the, our windows now, but that's a lot of damage to the to the 52. It is to come in. You're right. I will I will re request uh, information, please, because that that just you know we all woke up this morning to discover it had just fallen away with with no obvious answer. Um, it might just purely be a legacy of the incident yesterday evening. Right, Sam Bird brings what's left of the Ferrari to the pit lane. Getting a driver change at, uh, at 28. So, number 28 from Jota into the pit lane. Tom Blomquist has brought it in. He replaced Sean Galile, so it should be Stoffel van Dorn to take over, but Sean Galile's going to get back in, in fact, so they're going to keep Stoffel for the end of the race, potentially, where you need your gun for high. Absolutely. Your absolute star driver to, uh, to do the work. Remember, if you're watching for the first time, the rules are something dramatic always happens in the last 25 minutes. Always. Yes, yes. it's the law. Right, um, damage assessment, please. A lot. Thanks. That's, a, that's yep. a big insurance claim, isn't it? It is, isn't it? Always do the fuel first, get that done before getting the car up in the air on the chickens. Chickens? I'm sure, I'm sure Ferrari don't call them chickens, but... Um, oh, oh, and then oh. get the car wheeled into the garage and uh, all hands on deck at that point there. Sam being overtaken the pit in, right, so the team can now run round and uh, get the car into the garage. And struggling to get the back of the car, look, you can see the car's not gone mm. completely up on the back, not enough air in it, so they can't even get there, the, yeah. the wheels underneath. So AF Corsa... I think half of Italy works for AF Corsa, Graham, doesn't it? It's got so many cars and so many championships, so many mechanics needed. Well, I can recall uh, not that long ago they, they were doing an awful lot more single make racing than, than now, running uh, huge numbers for each other. Someone did mention to me that the number of cars, including cars that are tended by AF Corsa, that are not competition... cars well into three figures with the two at the beginning terrifying isn't it but they managed to do it properly you know they, they don't they spread do themselves too thinly and make a bad job they do and uh, that's why it stopped uh, <laughs> flacking round the, the, the wheel was completely locked up at yeah, that point. I do rec do recall uh, oh, many moons ago a requesting of Matt Griffin whether or not there might be a possibility of speaking to Amato Ferrari and Matt told me in the accent that I, I'm not going to attempt to repeat <coughs> that was somewhat like trying to get an audience with the Pope yes. but actually that's an audience not with true. the Pope is easier isn't it? No, I mean yeah, Amato big lock up there for the 26 car I mean, that's a bit undercooked, isn't yeah. it, coming into the pit lane like that. Youngest man in the race, Franco Colapinto, who blotted his copybook a bit last night. Yes, yeah. that's, that's it's not good. That's a little bit too hot, yeah. isn't it? But, uh, no, Amato, very approachable, will answer a straight question. Doesn't do interviews. Is he not? No. And I suspect the fact, the fact that the team will be running the Ferrari hypercars in 2023 will only mean that's more certain. Uh, Darren has a fascinating fact about Amato Ferrari, don't you? I do, yeah. He did uh, British touring cars in the uh, in 1990 in a Sierra Cosworth. Did he? Yes. That is fascinating. And it's amazing what you can learn in a commentary booth. Fantastic. There you go, you see. Educational. I found this whole... I've got a great fact as well about the British touring car championship. Darren Turner was... I mean, nobody <laughs> noticed, but... <laughs> I snuck in and I snuck out. <laughs> <laughs> No-one knows. <laughs> we remember Darren. They were the glory days. They were the diesel days. That's right. Yes. Wow. 
Other touring car championships are available <laughs> just for the purposes of balance. <laughs> right, number seven then, Kamui Kobayashi, well clear in the race lead. And Shah Malaysia has just made a pit stop from LMP2. Yep, uh, Frank Mayer is uh, out in the 708. To, much to my regret, nowhere on track uh, close to the number 29 car. So yet again, I'm not able to use my line about Fritz and Mayo. That's not going to happen. Well, that's something to be grateful for, at least. <laughs> <laughs> now, right now, the battle in LMP2 is really on for the lead between WRT, but for third, it's been uh, between number 28, Jota, and 65, the Panis racing car. Sean Galal now takes on James Allen in that battle. Galal on an outlap. So at the end of the next one, we'll see what the margin is between those two. This is number seven Toyota, which had its dramas early on with those two punctures. But right now, the question mark is more over number eight. Four minutes and seven seconds, or four minutes and eight seconds, is the real world gap on the road as we approach very rapidly the That's three good. quarters of this race mark. Six hours to go. That's going to change once the uh, the slow zone is now gone. Yeah. Because um, all the lap times were yep. considerably slow, weren't they? So it still should be a full lap advantage to car seven. I, I believe that's correct. Yeah, once it all shakes yep. out with the, yeah. the slow zone going. But uh, as we said, Sir Boemi is back up to more or less full racing speed. 10 o'clock in the morning here. And bright and sunny, some high cloud, but uh, nothing remotely like the kind of weather conditions we had in the earlier part of this race. That's what we need now. <laughs> Get <laughs> <a> rain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get everybody on the toes again. I'd imagine there's only a few people that really want that to happen. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all in here. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Everyone in the pit lane is probably not on that same page as you are for that <laughs> to happen. No, I, would, uh, <laughs> I would concur with that. So Kamui Kobayashi at the helm of number seven. He's doing a great job as ever. And is this the year, Graham, that number seven finally gets the rub of the green? I, 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 I genuinely don't even want to say it because okay. it's, what is it, three? Is it three consecutive years? Like no, that. it can't be three consecutive years because it didn't finish second last year. Uh, but I think Mike has been second three times. Almost as many times as Toyota. Hold that thought. Yeah. So three minutes, it is. Three minutes and five seconds. So it's just under a lap, basically, in this stage, isn't it? But uh, battles will still be there. We need, to be, we need to dig a little deeper to find them. But, uh, Antonio Felix de Costa is now that will take up the chase of Dragon Speed Car. Real Team Racing, they've been at the top of the Pro-Am standings in LMP2 for quite some time. And we know that uh, Esteban Garcia was burning that drive time, a lot of it. Uh, so overnight. Did we miss the, the move from Montoya then on Gonzalez because of they've both gone out of the pits to Costa's uh, the pit the actual pit stop was a bit yeah, slower, 13 slower, seconds so difference. It, it didn't swap on track, it was all no, in the in the pit indeed. Lane, so, yeah. so now to Costa it'll real be that will take up that the uh, the baton and uh, the, the answer, David? Three seconds and a third. And the first time Mike Conway came here back in twenty thirteen, he was excluded. G drive entry with John Martin and Roman uh, Fuel tank. That's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah a replacement race. fuel cell in, and the fuel cell expanded in the chassis. Mm. So uh, he's had four podiums Officer. and one fastest lap, <laughs> if you want the other stats. Looking at the overall classification as it scrolls through, pick out the AF Corsa domination of GT again, leading in Pro and Am. The Pro car is 22nd, and the Am car is 26th. Nicholas Nielsen, who is the Pro in the Pro Am lineup, Absolutely. doing a very, very good job. So, AF got Com Ledegar with a uh, 72nd lead over Jordan Taylor in the 63 Corvette. Uh, Nicholas Nielsen, what is that, 43 seconds over Dylan Pereira. Mm. And the TF Sport car. And that gap's pretty much stayed the same for yep. hour, hour upon hour uh, as they've gone through the night. The car that has made the most progress, by the way, up the order since um, I went off and uh, closed my eyes for an hour or two is one that I don't think we mentioned much, certainly in, uh, in the overnight, the 84 car, uh, the innovative car, now with Mathieu Lehay, the fully able-bodied driver of the three in the SRT41 car. That car was 
significantly further down the order than the 35th. And it also had an off this morning. Oh, did it? When um, Aoki, I think it was, okay. went off at Arnage. It was, it was still in the darkness. It was about five o'clock-ish. Um, and despite Darren's efforts to tell us it was getting brighter, it wasn't getting bright <laughs> quickly enough. So uh, in the darkness, Aoki had an off. So uh, that car is now, what, two minutes behind the D station racing. Just popped in its fastest lap of the race as well. Absolutely, it did. 3.37 for that car. D station racing, by the way, now with Tomonobu Fuji at the wheel. I don't know if you have much to do with Fuji-san, but I think he's been hugely impressive since we got him into the WEC as a silver driver. Yeah, yeah, uh, Fuji-san's been great. I mean, I, I went out and... Uh, did the Super GT race with them a couple of years ago she did. Uh, at Fuji, uh, with Fuji. Um, yeah, it was a great experience. And the, and the D Station team is, is just growing with confidence. Obviously here they're partnered with TF, um, but their, their program, they've got quite an intense program around the world. Uh, let's, if we can, catch up on tyre dramas. Sam Bird, after bringing the punctured Ferrari to the pits, is with Louise. Sam Bird is watching on as I'd say 12 mechanics are working on the 52A, of course. Uh, we, oh, that was a painful limp home, wasn't it? Yeah, very painful. We had a very similar issue in free practice uh, with Daniel. So it's a bit strange um, what happened. Everything was fine and then the wheel just looks solid going into the hairpin, so... Yeah, when it's not your day here, it's not your day. We've had another very difficult Le Mans on our side of the garage. Um, it goes that way sometimes, just need to pick yourself up and hopefully try again next year. As you say, you've had this before, so how quickly do you think these guys can work? I mean, they're all on it. I mean, when we had it in free practice, you've got more downtime, so less of an issue. This one seems to rip the car apart a little bit more, so... This is not going to be a quick fix. All right, thank you. So big frustration for Sam Bird. 92 there, blast out of the pit lane. Neil Yarni staying at the wheel of the Porsche. And also at the pit lane, uh, much to the delight of the just arrived Oliver Gaff in the 64 car that I think has been in the garage for quite some time. Uh, that car shown as 48 minutes uh, in the pits uh, rejoins and um, alternator issues, Ollie's telling me. On 64. On the 64. Right. To go with a clutch and rear diffuser and everything else. So it's had a, a torrid time, hasn't it? it? It didn't happen in my day. It wasn't my fault, are the other things that Ollie's going to tell us. And uh, clearly that team were unable to work around that issue. In the GT classes, are, are we thinking that everyone's done their brake changes if they were going to do a brake change? Is there anything coming? Uh, for 51, 63 that will change their position around just because they're going to have to have a longer stop. I'm, I'm guessing they've all done them at some the stage during the I night. They will have done them, yeah. yeah. I think they're good to run to the end now. Uh, and again in the AM, if there's anything that could, could shake out because they've got to schedule in that brake change. Mm. But with less than six, you, you presume they've all done they've that. Done it, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, Com Ledegar now at the wheel of the leading GTE Pro car. A, a, a thought about Com Ledegar, Graham, because he's one of those drivers that hasn't become pigeonholed with one no. manufacturer. There are some that are picked up by a brand and stay there. You know, you associate <laughs> driver X with Audi or driver Y with Porsche. But Ledegar came out of one mate Porsche racing with great success, went to drive for McLaren. Yep. Now he's finding himself at Ferrari and, and delivers no matter what you put him in. And I think I've seen him driving in Asian Le Mans series in a P2 car as well uh, a couple of three years ago with Alexander West, as I recall. Very probably, but, yes. Um, yes, and he's very quick and has been represented here not uh, only in person in this team, but also in the single make Porsche race with, was it four cars in that race, David? Something like that, yes, through his team, yeah. So... But yeah, Ferrari, busy, busy. Ferrari's in Asian Le Mans, he's driven Aston Martins, he's driven Porsches, he's driven Ligiers in, yeah. in, in prototypes. Um, he's raced Porsches in the 12 hours of Dubai. He was block pan endurance champion, wasn't he, for McLaren in the Von Ryan yeah. days with Rob Bell and Shane Van Gisbergen. I don't know about you, Darren, I think that's just greedy. <laughs> <laughs> it also shows that he's very adaptable, isn't it? You know, to be able to jump from uh, class to class and manufacturer to manufacturer and still be, you know, to be in, actually, to be in this car 51, uh, it shows that, of course, I've got a, a lot of faith in his ability. You know, it's it's yeah. not a seat that people get easily, so uh, Com is uh, well, well deserving to be in that seat and, and doing a great job out on the track. Well, it's somewhat um, deja vu moment for myself. When I left for the, the evening, 
um, at 4.30 this morning. Uh, Philippe Nazet was putting in fantastic uh, laps in the Vizzi Competizione car. He, that car's clearly fallen down the order since then. It's in 21st position and 16th in LMP2, but he's just uh, done the fastest lap of that car's race again. A 3.32. 0.120, which I strongly suspect is the fastest P2 lap of the race so far. I think Costa's check back in a moment, but yes, I think you're right. De Costa's on a charge on his new rubber. Uh, Montoya's got a stint, stint old set of tyres underneath him at this stage, so he's going to be on the defensive, not yeah. in uh, not too far a distance down the track. Jason doesn't need to be told this again, but it is such a frustration that Davidson had that car on the gravel because there's been nothing else wrong. The pace has been fantastic. They just can't make up the lost time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's one of those one of those uh, events that's going to haunt them, I'm sure, because uh, they were up for a good result. But you know, there's plenty of cars up and down the grid that have had the opportunity. They would have been in in sort of a, a podium position and then had some sort of uh, issue or problem. Going forward, going yes. forward, uh, <laughs> that, that uh, has cost them that opportunity. It's been a bit like that all season in the FIWC. Uh, Joe to Sports with one crushing uh, victory, and that, by the way, after the two cars came together uh, in the first turn at Portimao. Other than that, it's been uh, to this point all about United Auto Sports with WRT not really featuring. And it's all turned around here. And, uh, and what a performance by WRT. Amazing. Right, yeah. like from team, drivers, everything, strategy. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, very much by the book, isn't it? The other part of the uh, Deja Vu, by the way, delivered immediately by Yifeye with the fastest lap of that car's race. And that was what the, the, uh, the rhythm was in the early hours this morning. It was Felipe Naza the quickest, it was Yiffy 8 the next quickest and just tenths behind that pace as he chased down Jean Malaisi and that's exactly what's happening again. It's two minutes and five seconds is the gap between the two WRT cars. That lap time by uh, NASA at uh, 32.1, it's impressive, isn't it? When you're, looking at, when you're looking at the rest of the field, um, other than uh, Yiffy, who's also in the 32s. Everyone else is around the, the 34s, 35s, 36s. So uh, a stonking lap there. Well, if, you know, if, you're, if this is the one race you watch a year, uh, sports car racing, one, you're wrong. Uh, <laughs> but two, the thing to point out here is these cars have been slowed down since last year. They're heavier. They have less power to play with, something like 66 brake horsepower less than the 2020 race. And uh, those lap times, in those circumstances, are highly impressive. It's another 3.32 this time around from Nasna. And uh, Yifa Ye is in the midst of another quick lap too. So they're both on the chase. I think you're right about saying that Nasna has done the fastest LMP2 lap, because although I can't instantly find a scroll of the best in the class, I think the next best, a couple of hundred slower, was by Nick de Vries. Yep. So it's close, but I think he has now just edged that. And he's just gone quicker again in the first sector, so we're really on a charge at this point. Mm. I like saying with Alan earlier, if, if you've got no chance of a, a result and you are literally going to the flag, then you might as well enjoy pushing to the absolute limit. I know the guys at the front of the field are doing the same, but they've got a, a, one part of their mind is on about keeping the car on the island and making sure there's no mistakes where when you're uh, 16th in class, then you've got no real weight on your shoulders. You can just drive with that sort of freedom uh, to push to the limit. Just six drivers in LMP2 have had a lap in the 332s. Felipe Albuquerque, Tom Blomquist, Franco Colapinto, Nick De Vries, Felipe Nazra, and right now, one in the 331s because the FAA has responded. And I think he's sending a calling card. It's 331.957. And this is the move back uh, yeah. for position. So that's the Costa getting back ahead of Montoya. And that's for 16th overall, and it's for 11th in class. And he's gone through, and it's a very happy Antonio Felix da Costa who makes that move. Now, can he get away? On pure pace, you'd say yes. But first of all, he's got to try and break the toe there. Great stuff from Antonio Felix da Costa. And in LMP2, he's impressed as much as he has in just about everything else he's driven in recent years. Spirited, skilled. 99% of the time, cheerful 
We like that, the driver. Yeah, Jota has been particularly fast on the straight you know, with both cars during the race. 319 uh, that time round for, for De Costa. There was Montoya. Montoya's a 316. So they definitely have a little bit of a speed advantage with the Jota package. Yeah, Montoya fading away a little bit now, isn't he? That gap's widening between them. So it's 61 cars that started this race, 183 drivers slated. The start. station is off there whoa, whoa, whoa. at Molsan. Almost in the way of De Costa as he came back on. And more drama here. It's one of the Porsches just rattling the wall. It's 91. And that'll have done a bit of damage, surely. The slide is just about held. You ride on board here with Fred Makaviki. Could have been a lot worse. That was marginal, wasn't it? Mm. He should Ooh. have got away with that in terms of damage. We're certainly not coming to the pits. No, absolutely. So, uh, <laughs> I yeah. wonder if he's even radioed in to say, <laughs> I've had a, a little brush with the wall. <laughs> <laughs> We've what? seen. We've what? seen. Yeah. Probably yeah. couldn't speak. He couldn't radio in. He's yeah. still getting take his heart us, rate back. Take us normal. through those moments. Yeah. What's well, the choice like, Darren? Well, <laughs> it's less <laughs> nowadays because there is so much uh, decent TV footage out there. Uh, and the telemetry probably gives it away as well. We might be able to hear uh, number 91. This is the polite version of the team radio. Fred Mako to the team. Yeah, it looks normal. I mean, I already clicked on and but uh, I touched it. Car looks OK. I ran parallel. I touched it. Yeah, yeah and you, you're on, on board there where you're looking at Freddie driving. Uh, the steering looks pretty straight as well. That's, that's always the, the giveaway. <laughs> Uh, Jota is having an interesting race because we saw 38 in the gravel early on. 28 is doing a really impressive job with Sean Delisle at the wheel. And Jota team boss Sam Hignett is with Louise Beckett. Sam Hignett, uh, it's always bittersweet with Jota, isn't it? The 28 will be doing well, the 38 not so well, or vice versa in the whole championship. And that's how this Le Mans seems to be playing out. Yeah, absolutely. It was, it was a real shame. The 38 had a trip through the gravel early on in those damp sessions um, and picked up gravel in the floor underneath the engine and then I assume that over the curves a bit of gravel has punched a hole in the oil filter so we had to come in lengthy to delay while we changed the oil filter but they're back out there they're running round they're aiming to get up into the top eight and it would still look quite good for the championship especially with the 22 further down. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And uh, you've got to be pleased with how the 28's doing. Yeah, 28's doing really well. Uh, it hasn't had an easy run of it. Uh, there's been a couple of problems along the way, but the guys have driven brilliantly. Pit stops have been very good, so hopefully we'll be there at the end and be on the podium. Are you surprised by the WRT performance? No, not really. I mean, you know, they've, they've done a fan executed a fantastic race. They've made no mistakes. The drivers have been brilliant. The team's been brilliant. So really, it's to be expected of a team of that caliber. OK, so we hope to see the 38 making their way up the field. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Sam. Thanks. Interesting to hear the story being completed there about the uh, uh, hole punching the oil filter yep. legacy of that gravel. So there's, there's more to it than just falling off the circuit. Absolutely. Felipe Nasa, another fastest lap, trading fastest laps at the moment with the FAA. It's a 331.646, and uh, just as another little fact tip there, that is the first time that uh, the fastest lap in P2 is faster than the fastest lap of any of the hypercar drivers. Uh, faster now than the best lap from Frank Mayer. Uh, the other quick point I was going to make of the 183 drivers slated to start this race, only one of them has not turned laps, and that, very sadly, is Paul Dallana did not manage to get into his car after that uh, big off for Marcus Gomez. So once again, Paul Dallana, the he just can't cut any luck here, can he? He must be the unluckiest driver when it comes to, to Le Mans. Um, you know, been so close. I can't remember the year when they were leading until the last hour. Right here, yeah. in front of us. We uh, watched it happen in front of us. Pretty much a done deal. But uh, since then, it's it's just not played played out in the in the right way for Paul and, and that 98 car. You know, they've. Uh, They've won the championship. They've won so many races uh, with uh, Mateus and, and Pedro Lamy in that car during the WEC uh, championship. And 
and more recently they've still been very competitive uh, but just just haven't been able to have a, a, a clean run here at Le Mans. And at times in the WC when it's been very tough to win in that class, it's been a deep field in that class and there's some very talented teams, very talented gentlemen drivers too. Yeah, I think, you know, if Paul had uh, been uh, into motor racing at an earlier age, I'm sure he could have been professional. You know, he's got the talent. You watch, you watch him uh, drive, you look at the data and everything else, and considering this is something that he fits in around uh, a huge business operation that he's operating, um, that he does a great job just turn up and uh, jump in the car, and, and sometimes it's hugely impressive what he, can, what he can drag out of a car. And for me, it's, it's inherent pace only improved when they made that shift in the WC qualifying to bring the gentleman drivers into it. He was being, he had to be trusted with that because that's what the rules were and he found something more at that point, Darren. Yeah, I think that was really good for the championship to make that part of, of qualifying, uh, to, to get the AM driver more involved uh, throughout the weekend. And ultimately, that's what GTE AM should be about. It Absolutely. should be about, about the, the, the bronze driver and, and making sure they have quality time on the racetrack. And, and uh, contribute to whatever the end result will be for that car. Finally, I mean, in this quick bit of discussion, we now know more or less the timeline for the end of what's been a great formula in GTE. Of course, the, the market has gone away from it. Some form of GT3 will be coming. Um, it's, of course, a real regret, isn't it? The fantastic beasts. Yeah, I mean, it, it, things move on. You can see that with LMDH and everything else. And GT3, away from the WEC and ELMS, GT3 has been hugely uh, successful for GT racing around the world. It gives all the manufacturers a chance to be able to, to come and play, uh, which is a healthy thing and healthy thing for the, for the market as well. So, um, yeah, GTE has been amazing. GT1 before that was amazing. Uh, and I'm sure that the next iteration of GT racing will also uh, 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 manufacture some great racing on the track as well, but it, it just opens the door with more manufacturers being able to come along and, and, uh, and join in with the fun of racing here at Le Mans. Yeah, we'll wait and find out just exactly what uh, we're going to see in terms of the cars and in terms of the class structure. It's been made pretty clear that we may be seeing the end of an all-pro uh, formula at Le Mans and in ACO rules racing. We'll see how that one pans out. That's got effects in terms of the cars we might see in the future, but uh, beyond this glorious vision of what will happen in prototype racing in the next couple of years. Big wobble there as the 36 car came out. There are questions answered and more still to be answered about GT as well. Lots and lots of change to come. And I think the uh, bronze driver market could be very uh, interesting competitive <laughs> going forward <laughs> if it's suddenly the, the from the manufacturer's point of view that there is no pro full pro lineups, then suddenly uh, the, the asset is going to be the bronze driver. Absolutely right. And we're already beginning to see that little, uh, the one or two drivers with nominally bronze uh, classifications that uh, when you look at the data, as I know you all do, in her race, very, very high up the order in terms of the average stint uh, pace across a race. Yeah, and, and you know, some, some bronze drivers just uh, have a good weekend and, the, and their actual uh, performance on track is is comparable um, but over a whole season it you can generally see the difference between a, uh, a bronze driver and a professional driver you know uh, when you look through the whole year you can really sort of tell the difference but you know there is weekends when when they're just on fire you know and they're able to put the laps together and they have a really good strong decent stint looking uh, we saw Fred Magnecki uh, joining the race of the 91 car he is now working the gap and working it rapidly to Neil Janney uh, that gap under 20 seconds now, and last time around, three seconds taken out of the Swiss driver by the Frenchman. And the fastest lap for that car as well, isn't Indeed. it? Indeed. Maybe it's, it's brushed with the wall. Well, maybe that's just helped with the, the setup. It's, 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 it's just <laughs> tweaked uh, the toe or the camber or the caster, and uh, suddenly it's come alive. External assistance. Exactly, into the pits number eight then. So after it's mysterious stop on track it's been running okay again number eight yeah one minute and 48 seconds behind as it came in for that pit stop it'll be a further minute plus for this it was just 44 seconds of course because they're, they're, just, they're short fuel in the car aren't they so it's a bit of wait and see what develops here bit of a peer inside just through the wheels there possibly to, to 
again, check on anything that might be vibrating, anything that looks loose or damaged. Every time we've seen a pit stop from Toyota, there's a lot of smoke, uh, well, dust coming off the brakes with the wheel guns uh, and the, the, the air of the wheel guns sort of blowing into the, into the wheels. So maybe that's just a, another precautionary check just to make sure there is enough material left on the pads. Uh, yeah. to see them through the last uh, five and a bit hours to go. A couple of LMP2 cars as we watch the eight rolling down towards pit exit. A couple more of the LMP2 cars doing their fastest laps of the race. And uh, Antonio Felix da Costa is one of them. Uh, Renko Colapinto has just dropped behind Renny Binder, who's the other. And that's a 3.40 last time around from Franco Colapinto, not quick. And the middle sector, sector two. Yeah, he's had a problem there, hasn't he? Yeah, yeah good off, hasn't he, by the look of it. Yeah. Well, it's a 3.40 and now another slow slow lap. Is he carrying a problem here? How many laps has he done in this stint, Brad? Do we... Uh, well, we, he was, if you remember, it was Franco that came across the gravel on the way into the Oh, that's right, pits. yes. That wasn't so that long wasn't that long ago, was it? Have no. a quick look and see what we can find. 26 is only six laps into this stint, and right. it's the uh, average lap time so far is a 3.38 on the stint. That's not good. No. It's had a legacy of his trip through the gravel as we get a replay here of another car getting it wrong into our nage. That's the 49. The high class racing car with Jan Magnussen at the wheel. Yeah. But he avoids the gravel but uh, runs deep into the corner. Last time for Jan, it was being uh, kindly helped down that escape road. Well, now that's Colapinto in. Is that Roman Roos enough? I think it possibly is. Does you by so, the name on the side of the helmet? There is a problem. Six laps back into the pit lane and the driver yeah. change. Yeah. So they've, they're trying to make the best of this, make a problem into a scheduled stop, but there's, there's obviously more than just fuel and tyres and a driver change that's brought it in. They're now trying to salvage that stop. Ferdinand Absurg, ready to go. Surely you mean Ferdinand, Svonimir, Maria, Balthaus, Keith, Michael, Otto, Antal, Barnum, Leonard von Habsburg, Lothringen. It uh, cost him a lot of deals, that uh, that name, because they just can't afford the finals on the side of the car. No, that's right. It has to be a very, very big car. Debris on the left-hand side of the white line approaching Marshall's post-10, we understand, right now. So just heading down to the first chicane on the Molsan, Molsan straight. Big slide there for 48. The braking zone for the Dunlop. Who was that behind the wheel? Pile behind the wheel. Good recovery though. Just to open the wheel, open the steering, just let the car run through the uh, the little bit of extra tarmac that there's to the right of the circuit. Yeah, Patrick making his LMP2 debut here last year as a late replacement for Dwight Merriman, and uh, was, was retained by the team. Long-time Porsche factory driver, of course, but now making his way in LMP2. His pace has been great, you know, last lap. I, I mean, basically before that little... Absolutely. <laughs> ...little moment into turn two, but, yeah, the last lap in the 33s, which is very competitive at this stage of the race. The two factory Ferraris together on track again. The 52 pulls to the right, lets the 51 go. No point in holding up the class leader at this point after that uh, delay. 52 with the puncture, something rather odd. I'm looking at our timing and scoring screen, which shows that car in pit lane. It's not your eyes, Graham. Good morning. <laughs> right, I, I've just been off. I've had uh, five hours off air. What have you doing with all my hype? Oh, hang on, they're all still there. They're all still there. Incredible, isn't Goodness it? Goodness me. Absolutely. And, the... and none have dropped 20 laps back because they've had a major issue. But we have had dramas and looming dramas, potentially, for the number eight car. Yes. That car stopping on track briefly for what looked like a reset. Troubles in getting a full... Well, not troubles, but unable to get a full tank of fuel into the car. I was thinking about this because I've been sort of following it while I've been having breakfast and washing and stuff. Are you going to manage it or fix it, was a question that was asked. And, and the problem with fixing it is you guarantee you're giving away a podium. If you manage it, it's just doing shorter stints. No, you, you've not been listening. They're working around the issue. Yes. 
<laughs> they're working around it, i.e. it's only doing 11 laps or we're, eight we're laps. We're sort of hoping it, it doesn't become a bigger issue, I think, as I'm, I'm leading, I'm, I'm leading yes. into that one. I, I think it's not picking up all the fuel. Yeah. Now, things like that don't fix themselves, Darren, no. very often, do they? But if it's picking up three quarters of the tank, you keep going while it is. It could only mean at one extra pit stop with this time remaining. Yep. Uh, and at that point, the strategy will be, let's just carry on with this and, and do the shorter stints. And, uh... They could end up with a 1-2 still. They might end up with a 1-3. What they devoutly want is for both cars to finish. Absolutely. And uh, they've got four laps uh, gap from the second-placed Toyota to the Glickenhaus in third yep. position. Just that little shot of the Corvette garage, I wonder how many fans are going, where, where do I get that wallpaper? All the way across the back of the streets. Instead of a flat plane panel, they've got little sort of bow tie Corvette wallpaper, like that's like rows of birds on it. It's, it's sort of quite Art Nouveau. I bet there's lots of fans going, where do I get that? How do I get that? And How can of, I create that for myself? And lots of fans while I was going, don't even think about it. <laughs> yeah, no, too late, it's up. And Ollie's already out there trying to price it up. Absolutely. There's a market. <laughs> <laughs> I think you'll probably find he makes it. Yeah. Ferdy Habsburg limbering up. Oh, I say, bit of core work. Absolutely right. So he is getting ready for the next round of pit stops for WRT. In fact, this is where we were just before I disappeared. Yiffy Yi chasing down Charles Milesi. He then caught him and passed him for the lead in LMP2 on his in-lap. And we're still seeing quick laps. Well, that's, that's a quick lap indeed from Roman Dumas. That's a 3.29.427, fastest uh, lap from that car for the race so far. Quick laps have been coming this morning too in LMP2 from Yiffe Ye, from Felipe Nata. And although it's just cleared the screen, that was a purple first sector. Yes, it was, yeah. So the fastest first sector of anybody all race from the Glickenhaus. Yes. The delayed Glickenhaus, the one that had the crash early on. It's also talking yeah. to that car crew. They, they weren't particularly happy with the, the balance, even... Uh, right up to uh, oh, the Saturday. Other, my apologies, yeah. it was the other Glickenhaus that had the crash. It was Oli Plar, wasn't it? It was Oli Plar that was carrying the damage at the start of the race. 708? Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. OK, so, that's, so that is the podium placed currently yeah. in Glickenhaus with five and a half hours to go. But for the crew of 709, it's only taken uh, 18 hours and a and 30 minutes for the balance mm. to come to them with their setup. <laughs> so, uh, yes. <laughs> it's been a long slog yeah. for that car, hasn't yeah. it? Well, They've just finally not there. had I mean, it under them. I mean, you know, we're talking about the, and, and with apologies to Toyota and to their followers, uh, it's slightly taking the mickey about a corporate line. You know, it's a serious point here with the number eight car. And these are the moments that matter. Yep. But a moment also to just look at what's achieved already here by Glickenhaus with an absolutely ground-up new car with a budget that will be a fraction of what is being employed at Toyota. And again, I thought about that, and I thought, why has he jumped in with both feet right at the start? Because when everything is new and there are fewer people engaged, you have a better chance have an opportunity. of actually... Yeah, of, of creating something for yourself. And, and that car that had damage early on, or that caused damage early on with the number eight car, is in third place and, and potentially they've you know they've got a very tight battle on their hands with the Alpine in fourth place but they've got potential of an outright podium their very first appearance at the mall. Well look like Jim Dickenhaus knows what it takes to do both sides of things doesn't he? He knows what mm. it takes to compete he absolutely knows what it takes to lose and there have been three uh, objectives here, four objectives. The first one is to be here. Yep. And that they most certainly have done. The second one is to finish this race. I'm saying nothing about that because no, I don't want to uh, have any influence. A podium most certainly would have been in their dreams. And of course, it is wildest dreams uh, to win the 24 hours of Le Mans. But uh, make no mistake, whatever happens from this point forward, they will take a huge amount of, of kudos and credit away from the 2021 Le Mans 24 hours. Trolley is in fact that's, that's the, the 51. The surfboard is that's, ready. It's the 51. That is the leading car. Yes, that yeah. is that actually says 50. It says 52 on it on the bit I can see of the surfboard, but they are ready to take that back into the garage. 52 and 51. There you, you are. It's for brakes at this stage. Could be. Might be. Could be. Right, we'll Minute and 10 seconds on the Corvette when they came in, but the leading car in GT Pro is in the garage as and into the pit lane comes Corvette now. 
Okay, okay so work the wheels. Are, this think. is a three-quarter distance full service, isn't it? This yep. is everything. This is ducts. This is brakes. This is oil, air filters, cabin filter. I mean, it's everything because you've got six hours to win Le Mans. So it's a driver change, standard full service pit stop for Corvette, and they will take the lead here, I think. Neil Jenny now, is four minutes back on the road. The question is, will they need a brake change? Have they had a brake change? Not while they I really come back out. Was a brake change, yeah. Great, great effort. Oh, this is going to be this is going to be close, isn't it? Super fast. Come on, get the marks off. See. Was that in total when he gets across the line at the end of the pits here? We have an idea of how long that actually took. Oh, oh, trouble for the left front puncture. That's the Proton, Dempsey Proton car, Matt That's Campbell, the fourth the place. Oh, 77, okay, it's in fourth place. That's 88, Lance yeah. David Arnold. Those two are so close in colour, aren't they? One's blue and one's turquoise. Teal. Really? Teal. Teal, yeah. See, that's an interior design colour <laughs> as well. No, no item of clothing I own is teal. That's my age. <laughs> they probably, they probably are, actually. It started off as blue. That's a long way back, isn't it? It is. Long way back. So the F Corsa car... Slow down. Conrad Agart comes out of the pits. Two minutes and 16 seconds. So it's a, an extra minute on the stop, basically, over yeah. a full-service driver change and everything else. Conrad Agart stayed in the car because there was no time to do anything else. 42 seconds gained on those stops by the Corvette. The gap now 29 seconds for the lead. So um, that shot is at the second chicane, Darren, so he's still got you know, 10 k's to, to... 9, 8 k's to get back. Well, let's hope he doesn't have the same sort of damage that we saw from the uh, 52 Ferrari with Sam. Yeah. You know, that was yeah. a huge amount of damage done. So the main objective now is just to bring it yeah. back steady. We saw Frey do that uh, yesterday yes. evening. Yes, took like, 10 to, minutes to get back to, in. That 52 car that Darren just mentioned, by the way, it's 21 minutes on pit lane to repair yeah. that damage. And the problem there, I think, was that it let go at maximum velocity, which yeah. is when the tyre is most likely to let go. When it's grown, it's been stretched by centrifugal force as much as possible. Whereas that one, if he got through the chicane without the damage, then at least he's down at no speed and he, it's up to him whether there's any damage. It, I don't think it was in Sam's hands whether there was any damage, it just happened. I'm not sure, because we saw Sam coming back out from the wall at Mulsanne, so maybe he had a big, big lock-up, which yeah. then would have been a, a, tile f a tire failure from yeah. the flat spot, which, um, you know, it, it fell apart uh, after that. Yeah. So uh, a simple puncture means you could probably uh, recover the car without too much damage. Mark this in the race diary, uh, potentially a very significant piece of news from Toyota. They are managing a fueling issue on the seventh car. Yep. And vibration they're reporting as well. Not just the eight. So both cars appear not to be able to take a full load of fuel at this point. And they made a driver change as well because they wanted to brief Jose Maria Lopez before he got into the car. On the workaround. And, and it was not possible to do on the radio, or not easy to do on the radio. And that, that you can see in the background, Lance David Arnold going very slowly um, in that 88 car. That was his outlap as well. So we've seen a couple of these. The Inception Ferrari spat its wheel off on its outlap and then spent 10 minutes driving very slowly back, as you would on only three wheels, because um, it, it lost the wheel at the first chicane. Well, to, to just, just go through what we've got here, um, in, the last, uh, in the last stints for the brake car, nine laps, seven laps, five laps, four laps, three laps, 13 laps, and now three laps into a stint for the number yeah. seven car. 13 laps, 9 laps, 13 laps, 8 laps, 7 laps, 5 laps. It's all over the place. Have number, you're right, and number 7 from the start of the race has been all over the place. Number 8 has done full stint, 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 basically. Trouble. Then trouble. Number 7 has gone yellow, fuel, uh, slow yeah. zone, fuel, safety car, fuel. They, they've, yes. they've played an American racing game strategy Take fuel every time you can, make sure you've always got fuel, and, and then you might have options later. So their, yes, their stint lengths have been anything between full and, and you know, barely a third. Yeah. So 
trying to read anything into their into that pattern has always been quite hard. Absolutely right. So yeah. vibrations and fueling issues reported for both Toyotas as we come into the morning. Racing Team Netherlands goes straight across the chicane. Yeah, the van der Gaard just that's, not getting a, that's it's slowed that's down. ARC, Is that ARC Bratislava yeah. again? I'm too many, too many yellow cars. Yeah, Racing Team Netherlands on an outlap, so it wasn't them. And through comes the 38 car, hops over the oh. curve, almost spits the car. That is how you get spat into the wall, Anna McNish. That's not comfy, is it? Yeah, it's... the problem is if you get two wheels over that curb, it's got a little bit of a dip, and then it actually springs it out the other side. And uh, you do have to be a little bit careful. You know, we're five hours, five and a half hours from the end of the race. There's quite a good rubber line, but that also means that off the rubber line, it means <laughs> it's significantly less. Saw some great shots in the darkness looking up through the Dunlop chicane where there's a clear white line and the rest of it basically is rotted gravel. And it just the most appalling filth off line and, and the, the sort of low level lighting from the, from the headlights really showed it up. And, and you don't see it so much in daylight. But that doesn't mean it's not there. <laughs> yeah, I can tell you, but you feel it. Right, there's a left front yeah. issue. Is that car being coming it's back? It's been coming a slowly. Yeah, it, yeah. it sort of came through the second chicane very slowly. Yeah. Got wheel arches ready for that car. Louise Beckett says there's the uh, Goodyear blimp overhead, and there's Van Sam Voss watching with interest. Alan, earlier in the season, WRT joined World Endurance Championship. They've been very successful in European Le Mans series with their, in their first year with an LMP2 program. They have been super successful in all sorts of endurance racing with GT cars. And you, you said that they sort of have underperformed a bit in World Endurance. Certainly, I think, by no. their standards and their expectations, uh, they might have. But I wouldn't say they underperformed. I think but you the did fact say is, that. no, I said <laughs> that when you come to this level of competition, when everybody comes together, it, it, you have to really step up. Yeah. And uh, it didn't run quite as well for them as they did in ELMS, where they were dominant first time out, looked fantastically quick when they got to Austria. Yeah. And, 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 and uh, in, e in WEC, it just hasn't quite, it's been the United and Jota show at the end of the day. Yeah. And uh, then came here and Jota show looked as if it was going to continue. United show struggled and kind of fell apart for various different reasons with all of the cars. And uh, WRT flexed their muscles and came through. Yes, their, their talent and their wherewithal and their driver lineup has definitely shown, you know, there's... Yeah, but there's a lot of their driver lineup that's not done Le Mans before. No, no, and I hate starting sentences like this, but they have not put a foot wrong so far. Don't Ferdy start. To, I know. We just saw, we just saw know, that uh, one of the stewards was going into the back of the garage there, um, one of the pit marshals, and that's usually for some sort of pit stop discussion. Louise Beckett pointing out for the pit. She's very alert with the mass for this time. Where's she? 31 car is 30 points off the 36. lead. 36. 36 points, and it's double points here, Graham. How much do you get for winning? You get 25, 25 and, and 12 and a half is 37 and a half. You get 50 points for winning. 50 points. Oh, for double winning. points. Sorry, yes, no, yes. not points and a half. So. That, I mean, yes. So that what? means of leading the championship as well as Louise is trying to say to you. It's, it's, been a, it's been a struggle. She didn't oh. say, so they're leading the championship now, Martin, because I know your maths is poor. Uh. You know my maths is poor. We've done this for 20 years, <laughs> 10 years with you, obviously, Louise. Well, we've got... Since uh, you were nine. For the championship, double points here. We've then got a six and an eight-hour race in Bahrain to yeah. come. Yeah. But the eight-hour race, again, as the 88 car does make it back. Well done, sir. Painful for Lance David Arnold, yeah. creeping in so slowly. Very painful for them, but also just interesting now to see whether the Toyota number seven continues through, whether it will do a seven-lap stint or whether it will be six, and it does continue through to do another lap. So Toyota number seven is not on that reducing lap count that you were mentioning no, there, Graham. It indeed. seems to have stayed Stabilized at worst. We, you, you, all the way round, you're going, keep slow, 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 slow. Just watching this car come to a halt, that's another potential flaw, because you come into the pit lane, you think, right, I've done it. If you hit the brakes at your normal spot, you just glide straight past your garage and into somebody else's, because the car won't stop with the flat tyre on the front. Even at pit lane speed, it will it will not stop properly. So but it's not delaminated, no. and that's been the same thing. It yeah. might just be, it oh. is going to be tyre and go. 
708 is in and that cycles it back from third to fourth place. We've got a very tight battle for the podium in Hypercar. We've got a very tight battle still for the lead in GTE Am. Com Ledigar ahead of Nicky Katzberg by 24 seconds. That is nothing. I'm not sure there's a problem that you can have at Le Mans that costs you as little as 24 seconds. Ferdy Habsburg in the WRT entry. That was Alan stirring his tea. You didn't, you didn't imagine that. 31 car leading in, w, in uh, LMP2. 51, Com Ledigar leading in GTE Pro. 22nd overall and leading GTE Am, still the 83 Ferrari. Nick Nielsen, well, he was in this when I went, to, when I went off shift five hours ago and he's still in the car. I imagine he hasn't been in ever since. Who are we talking about? Sorry, I was Nick just Nielsen, getting my the 83 cup of tea ready. Car. Yeah, weren't you, though? Were you? And, and Jose Maria Lopez leading the race for Toyota Gazoo Racing. Number seven car ahead of number eight. And the fierce battle between Alpine and Glickenhaus to get on the podium continues to rage. And there is the 92 Porsche that had dramas on the opening lap. Well, had dramas in, in Hyperpole getting crashed by Kevin Estra. And then is, has very quickly in the first six hours fought its way back up into podium contention. Number eight uh, Toyota uh, on the way back in. We're told by Louise. Well, those cars are still on the same lap and they have a four lap advantage over the battle for third, which is effectively one, one car because they're only 30 seconds apart. And if you're going to lose four laps, the chances of you losing four laps plus only 29 seconds are relatively slender. Um, they just changed the drivers on number seven to put Jose Maria Lopez in with instructions on how to manage the current situation. So I don't expect, since Seb Sebastian Buemi has been managing this since three or four in the morning, I don't suppose that they need to rebrief him. He will stay in. Dylan Pereira aboard the 33 car, trying to chase down Nicholas Nielsen. Uh, also looming battle, it's going to be uh, this lap, I think, that uh, Fred Mako catches Neil Janney. Three seconds bit, uh, back from the sister car, but the 91 car much quicker at the moment, into the 349, so a 352 last time around from Neil. Might be interesting for Louise to go to TF Sport and ask them how things are going with the Aston Martin without, without wishing to tempt them. There was a stage from midnight till about four where when the AF Corsa car stopped for a lap until they came in, the TF Sport Aston was the leader, but that was its in-lap. And then, mysteriously, one lap, they came in on the same lap as the Ferrari and since have not been able to find that extra lap no. back or retake the lead. And they're now two minutes behind, and two minutes here is half a lap. Yeah. So you can see the 33 is coming through the Porsche curves, but the leader in the class is out of the second chicane, out of the first chicane. So it's, it's sort of on the opposite side of Le Mans, if you like. Cracking lap time, last time through. Fastest lap of its race for the 63 Corvette. Nicky Katzberg is on the charge again. That gap, 21 seconds for the lead in uh, GTE Pro. Somebody in the truck spotted that at exactly the same moment you did, didn't they? And they went, give me the 63, just as you started talking about him. But that's a race. To view. That is a race. That is a race now, because they've been at it, uh, you know, for now what, since you were in sleep, so that's the middle of the night, yeah. so I would have said, Martin. And uh, it's been back and forward, and Katzberg has been able to hang on yeah. all the time. Since before midnight, and actually the, the, the key to that is they have not dropped behind, they've not dropped away from the Ferrari, despite as, as what Ollie tells us, they've got one soft tyre, and it's not soft enough to be the soft night tyre, so as soon as the temperature drops below a certain level, they are giving away performance to the Ferrari, so those three drivers have really, really clung on grimly. And a change for position as Roman Rusinov has just overtaken Esteban Garcia, and uh, that is for uh, eight, ninth position, so Rusinov is now overtaken, gone up into ninth, but uh, Esteban Garcia is leading the Pro-Am category yep. in 
LMP2, 10th overall in category, but leading Pro-Am. Seconds, uh, Juan Pablo Montoya and Dragon Speed that are a couple of places behind and a lap behind. I mean, Real Team are going to be closing in uh, pretty shortly on Esteban Garcia having burned the required six hours of time. He did a fine job overnight of... I think he did double, a quad, double. I think he did, didn't he? He did, did do a double double, stint. yeah. He did two full sets of a double double stint. One of them one of them was very slightly shorter. I think it was maybe you know two or three laps shorter than the full stint, I think but we, it was I think we worked out he needed to do two hours yeah. uh, into the morning. Yeah. He, the he the did a lot of the heavy lifting. He did. Uh, and in fact, through the night, it was clear, it was moonlit sky, it was clear sky, its temperatures were low, and they were on the, the soft tire. There were lots and lots of fast laps being banged in, all I mean, in all four classes, well, lots it, and lots. In reality, what that's left us with, despite the fact Roman Rusnov has just gone by him in their class, and the pro oh, out of trouble. Oh, that's the uh, see, Rinaldi Racing is, Ferrari. That's off at uh, Dunlop on the left-hand side as you come in. Christian oh, Hook's in. gone a long way off, hasn't he? Yeah. Those tracks across the middle, that's from Ant Davidson's car. Oh, is this a touch with 64 or was he just no. offline? He's just, just offline. Off in the dirt. And Alan, out there by the kerb, you don't see anything, but the tyres are just picking it up and he's just rolling off there with tyres yeah. that aren't touching the road anymore. He got a little bit spooked by that one and uh, it, what he should have done is actually, instead of trying to follow the road round, if he had just kept it straight, he would have more chance of uh, then coming straight out the other side. Not, it wouldn't have been pretty, but at least it would have been. Uh, uh, wouldn't have required lifting out of the gravel. That is a sea of gravel. The uh, they are battling essentially with Inception, who had that wheel come off at about uh, three or four in the morning. So that's going to be to rise to the tail of the of the Am field. Sorry, I was just about to say that's going to be a slow zone, so that's an opportunity yeah. uh, for someone to play a little bit of a strategy game to see if they can pit with a lesser loss for a pit stop. And uh, looking at it, both the Toyotas could yeah. maybe start to play that game. Well, number seven's only just come on to Mulsanne. Number eight is uh, between the two chicanes. What about our LMP2 leader? I'm more That's thinking... coming through the Porsche curves. Yeah. Porsche. I'm more thinking about uh, GTE Pro because that is the, the yeah. fight at the moment. But both are on four laps, so it's probably a little bit too early for Ooh. them. However... 83 has just come out of the pit lane. That's the AM leader. So where's TF Sport? And just in, by the way, the second place car in LMP2 and indeed the fourth place Panis Racing car. Uh, they stopped too. There's the 41. Yep. That's the second place car of uh, WRT. And that's a no-brainer. You're coming up towards the pit lane. Yes, of course you stop, I think. The slow zone gives you the opportunity to get in and out of the pits while your rivals are going nearly as slowly as you are when you're stationary. Yeah, this car had done seven laps with Yi at the wheel, whereas their sister car that's leading's only done three. And so therefore, yes, again, you're right there. It's worthwhile throwing the dice on this car. The other one, you probably want to just stay out there. Yeah, it, it makes almost no odds because you're going to be in so short. Louise Beckett says both Porsches are coming in. Kevin Estra due to get into 92. Maybe a driver change in 91. We'll keep eyes on that as well. 26 comes in after just yep. six laps out there for Roman okay. Rusinov. Again, that'll be a, a tactical fuel race. They're, they are looking to recover, aren't they? Rusinov got a penalty for tubbing off Jan Magnussen. Um, a very clumsy move. Franco Colapinto, not a happy bunny. Uh, Luis reports as he got out of the car. A bit of a struggle Ooh. yesterday. Yeah, real team coming in all a squint across the nose of the number 26 car. They're both run by the same crew, TDS Racing. So they are in neighbouring pits, although they are very differently liveried and financed, obviously. See the uh, high camera flying down the pit lane, chasing the G-Drive car. So Panis came in, came, came in, came in from fourth in LMP2, WRT from second. And this will be the onboard view of that. Oh, no, this is the Sophia Flourish incident. Plus. Now, why are we seeing that again? Because you're looking at the back of the, uh, the, 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 the repaired back of the 26 yes. car on pit yes. lane to explain why there's no Correct. livery on it. And, and what we're not seeing is when uh, Roman Rusinov thumped uh, Jan Magnussen up the backside. That was down at Arnage. 
came in fully lit. I mean, he was never making the corner, whether whether, whether Jan was turning in or not. Came they in can't. fully lit, hit him square from behind. Eight laps Bohemi had done on this uh, this tank of fuel. OK. No, they are. Tyres, service. Yeah, but that's got to be give us a little bit of a difficult steer whether they were able to do longer because this is the car yeah. that had the fueling issues yeah. and uh, its previous stint was a full 13 laps. I glanced at the timing screen and looked back. Was that all four tyres or just one tyre? No, I think that was four. Charmelazy there. Yep. Yeah. Not necessarily closely related to Tintin, but, you know, definitely has has a look about it was Ed Sheeran was it there, there team WRT's Ed Sheeran look-alike if he yay out of the pits so to James Allen in at Panis Racing Edex Sport put in Paul Lafargue in the 48 car Roman Rusinov stayed in 26 Esteban Garcia stayed in 70 so he is going to get his full allocation in is Andre Negrau. Doors stay closed. Tyres again are ready on the apron. This time they're going for a change, so this will be the start of another double stint. They did do a lot of double-doubles in the night. A lot of times we saw the tyres just being left on the apron and not used. And away he goes. They know they're in a dogfight for third, potentially for second. I mean, potentially, who knows, for victory. Nobody knows with five hours to go how any of these hypercars are going to fare. They're all in unexplored territory in terms of racing, Alan, because testing is one thing. Racing is is very, very different. Yeah, it is. You get so many situations like this. You can only simulate so many slow zones and safety cars when you're driving around Paul Ricard in your own in the middle of the night. And uh, so now you can see the Ferrari is back on and back moving again. So it's going to be quite a quick release after it. Yep, that 388 car, 45th overall in the order, 14th in the GTM class. It's been uncommonly unreliable. Mm. Lots of incidents. It, yes, that's not reliability. It, it hasn't Dramatic. broken. Dramatic. Use that one. It's been binned several times. Uh, and that is, the, that is the drama. 64, Nick Tandy in the uh, grey Corvette, silver Corvette, grey Corvette is the last running car. 48 cars remain from our record equaling 61 starters. What is that? Is that what, a rear view mirror? Just in front, we've seen Nico Lapierre just on the top of the dashboard. There's a little camera looking back at him and to the right of it, it's sort of something with a flap on it. It, it, it looks like it's an ashtray or something. An it's an air duct. Uh -huh. It comes in from the just below the bottom of the screen, and you have to close it off because at certain times you get a lot of dust in through there, yep. and if it rains, you need to close it off or you get a shower. Right. So, so we've there's two air ducts. We've seen him lifting a flap yeah. up before, yeah. so it's that may getting be... Getting ventilation. Yeah. As the day gets warmer, it was pretty chilly overnight, actually, and a very heavy dew, I noticed as well, but no, actually, it looked like it had rained when I woke up, but it hadn't. So it was pretty cold. Right, somebody has asked a question of Toyota whether the eight pitted early tactically or whether it was forced to. They did change drivers to Brendan Hartley, so Brendan clearly has also had the briefing on how to deal with the issues. More of a worry for me would be, again, with my really rubbish team manager's hat on, Less that it's not picking up all the fuel, although that's not going to fix itself, more that they've got a mysterious vibration. Yeah. I, 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 don't, I don't like vibrations. If you have to go shorter because you're not picking up the fuel because you're on the backup pump or something, then that's one thing, but vibrations don't go away. And, and although I've not experienced driving at anything like this pace, they tend to get worse on yeah. all the old snotters I've ever owned. Kind of, so. the, the interesting bit, there is a bit of a chat uh, available for media with the Toyota PR and Al Moffat and his crew, very good at it's giving true. timely information, but they've not given answers to the last couple of questions about the seven. And it may well be that there aren't... Uh, it might be that. ...answers to the questions, 91 and 92. And this is for position. And that's just changed. So, Fred Makoviki ahead of Kevin Estra. 
They're both on their out lap. That's really, I mean, you know, how on earth the 92 so quickly got back in touch with the, with the leaders is just remarkable. They have done a very solid job. Ferrari with one horse left in the race. It is the leader, and you can only win with one car. But if you've got two chances, then you give yourself a lot more opportunities. Alexander Stelig, the head of their GT racing program. That's a great photo op, isn't it? The two cars emerging under the Dunlop Bridge with clear blue skies behind. United Auto Sports. Wayne Boyd in sixth place in their 23 car, the better of the or the best of the United cars that survive. Oh, threading the needle of 91 yep. with the United car. Is it an optional extra to go through the left-hander and right-hander? Yeah, or, don't or, have you to. Know, what's, what's the deal here? <laughs> That's greatly overrated using yeah, all the bits of the chicane. I'm getting a bit bored of this, to be honest with you. Need to put a wall or something there, just yeah. because people are now using it as a part of the standard track and they decide whether they want to use the track or not. Yeah, using it as an overtake. So it's the 22 United car there, uh, with the Risi Competizione car behind it, and the two Porsches still battling for... Well, potentially still battling for victory. There's no guarantee that the A of Corsa Ferrari and the Corvette will continue to lead this race. The Porsches are effectively about a lap behind. 22, by the way, 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 way down the order. 47th uh, overall, 21st, and then Peter over had problems again overnight. I would have documented that, but I just couldn't see it. I was looking too high up the screen still. Let's hear from the 91 Porsche team, see what they've got to say for themselves. Hey, Fred, just a reminder that Kevin's tires are brand new. No problem. I didn't get that at all. No, I think it was uh, the car behind is quicker than you, but think, I'm not 100% yeah. sure. Yeah. And I'm not sure if he got it either, because if the radio quality is that bad, I'm quite sure that uh, it was pretty bad to the driver. It does often sound like they're in a goldfish bowl, doesn't it? We're talking about this with Ollie Gavin during the night uh, about Toyota. It, it's become clear that they have a standard format where when you close on your teammate and get on the horn and go, I'm quicker than him, I'm quicker than him, they will wave you by, but if you don't then escape, they'll give you three or four laps and go, right, Sunbeam, back where you were, back in your box. Ollie said that was standard practice at Corvette Racing as well, and it looks as though that might be the case here at Porsche. But if Estra is arguing the toss that he only got held up in traffic and that's why Mako got by, he might want to get back past. They might give him a shot. The, that's certainly, I would say, general standard practice. It doesn't always follow through in reality because the problem is that if suddenly something happens and there's a car or a slow zone or whatever, um, to give it back, then there's always the discussion afterwards of the reasons why you shouldn't give it back. It's also a little bit more tricky in a prototype because in the hypercar, just with the front aero and the front aero wash, it's so difficult to follow. Yep. Uh, the message I'm reliably told by the friendly crew at the Reddit WC fan stream was Kevin has brand new tyres. Ah. Okay, yeah. so that's a do not panic message. And they, and they should, no, it's not. It's, oh, hang on, Kevin's that was, back. He gets that was Kevin away. He doesn't stop blocking him. He's, you're yeah. compromising his strategy. That's the one thing that's clear. If you're on the same strategy, then it's about performance, but you don't compromise the other car's strategy, then they should switch yeah. because the strategy will come back on the other direction later on in the race. If they're still nose to tail. Uh, Toyota informed us that the number eight car, that was a slow zone driven, and here is the pass, that was a slow zone driven opportunity to pit and put Brendan Hartley in. And the deal there is obviously that when you're stopped, everybody else is going through the slow zone. At some stage, they're going very slowly as well, so you lose less time. Now, we always it here with a long circuit, it's not quite the same. But on short circuits, we always had places to pass, specific yeah. places and specific ways to overtake to lose the least amount of time and the least amount of energy. Here there are lots of long straights yeah, and some no. heavy braking areas, so you do, you have plenty of shuffleage. You, you just lift and coast, yeah. you save a bit yeah. of fuel as well. And uh, so it, as much as you don't necessarily want to lift, if you lift, then you actually gain a little bit in some respects. Mm -hmm. Who's left a lot of time? That'll be from, from Lance David Arnold. 
that will be a bit of tire debris. Yeah, looks like it. And I'm afraid yes. at, at some stage all of those reach a critical mass and then one incident happens, tips us over the scale and we'll go full course yellow to allow the marshals to clear all the rubbish from all the track. Makoviki is not letting Estra disappear here. He's trying to make the point and the, and the slight problem here is that you might end up really compromising your tyres just to make the point saying actually I'm really as quick as him even though my laps, my tyres are a whole stint older. In comes Racing Team Netherlands this time. It's had a new left front guard from an incident earlier on. It's had a few gravel trap excursions. Fritz van Eyde was in the car when uh, suddenly he met rain. We're going to see that now. Oh, no. Oh, hello, photographers. Look at that. Oh. That is full-on drift That's king. And Guido. Yeah, That's Guido. It is Guido. But did you see the photographers at the barriers there? I mean, that's that's a full rally stage now. Full service. And have they put Fritz in? Uh, no, it's Yop. No, it's Yop. Yop. Yop, yop. There's Fritz in the doorway, in fact. Hands on hips. Yep. Funny, isn't it, how even with a mask, there are certain people who you just recognise from their, their, their stance. Doug Feehan is one of those. Oh. Oh, number seven coming in across the gravel. It's an alternative line, but that's one thing they've struggled with a little bit. We heard Jose Maria Lopez talking about front brakes and things in the past. Uh, he's in the car at the moment. They seem to struggle consistently in the last part of the braking areas. That's when all the aero washes off and all you've got left is mechanical grip from the tyre. It could also be a little bit, though, the uh, hybrid system and recuperations yeah. Yeah. and things like that. Interaction and also the brake balance shift. Saw a mechanic there with a pressurised canister, so that's either fueling system or oil system. It's a little bit like when they plug in the airline, it's got a dry brake and you have this pressurised system, you plug it in and it empties the can. And in fact, that looked like, an, if, if it's putting that much oil in, that looked like it was a good four litres. Then, mind you, if it's putting that much water in, they've lost a lot as well. So it may not be using all of it, just enough to fill the system. Roman Rusinov ahead of Rennie Binder. At one stage early in the race, that Duquesne car, you thought, that's never going to see darkness. No. It just <laughs> would not stay out of the pit lane. And then suddenly, like the prodigal child, it went, if I have to, all right, and it sort of settled down. And actually, it's been good as, I shouldn't say this again, good as gold ever since, but really... But, but the G-Drive car as well, my multiple issues, multiple impacts for that car. Yeah. And still, they carry on. Sister car, long, I'm afraid, in Park Ferme, after that's off for Rui Andrade, up uh, towards Dunlop. It's been a familiar sight seeing LMP2 cars picked out of that barrier this week. Here's Gado and Fritz going, all right then, it did tell this. me all about it. It did this, it had nothing to do with it. Look at these photographers uh, right. by the by the wall. Oh, oh, he's one of those Regis, do we think? Well, he's short enough that he doesn't <laughs> have to duck, so he's OK. So, And he's got no hair for all the dust to get caught in. It's a, it's a quick polish and away he goes. One of our American uh, photographer colleagues, Regis Lefebvre, uh, Lefebvre. 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 Uh, who, who was assaulted, nearly assaulted very rudely by an Audi in the middle of the night, in the middle of the forest, I think on the run down to Indianapolis, he was behind the barriers. And I'm not sure if it was Dindo, I think it may have been Dindo, basically aimed straight at, not intentionally, obviously, aimed straight at him and clanged off the barriers. And uh, as the photographer dived for cover on the Eurosport coverage, I recognised who it was in the Regis. replay. And uh, Regis got his, his name check. It's, uh, you know, uh, very seldom been trackside here at Le Mans, mm. uh, the really quick stuff, it is a scary place to be. Properly is. I mean, there's, there, well, they may have, might have cleared a few trees, there might be a bit more runoff area, but the run down to Indianapolis through the forest, it's very, very fast. It's not for the faint-hearted, Alan. No, it's definitely not, as we're looking for the battle in 8th and 9th in uh, LMP2. There's just something that's nagging at the back of me, which I don't really... I can't confirm at the moment, but there's a minimum driving time in LMP2. Three um, hours for the six. gentleman driver, six hours rather yeah. for a gentleman yeah. driver, yeah. Um, but at the same time, it looks like uh, 
Stoffel van Dorn is actually in the Jota car that's third in LMP2. He's only done four hours out of the six. Now there's, there's time for him to yeah. get in the car, and he's in the car next, but yeah. uh, certainly he's the one that's done the least driving time in that third place car at this moment in time. Yeah. So you're talking about saving your big gun for the end, but. Uh, Certainly, Not it's just sure a point of time to yeah, pick him in. Exactly, yeah. that's yeah. the point, is that there's a few cars that are... Yeah. You know, another one that's underneath the time at the moment is third place overall, Mathieu Vaxivier, in uh, the, the Alpine. He did quite a lot in the small hours of the morning. He did a couple of double stints, but you're right. Oh, dear. See, trying to hang on to a car that's on a stint newer tyres, not necessarily a great idea. And he's, you know, he's on 19 or 20 lap old tyres now. Kevin Estre in front of him on five or six lap old tyres. You're not going to hang on to him at places like Mulsanne Corner, at places like Arnage, at places like the Chicanes, because that's where his new attire is going to be most significantly an advantage over yours. Yeah, but you do have to try. You do have to try, but you have to judge where you're trying. Um, yeah, I'm not a driver, but I, I'm, I'm not thinking you're <laughs> Thank judging you for the that advice. right. No, he definitely went in a bit deep, I'll give you that. Yeah. Reese in the pit lane, and a little... Ooh, a late call! Whoa. Oh, no, engine. Oh, no. Engine. Look at the pumping out the yep. left-hand side bank. That's burned the cylinder. Yep. That's the end of the race for Rizzi Competizione. Oli Jarvis in. Oli Jarvis had a similar incident when he was... He took the car out in the small hours, taking over after Felipe Nasser's massive run and came straight back in. And what was it they changed? They had to take the car apart. They... Know, I, I think know. they changed an oil filter or something. I think there's been a bit of an issue with oil filters getting damaged. I don't know why, but that's going no further, is it? No, that's going to be the shutter doors down on the Risi Competizione car. Yeah. I've got to say, stunning, stunning livery. I love looking at it. You just saw the puddle of oil that it's draining as it comes back in, or, or fluid of some kind. Third place in GTE Am Iron Links. Team manager to the race director immediately. And uh, that's never a good sign. Every no. time I've gone to see the race director, Eduardo Freitas, it's been a one-sided talking discussion. That's because you've always been a naughty boy. I, I'm, I'm not sure that's necessarily... I was <laughs> being friendly going to see him. <laughs> <laughs> not sure that's necessarily the case with Reno Mastronardi. Yeah, but why is he being dragged up yes, there? No, I don't you know. know. If you, normally, these things can be done digitally, but uh, if he's going there, then he's got to explain something that's got a bigger consequence next to it. That'll be for final evidence of something, won't it? And that's not a driving issue either. That has all the hallmarks of it being a technical infringement of some kind. And ahead, Dylan Perry are rapidly catching Francois Perrault at the moment. Very different fuel strategies at the moment. Uh, so was it four or five laps into the stint for uh, Francois Perrault? It's 12 or so for Dylan Pereira, so he'll be on pit lane reasonably soon. But uh, can he catch the leader before we get to that point? And that will mark another swing of the pendulum in GTM. Frank Mayer, meanwhile, is catching Mathieu Vazavier at the moment. So, Is that so yeah, Pereira actually with the fastest lap of the 33 cars race of 350. That plays against a 357 last time around for Perodo. The gap now 11.7 seconds. So is he going to catch you before he has to pit? down on one of the two it's, the, it's the third place uh, fourth place car I think of from my uh, that's, no, that's a 709 that's I think 709, okay. that's Roman Dumas yes. board now with Roman we were on board with him a little early weren't we looking back we at him now we're looking forward from him seventh speed and this is a P2 car ahead. 3 10, 3 12, 3 18, 19, 22, 3 4. Driver's not focusing on that. 325 kilometres an hour and change at top speed. It was interesting to see that. He wasn't catching, wasn't catching, wasn't catching, was suddenly catching, yeah. and then running out of road. Yes, indeed. Now it is in the tow. Yeah. Pulls out and we'll go past the case. 83 going Trouble. slowly. Trouble or for is the that lead. 54. It's a. Uh, that's 54. That's 54. 54.
That's 54, the fourth-placed car in GTEM. So potential also run by AF Corsa. Yeah, problems for the fourth-place fourth car and potential issues as well for the Iron Lynx car ahead, the 80, mm. with that uh, call to race control. What's that on the driver's left? Has he got a left rear something issue? Yeah. It's something dragging underneath the car. It's not a left rear issue. It's it's all inflated. Tires are inflated. Yeah. But something a bit bizarre. Dylan Pereira, meanwhile, ahead of this as Thomas Fleur moves to get out of the way. Here comes Roman Dumas, threads the needle up the inside of the 74 car. Christian Reed, three and a half minutes behind him. They're going to work at the back of the Risi Competizione for our uh, LMP2 car with Gibson yep. uh, personnel there. And they're cleaning the front, but I'm not sure that's going to be required. When you see exhaust being pumped out with white smoke, that is normally not that we've just had a new Pope elected. It's normally that we have lost a cylinder. Giuseppe is Italian. Yes. Slow car in front. That will be covering the uh, 54 car. There it goes. And that is going very slowly. He is nursing that back. Pitch entry of car 82 under investigation. Well, that was a... Yeah, exactly. That's a neither here nor there because I'm not sure it's going to leave the pit again. So any penalty they may be handed for that last-minute decision well, to leap into the pit. He had no option. He could have gone and left oil all over the circuit. That's, yes, that would be exactly my argument point. What would you prefer, oil on the track? Yeah. or? But uh, it's an automatic thing, though. When yes. someone doesn't come into the pit lane in the correct way, then automatically this comes up on the timing monitors yeah. and it has to be investigated. Indeed. And rightly so, because you can't have people sort of halfway through the chicane just suddenly going hard right. So that's the way very big accidents happen. Dylan Pereira at the end of another quick lap. It was the quickest lap of the race for the chasing second place car in GTM. Last time around a 350.150. He couldn't cross the line now. And the pressure through the Porsche curves from the toe to behind. And More it's a 349.707. And he's now just five seconds behind the leader, Francois Perodo, who completed another 357. Fastest lap of the race for the 33 TF Sport car. And we've got fewer than five hours to go. They're pushing. They know there's an opportunity yep. here. Yes, I mean, what a feather in the cap for Tom Ferrier and the crew if they could come out with this class win at Le Mans. I think he's due in next time around, though, Alan. Yeah, he is. He's uh, just one lap from coming to the pits, and so, therefore, the gap will extend back out to over a minute. However, they're offset on pit stops. But, uh, officially, 48 cars still running. And they just actually updated with yes. the retirements, so everything from 49th down, which would you like me to just run through those for you, Martin? Uh, do it in number order. Uh, okay. oh, oh, hang on. Uh, look, during the night, we have been playing Spotter Guide Marker of Doom Connect 4. Excellent. Well, let's start with that. Number one uh, was the was eliminated, the uh, Richard Meal racing team, Sophia Flourish, uh, after the impact with Franco Colapinto, followed by being harpooned by the number 74 car. Racing Team India, just to document that 54 has made it to the pit lane. Slowly. Yes. Uh, 25, uh, new, right, uh, the next numerical car to go, Rui Andrade, with dramas up towards Dunlop, but... H hold that thought, because Louise is with Oli Jarvis at Risi Competizione. Louise, I sense this may not be good news. Oli, uh, we saw the car coming in, smoke coming out, was looking at everyone, scratching their heads. Um, Tell us from, tell us, give us an update. Yeah, I just jumped in the car. I think I got woke up, woken up about five minutes. Walked in the pit lane, jumped in the car, everything was okay. Um, was on a lap and then suddenly lost power in sector three. Radioed through to let them know. I had a sensor warning on the dash and loss of power. And I think fortunately the, the cameras picked it up and the team were able to advise me last minute to dive into the pit lane. So. I'm not sure what the issue is, if I'm honest. Um, I'll be stood here with you and, like you say, a lot of people scratching their heads. Has, did something similar happen in the night? No, we've had um, a few issues. So we had a, a rear wing, a uh, rear bodywork section that dislodged itself. So we, we lost all rear downforce from the start of the race and they couldn't get that off. And later on, we had an oil leak. So definitely been an eventful, uh, whatever it is, 
19 hours so far. And do you think uh, you can salvage anything from this? I'm honestly not sure at the moment. Generally, when you see smoke like that, it, it's quite terminal. But on the positive side, you know, for a new team, the pace has been outstanding throughout the race. I'm just cutting for the guys because it would have been nice to, to have brought the car home. Regardless of position, um, they've worked so hard for, for months now, not just this week, but for months, and a really strong team effort. All right, thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Ollie Jarvis. Yeah, when you see smoke like that, generally it is the the engine giving up the ghost. And, and he's absolutely right. You know, um, not only Ricci Competizioni, but every single one of the 62 cars that came here has had a long run up at getting prepared as perfectly as humanly possible for Le Mans. But Le Mans is a cruel mistress, and Le Mans decides who wins the race. It doesn't matter what you've got or what you bring. If it's not your day, it's just not your day. They have dropped down to currently 16th in LMP2, but I don't think that car will return. LMP uh, GT Am battle continues. The number 33 car of Dylan Pereira comes in. It's two minutes behind Francois Perodo, who's now at the wheel of the 83A, of course, uh, Ferrari. So gentleman driver Perodo versus gentleman driver Ben Keating. Now, this could be very interesting. Alan McNish, Ben Keating regularly with Egidio Perfetti among the gentleman drivers in, in the AM class getting on for as quick as most of the good pros. He is a very quick peddler. He's already won Le Mans once in the Ford GT. That didn't stick. He then lost it in the post-race scrutineering bay. He knows what it's like to take the chequered flag and to stand on that podium. What he'd really like is to keep it, but they've got to beat this car, the AF Corsa 83 machine that currently leads the class. And these two, have basically been with one hand on each other's throats at the lead of the category for the last six or eight hours. Well, for the last six or eight races, actually. You are true. Reality, all the way through the, the season so far, they've been fighting it out. They've been two of the main top contenders. I wouldn't say the only contenders, but consistent contenders. And uh, Perodo is very, very committed to it as well. He's been in the car for a few years now. He understands the Ferrari. The team are strong in and around him as well. And uh, for... Uh, for Keating, this is the first real run in the Aston. As you said, he's jumped into different cars through the last few years. But uh, with TF Sport, I think he's got a good team underneath him to be able to deliver. But it's going to be a good run into the end of this race. The GTE uh, Pro and Am are really the two races at the moment that uh, you're not 100% sure which way they're going to go. You know, they could quite easily flick on the other side. Yep. Dylan Pereira, the Luxembourg driver. Spends most of his weekends racing in the uh, Porsche Mobile One Super Cup. Last year's championship runner-up, multiple race winner. And this World Endurance Aston Martin engine at the opposite end must be a very different beast to drive. Uh, welcoming back to the booth, Ollie Gavin. And Ollie, you've got recent knowledge of that, swapping from a front-engined Corvette to uh, a rear-engined, mid-engined Corvette. It, it, it's not the same thing in in any direction, is it? No, it's not. And, uh, you know, he is, uh, Dylan Pereira is doing a fine job, uh, you know, mastering the Aston Martin around here. He's been fast all weekend, and uh, he obviously gets it done as well in Super Cup. So, you know, it's versatile. He's, he's fast in, in GT cars, and that's going to serve him well for his future career. All right, well, Louise Beckett is down at TF Sport. Let's see if we can hear from Dylan Pereira and find out how their race is going. Dylan, that was an incredible stint from you and actually from the TF Sport 33 throughout so far, it's been a great run. Yeah, so yeah, we, were, we were leading quite uh, at the beginning. Uh, unfortunately, we had the puncture afterwards. So, uh, but then until now, after the puncture, everything went quite well. So we were fighting quite a lot. Now my stint, the last triple stint I did was really good. The car felt really nice. So we could close the gap a little bit. Um, for me, the job is done, let's say. And uh, now I just have to finger cross for my teammates and that they bring it all home and that they push and bring that we, at the end, we are on the top spot. You did have that unfortunate incident with the uh, puncture, but also the team have played it really well, knowing when to come in, when to, well, hopefully play those uh, yellow zones. Yeah, sure. Also, with the flat spot, they, we had to change the diffuser on the rear. The team did an amazing job. They changed it really quickly, so we managed to stay on the lead lap, which is really important. And uh, yeah, then with the safety car, we 
close it up again. So really good on that one. The team was doing a good job. Uh, yeah, now hopefully the car keeps it alive until the end. And uh, let's see, hopefully we are on the top step after. Oh. One more try. Martin out there now with these last four hours to go in the race. Yeah, for sure you feel that uh, it's getting a bit old, uh, let's say. You feel it's a bit uh, more lazy on the steering wheel and also it's not uh, not that pointy anymore. But all good, the rest of the brakes are still really good. So, yeah, car is really fast yet now still and uh, hopefully we can keep up the pace. Thanks very much. I'll let you go have the rest. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it sounds like he needs it. Dylan Pereira with Louise Beckett down in the pit lane. Martin Haven with Alan Benish and Ollie Gavin in the commentary booth. And, and Ollie, four and a half hours to go. When do you start actually winning the race? You know, they always say the Indy 500 is 400 miles to stay on the lead lap and 100 miles to win it. Is this 23 hours to stay on the lead lap and an hour to try and win it? No, you, you're working away at it the whole time and you're trying to work yourself into a point of, of, of strength and you know, getting the strategy all lined up and right. And you know, all the engineers have been spending quite some time looking at the end of the race and working their way back, trying to you know, figure out, OK, how many more stints can we do? Which tires are going to line up? Which driver we're going to put in the car? You know, and, and watching the evolution of the track as well. And, you know, the, the engineers at this point are, are seriously stressed. You know, they are working all of the numbers. They're trying to make sure that they're getting the right tire in that oven, get it warm, but also getting those pressures right. Because they know if they make one tiny little slip with that, you're going to be sending their car out with the wrong pressures yep. and the performance of the car is going to go down. And the problem is we're at the end of a very tiring two weeks, mentally and physical, <laughs> physically, they're exhausted like we are, yeah. like like the mechanics are, like the team we just, is. We just actually just saw that with the Jota boys. Yeah. They sent, re they released the car and they still had the grounding cable attached to the right rear wheel and it pulled away and then the thing flew back into the pit box. Yeah. And it's all those little things yeah. that the boys are just tired. They're just starting to make a few little errors and mistakes. That's the sort of thing that Jota would be all over all day long. Yeah. But it's just, it's, been t it's tough. This race is just brutal, no, not only physically, but mentally. I was going to point out that unusually they did tyres, then fuel. Yeah, it's odd. Normally, the first thing that happens is the fuel hose goes on. As soon as it hits its marks, you, the, the mechanics scramble up it, clean the windscreen, clean the lights, all the other stuff. Maybe there was, uh, it was completely out of, sort of out of sequence and there was something else going on. But they had the tyres ready, so it wasn't an unexpected stop. And, and just tyres first, then fuel, because you're never going to do tyres only. That's not that's not a thing. Right. It's only ever going to be fuel only, and, and, and that's why fuel always goes in first, because whatever else you're doing, you always need fuel in it. It just, just I've, I, I can't think of a time I've ever seen that happen Yeah, before. maybe there was just a misunderstanding yeah. with what they were going to do. They weren't going to take tyres, and then they did, and it was all, yeah, I can't explain it either. Is the tent blown off our roof overnight? We're just looking down there on the right-hand side uh, of the Ford chicane from from the uh, helicam, and you can see I uh, can see the roof of our commentary booth, which should have a tent on the top. It's not our tent anyway, is it? No, it's not our tent. No, it's the studio for TV2 Denmark, but it, it didn't seem to be there in the heli shot. No, you're looking at the one next door. Ah, okay, right. Good. You're you're as tired as the engineers in Georgia, <laughs> champ. <laughs> see, yes, it's absolutely. even duff in the comms box. <laughs> James yeah. Collado getting ready. He's yeah. going to be going in next into the 51. Recent Competizioni's number 82 car and, and actually has dropped right down the order. It's now behind all the GT Pro cars. I don't think we're seeing that car no. again. And actually, just on GT Pro, um, the 51 car is some 45 seconds ahead of the, of the 63 Corvette mm. racing car, Nicky Katzberg. And before that last slow zone, Nicky was within 23, 24 seconds. But that slow zone wasn't uh, wasn't kind to Corvette Racing, and it's just stretched it out to 45 because Nicky came out on new tyres, and Comrade Gar is out there on on, a, on second stint tyres, and Nicky's not really been able to use that performance, and he's yeah. not really been able to edge much closer. And this has just been they've been sort of dancing around one another for the last oh, six, seven, eight hours. Love this shot. Look, looking down on the Joe Sport car, look how slow that is going. 
you know, with, with the width of the road, you've got a two-lane normal highway, and then you've got the big sort of side areas, and there's nothing to judge it by, and you're no. looking down, going at the same speed from that plan view. It looks like it's the easiest thing in the world. If you're in the passenger seat, you it's... would be absolutely terrified by the speed. It's so, so hard be. to convey. I yeah, you would, because you're a driver. I hate it. Even Mrs. Gavin terrifies you. <laughs> No comment. <laughs> not getting into any of that. It's daylight. Yes. It's no longer safe. Now, we, I, I, I was chatting to Alan a few minutes ago, uh, and I said possibly the most impressive thing about the Corvette being second at the moment is that they stayed in touch through what was quite a long, cool, dry night. Yes. When everybody else in GTE was using their nighttime tyre, the softest rubber that's available, and you were saying that's not an option for Corvette, but they still kept themselves in the hunt. Yes, they did, and, and I think the soft tyre that, that Corvette have for their car is is just quite a wide window. I mean, it's not. Mm. It, it's almost. It needs to be softer for them to really yeah. make use of it. And so I'm sure that that is something that they're feeding back to Michelin and working on. And so the evolution of that will come, hopefully, for next year. Right now, though, it's properly in the sweet spot. This is Nicky Katzberg going for another fastest race lap on that car in second place. He's got two green sectors, personal best in sector one and sector two. Has he got much traffic in front of him? Not sure he has in sector three, so... Four course yellow coming. Ah... Uh, 25 seconds. 25 seconds, there's Eduardo. So is this, do you think, to pick up debris? seconds. And... It, will, it will have reached critical mass. There would, there we, we saw that bit in Rouge. And so he will go full course yellow, and that allows all the marshals Ten, to get their nine, jobs list done. Eight, seven, six, five, oh, four, three, do you think Two, F course would bring the 51 one. car in? We are under full course yellow. We are under full mm. course yellow. Depends how long it stays out as well. And it also laps. depends how laps. many fresh sets it's got of tyres. It's done 14 laps. It's going to have so to come in. I think it's uh, it's Pretty a good time due. to do that for Ledgard. He's on the back. He's on the Mulsan straight coming out the first chicane. Yeah, that timing of that could be absolutely perfect for them and terrible for Corvette. Cause, cause Still Nicky's the fastest lap for yeah. Nicky, Cor <laughs> but, but Nicky in Corvette. He's just gone past the pits, so it's not yeah. an option for them. So they yeah. can't, they, if they could have dived in then to, to take advantage of that, but they, they couldn't. And uh, it looks like the, the opportunity's turned into the Ferrari's favour. Depends how long this is, though, because, uh, you know, they're still probably four minutes away from being towards the pits. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Francois Perodo is quite close, or sorry, I should say, in uh, GTE. Um, yeah, it's Francois Perodo that's in mm. the car at the moment. He's pretty close to coming towards uh, Porsche cars. And so definitely for him. And uh, then behind him, Ben Keating is about another two minutes back at pace car speed. Just saw a marshal there with a floppy from the Dunlop chicane. That might have been perhaps the piece of debris that triggered it if he's picked that up from the racetrack rather than from being out in the gravel trap. But you know, all, all the marshals post, every single one of them around will have, we've got a bit of debris here, we've got a bit of debris there, and there's a to-do list, and eventually yep. something will tip it over the edge and Eduardo will trigger full course yellow. I, I said that this is likely to happen a little while ago when we were looking at some of the other debris well, and oh, oh, somebody didn't get the memo that's the iron links number 80 car that's a really big error that's the car that lies in third with reno mastronardi that could have been the end of their race so iron links third and fourth 80 and 60 they've got two shots at a podium finish here they of course a lead with their Ferrari number 83. TF Sport at the moment, the Aston Martin in second place. The only thing potentially preventing a, a Ferrari clean sweep of GTE Am. And Ferrari for a long while were 1-2 in GTE Pro until Sam Bird had that high speed uh, tire explosion in the 52 car. And that dropped them, well, way, way out of contention and, and many laps back. Uh, we're talking about Francois Perodo there. He's just gone past the start finish, so it certainly wasn't a opportunity for them, even though they were pretty close to their pit window. Louise Beckett saying, is this doing anybody any favours? Well, if Toyota need-ish a pit I stop, they could duck in. But I think the 51 car is really the only one that I can see the Ferrari in, in GTE Pro. Yeah. If they can get themselves to the pit lane before this goes back to green, then there uh, would... 
for me, Perodo would have been an ideal yeah, one as well. Yeah, yeah. He was kind of is two thirds, uh, three quarters of the way through his stint. We're going going green in six seconds, so it was it may well have been communicated that it'll be a two or three minute full course yellow yeah. rather than a ten minute one. So Discord, yeah. yeah, we go green again. So the teams may well have had more information from race control. Uh, lots of cars shown have stopped. That's because they are going very slowly between sector beacon and sector beacon. So as soon as they go green and they speed up, they, then they will be reverted to the natural status. WRT coming in. OK. Well, that, that may have been forced on them. That's the car from second place, Yiffy Yi. He'd done 10 laps already at this point. And he'll stay in. So WRT first and second. You can see the list of retirements there. Down to the 98 Aston Martin, our first official retirement. It wasn't the first car that was out. 98, 99, number one. They've all gone. So getting ready for driver changes. Into your pole, Jakub Schmikowski comes down pit road. There is Kuba in the number 34 green and yellow car. And that car currently fifth place in LMP2. And Alan, this is one of the teams that came into Michelin Le Mans Cup, graduated to European Le Mans Series, stepped up onto the big stage this year in World Endurance. They are proof positive that the ladder that attracts people to come and race at Le Mans works well. Yeah, and they also as well, they have definitely stepped up this year, Martin, in the World Endurance Championship. They've definitely leapfrogged in terms of their performance, the way that they just generally present themselves. 51 on the pit line. Yeah, pro leader is in, Comledegar. Yes, they absolutely have. You know, they started four or five years ago racing in V2V. They learned their craft in, in that with LMP3 cars, brought LMP3 into Michelin Le Mans Cup, graduated to P2 in ELMS, and now P2 in the World Endurance Championship. And top five in a race as attritional as this one, I can't think of a time that I've seen that car off the road, and that's, you know, that's a really key indicator. Louis Delatraz takes over the 41 car, and Alan throws his hands up in disgust as he fails to notice the Dunlop chicane. And the 63 car is, is pitted as well in GTE Pro. Mm -hmm. Nicky Katzberg brings that car in, so they're just shadowing them right now. Yep. Brendan Hartley in, fuel goes in, driver's drinks bottle goes in, he stays in the car. It's an 11 lap stint by Hartley. Talking to um, Earl Bamber a couple of nights ago about the situation back home in New Zealand, the country locked down. He was saying Brendan and his wife are trying to get a slot to go home at Christmas and none are available. Brendan hasn't been home since the last lockdown, so a year since he's been home. Same deal for, for Earl as well. And uh, New Zealand, Australia, both in full lockdown, no in, no out. And there, there are only a limited number of slots available, even for professionals like, yeah. you know, like international racing drivers and world champions. Yeah, if you was, can't get a slot, yeah. you can't get a slot. Yeah, he was talking about that the other day and yep. just saying how tough it is. Yeah, really, really tough. You know, as, as Europe starts to open up, the US is, is open up. It's, uh, it's becoming very difficult. Louis says fuel only for 63, Nicky Katzberg, so he stays in. And, and you don't just have the option of throwing tyres at the car every single time you stop, Ollie. No. You've got a limited allocation, and, and it's deliberately so, not just on cost grounds, but also to help competition, meaning that teams have to think about what they're doing with their tyres. Completely. And, uh, you know, that was always going to be the plan, that uh, Nicky would, would do a second stint on these tyres, and then they'll be getting themselves lined up to, to seeing, OK, right, is, is Jordan going to go back in next, or is it Antonio next, or who are they going to put in for the finish? Am I Mm. My bet would be that they would, they would have Antonio finish. And, and does anybody still need to do time in the car? Have no, they all completed no. their minimum? I'm sure. And then what's the maximum that you can do, which is three hours in a go? So it, four no, hours... Four, four hours and any six, six hours. Four hours, hours and any six 14 hours, hours okay. total. So we've got four hours, 23 minutes. So after 24 minutes from now, you can put somebody in until the end of the race on driver time. That's as long as he hasn't already done more than two hours. Yeah. Yeah. Which, in, 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 in my experience with, with that car in particular, I've, I've seen Antonio be put in the car with sort of three hours and 37 minutes to go. Yes. <laughs> Suck it up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right, you might be the old bloke, but just get on with it. Yeah. Yeah. 
He's done a Sebring like that. He's done a Daytona like that. He's done a Watkins Glen. I mean, I, you know, I could go on. Yeah. I do go on. Is that because he had a lazy teammate who just didn't like driving the car much? <laughs> no. No? No, no, no. no. It's just, <laughs> you know, Antonio has just been, for many years, been absolutely hooked up in, in, yeah. with Corvette racing, and he just, he just delivers. Really does. We, we played guess the Corvette racing driver by their nationality during the night with Graham Goodwin. Surprising, you, you know, you think of it, it's America's sports car, it's an American team. You think of it as being predominantly populated by American drivers, but there's been some interesting nationalities who have driven. You know, how many French drivers have driven for Corvette? Yeah, well. A couple. Yes. Can you name them both? Uh, Manu Collard. And? And Simon Pagano. Oh, OK, so three. Well, who, who, who are you going to, who are you going to say then is the third? Frank Friel. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I know, I know. Yeah. I know. See, my, all of my intimacy with with the, with the Pratt and Miller operation goes back nearly 20 years to to, to the, the the early noughties and, and American Le Mans series. Uh, but uh, but then you know the random third drivers that come in, Max Pappis. Yeah, Who remembers it, that he was? I mean, he obviously does, but I don't remember that he was a Corvette driver on the endurance races, predominantly because it, it will less likely have been here and more likely have been in IMSA races. Yes. No, I did a, I did a, a Le Mans with Max, mm. and uh, he did a couple of couple of them with Ron and Johnny as well. So yep. Max was at least three, four years with the team. Early days, yeah. yeah. Yes, and again, Ron and Johnny O, and you know those were those were the early guys, yeah, weren't they? they, in the were, they were the They were the ones who were leading the charge, and yeah. Ron was the captain at that point, and he was the one who was, you know, charged with with sort of I don't know, educating me, and, okay. and you know. And, and you never felt the need to grow the tash as right, the team guys. leader. Who was oh, the Alan's first Brit in the room. to race for Corvette? Justin Bell. Wrong. Nah. Considering Andy Pilgrim. Room? Yay, I'll name that to Andy Pilgrim, yes. You see, now that caught me out <laughs> as well. Yeah, because now he carries the US flag. Yeah. 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 But born in Nottingham. Yeah. 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 You, you drove with him. Yeah, I know. That's how I know. Right. <laughs> I knew what, you it, it was a... I drove the, a, when he won the, no, no, I raced uh, the end of 1997 season in, in what was going to be IMSA. Ah. with Andy, uh, okay. with Roar, and then we raced for champion in a few races in 98. Yeah. That's it. Mathieu Vazivier remains in the Alpine. That is in third place. And then he went straight from there to Corvette, didn't he? <laughs> Sorry. No, no, if no, you no, can just, just hold on with the race. No, I was just documenting what's on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, then he went to Corvette, exactly. Yeah, exactly so. Yeah, no, that was one of the ones that, that, uh, that, that Graham uh, blindsided me with. I thought, I, I you know, I... Always in my head, because he lived and worked in the States, Andy Pilgrim was an American, even though he wasn't. So third and fourth have both just stopped. They're on outlaps, Mathieu Vazivier. Pipo Durrani has taken over the 708 Glickenhaus. So now that's really going to start to pick up speed, isn't it, Alan? Yep. But, uh, you know, this is a bit of a battle between the two of them. They're going to be very close towards the end. It's only going to be on the, yep. the final fuel stop, really, who picks this up, unless there is obviously a mistake between them. But, and, uh, and, yeah, and right now, he needs to do his, his lap times because yeah. he's not done his total driving time yeah. at the moment. But Durrani needs to get on with the program yeah. because he's behind. And right now, they're battling for third. Who's to say that the Toyota issues and both are carrying an issue are going to stay managed? Toyota aren't saying that. Don't, we, we're not worried. You know, they, they've got a, a fueling issue on both cars, and, and, you know, those are the sorts of things that don't fix themselves. No, they do have a five-lap advantage, so if you take that, they've got an 18-minute advantage. Mm -hmm. And so there's a little bit of comfort zone in there for Toyota's point of view and two cars at the front. But uh, definitely, it's a place on the podium, and both teams want it, yep. and neither team wants to lose it to the other. Yep. And uh, so from that perspective, it's important, because clearly uh, there's quite a lot of people from Alpine that are here and uh, looking at future and future programs potential and uh, Glickenhaus are here for the first time and he's very much looking for uh, the future and being on that podium at some point. Yeah, yeah. Philippe Signot there with the mask on and Andre Negrau in the cap. Philippe Signot has been uh, nominated to receive this year's Spirit of Le Mans Award. Richly deserved a man who last time he was here with the 36 Alpine they won in LMP2 didn't they a couple of years ago. Hugely emotional final lap for Nico Lapierre. How he got it round, sobbing as heavily as he was, goodness only knows. Triple seven under investigation for passing under yellows. 
sixth in category as well. They're mm. onto the front page of the timing screens. They had a lot of early issues and they are just creeping up slowly from behind. They are really just pushing on hard with that car. MC Proton 77 car is ahead of them in the category. There's a lap separating them, but again, any tiny issue can cost you a lot more than that. There is 708, Pipo Durrani. It's a fairly intense Jim Glickenhaus this weekend. He's always fairly garrulous and, and gregarious, but he has had kind of a slightly distant icy stare this weekend because this is what it's all been about, this whole program of two years developing this car nearly and, and getting ready for hypercar, seizing, seeing the opportunity, seizing the opportunity. As we talked about that, and pole engineering who, who have built all his cars previously, he knows them, they don't know Le Mans, they've never built a hypercar or a prototype like this before. You've got Pipo Moteur who build race, uh, rally cross and, and rally engines. They've never done an endurance engine before. Basically, they've they put a common crankshaft in two four-cylinder turbo rally engines and created a, a new power unit that's never run before this season. The whole deal, you know, you've got Sauber's wind tunnel trying to bring their Formula One experience to endurance racing. You've got the, the, the sort of the nous of, of some of the, the brains at Yoast trying to massage it into the right place. This is so many disparate elements that have never worked together, working together for the very first time and coming to Le Mans for the very first time. That's a, it's a big mountain to climb. Yeah, it certainly there is, but I think there's a lot of the elements in there that do have very good experience of what is the base points of requirement. You know, Sauber have been developing a lot of sports cars. or the, Their tunnel has developed a lot of sports cars in the past, I'll put it that way. And I uh, say Yoast have been involved in different programmes and also even the new people in Yoast have been involved in different programmes. The thing is, is about bringing it together to function as one team as opposed to necessarily bringing it to function as one car because uh, I think that's the harder part about it, and that's the area where um, you find out when things go wrong, when your you know, back's against the wall is how they fight out of it. The second Glickenhaus, this car, 709, has been sort of towards the bottom of the top 10 overall, almost from the beginning of the race. Mm -hmm. But actually, you look at the gaps, it's only a lap adrift. Again, it doesn't take much to go wrong in front, and suddenly 709, which has been sort of almost the forgotten one, could be there, it could be a threat. It's only a lap behind the battle for third, so that means effectively, with, what, four and a quarter hours to go, we actually don't have two cars, we really have three cars in the battle for third. Uh, you look at when you talk about a lap, it sounds like a long time, three minutes, 30 seconds, but if you get a puncture at Tetra Rouge, and you've got to come slowly yeah. back to the pits, then your lap's gone straight away. Tell you what, a lap, a lap here is a long way if you watch me trying to run it. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, a lap round Knock Hill's a long way trying to watch you yeah, trying yeah, to run yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just because you lap me at Fuji, that's not, that's not fair. Let's go into that. Um, Jose Maria Lopez and Brendan Harley, 1 2 overall and in the hypercar class for Toyota, and that's creeping out that gap a little bit. And then the battle for third, Alpine versus Glickenhaus. In fact, Alpine realistically versus the two Glickenhaus and Roman Dumas in 709. I mean, that's got, you know, both cars have got a really strong driver lineup. There's no question that they've got the will and, and the talent to put it on the podium. Whether they have the, the opportunity and the luck remains to be seen. Yeah, and uh, Dumas at the moment got his eye focused on 20 seconds up ahead where Stoffel van Dorn, and this is a battle for seventh place overall. Uh, it's not in the same category, but the P2 and the Hypercars are pretty close at the moment, generally. And uh, that's what I think is going to be the focal point for Roman Dumas at the moment. At the same time as well, fastest lap for the car, for Dragon Speed, second place in Pro Am in LMP2, twelfth uh, in category, but second in, in Pro Am. Ben Hanley is now nine seconds behind Esteban Garcia, and he's just on the car's fastest lap. So I think the Pro Am category is going to have a switch there uh, for the lead. Yup, Van Eitert leaving the pit lane. That car in 13th place in the LMP2 category and third in Pro-Am, so that is a Pro-Am podium spot at the moment. Real Teams Garcia, Dragon Speeds Hanley and Racing Team Netherlands Van Eitert. 
High Class and Graf Racing are fourth and fifth in the category, and they are uh, a lap and two laps behind Racing Team Netherlands. But the job is not done. Over four hours remain, still more than a sixth of the race distance. In fact, we've, we've got one ELMS race still to go, plus 12 minutes. Yeah, and that's um, that battle in GTE Pro between the 51 Ferrari and the 63 Corvette. James Collado in the Ferrari, Nicky Katzberg in the Corvette. It's, you know, sort of stabilised around about that 40 seconds. Yeah. And uh, we'll have to see if James can just stretch that out a little bit because he's on fresher tyres. Yes, and that, that was the thing. Again, Nicky is maintaining that that deficit to the to the Ferrari in front, despite the fact that his tyres are a stint older. Yeah. So again, you know, it's it, it, this can all come down to who has the best run on freshest tyres, maybe at the end of the race. Yeah. With 30 seconds in it, that can go either way still. And of course, Porsche third and fourth waiting to Ponce, aren't they? Yeah, they are. Not, not far, far off. behind, no, no, exactly. You know, looking at one car on the podium already, not not beyond the, any flights of fancy of Alexander Stelig and the crew that they could get both of them on there. Yeah, they had, had just haven't quite had that same amount of performance, have they, as the 63 mm. and the 51. Mm. But they are sort of just circulating, just shadowing a little. It's Ferrari 134 in GTE AM. It's only the TF Sport Aston Martin that is separating them from a current clean sweep. Iron Links Reno Mastronardi in third. Iron Links Paolo Roberti in fourth in the AM class. And AF Corsa's Francois Perodo leading in the 83 car in GTE AM. So Ben Keating at the wheel. Let's take a look at, at their relative performances. Francois Perodo last time round 355.8 and Ben Keating, 3.55.5. So very little to choose between them uh, in clear air and a clean track. Of course, you don't get clear air or a clean track at this time at Le Mans. It's how the traffic treats you a lot that, that makes a difference in your lap time as much as the driver's actual ability to, to perform in the car. You know, Ben Keating's averages have been really impressive. <laughs> really, really impressive. You know, almost on a par with Dylan Pereira. Uh, and, uh, and we, you know, I, we've been saying that for the last sort of 12, 18 months. He and Egidio Perfetti, and actually Francois Perodo as well, because now he's back in the Ferrari and not in an LMP2 car. He's, he's very much in the happy place. They really put it together in a race. They really do. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah. So Fraga, I think, will be finishing in the, uh, in the yeah. 33 TF Sport Aston. OK. On board with Jose Maria Lopez, our race leader by... How much is he in front? A lap, isn't it? Yeah. Is it a full lap now? Because the eight stopped before. Where's the eighth car on our plotter's guide? It's, yeah, it's about a quarter of a lap back. So the number one, uh, number seven car is leading with a little bit in hand. Yeah. Needs to be seen how much there previous issues trace them just working the traffic here coming down into the second chicane taking a nice toe off the united car and uh, sort of the car sort of seems to stall out at about 315 yeah. 320 kilometers an hour pretty slow really yeah <laughs> the average not much in terms of top speed difference between the hypercar and the fastest of the LMP2s, maybe four or five kilometers an hour, but it's how quickly they get, get there, there. Yeah. and how quickly they wipe it off as well that, that tends to make the difference. Mm. Certainly off of a corner like Tetra Rouge, which is a sort of medium high speed corner and they can really use that, that hybrid punch down. Come up to that speed quicker. Oh, down at Mulsan corner, kind of drifting his way through the turn there. Is that to be recommended on a radial racing tyre? He's making it work. Well, he is, isn't he? Yeah. I think now the seven crew, they've been the bridesmaids three years in a row, four years in a row now, and they definitely, definitely want to win this one. They are now starting to become quite... Well, not desperate, that's not the right word, but... I'm sure if you talk to them about it, there's that sort of steely glint and far away look. Yeah, absolutely. They can't come runners up here again to the number eight car. They just can't. A, it'll break their hearts, and, and B, it'll torpedo their championship challenge, I think. They've just got to somehow have luck on their side. 
Our AM leader is in pit lane, Francois Perodo, just scuttled in underneath our window. And so that car in for what should be, I think, routine service. And Ben Keating will close a little. Porsche pit stops as well in GTE Pro. Uh, Jimmy Bruni has taken over the 91 car, I think. I don't think he was in it just now. That's the car that's in fourth place. Kevin Estra was Richard Leach, wasn't it, in it before? Kevin Estra yeah. is in the 92 car, should be in. Here is 83, our GTE AM leader. One orange light on the side of the car. Again, thank you, Don Paynos, for that. That was something he introduced, the leader lights in the American Le Mans series. Before, you just sort of had to know the colour of the car and, and be able to hear the commentary. Now, even if you don't know what the car is or if you can't hear any loudspeakers, if it comes past with one coloured light on, you know it's leading whatever colour that class is. Yeah. Um, and here's the number seven car. Again, one light illuminated on the side of the Toyota. It's a red light, because those are the colours of Hypercar and were of LMP1. The top category, LMP2 blue. That's not Francois Perodo, that's a car late. Perodo stayed in, by the way. So it is. It's just fuel, I think, for that car. Yeah. Oh, no, he's going in the garage. No, he's not. No, he's not. <laughs> just, whoa, easy, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Didn't see the tyres waiting on the apron there, <laughs> get, but the get, car went up in the air. Someone massaged this man's back. He's a little bit stressed. OK, you know that cup of tea that you offered me earlier? <laughs> oh, oh, it's Duncan. Sh shouldn't you be working or something? Uh, well, he will, actually. Duncan will now get the kettle on, which is far more uh, suitable use of his slender skill set. 92, having a check over. Jimmy Bruni has left. Kevin Ash just stays in. Number seven on its way back out. Thankfully for Martin. <laughs> Thankfully for the Toyota team, you mean. <laughs> Your stress levels were through the roof there, Martin. Yeah. I d hadn't seen the tyres, and suddenly, pink the car pops up in the air. That's never a good thing. If you don't, don't notice that the team are ready... So, a set of tyres, but no driver change here for the 92 car. Kevin Estra is desperate to try and redeem himself after binning the car in Hyperpole, is this, is this a uh, roll of the dice to see if they can just try and close that gap and Kevin to do qualifying lap after qualifying lap? Yeah, it's a, it's a put me in, coach, put me in. I can do it, I know I can do it. You know, he's, I don't know how much time he's got left in, in, in the car and how much he can run, but, yeah. I think that's not a problem. You know, they've been very equidistant all the way through with all the driver time, so I don't think that's a particular issue. No, I was thinking more of the four hours in any six in the final six hours of the race, because he's already been in for at least a stint and we've got four hours to go, so he can't, I don't think he can stay in to the end. No. Physically, I don't think he can anyway, no, he but no, I, no, I no, think no, it's no. unrealistic, so... He has been very, very strong in that car, though. His averages are yeah, significantly better than, than the, uh, the guys in the, he's sharing the car with. Interesting little change going on at Iron Links in the number 80 car, Alan. Have a little scroll. When was the last time Callum Eilert was in the car? I sort of sense that he wasn't in during the night. I don't remember saying his name very often. That car's in third place and sticking in a young potential Grand Prix driver in the final four hours might give them a shot, perhaps, at winning this thing. They're a lap off the lead, or they're a lap behind the leader, and there is a 20-second gap from AF Corsa's 83 car to the 33 of TF Sport, the 80 Iron Links car, Calamila at the wheel. Yeah, that, that gap really closes up yeah. after the 83's just had that stop, and it's yeah. not until they cycle through again and the 83 comes in to uh, take it, its stop. Powder has been kept dry at G Drive as well. There's a very fresh looking Nick de Vries. And there's the uh, Duquesne engineering team. De Vries looks fresh faced and ready to rock and roll, doesn't he? Could be very entertaining. Good. Stoffel van Dorn in the 26 Jota Sport car. And in the G, uh, beg your pardon, uh, Stoffel van Dorn in the 28 Jota Sport car in 26. Roman Rusinov has how much of his six hour allocation has he actually completed? Does he step out of the car at the next stop and 
toss the ball to De Vries. Uh, Eilat's been in for quite a long time, oh, so has he? Okay. yeah, it's not uh, it's not as if he's been quiet on that. He's coming up actually to his six hours right now okay. in uh, five minutes. And who was the other person you were requesting Rusinov, information on, sir? How much more drive time does he need to complete? A 92 car. His pit stop is under investigation. He's done his time. Okay. So the next time the car, whoa! Next time the car stops, Roman Rusinov will step away from the machinery and give it to the hot shoes. This car is chasing, still the number 30 car. A Duquesne engineering car. It is a very noisy teaspoon. You're absolutely right, Louise Beckett. That, that's some shoddy work on the mechanical apparatus by Duncan Vincent. However, he has produced a cup of tea at the end of it, which is lovely. Do, do bear in mind that there are open microphones in the room, though, Doug. That's it. Hand signals will, will suffice. <laughs> in frustration, he clips Finley and McNeese around the back of the head. Probably deserved it. Yeah, well, yeah, just by sitting there. <laughs> Not making the cup of tea, I was thinking. Hang on a second. I, I don't... Carry on and talk amongst yourselves. It's all sort of stabilised a little bit here in most of the categories. Again, though, Nicky Katzberg is chasing James Collado, 40 seconds being the gap. And uh, it's not really going, it's no, just not budging, is it's, it? It's, 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 yeah, if anything, it's punch for punch. out a little bit at different points, but it kind of is, is, looks as if to me, Nicky's just hanging on more than necessarily able to make it into a, a full blown attack at the moment. Yeah. But you're there just in case. Yeah, they do need a little bit of help just to, just to get that gap down so they can get up on it. The other one I quite like is uh, TF Sport, Keating and Perodo. That's 19 seconds at the moment. Yeah, admittedly, they're a little bit off sync on yeah, stops. So. Yeah, I think that uh, 33 cars is a stop, so it well, does. It'll be in in uh, six laps time. Battle, right. battle we were just watching, Duquesne versus G-Drive. We're looking at those two cars. That's actually a three-way battle because the 38 Jota Sport car is only five seconds ahead of that. So you've got 38 in eighth, Duquesne's number 30 car in ninth, and in 10th place, the number 26 um, G-Drive car. So those three cars battling together, covered by seven seconds. Just having a little look, look at Stoffel van Dorn now, who's... Uh, he needs to finish his driving time in that Jota car. He's been quite weak in its... I come down to 37 seconds to Louis Delatraz. New fastest sector two of the race for Glickenhaus 708, the car that lies in fourth place. So Pipo Durrani finding some fresh air. Paul Lafargue in the pits for Edex Sport in seventh place in LMP2. And again, the 48 car in the first couple of hours was never out of the gravel traps, yeah, yeah. the red and black car. Uh, you know, like the Duquesne car, you thought, right, we're never going to see that car after darkness. If it makes it that far, it's still going. Well, I think if the conditions had continued in that same way, we wouldn't would, have, for sure. Wouldn't much of a race left, well, would no, we? Well, no, it's true. <laughs> but it's uh, on Nick de Vries, I think he's getting look, ready Look here. below his name. Look, oh, the camera's just zoomed in too far. Uh, just below his name, there's a little bit of white gaffer tape with world champion written on it, Enviro, oh, by nice. the team. So, yeah, very nice. Very nice. Very nice. So, formerly E, world champion. Right, some thoughts from Alan McNish. I'm going to enjoy my cup of tea. I'm not sure I've seen Nick de Vries looking younger since he was about 15. And some, and uh, we'll be joined by Graham Goodwin. Is that what happens when you win a world championship? You get younger. Yeah, eternally young. Eternally young. But, uh, yeah, at the front of the field, still Jose Maria Lopez there kind of able to eke out reasonable end stints now. The last one was actually 13 laps by Lopez, so it looks like uh, the seven has got no particular dramas. It's more the eight that's still bouncing around on stint lens. However, they are going long enough not to actually have any issues when they look behind in the five lap gap they've got to Alpine and Mathieu Xavier. Now that, that stint length sort of the problem that they've had with the, with the eight has been there all race, hasn't it? Uh, no. No, no, no. Nice. It's uh, it's arisen really this morning. Okay. Uh, they were Bohemi was the first one. It was actually the seven that was doing shorter stints. Yep. Sorry. And uh, then Bohemi did 13 laps up until it was uh, 15 hours, 16 hours into the race. 
Oh, right, OK. And so at 8 o'clock this morning, that's when it started to come through. And that's when Nakajima also so, mentioned yeah. it on the radio, talking that about was a, it. A, a vibration, though. It, it's a vibration, and they said it didn't feel right. Yeah. And uh, they said, yeah, we know we're monitoring it. And then about seven or eight laps later, they went in, and he came out, and he only did a nine-lap stint, and so then it went seven, five, four, three. So do you think that's like a fuel fee? Do you think that's just a...? I'm not an engineer. <laughs> I really don't know. I just know that clearly they're getting the fuel in the car, but the car the car isn't transmitting it to the engine. Sure. And uh, it's a slight misfire, maybe. Yeah. You know, maybe. I think if it was injectors or something, then they would have changed the bank sure. of injectors. Yeah, yeah. Uh, normally, in that situation, it's something with the lift pumps. Right. And uh, down what in the tank. is yeah, but it's usually at low fuel. You have that problem. Right. Yeah, yeah. And but they've been having a sort of. Uh, even at nine laps, which means that they've only done three or four laps. As right. we see the Toyota coming wide and aborting the corner, that's uh, Jose Maria Lopez in the lead car at the moment. He's got two minutes and 40 seconds of a gap, so he's clear. Here we are on board with it, comes through the left-hander, and he's playing with some buttons on the top of the wheel with his right index finger, as you see there, and uh, just aborts the corner. Yep. Yeah, that's Don't. been a bit of a theme, hasn't it, with a number of cars nice. just deciding to do that and just bail out of the right-hander at, at, at Dunlop. It would be, and you noted that some of them were doing it on the outlap consistently, Yeah, which is a lap that's not as easily monitored for lap time right. deltas, Yes, which is quite and I'm sure clever, that, uh, I have yeah, to say. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure Eduardo has made a note. And Several notes, I yes, think, fair to say. And uh, it will be pointed out. I'll be interested to know what's actually changing with this right index finger on the top because Lopez is doing a lot of changes at the moment. It seems, uh, certainly for the messages we've been getting back from the Toyota team, we know we've had the fuel feed issue with both cars, but the vibration only on one, we're told, only on the number eight. So it's, uh, that tends to indicate it's more than one problem for the number eight car. But it's not a vibration that is manifesting itself with fuel feed. Right. It's something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's interesting that he's, he was making a lot of changes. Velocity, yeah. yeah it, it, it depends. I honestly don't know what the button is, but I know that we used to have a system where we would we had multiple a rotary with multiple yep. positions yeah, and yeah. then you would get it to whatever you wanted you would click yes. it up to 15 times right. and then hit okay and that would confirm yes. so yeah. there was there was three things to change one setting right got you yeah and it could easily have been something like that yeah we had a similar thing with the corvette corvette in the pits yeah 64 car which is the one that uh, is kind of at the back of the hole field at the moment, Nick Tandy at the wheel of that car. That was an alternator problems overnight for the 64. Yeah, I went down to see my old crew chief, who's still the crew chief of the number 64 car, and, and he was just shaking his head with uh, their turn of luck in this particular race, certainly having the contact, just leaving the grid with uh, the 51 car, just ran at the back of the... It just it's, can't really explain it. It just... This 51 just drove in the back yeah. of it for some oh, we've bizarre seen, reason. We've seen video of it, and... Yeah. Uh, well, it did look to me as if uh, I can't recall who was aboard the Colado. Just, just didn't have. Wasn't looking. Up. Yeah, just wasn't looking. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So it was split a damage for the Ferrari, and it's just a damage for the Corvette. Yeah, and it's unravelled from there for that car. And um, but fortunately, the 63 is uh, carrying the charge for Corvette Racing. Nicky Katzberg is, he's actually just set his personal best in that second sector. Yeah. That lead is for still 41 seconds. James Collado just metronomic and it, just, it, ah, just... It looked at one point as if that was on and then it's kind of sort of eked away again. Yeah. There's still a European Le Mans series, an Asian Le Mans series race to go, though. Three hours, 54 minutes remain in the... 2021. Yeah, 24 hours all of these teams will be sitting there looking at, you know, who we're going to be putting in next and who we're going to be finishing with and, okay, what sets of tyres we've got now from now to the end, you know, what tyres they're going to have in the ovens, what the engineer's thinking about for fuel loads and stint lengths, all those sorts of things. Uh, that's It's going to come to the business end of this race. So where are all the battles live at the moment? Rusinov is chasing hard on Rennie Binder. That looks like that's going to be a change fairly soon. That's uh, under half a second through the last time he'd been for Rusinov behind Binder. That's for ninth in LMP2, 14th overall. Is that Roman Rusinov? Yeah, I, I, I checked earlier and he's got his name on his helmet. 
So uh, that helped, that saved all that confusion. I, I know it was very confusing it for you was. earlier on in the it race. Was. Yeah. But you've, you, your reading skills have it's, sort of it's, come back. It's because of my confusion with things. I, I'm so grateful to be in the booth with such legends as you and Alan. You know, and I've not won them on. Have you been here before? I have been here once or twice. <laughs> but uh, where else have we got those battles? Well, Jimmy Bruni pushing on, but uh, is dropping off Kevin Estrep. We saw that battle underway, and eventually uh, the team making it yeah, pretty clear. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, the 92 car has been the faster of the two Porsches for sure throughout this whole race, and Kevin Estrep in particular has been stand out. Panis Racing, the 65 car, fourth in LMP2. They've been there and thereabouts, Alan, throughout this race. They're coming off a, a first win in the European Le Mans series. It's Julian Canal at the moment at the wheel of that car. Not immediately a threat to Stoffel van Dorn ahead, and certainly comfortably ahead of Alex Brundle. That seemed remarkably, again, in the fifth position. Uh, but uh, this has been a, a big step up again for Panis Racing. They certainly have been strong, uh, much, much stronger. We spoke about it earlier on, Graham. Just uh, as a general point, they've stepped up, I think, a lot in the last two years, but uh, they've run cleanly through the whole week. They've been competitive through the whole week as well. You know, we have to remember that they were uh, one of the last teams to switch across from uh, to, or to the Orica, I should say, and so it's taken a little bit of time maybe to get up to speed in terms of the nuances of that particular chassis and how it works in such a close combat. But I think as well with the change of tyres this year, it's had a reset for a lot of teams and it's allowed them to sort of to make a step forward. But yes, they've been very, very good. Excellent stuff from the 65 crew. Also been looking after, of course, the 24 car, the PR1 Matteson car that had troubles with oil leak overnight. The Goodyear blimp that isn't a blimp, it's a Zeppelin. icon of world motorsport been great to see that back over the last 12 months so still those two wrt oricas ferdinand habsburg from louis delatraz that gap a minute and 15 seconds for the lead in lmp2 and they've led and led comfortably through the night into the morning the threats from behind have sort of dematerialized Alan yeah they've dissipated they've really di dissipated it's only really the Jota sport car 28 uh, Stoffel van Dorn that even if they do trip up that can I think uh, pick up something from them and uh, they've been very very dominant really from about midnight when they kind of got into the position and uh, then solidified it but Partly because everybody else has dropped the ball at one point or another. Absolutely, it's right. not that they've just driven off into the distance. They have been very strong performance-wise, but uh, they haven't really had any issues, and uh, that's allowed them. They had most of their issues, funnily enough, was in the first hour yeah. when they disappeared backwards in terms of uh, their position in LMP2. They were nowhere, but uh, it was Jota that was at the front, and uh, then every team has had a problem, a mistake, or something, and uh, WRT are there at the moment four hours from the end. Kitty Pro in the 63 car has been much the quicker through and more consistent through the 24 hours of Le Mans so far. Oli? Nicky Katzberg behind the wheel there. He's been the gun, hasn't he? He's running the full crack there on his visor. The visor fully open, which is the Nicky Katzberg full crack setup. <laughs> As opposed to? Well, there's, if you bring it down, it'd then be just the half crack. Or a yeah. quarter crack. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's this. It's this level of searing professional analysis uh, we look for. To be honest with you, I really am disappointed I never drove for Corvette. I'd love to be in your debriefs. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. How does the car forget that? Just look at his visor setup. Whoa. And he's That's got a sticker on the, the top. The level of detail that Nicky goes to with his visor setup. Two hypercars on pit lane at the moment, so Brendan Hart brings in the, the number eight car from second overall. Three minutes or so back. Uh, it is Pipa Durrani at the moment, the fastest lap of the race for the fourth place car, the 708 Clickenhouse. The sister car running in seventh overall behind those two, two uh, Team WRT Oricas. The fastest, uh, so it is uh, on pit lane with Roman Dumas. We're on board now with Kevin Est. 
lead of the two factory Porsches, but only third. And he's three and a half minutes back from that. Uh, you ride on Corvette. This is the eight car, and it's not. It's no, not going right. anywhere. No, they are. Yeah, but there is some information coming from the engineering and they're waiting on confirmation. The chap with his head pointing in is looking to see visual feedback from some engineers that are looking at laptops. Yeah, they're frantically working it now, crunching the numbers. OK, so just to, while we're watching this, and there's attention going on yeah. in it, the... Uh, it seems like they were changing a box, some sort yeah. of control unit. Away he goes. It's uh, slightly might shorter stint. So therefore, it might have been changing the box and then having to do the reboot of the whole system. Absolutely. And yeah. you'd be waiting for that reboot, reboot because when you do a master reset, it doesn't automatically just, it's like a computer. It doesn't just automatically start up and then yeah. you're ready to go. You That's have to wait until yeah. it's activated all the systems. And then as well with the gap they've got, I would suspect they would then want to actually have a check of the key criteria to see yeah, talk if it's, back and forth to one another. Yeah, yep. and also to make sure that if whatever it is they're looking at uh, actually has got the connection and yeah. or better. Cost a, a minute uh, in pit lane, two minutes on pit lane for that. That has allowed the Alpine to take back one of the laps. It was in arrears to the number eight car at that point, but uh, still three laps to the good over the first of non Toyotas. I mean, if, there was, if, if there was ever you know any chance that the eight was going to going to win or going to beat the sister car without the sister car having a, a massive problem it's, it's now all gone hasn't it's, it it, it, yeah. it does seem to be just increasingly troubled so the alpine five laps down on the leader three laps down on the second place car and somewhere in the middle there it's around four laps on yeah. countback isn't it with the first of the glicken house uh, going quickly again in the hands of Pippa Durrani, two and a half minutes back from the Alpine. That's the top four. Before we then get into uh, LMP2 territory, fifth, sixth, and seventh at the moment with that uh, latest pit stop for the Glickenhaus, the two WRT cars, with the 41 on pit road now in the hands of Louis Delatraz. So in GT Pro, James Collado has just set the fastest lap of the race for, for the 51 Ferrari. They're looking to nail that in, aren't they? It's, yeah, uh, and it's 42 seconds the gap now to Katzberg in the 63 Corvette. So it's Gustavo Menezes in the pit box at Glickenhaus. He's the resting driver of the seven. Uh, did race the car earlier this season. Of course, was a key part of the Rebellion team last year. We'll get Peugeot next year. But, yep. uh, not on driving duty, but in GT Pro, there's sort of a message I think being delivered here, which is we're good. Yes, I mean, and they are. I mean, that's the thing. They, of course, are an unbelievably well-drilled team, and it, it, the Ferrari is, is a phenomenal machine. And uh, it's got to be something special that's going to have to come from the 63 car to, to close that gap in these next three hours and 45 minutes. Into Europol, in and out of the pits, Alex Brundle with the fifth-place car in LMP2. Uh, that was a regular pit stop. Panis races, Racing is in. G-Drive Racing are in. And uh, hearing from Louise in the pits, Nick De Vries is stepping aboard. So our, our latest world champion of many in this field, Nick De Vries, and the first world champion in, world driver's champion in Formula E, now a full FIA World Championship, is about to get in for his latest stint in the 26 car. That car, a little way down the field, in the top 10, for LMB2, but that's not what this team were looking for here, the Aris Zero One. Lost a car overnight with nasty accident for Riri Andrade, losing the car out of Turn 1 and heavily into the barriers. But, um, looking for where the next move is going to come. Look at that GTM battle. Ben Keating is wheeling in Francois Perodo. How far has he got left on this stint for the 33 car, Alan? Because that's what he's tended to do is get close, get close, get close, pit. Yeah, they're, the pendulum is beginning yeah, I think to swing. Perodo is definitely, in my view, has got the advantage. Um, it, and it is exactly as you say, he's got, yeah. two, you know, one 
lap longer before he has to pit, and that's the, the issue is that he's on the wrong side of the pit yep. strategy. OK, so hearing from Louise around the number eight car, the connected the umbilical uh, cable to change settings on the car. And to cost them about, what, 30, 40 seconds on a regular pit stop for... But I bet you, you're right, Alan, it was a, it was a full system shutdown, yep. reset, connection, check everything, make sure everything's up and running, send it. Good look at the 708 car, the hands of Pippa Durrani. And whatever happens the rest of this race, it's been an impressive debut for the little team that could. Both the cars running and running well. Conscious, by the way, that we didn't finish that run through the official retirements a little earlier because uh, some drama or other intervened uh, when Martin Haven was wielding the marker of doom. So to go through that for anybody that's joining us this morning, we currently have officially uh, 48 cars running, now 47 cars running, with the news breaking now that the official retirement of the 24 PR1 Matteson car, that has gone. The other cars... Um, double yellow at MP11. Right. Rinaldi racing at MP11. So right. uh, just hold on to your marker of doom there for a second. <laughs> Rinaldi racing. It's been through the gravel a few times and it looks on an outlap as well. As uh, we are on board with eight. That has also Brendan Hartley decided to do the, the special alternative, the, will... the short lap. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Joke and so while we're waiting to see whether or not there are dramas uh, worthy of our intervention slow in this process, yeah. there's a slow zone coming for what will be recovery of the 388. No, no 388 has got moving again. Okay, it's so now on its way down towards the second chicane, so I presume the slow zone is going to be due to uh, a mass of gravel. OK. Well, while we're waiting for that to all emerge, class by class, uh, all five hypercars still running, top four. Plus, currently running in eighth position at our five, and there you go, Whoa. it is Conrad and Debris there. Now, who's that come off? With That's, that's going to be the Rinaldi car, isn't it? And that's been in the wall. It's gone in the wall, it's got itself out, it's dragged all that debris. That's going to require quite a lot of clean-up there, isn't it? That's, that's not a nice place to have to do that job. No. And as always, thank you, thank you, thank you to the marshals out there, keeping everybody out there safe, allowing this race to progress as well as it does, year in, year out, and other races around the world. It's been a tough year for the marshalling community. Did we see a replay of the incident? No, we yeah, haven't. No, we've not seen oh, yeah. that. So, so it kind of uh, looks like he went in far too hot, skidded across the gravel yeah. and nosed uh, into the other side. I'll interrupt myself if we do see that, Alan, but Martin Haven is wielding the marker of doom. Let's go through um, class by class. No retirements in the five-car hypercar. <laughs> 24 uh, is confirmed as a retirement. That's a car that's had a repeated oil leak. That's the PR1 uh, Madison car. Uh, the number one car was the Sophia Flourish car that uh, was first hit by the 26. I think was out of control. Uh, then the... OK, we're going to go... Uh, before we go down that, because uh, it, traditionally we interrupt this with something, uh, down to Louise Beckett in the pits, who has Roman Rusinov with her. Roman, you've brought in the 26 Street G Drive, handed over to world champion Nick De Vries. Uh, How's your Le Mans? You're not looking too happy, I have to say. Yeah, you know, it's quite uh, it's quite difficult one because we have uh, Franco Colapinto who crashed in the beginning of the race. We lost, so I have to repair the car. Uh, we lost probably 20, 25 minutes. And I was just try to drive and recover, but yeah, way too far. Yeah. Tough work for you. Yeah, you know, it's like, uh, it's hard because I think if we would not be crashing, we should be leading now by far, you know, because the car is fast. Uh, the guys, the team is doing a good job. Yeah, fortunately, Franco crashed at the beginning. So, yeah, what we can do. All right, thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks very much indeed to Louise and to Roman. And uh, as Martin Haver reminds me, actually, as there, there is the, reco the recovering uh, 
Rinaldi car and damaged the rear, the rear wing hanging off that car as well. Uh, that uh, the four safety car periods we've had so far, 50% of them brought out. There's trouble for the Jota car coming into the slow zone. That's not, that's the Lickenhaus getting it wrong, isn't it? Oh. Lickenhaus getting it very long because you saw the yellow flag behind there that was waving. That's a 709, so that is Roman Duma at the wheel. That could be a penalty coming there, should be a penalty coming there. Uh, two of the four uh, safety car periods brought out by G Drive cars. One was the impact with Sophia Flourish, the other one, Rui Andrade's whoopsie. But going back to the marker of Doomfest, 25 um, is gone. Uh, the Edex Sport car didn't start, of course, the 17. 25 was Rui Andrade on the run up to Dunlop. 24, we think mechanical oil leak uh, PR1, they're gone. And uh, next in the order, the 32 car. That was the United Autosports car of Manuel Maldonado that harpooned the sister 23 car up at Dunlop. 82, uh, recent retirement with engine trouble. We saw that car pulling off and into the pits. Holly Jarvis at the wheel of the Rizzi Competizione car. That's gone into GTE Pro. And the one car I don't think I saw retire, that was a Hub Auto racing car. That, I believe, was Gearbox Electronics for that car. Car has gone, 72. 79, the other privateer entry in GT Pro for a Porsche. That was the WeatherTech racing car. That was accident damage after Cooper Mitting lost the car in the Forge chicane. Then we get into GTE Am that's had a lot of attrition. Numerically, the first was the Team Project War 146 car. And uh, that car, I think, was suspension, uh, suspension damage. Chetelar Racing, an accident overnight for the 47 car, limited, eliminated that car. 55, the Spirit of Race car, that car, as we see the 388 going into the garage. Now, it might be lucky that that could be more superficial than it looks to the 388. 55 car, Matt Griffin stopping uh, just after Tete Rouge, and the car going no further. The 56 car, another accident I didn't see, but that was a Digidio Profetti. Uh, off with that car, 57. Clutch went on that car, the 57 car. JMW Motorsports uh, involved in an incident with an LMP2 car, got the car back, but then the car grinded to a halt as it left the pit lane, went no further. And uh, we're waiting for, uh, well, we're not going to say which cars they are, but uh, Mark Martin working on a bit of a bingo uh, four in a line here. And there's still lots of time to go. So that basically covers off. Uh, well, we've got 47 cars still running. Oh, apologies, more to come. The 98 car, that was Marcus Gomez down at Indianapolis into the barriers hard. The 99 car suffered repeated suspension issues, and finally, the Multimatic crude uh, Proton effort decided that was the end of the day. Garage doors down for the 99. That completes the Marker of Doom parade. Martin can go and have a cup of coffee more happily now. So, with that slow zone... Maciuvac Xavier into the pits from third place. And uh, the headlights got a big hole, big in, hole it. in it, yeah. And uh, just looking outside, there's dark clouds on their way again. You see the sunshine, it looks like, out the right-hand door of Xavier, but actually there's big dark clouds all the way around here. Ollie. Yeah, I've just been outside, out of the booth, and there is some pretty Ooh. chunky dark clouds around. Are we going to get another twist in the tail with the uh, with the weather? Well, we did have weather forecasts uh, yesterday that uh, we might expect some light to moderate rain towards the end of this race. It's a little earlier than I think we were expecting, though. Yeah. I had the inclination it was closer to kind of 2 2 30 that was expected, but you're right, it's gone very dark again. Pretty sure nearly every single team would not welcome the rain. Uh, not at this point, no. But off again goes the Alpine, third position. Mathieu Vazavier also back out and running Pipa Dorani in the 708 Glickenhaus. In and out for the WRT leading car in LMP2, fifth overall. Freddy Habsburg is aboard that car. And uh, other stoppers, the Duquesne. Orica, the real team racing car that led Pro-Am for so, so long. And double yellows and slow zone now removed. We're back to full green flag running. Racing team Netherlands also. 
um, in and out. So it's Norman Nato with something like five minutes on the third place car. I think that was, was that Thomas Laurent in the um, Alpine garage? I think it was. There's Philippe Senior. It's a 36 car making its way through rapidly. Past the scene of the incident for the Rinaldi car. And that is one of, well, I think it's the only running car that's currently in the pits. We know the 82 car is gone. We know that the 24 car is gone, and as I say, that 22 United Autosports car of Fabio Scherer pits. Replay. Oh, big lock up. Is that Jose Maria Lopez? Yeah, this is Jose Maria Lopez quite a while ago. And it was a big lock up down into Mulsan. Managed to keep it out of the gravel. Let's have a listen into what's going on in the number seven Tota. No need to save anymore. No need to save anymore. As you prefer. Okay, copy. No need to save. They've had a couple of new misses. Uh, I, don't, I think there's no need to save, but there's no need to push. And this particular point yeah. was, I think, fuel saving they were talking about. Or brake. It was one or the other, it was fuel or brake. So they must have been critical on one pit particular parameter. Well, it's only looking at the amount of brake dust that's coming out of the rear wheels at every single stop, every time they change wheels. Yep. So it could well be brakes. That might be why they're shifting the brake balance forward and then having the locking as well right. into Mulsan at you. the end of the braking yeah. area. Yeah, that up now. Yeah, when the... Aero comes off. Mm -hmm. Well, the Glickenhaus is just behind the number seven here. And this is the lead car, of course. Chita Lopez looking to finally put to the sword just a run of bad luck here. That this crew has suffered. Is it going to happen for them? Through Ted Rouge on to the Mulzan. Looking rock solid at the moment. <laughs> so he catches the Dragon's Peak car. Sorry, it's just, just laughing at Darren's dancing in the back of the booth. Well, yes. <laughs> Is that what it was? <laughs> yes, I think so. I thought he needed medical intervention. It was dad dancing. Another half hour about to be in the books. Three and a half hours remain. rhythm of this race, <coughs> gentlemen. Where are the dramas to come, do we think? The rain. If it rains, there's a massive amount of drama potentially to come. Other dramas is there is... I would sort of get the feeling there's a twist in the tail somewhere. I don't know where it's going to come yep. from, but we're going to see a car going slowly along the side of the Mulsanne. It's got that feeling, and isn't it? Or a puncture or something. I know you shouldn't be biased, but I... I do hope it's not the number seven this year because I've seen it too many times and I know the pain of being in that position as I'm sure Ollie and Darren do as well where you think it's just in your hand and then it slips away and it's like it's sands of time, yeah. you just can't get them back. Uh, but um, there's a twist in the tail yet, there's still three and a half hours to go and three and a half hours if it rains is... Like a long a, time. Yeah, a long, long time. Or two Grand Prix distances, we'll put it like that. Absolutely. Thanks so much for your latest contributions, Alan McNish. We're going to be joined... A driver change. Darren is coming in. Absolutely. Darren Turner and Ollie Gavin, it will be for the next period. We're along with and me, Graham. Alan was just trying to steal Darren's coffee. <laughs> yeah. Which, which Darren's getting quite upset about. Is Alan he, has returned it. He has? Yes. All it is good in the hood. It's OK. Now. He's, got his, he's got his initials on it, so... I don't know what Alan thought DT stood for, but we could maybe do an internet competition on that one. <laughs> Answer sort of postcard. Absolutely. So I tend to agree, guys. It has got that feel of drama still to come. There's the seven car again, and it's he hits that corner. On, on this That's like acceleration, he's got the drive, and then it stops. And, he, he's and then not, gets going again. Yeah. So uh, I wonder if there's a, a slight issue with with the car accelerating from very low speed that you, you experienced there at, at Mulsanne. twice in succession he's done something at Mulsanne. He's Mulsanne, not got yes. that right. Nearly ran into the back of the 84 innovative car. 
That car, by the way, running in 30-second position overall. It was like he was caught out by yeah. whatever they were doing, but it, yes, he was coming in hot. Yeah. And it was just like, okay, we just wind it back a touch. Pushing. They certainly can afford to do that right now, can't they? Just to yeah. just peg it just a little bit. Gives you Nine tenths is good enough. I, I mean, as you know, Darren, when you do wind it back a touch, though, you can lose that rhythm. Yes. And maybe yeah. that's what they're asking him to do, is just to wind it back. And, and, and it's just thrown his references off. He's just not in that same racing rhythm that he's had for... Yeah. You know, all the seven or eight hours he's been driving the car. You should maybe at some point during this broadcast take us through those times when doing that has lost your race to each other. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly can remember being asked to to wind it back and and then You're calling him an ass. No, <laughs> <laughs> well, not on air. <laughs> if I mute my mic, maybe. But I can remember um, being asked. Uh, I think it was in the early stages of the of the DBR9, maybe year two, three, something like that, around 2006, maybe. And being asked just to just to back off a little bit, um, and the rhythm went from the braking zones yeah. into the into the into the chicanes, both chicanes and Molsan, and it was it was uncomfortable. You know, you're only backing off maybe a second or two from the actual pace that you would naturally want to drive at, uh, but suddenly all the rhythm went, the downshifts went with yeah. the way that you were using the sequential, and it was it was just more comfortable and more. Uh, like e or it's easier to drive at that point by is that muscle memory what is it what is I think it's everything and also just just the, the the frequency the car is running at it just works you know suddenly when you're trying to slow everything down especially with a sequential gear shift it just starts to just not feel as nice after and doing it for so many laps you really do fall into a rhythm and you get to recognize what are the natural frequencies of the downshift, yep. of how the brake pedal feels, of how you're going to turn the wheel and, and how all the load is going to be transferred within the car. And if all of a sudden that starts to change and you're, you're you know, changing one of those parameters, then it can really just throw you off because you've got so used to it all, now you're doing something different. It's like, well, uh, 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 and you just, it's almost like you just lost a bit of calibration. I, I, I'm a firm believer that motorsport is made to look easy by television, and pretty clearly the physicality, and as well as that, the the mental pressure that comes through uh, any race, and particularly an endurance oh, race. Yeah, that, that, extreme. And that, and that is what is going to build in these next three hours, is the, the mental pressure that is going to build on these finishing drivers, particularly in the classes like the, the GTE Pro and the GTE Am uh, battles. It's really, really going to come down to the mental strength of those finishing drivers and also the mental strength of the engineers to make sure that they give the car to those drivers prepared correctly and, and with the tyres absolutely, you know, to the, 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 they're the right tyre, the right pressures, temperatures, everything, so that they can just drive out of the pits and fight immediately. Looking still for where these battles are coming in comes the lead car from GTE Pro. We now know, by the way, this class as this year and next year at the moment yeah. in the plans. And then we are done. And gentlemen, both of you have been a huge part of the history of and a fantastic history of this class in recent years. And it's delivered again here with all three makes providing the entertainments. We'll miss it. Yeah, that's why I'm, I'm a little confused by, you know, because it, it works. Yeah, it's a it's brilliant racing and it, it creates so much drama. And it's really, you know, every single year, these teams come back and they absolutely deliver with their driver lineups, with their team, the car preparation, the teams, the strategies that they run, how close it is, the BOP. It's all, it, it works. It so does. Why are we changing it? Well, we continue that debate in a moment. The 63 car, uh, which is second, Nicky Katzberg pulls into its pit stall, 30 seconds behind uh, James Collado. So. To, to catch up with what's been announced so far, the full plan not yet uh, revealed or indeed decided, but GTE Pro and GTM will continue into 2022. It then looks set to be GTE AM only for 23 before a transition the following year. And you're about to tell me. Nicky's staying on board, which I then think that they will have Antonio in the car to do the rest of the race okay. once he's finished this stint stuff out comes the Ferrari and about 30 seconds behind will follow the Corvette it'll then transition to some form of oh. GT3 platform and what was that Ollie they, they hadn't 
that I think Nicky had started the car and they hadn't taken the, um, the grounding wire off of the rear wheel and they couldn't touch the car again until he turned the, the, ah, the engine off. Right, let's have a look at what that's affected in terms of pit stop times. It was a 1.22 on pit lane for James Collado. Four seconds quicker for Corvette, despite that marginal issue. So 1.18, so four seconds gained in the pits there. So to complete the story, uh, as to what we know so far, there are still conversations to be had with rule makers and manufacturers, but at the moment the clear intention is that some form of GT3-based platform will replace GTE in 2024. And yeah. the intention is that there will not be a pro class. Yes, and I, well, I, I, think, I think that the, you know, the GT3 layout is absolutely fine, and I think that all of these teams would love to, love to run those cars, but I still think you can run pro, pro cars. cars. Yeah, I don't think that the platform, if it's GTE or GT3, is, is so much the problem. It's having a pro lineup um, and then having something that distinguishes the two classes between the AM yeah. and the pro. In terms of the, the manufacturers, there's not that many manufacturers that are committed to GTE, so you're always going to have limited groups. It works, it does work, you know, the cars are great and everything else, but when you look at what cars are on the grid at the moment in, uh, in pro, for you've only got the Corvette and the Porsche. Uh, and Ferrari this this year. So, you know, there's been years when there's had, you know, very, very Six. strong grids yeah. here with Ford and Aston also in the pro mix. I, mean, I think I worked out earlier this year, 37 different individual GTE cars will have raced by the end of the Le Mans 24 hours this year. Uh, or some of them just racing once, it's fair to say, but there's 37 cars available globally for the platforms that allow that to happen. That's the IMSA Weather Tech Sports Car Championship. It's the European Le Mans Series, the WEC, and of course, uh, the Blue Ribbon event here at uh, the Le Mans 24 Hours. It's, it's a sad reality that it's going. It's clearly a knock-on effect of the manufacturers, or some of the manufacturers shifting their attention to hypercar. Yeah. And that two of the critical manufacturers involved there, Ferrari and Porsche, uh, are clearly shifting their factory emphasis to that. And all of a sudden, that does leave yeah. just basically one chip left on the table, and that is Corvette. And there's only so much of a budget these manufacturers have got that they can put towards motor racing Absolutely. programs. So if they're moving away from GT into LMDH um, right. and hypercars, then the GT platform needs to be something that is affordable. Yeah, it's like a busy pit lane there as a seven car comes in and needs to be put on the dollies to be shifted around the number 20 high-class racing car. It's a driver change. Yeah, Lopez uh, has got out, but um, it's, it's like it's a surprise. Yeah. And um, Mike maybe wasn't quite ready because he wasn't there immediately. I it's wonder unusual. if the, the bigger surprise was that the 20 car was going to be there and uh, the usual slick choreography wasn't quite there was it 20s uh, got away by the way so the lead car came in the hands of Jose Maria Lopez that completed 317 laps and uh, did they go with tires as well I don't think they did tires so, yeah. yeah that's not uh, so common is it to to uh, have a driver change without yeah. swapping the tires at the same time it's unusual Maybe I guess uh, they could be putting Mike back in just as Lopez was having a few struggles out there. Uh, yeah. Just yeah. to see where the car is at right now. Yeah, maybe. So this, I think this this means that uh, Mike will do the next couple and maybe they'll put Kobayashi in to finish. Yep, that would seem about right. They've been, I think, doubling or has it been trebling through? Difficult to tell with these shorter stints, but... Uh... Yeah, it's... Um... Unusual. Didn't, didn't short cut the uh, down option came this time. <laughs> <laughs> All got a, bit, a little bit spa 24 hours there for a while, didn't it? Yes, it Nick, did. Nick De Vries, fastest lap time of the race so far in the 26 G Drive racing car. We heard slightly put out Roman Rusinov, recognise him from his helmet. Uh, 3.31.851, and Nick De Vries is working a 25 second gap to Ant Davidson ahead. Uh, one world champion, 2021 Formula E, working on another, 2014 WC. So did I, I must have missed something then with car 26 earlier on. 
have I? Uh, 26 had two significant uh, incidents. Uh, one was the uh, the shunt with uh, Sophia Flush. Yes, yeah. And yeah. the other was Roman Rusinov running up the back of another car from the. Oh, that was that with Jan, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, okay, right. Uh, but, but nothing recently? No. Right. And then we've got uh, Brendan Hartley on board here, and he is also uh, messing around with the buttons. Well, not messing around, but he's pressing the buttons on the top of the steering wheel, and I think we think that that is brake bias yeah. that they're working with, and they're, they're maybe managing brake performance. And from the moment these cars hit the track in Spa in the WEC, braking was clearly an issue for them there, and whether or not that was just learning the car in race conditions, whether or not there were issues on the car, we're unlikely to establish firmly. But it does seem to me they're managing that, they're having to manage that. It's deeper into any race conditions. They're all new cars, remember, the Totas and the Glickenhaus. The Alpine uh, rather more understood platform, albeit not in the spec it's presented here, heavier, less powerful. 48 car, D-Deck Sports, uh, was in trouble early in the race. And we've also got on pit lane now the GTM leader, Francois Perodo. Is that going to be Francois's last stint? Is it going to be out and out? We'll have, we'll have a quick to go. look at that uh, strategy uh, lap top and see whether or not he's completed his required six hours. Um, they are working their way through all of this. Ben Keating still aboard the TF Sport car. was 65 seconds back as Francois came through. And I think, well, certainly will take the lead here. But as... I think David Addison was saying a little earlier. Unless he comes in the pits. Uh, no, he's, I think he's on a different, slightly different strategy. In comes number eight car from second in the hands of Brendan Hartley. Four and a half minutes back from the lead car. Uh, the time he passes the blend line. Francois has definitely done a double stint there, so uh, it could be that's him done and dusted now. Yeah, through goes Ben Keating to complete the lap and take the lead for the time being at the very least in the TF Sports 33 car. It's been a long, long battle between these, but this pair, 83 and 33. And ben Keating and Francois Brodo, firm supporters of international endurance racing. Francois and the AF Corsa team doing both the WEC and the ELMS this year. Ben Keating racing wherever he's got the time to, whether it's an IMSA racing in a P2 car or a GT car, a WC in the GT car. Very good drivers, both of them. Francois already a WC champion. He's replaced by Alessio Rivera. Yeah, the tyre change there for the number eight. Yep. The Rivera being very quick indeed. Away goes number eight. Pulled away on the electric power and then yeah. it fired up the uh, IC engine. Down towards the pit out. Here comes the Alpine. There's 36 car still in third position and three laps back from the second Toyota. Two minutes ahead, less five seconds, or a minute and 55 seconds ahead of Piva Durrani. And lapping just a little quicker last time round than the Glickenhaus. The 708 car is the car in contention for a podium position. Nick De Vries is pressing on in the 26 car. He's uh, done another personal best in sector one. Uh, you know, he has been through this stint, certainly lighting up the timing screens with, with improvements. Yep. Fast laps have gone away for a while. To remind ourselves, fastest lap of the race came on lap 60 from Brendan Hartley in the number eight Toyota, 327.607. It was like there wasn't really a happy hour this morning. It was, it was bits and pieces. We had some, yeah. we, we had some, uh, some LMP2 times that were coming in as I came back to the booth that were pretty impressive. Also wrote, saw Roman Dumas in the uh, the more tardy of the two Glickenhaus, running seventh at the moment with a 3.29 for that car. Became very impressive indeed that deep into the race and a car that we think is running a pretty conservative strategy. Yeah, it's just not been as pacey as the, no. the sister car, has it? Not had that same turn of speed. Uh, Nick De Vries is clearly listening to us because he's just pulling two blue sectors and is about to improve subject to traffic. The lap time on the board from the 26 car, the g Drive racing car, still chasing and Davidson hard, 22 seconds the gap now. Tristan Gomondi behind both of those two cars and just 20 seconds back too. So looming battles. 
This could be a 31, a 331 from De Vries if he's uh, able to get a clear run to the end of the lap, which is mightily impressive to be putting that sort of lap time in at this stage of the, of the race. Yeah, 20 hours in. He did look very fresh just before he got in. Pumped up. I wonder if he's had a double espresso. De Vries, piling pressure on here, and Davidson ahead. 38 Joe Dakar. We heard a little earlier from Louise in the pits with um, Hignett in 38 car pits now, so that possession will go unless Nick De Vries is on an inlap, which I pretty certainly isn't. But uh, it was the run through the gravel, and they believe it was uh, one of the stones picked up in the gravel that uh, put a hole in the oil filter for the 38. That was the big delay for Chota Sport. Another driver pumping in some uh, reasonably quick uh, times, so both in the pro. We've got Estra, a 48.3 right now, and then further down the field, Sam Bird has just done the fastest lap for 52 with a 48.4, so both of those cars within a tenth of each other as they, uh, as they knock in their fastest laps for those cars at this stage of the race. De Vries didn't improve his time. There's a couple of tenths in that. Uh, it's a slower uh, final sector, but he has taken the 13th position with the Jota car. Uh, on pit lane now for what is a scheduled stop for the 38. And that battle at the front of GTE Pro between the 51 Ferrari and the 63 Corvette is uh, st still around that 30 second mark and it's just hovering around there. Copy. Copy, comes in now. Now let's go down immediately to uh, Louise in the pit who's got Jose Maria Lopez. Lou. Maria Lopez, the number seven, has been running well since the start of this race. Uh, some issues along the way? Uh, yeah, uh, he hasn't been exactly the, the most smooth time so far, but yeah, we're dealing with some fuel flow issues. We sorted out, but we, we have to do, in order to control a, a lot of things in the car while driving, which makes things uh, yeah, complicated. So let's let's hope we cross finger that everything everything goes around. Uh, we I know your focus is on the seven, but the eight is having similar things. So is it it's the same issue for both cars? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's the same issue in both cars. But as I say, uh, likely we, we we found a, a way to to deal it, and uh, yeah, we, we hope we can we can manage until the end. Yeah. How are you finding that communication between the drivers then to, I believe you probably had to be brief before you got in the car and how to deal with it? Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, we are adapting, you know. Um, of course, I stay a bit longer in the car because I was used to do the procedure. Mike now is going to take a bit, but yeah, we try to communicate all the time and, and, and make things, you know, happen. So more than ever is a is teamwork, yeah, for sure. Was Mike expected to get into the car then? Because it seemed a little bit of a surprise at that pit stop. Uh, yeah, I was supposed to stay one more stint on the car, but yeah, finally. We, we decided just in case of a safety car or something, uh, my time in the car was quite long already, so we decided last minute, yeah. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much to uh, Pichito Lopez. Excellent stuff from Lou. Thank you very much for that. Well, that told us a lot um, in not telling us some things. He was, they're clearly worried. Yeah, well, he's been uh, obviously very well briefed to uh, and what to do in the car, but then also what to say out of it, <laughs> you know, because he's really not telling us that no. much. But that they're explains obviously the, They're obviously concerned, aren't they? That explains the situation we saw down at Molsan when he had a slow pull away yep. out of uh, Molsan just behind the LMP2 traffic that suddenly and, just dropped a lot of. And also uh, that act, all that action on, on the on the wheel, yes. you know, with the buttons. Uh, there's action the on the wheel with the buttons. Also the pit stop that looked a little bit clumsy. That yep. uh, there was a late decision. That should there be, to explain what uh, Jose Maria was talking about there. There was a maximum time you're allowed to be in the car. Three hours allowed in the car. Four hours. Four hours six. in the car. Um, the, uh, and what that was all about was Jose Maria explaining that had he been caught with a safety car, they might have been pushed into making a pit stop they didn't need, need to make. To, yeah. So why make that? Why uh, risk that? They made the driver change at that point. Yes. Damaged the rear left of that 91 car, which I'd not spotted before. 
That's not as it came from the factory. The inner wheel arch is still there, so yeah. I, I don't think it'd be affecting the car too like badly. Somewhere, isn't it? Yeah, someone's giving him a, a little uh, love tap. It's a driver change there. Out came Jean Maria Bruni. It's quite high up, though. You know, normally the damage yeah. is down lower where the splitter is. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just trying to think what what car could be that high at the rear or at the front that would be able to Alpine. Yes, yeah, yeah. And there is uh, a hole in the front of the headlight on the Alpine. Uh -huh. So, they're guilty. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I think we can conclude that, Your Honour. Absolutely. Honor, and uh, <laughs> move Place on. Close. <laughs> yeah. We've got the microphone. There you go. Uh, Pippa Durrani on a quick lap at the moment. Two blue sectors for the 708 car. A minute and 53 seconds back from the Alpine. Is this going to be a fastest race lap for that or for both? Uh, Click and House, have they saved something for the final three hours? Quick Sectors 2 coming in from both United Autosports 23 car, Alex Lynn, and Paul Lepshata from the Edex Sport 48. So, again, some pacey stuff coming through. Kevin Estra also flying at the moment. We're seeing a lot of faster sectors in uh, Sector 1 and Sector 2, but not really seeing much ping up on, on Sector 3, so... Uh, um, is there some, something on the track somewhere, or is it something...? Or they've all found a little bit of extra... Uh, yeah, extra tarmac <laughs> in Sector 1 and Sector 2. It yeah. was a slower uh, final sector from Pippa Durrani, so 3.32.1. No closing in on that lap, at least, on the 36 car. Oh, there you go. Just as I said, that Roman has done a, a fast sector in the, in the 709 Glickenhaus in sector three. Well, it's a 3.29.8 for that car, which at the moment is the quicker of the two cars. Do wonder whether or not they're trying some things on the uh, the 709. It's possible. It certainly is. It makes a lot of sense at this stage, doesn't it? There is nothing much to lose there. No, and it's uh, it's in seventh at the moment. It's got a half a chance of uh, of moving up to fifth, possibly. Well, it's about to move up to six, six because yeah. it's five and a half seconds back, and it is six seconds quicker that time around. So we'll keep an eye on progress for both of the Glickenhaus cars. Say it again. We are twenty-one hours into this race and both those cars are running and running well i'm so surprised uh, I at the hyper car uh, just the five of them all five of them it's a massive credit to the people behind these programs i mean i really did think when the when we had the heavy rain at the beginning that this race could easily go to an lmp2 car oh, absolutely um just to be a last man standing well, at one point yeah, wasn't it yeah. really? well, two things one is the numbers it's only five yeah. two is they're new and we did have those changeable weather conditions which threw up all sorts of challenges for them and it's absolutely to their credit to their credit to team wrt's credit to stay out of the troubles that we saw it's been a wretched day i'm afraid of two days for united autosports two cars in trouble in one accident yeah it was a, that was particularly up at the dunlop chicane was yeah. uh, just a bit of a perfect storm really Manuel Maldonado losing the car through the gravel and harpooning the sister car yeah, Fastest, if you're Paul Resta. Absolutely. What? Two, two. Um, some good news for United. Two cars posting their fastest laps of race, race at the same time there. And, but this possibly reflects the fortunes of United Autosports. Fastest time for the 23 car is a 3.34.081. At the same time, the G-Drive Racing Arabest, the 26 of Nick DeVries, does the same, but a 3.31. 0.435 is their fastest lap of the race. That's a big gap yeah. in performance. Is that 2.6 seconds between them? Yeah, um, that 23 car, I'm pretty certain, is the car that had a replacement engine before the race. Uh, they've been feeling it's been down on power for most of the week. Yeah, you can sort of see with, with Roman Rusinov, he was very upset when he got out of the car for his last time. Sort of, He, he kind of knows that they've got a very fast car underneath them. And this is an opportunity missed, but you know those conditions were just absolutely, you know, they were a nightmare, and the track was treacherous, and it just so happened that their youngest, most inexperienced driver was in the car at that time. So, and uh, we called him out. But we never saw the start of it, did we? We just saw it was yeah. slightly out of control. Yeah, yeah, we just saw the, 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 the onboard from control yeah, from Sofia. 
and uh, yeah, so we don't really have the full story. Um, but yeah, it's uh, very difficult. So closing in on the end of the 21st hour. And, uh, moves still being made just to get these cars into position to attack in these last three hours. Team WRT. Pit as the 709 goes through to sixth position, Darren. Yeah. Is that as high as it's been since the opening stint? I, it's not far off it. I, I don't think we've got to the point since the, the mayhem that we've had all five at the top. I don't think we ever got no. there. Because it's got close to it and then had to pit and uh, cycles back down. But Louis Delatraz is in the car and will stay aboard the 41 car. So it just looks like fuel. Swiss flag proudly on the side of the helmets for Louis. Another family weekend out here with his father, 10 times Le Mans starter and ex Le Mans racer Louis uh, Delatraz's father, Jean Denis Delatraz, raced with this same team in the Road to Le Mans race, or races, Thursday and again uh, on Saturday morning. We're closing in, by the way, on another change back to the David Anderson next in the, always say the big chair, the one with the more complicated buttons. <laughs> I didn't know that was the picture. I didn't know there's a hierarchy in here. There's no hierarchy. Okay, right. <laughs> You're in charge, Darren. Oh, yeah, can you imagine that? With the exception of myself, we literally are all winners. <laughs> and uh, we also have a change in pit lane as Nick DeVries pits after an uh, excellent stint in the 26 car. And it's the Becks of the Posh and Becks of pit lane. Duncan Vincent will be joining us. Or the Alley McCoist, should we say? <laughs> <laughs> He's upset about that one. Yes. Which means I've done my job, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and you do it so well. Yeah, you Absolutely. are. You are so good at it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, that's an impressive time there by Alex. You know, it was only a lap ago that he put the fastest time 34 in plus, yeah. with the uh, United Auto Sports 23, and that was a 34.1. Now it's another second faster. A 33, so Alex has got the, got the hammer down now. I think they are sniffing the possibility of an attack on Alex Brundle ahead, who's just been in and out. That gap is about 30 seconds. In this inter Europe all competition team, the 34 squad, I think they've had two fifth positions in the WC this season. I think they'd like something a bit better this time. Palace Racing also in, Julian Canal. But you think after that contact at turn two, to bring the car up, his fight is obviously in six now, but to bring it into the fight for fifth yep. will be super impressive. Flying back by the team. Julian Canal, by the way, that uh, has something in common with both of you gentlemen here at Le Mans, and that uh, he's a GT1 class winner here. Ah, yes. With in a Corvette. With uh, no, Labre. No, I think I th was he in the was he in the Labre Celine the last year? I'm pretty certain he's had two GTM wins and uh, a GT1 win. Right. I'm going to check it now. I'm, now. I'm now feeling vulnerable because you both look confused. <laughs> no, 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 this, my, this is my normal face. No change there. <laughs> no, not, not at all. <laughs> Super slow-mo of the 65 car, another team that's been in rich fame of form. Duncan in the pits that uh, the Clicken House is on pit road and it will be Ryan Briscoe to take over from Roman Dumas who's had a very quick stint. It's the fastest lap of the race for the sister Clicken House as we about to have that switch over. 330.251 for Pipo Durrani trying to put the Alpine under pressure and uh, I'll hand over to Darren Turner, who's going to tell you a little bit about uh, what's going on on screen while we just do a little bit of unclipping of things and clipping in of the dulcet, silky tones of David Anderson. I was just looking at the, uh, the stint time there by Roman. Um, he's been in the car for a quadruple stint, you know, 13 laps each go for the 709. That's a, a fairly long time in the car. Um, so I'm guessing he is now completely done for this race and it's going to be uh, Ryan Briscoe to, to drive that car to maybe to the flag or it could be another swap with uh, Westbrook uh, for the very last stint uh, before we get into the, uh, into the final hour. 
Um, but yeah, Roman's done a, a solid job there in the 709 um, as he's been chasing down both the both the uh, team WRT cars. Mike Conway just starting another wonderful lap in the Toyota around this circuit. And he's obviously having to deal with this fuel issue that both cars are, are struggling with, uh, but it doesn't seem to be slowing them down too much. I mean, they're both circulate, circulating around the, the 330, 332 marker. Here's the running order as we get into the 22nd hour of the uh, 2021 uh, Le Mans 24 hours. 323 laps for the lead Toyota. Uh, one lap behind now, the number eight car, the sister car, 36 car, the Alpine uh, third, with two minutes uh, advantage on the first of the Glickenhouses. Team WRT still in 1-2, 31 from 41, with the second Glickenhaus between them and the third place car the Jota 28 car. LMP2 Pro-Am is Dragon Speed from Real Team from Racing Team Nederland. That's the 1, 2, 3, 16th through 18th. GT Pro, which has doled out yet more entertainment. James Gallardo in the 51A, of course. A Ferrari leads from the cor chasing Corvette of Nicky Katzberg, the 63 car, then the two Porsches. Michael Christensen in the 92 leading the team car in the 91 of Richard Leitz. GT Am, 26th place for the leading uh, TF Sports Aston Martin Ben Keating at the wheel of that car the 33 car and he heads Alessia Rivera by just 14 seconds with Rivera closing in again in the 83 AF quarter car in terms of the provisional podium positions it's kind of alert at the moment aboard the number 80 Iron Lynx Ferrari and he is a further three and a half minutes back and welcome back to the booth David Addison uh, Graham thank you it's uh a familiar order, but with a bigger gap between the two, isn't it? Toyota's still first and second, but the pendulum has very much swung number seven's way. But from what I understand, they're both still having to manage these problems, and, and they're not going as far on a, t on a, a stint anymore, on a tank of fuel. No, and uh, that's... Well, were they not... Uh, were they under rather more pressure at the moment from the yeah. Alpine? We heard, I, I think, some pretty worried tones uh, in uh, Luis's interview just now with Pachita Lopez. <sighs> They're managing it. Yeah. They think they've got the, a handle on it, but the tone is not one of excitement. It's one of trepidation. And how many times at this race have we seen and heard those kind of situations coming to a head in the last three hours, two hours, one hour, 25 minutes? So is, is, are the cars not picking up the fuel, or is it the, the dispenser not being able to tell how much is going in? Fuel pickup is what we're right. hearing for both cars. Right. And uh, it seems to be... Uh, fuel pickup for both cars, and that is uh, does appear to be the same problem, and a vibration as well for the number eight car. Mm. Which they've had for a while, haven't they? They've had for a long time, yeah. through the night, in fact. Yeah. And if you have a look at Brendan's last stint, they've been an 11 laps, a 10 lap, an 8 lap, and now um, it's currently 5, so we should really keep an eye on, on car rate right to see how far they can push this particular one, and that gives us a good indication if the problem is stabilised, if they've yeah, found yeah. A, a real fix yep. to be able to go and stretch the stint a bit longer, or if this one ends up even shorter, yeah, exactly. then they really yeah. do have a problem. Seven cars certainly has been the more stable in terms of its recent uh, pit stop cycles, as uh, I'm looking, timing and scoring, and Massimo Vazafier puts in the fastest lap of the race for the Alpine, a 3.29.454. We're looking at one of the pit stops here for the WRT car. This is the 31. Why are we looking at that? There's obviously concern around that left front. There's a problem. They haven't changed the rears. They've only changed the fronts. Mm, OK. Right, He's on an out lap. And number 70, apparently, is smoking on the circuit. So car 70, which is the real-time uh, real car. Esteban Garcia, like Duval, Norman Nato, that car's got a problem. That car, long, long time leader of the Pro Am mm. class mm. in LMB2. Fine stuff overnight by Esteban Garcia, and that would be bitter goal. Should that be a problem, manifests itself with so, a delay? Well, he's on his outlap at the moment, so uh, yeah, maybe yeah. they've just dumped a load of oil in the car, and it's, it's something like that, you know, they've done an oil dump. Uh, bitter goal, um, you're right, if it's smoking, it should be bitter goal was. Thank God you're here. <laughs> he lied. 
Go on, well, cigarettes. French cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this is really interesting. Something, something going on here. <laughs> something, something, well, filter not, something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For years, Ligier has always had um, uh, Gitan and then Gorwell's backing. But uh, <clears throat> into the pits has come eight, and Brendan Hartley on. So what was that? Eleven laps? No, no. six laps. Six. Seven, yeah, six. Uh, we are on only six. Right. So in other words, the number eight stints are getting shorter. Is that what yes. we're saying? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, if that's right. So it's right. gone from 11 to 10 to 8, and now this one is only six laps, so... Right. So okay. a looming crisis for Toyota here for the second car. Well, the stints are getting shorter and shorter. How short will they ultimately become before well, it has to go to the garage? The, the problem is, is can they fix it in the garage? If yeah. it's something in the fuel tank, that's a major issue for them. But it's increasingly pointing at pickup, isn't it? And now we've got rain being reported just when you thought you couldn't have anything else. Rain reported at Marshall's posts 25 to 27. Yep. Darren said it was going to be a lovely day. He did indeed. <laughs> a lovely morning. Yeah. Said, oh, a lovely okay, morning. Okay. Okay. So, and indeed, the wiper is on briefly there on the 36 car as Nicola Pierre prepares to get aboard. So the weather's coming in from, uh, where's that, down at Indianapolis is the first place they're going to start to see the... Uh, yeah. Clouds are moving across quickly, Darren, as you look over the, uh, the Porsche Experience Centre. Uh, the clouds are coming in reasonably quickly, so there's high winds up there. And that's both good and bad. Bad because they're coming, good because they'll move through quickly. Number 36 Alpine is expected in this time as well, as through the traffic tries to come Mathieu Vesivier, who was in the gravel yesterday evening. He's being held up a little bit by 86 Porsche there. The GR racing car, Michael Wainwright, the patron at the wheel of it, and in bails the Alpine then. So on cue, into the pits comes Vesivier. And Nicola Lapierre is going to take that car over. So in it comes. And that's still in its fight, isn't it, with the Glicken House of Pipo Durrani? Effectively, with just under three hours to go. And 7.09 Glickenhaus, even though it's seventh, it's inching up into the reckoning, isn't it? It is. It's coming back and showing more pace at this stage of the race than it did through the night. So maybe a little bit more confidence now. They've been managing, we know, um, the brake issues we saw at Monza through the race. That mm. seems to have been very successful indeed, despite, uh, it has to be said, fair amount of cynicism on that front. They've done a great job on it. I can house. Uh, well, you know, eight hours, we've had a brake change yeah, yeah, at yeah, Monza. No. Here I we mean, are, 21 hours into the race and not required. They're both still going. They've not yeah. had a plethora of problems. Nope. There are more experienced teams that have been in more strife. I think they've Absolutely. done an outstanding job. Uh, in has come the Alpine. Now, that car is three laps behind Toyota number eight. And they've got just under three hours to go. So can they salvage anything other than a third here at best for Alpine. If the Toyota's problems get worse and worse and worse, there's a, there's a chance, isn't there? Yeah. I mean, they, can't, they can't get to a point, for example, where Toyota are only able to do two or three laps between pit stops. Well, I mean, if, if the problem is getting worse and the, and the fix is actually uh, pulling the, the engine out and getting into the fuel tank and etc., then, yeah, there could be a, a lot of pit stops for that car eight all the way to the end of the yeah. race now. So uh, you never know. Alpine could suddenly uh, claw those three laps back if uh, if that becomes the, the situation for, for car eight. And at what point does a growing problem become a critical problem? Mm. It's something working less well gradually. So what's a, a number eight pit stop? The last one was a minute and 22. Yep. A lap is... Three and a half minutes. Times three. Yes. Divide that by the number of pit by, by a pit stop nine. time. So it's needing to make nine pit stops yeah. to give the Alpine a chance of second place. Which uh, would be dramatic, to say the least. Or fewer, longer pit stops. Correct. Yes. Right, we'll keep monitoring it. Number 63 is about to be taken over by Antonio Garcia because Nick Katzberg is set to bring it in. This is 7.08 then, so as the Alpine leaves, this is Pipo Durrani. And the Alpine, for the moment, has cemented that third place because it's kept it on that round of pit stops. It's come in, it's served the stop, and it's gone again before 7.08 comes in. So the Alpine, as it was a few hours ago, when Olivier Pla had that mysteriously modest stint, yep. it started to cement third place and just edge away. Yes. And uh, I, I do think a lot of the explanation here is they're cleaning the car. 
Uh, the, whatever happens, the body work here is going on the wall in the garage at Clickenhouse, mm, isn't you it? You think so, yes. But yeah. uh, it's, it's a, an effort that's been a huge amount of pride over. I have to say, my flabber is ghasted that his, both cars are, are still going. I didn't expect them to get to, to midnight and for them to have not only kept going, but with so few dramas and to be both within the top seven. I think they've done an outstanding job. Well, I hope what this does do is it, I hope it piques the interest of other challenger brands that shows that you can do something mm. uh, that's, it's, you know, I'm not saying it's not complicated. Of course it's complicated, but it's not as complicated as developing a four-wheel drive hybrid uh, hypercar. Mm. It is effectively an old-fashioned sort of hypercar. It's got a very efficient, very powerful engine in the back. It's two-wheel drive. Uh, this is, it's almost a, a, a throwback to something more 60s, 70s. Mm. Um, you know, Jimmy's not going to be giving us terribly many figures, but he tells us that uh, the cost of doing this uh, is pretty comparable to closer to an LMDH budget than is an LMDH budget for the okay. big factories looking at it. Might this sell a couple of cars? It might. You want to come and be competitive at Le Mans next year, where are you going to go? Who are you going to go and buy, buy something from? So I think he's got one already that uh, has been sold, which was from Goodwood, because the car... Uh, Roman Dumas took it up the hill back in July, and it uh, was quite impressive. Still got the Goodwood stickers on the side of the car, indeed. Mm. And, um, and by the way, Jim, should you uh, be looking in and be in the marketplace for a road version of this car, um, he will, uh, they will build one of these for you with up to 1,500 horsepower. OK. And uh, that means you can get to and from Tesco Metro remarkably rapidly of an evening. I think Briscoe's got that 1,500 horsepower right now. He's <laughs> closing in pretty rapidly into uh, Team WRT uh, car 41. That's dropped down. I mean, he's, he's charging in at four seconds a lap at this stage. So I don't think it's going to be too long before before he swaps back from seventh to sixth position. And uh, But again, he's going to do that just at the point where he gets to have to pit the car, isn't he? Mm. So Anthony Davidson goes through, still kicking himself for the incident last night. Hold his hands up to it. 13th overall, 8th in class, 9th in class. Nick De Vries behind him. You can see that gap 12 seconds when they last went over the timing line. But for Jota, I think Louise made the point to Sam Hignett earlier on in the race. It's bittersweet yet again. One car good, one in strife. But yep. uh, they are still both going. And of course, for the championship, Graham, of which this is a round, of which this is a double point scoring round, getting to the end, ka -ching, points, ka -ching, It all helps at the end of the year. And better still, by the way, for Jota, one of the two WRT uh, cars is invisible for points because it's not a full season WC entry so they're effectively in points terms it's two times second place uh, for their efforts there a thoughtful Roman Rusinov what one out of the two WRT isn't for the points for the championship uh, the the it's the leading car the 31 is the it's a WC car right Uh, certainly 28 Jota is closing in and it's not that far away is it it's less no. than a minute from uh, from car 41 and they've been quite savvy here haven't they Jota they've kept Stoffel van Dorner in towards the end of the race to exploit him at the very end yep and that could be uh, a real cracker in this race that might be there's always seems to be one doesn't there it, it's seldom for a win in a significant class although it has been in recent years yeah, yeah, with yeah. GT Pro but quite often, there's podium places up for grabs at the end of this race, and that's the one that seems to be looming. Mm, indeed. The threat of rain seems to have uh, disappeared at this moment. Yes, we've not heard very much more about that. I've sort of said it, hopefully that's the thing that... It's going to bring it back. Bring it yeah, back, yeah. Normally when you say, it's all gone terribly calm now, yeah. something suddenly appears in a gravel bed. Great. One other significant point to mention that's just appeared on timing and scoring, and it's because a car has been greyed out for the first time and the 388 Rinaldi car is retired. Right, that was the one that had its damage a little while ago, wasn't first it? First chicane yeah. on uh, the Renaudier. So the 388 Rinaldi Racing's debut at the... 24 hours of Le Mans is over, and uh, that's a real shame. Pierre Rettig was at the wheel of the car when it had the incident. And Ben Keating with the TF Sport Aston Martin Vantage GTE has pitted. So I'm, I'm guessing now that is definitely Ben's running done for this right, race. We'll have a quick look at that. It can't be far uh, off, can it? Yeah, and uh, I'm sure he'd be relieved to to be jumping out of the car and also knowing that he's done a great job. Hugely competitive run from the 33. Impressive from them. Leader in as well, just whilst Graham's doing some number crunching. That is Mike Conway that's brought the leading car 
in. Uh, also in has come Anders Fjordback in number 49, the Fjordback Magnussen uh, Pere Fies car. And that's currently 32nd overall as number seven is waved away. So purely fuel, keep it on that set of tyres, but therefore enables that car to uh, save time in the pits, double stint the tyres. Can we have a quick look at the uh, stint for car seven? Because I think that wasn't particularly long either. Uh, uh, for look Conway, he, he wasn't... He... Ten laps oh, on was ten. seven. Right, yep. okay. okay. So that's doing better than eight. It yeah. is. So managing the problem is the euphemism, isn't it? And they are doing so, but they've they've only brought that stint down by about a lap or two. Sorry, issue. Issue. Sorry. Not the problem. Sorry, forgive issue. me. Forgive me. <laughs> I, I lapsed into English, not PR speak for uh, a minute there. Ben Keating still needs to do another stint. Does he? He does. Right. So five hours and thirty-four minutes, if my laptop is to be believed. And looking a little further down for where we can find Francois Perodo, uh, because he's the other critical piece in the jigsaw here. Uh, Francois has completed his drive time, right. okay. so that's Strive. advantage to the Ferrari without a shadow of a doubt. And that battle, Lesia Rivera at the moment, pounding around and taking time out of that battle. That I think that is the pendulum firmly swinging towards the 83 car, the chrome and road dirt uh, liveried. Uh, it does look glorious, does that yes. car? Really yeah. glorious. So Ferrari's therefore, as they have really since it's about midnight, leading both classes as far as GT is concerned. Absolutely. Who waved the starters flag? Yeah, <laughs> it would be that Ferrari guy, wouldn't it? And uh, just asking for a friend. And we're welcoming them back, of course, to the top class of sports car racing at Le Mans with a factory entry for the first time in what is it? 50 years? Something like that. I think it's yes. 50 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the time we get to 23, I think it was 1973. The last time there was a factory entry, and in terms of a, a, a car in the top class. Well, if you count GP. G, G, well, you can't, yes, so 98, 99, yeah. something like that. So it's an enormous story for motorsport, an absolutely yeah. enormous story for motorsport, and part of a, a growing tidal wave of interest in this that we're going we're gonna to be talking about and writing about for years to come here. And we're seeing the very first iteration of that with this battle between these four cars and going quicker already. Nicolapia, a fastest lap of the race for the Alpine, Darren, a 3.28.994. These cars have still got pace. They're putting the pressure on. I wonder if the Alpine have, have, have smelt the blood in the water mm. with Toyota and have, have turned it up knowing that they can put the pressure on. It's uh, the last roll of the dice, isn't it? Yeah, They've really got to do is. it now. Yeah, and uh, if they can keep that pace up, then anything can happen uh, well, for that. I'd say the second place uh, position on, on the podium. So. Uh, yeah. Um, if Toyota continue to have these short stints for car eight, then uh, Alpine really do have a chance. On what lap was the last pit stop for number eight? Because it's on lap 326 now, isn't it? Uh, that's a quick look at that. Sorry, there, it, has, it has done 326, it's on 327. So number eight has only done three laps uh, on this, this stint. stint. Right, and, okay. Uh, the last stint it did was six laps. Exactly. Eight before that, ten before yeah. that, eleven. It's coming down. So my point is that now we need to start focusing on this because if it's going to be even shorter again, they're in real trouble. We know they're in strife. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. And at some point, I think you're right, David. They're either going to be able to fix it or not. It's then a matter of how quickly they can fix it, if they can fix it, and whether or not they've got the time to fix it with the three laps advantage they've got. Well, that's it, isn't it? The three-lap buffer. They're, they're not yet with the backs against the wall, no. but 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 it could head that way. Gatsper brings in the number 63. Corvette, and that's increasingly looking like a lost battle at this stage of the race with the number 51 AF Corsa car. James Gallardo leads the race 54 seconds ahead at the point at which the pit stop began. It's Garcia in the car now, Garcia. is it? Garcia, yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, we were told that. Uh, remember, now, uh, Ollie told us that that was looking set to be the strategy for them. Antonio Garcia, long-standing, very successful member of this Corvette racing crew, the Spaniard, with his helmet commemorating his racing hero, Adrian Campos, uh, this year. A number of uh, drivers sporting commemorative and tribute helmets this year. Uh, and away he goes and back on track in the 63. But one consolation for 63 is that for a new car to Le Mans, this one has been competitive oh, and oh, it's been oh, reliable oh, oh. and drama oh. there because there's a spinning that was the 95, 95 car. Aston. Which and the 85 is off and the, it was, uh, the Jota car did well to avoid that too. So it that was, was the Iron Dame's car, yellow yeah. at Marshall's post five, we can Ollie see Hancock why. was in the other one that spun. So was the contact between the two or was that in avoidance? I thought it was in avoidance. Yeah. Massive, massive yeah. drama there. That could have been so much worse. Bovey did well to uh, 
exit stage right and yeah. avoid that. So Sarah Bovey, the uh, recent addition, she had just as a quick twiddle of the wheel to see whether or not everything's pointing in the right direction. Let's see what happens here. You can see the Toyota starting to avoid. Yeah. It was in avoidance, wasn't it? Yes. So Sarah Bovey has seen what's coming behind her, has basically bailed out in avoidance of the, the spin ahead. The 95 car, I think, will rejoin and has rejoined. She did a good job of recovering there. She, she aimed for the, for the runoff tarmac, didn't yeah. she, behind the gravel, and uh, was quickly back on track. But yeah, the Toyota was in the middle of all of that, so another heart-in-mouth moment for the Toyota team. Sarah Bovey continues, World Endurance Championship debut, never mind just Le Mans debut. Yeah, and eighth position overall in the GTE Am. She's still giving that a bit of a weave to see what she can do about getting rid of some of that gravel, I'm sure. She was a long way off in the gravel. She was. Super smart, though. Got the steering wheel straight, kept the power in, just made sure she was able to sort of plough her way through and get out the other side of the gravel trap. I think Sarah's been quite a revelation to the Iron Links team. They, they seem to have reshuffled their order in a range of... Uh, their, their, uh, their campaigns this year to accommodate this switch to the WEC. Manuela mm. Gosner raced, uh, was due to race in the WEC instead of racing in the Road to Le Mans and Michelin Le Mans Cup now. All sorts of changes uh, with the multiple uh, GT, Ferrari GT and GTE and GT3 programmes now being run by this impressive, relatively new team. There you go. This is on board oh, number was, seven. Was somebody else involved, wasn't there? It might have been the Ferrari after all, because the... There's yeah. a car off to the right, a long way off to the right, so possibly there was a tag. Yeah. But the Toyota took evasive action. Off through the gravel goes Sarah Bovey. Ollie Hancock was the one that was more delayed. Yeah, as did one of the Jota cars mm. going uh, the wrong side of the bollards, and I think two wheels just kissing the gravel. Didn't cost Mike Conway much time, in fairness, but uh, you've got Callum Islet there going through, running third in class for Iron Links, looking strong. All those who were told at Spa, don't jinx the links, and there's somebody smoking in the background. Was that car 70? They I think it was the real-time car, yeah. yeah and we, and we did have a report of that a while ago. Yeah. It number 70 smoking. Now, that uh, car is not on full song. 3.40 last time around against something like a 3.35 for most of the front-running uh, LMP2s, or the less-delayed LMP2s. There is the real-team racing car up inside of the Iron Links car. Into the first chicane on the Nordier. And no sign of that smoke there. Is that where, where was the smoke coming from? Could we Looked tell? Like right rear. So could be body rub. With this car, we've not seen much of the 80 car with the excitement right. of the two cars ahead. But that car sitting in a podium position, Kalamala is what two minutes and 20 seconds back from Ben Keating, who has got another, I think, full stint to do in this car. This one. Keeping an eye out for number eight. Number seven Toyota has just been through, but how many more laps on this stint can Kazuki Nakajima do before he has to come into the pit lane once more? You've got 48, the EDEC entry in, which is Paul Luc Chatin, who's brought the car into the pit road. Yeah, and at the moment, Kazuki Nakajima is working his lap five on this stint. And to remind you why we uh, focused on this, with a great middle stint there from uh, James Collado, uh, great middle sector rather than James Collado, the last uh, fuel stints for the number eight car have been 11 laps, 10 laps, 8 laps, 6 laps, and we're now working lap 5, so we're watching with keen interest. It's going to stay out, I think, because it it's just coming out of the chicane yep. up towards the timing line, so yes, it's going to at least do 6. At least 6, so not degrading at this point. And the lap times are OK. Yeah. That was a 3.31. Of course, it's gain time against Mike Conway, who was a little bit delayed last time, indeed. Absolutely. Drama's over at the exit of the Dunlop S is towards Terre Rouge. So I think we can call that one a melee. I like a melee, melee yeah. sounds about the right tone for that. Like George Melee. We haven't had many melees in this race since about the first proper racing lap. Uh, another pit stop cycle has gone through for Jota, for United, for Interpol, for Inter-Europol. Yeah, IDEC and the second Jota car of Anthony Davidson. Uh, is imminent, I think, because there you've got 48 then, so Paul Luc Chatin having just rejoined the racetrack. Well, there's a switch through that pit stop cycle, by the way, uh, which is the inter Europol cars dropped back, and that was a slower stop by the look of a certain slower lap. Mm. 450 on the... On the in-lap. In-lap. Now, let's uh, try and catch up on what's been going on for United Autosports. Paul DeResta has had a pretty... Um, fraught race. Uh, let's catch up with him in the company of Duncan Vincent in the pit lane. 
Hi Paul, it's good to catch up with you at Le Mans. It would be, be a lot better if it was in better circumstances. You did start very well as a team, but unfortunately a slight error at the chicane really put pay to your race and your teammates' race as well. What's the What was the general consensus on that happening? Listen, it's, uh, it's an unfortunate thing to happen. I think, you know, there's 62 other cars out there, and unfortunately, um, you know, young guys, you know, their ambitions of what they want to do here, uh, how they go about racing, but he apologised. I think that's a manly thing to do. He stood up, but the conditions were very hard, you know, to go out there in slicks in the rain for your first time going into the night, uh, and it was just very unfortunate. Had it been a second either way, uh, we'd be in a very different position, but um, they certainly annihilated us in having any decent race. Uh, and the biggest thing was where it happened on the track was getting the car back to the pits, actually, with the bend suspension. The fixed time was not too bad, although we're, we're still carrying a significant amount of damage uh, in terms of aero and on the side. But listen, we're still going. I think we're fifth, and I think his recoveries go great, but it's certainly been a turbulent week up and down um, where it looked so promising. Speed left in the car, which can maybe take you a little bit further forward, or the gaps too big and the damage too great. Uh, I think we're quite fortunate there. The car that we were kind of we've chased down over the past six hours uh, just took a puncture. Uh, not ideal for them, but we've managed to jump them. I think we've got a 30 second buffer, so hopefully we'll just carry that to the end of the race. I think the other guys are out of touch. This is a reliability game now. Um, and that's where you've got to have the trust in the machine you've got. But um, listen, everybody's getting tired. Uh, I'll be back in to finish at the end. Um, but this is one huge test, and it's been um, a bit of mixed emotions for the whole United Autosports and where they are. But uh, listen, this is the nature of this race. You can have it absolutely perfect every year you come here. And uh, last year, we were fortunate enough to stand on the top step. Paul, thank you very much for your time. Good luck for your stint. So that explains, uh, we believe, why they've been able to jump the Interiorpol car, a puncture for the 34 car deep into this race. Also, and with thanks to Simon Strang down at uh, Toyota Kazoo Racing, uh, explanation of the short stint last time, not just fuel, although that's clearly part of it, but to replace a broken co-driver door uh, on that car. So there was a driver change undertaken at the same time, but they replaced the, uh, the passenger side, there's no passenger seat, but passenger side door on the number eight, which is why they short stopped last time. Why did they need to change the door is the question on the back of that? Uh, I don't think that's linked in with fuel. But <laughs> no, but I'm intrigued to know why, because uh, but clearly they had to bring it in broken. early. I mean, my guess is the catcher had failed if right. that door was open. Uh, that's okay. not going to help matters. 31, um, Team WRT. Car 8 has actually just gone through for another lap, so this is going to be 7, isn't it? Yeah, a, a better uh, longer stint. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the next one you're looking for there is 7, because if 6 was a short stop because of a door, then you're looking for a degradation from, uh, from 8, which is the next biggest, not 6. So and if he yes. comes at the end of seven, they're still in fuel trouble. Sorry, seven laps, not car seven. Yes, Correct. Venue. Yes, My because uh, car seven was on a ten lap stint last time. Yep. And it's, it's now number seven Toyota's race to lose, isn't it? Not to put uh, any added pressure on Mike Conway. No pressure, yes. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. They've got a comfortable gap, lap gap on the sister car, which will be uh, plus, by the way, the pit stop to come for the number eight. Uh, the number eight not under pressure from the back, at the, from behind at the moment, although the Alpine is still showing really good speed at the moment and uh, not bad speed either from the 708 Glickenhaus. We're in now to a race of luck and a race of reliability. Indeed so, as down the pit lane now then comes number 31, Robin Freins. Uh, uh, tempting fate, I know, but the WRT cars have been outstanding. I know you expect that in... GT terms, you say WRT, you expect the cars to be up there, but they're relative newcomers to prototype racing, but you would not think it. No, they've. Uh, well, they, the context here is a one-off at the uh, European Le Mans Series race, I think at Spa in 2016 with Eligier. Mm. We didn't see them back then until the effort this year with a single Orica in the European Le Mans Series. They won the first two races in the LMS this year and the, their season debut, uh, full championship debut in that series. They've had less good fortune and good reliability in the WEC. Uh, were firmly trounced by United Autosports uh, at Spa, as was everybody. Um, uh, but have been in the mix, but not quite at the pointy end of the spear for the other races so far this season. But here, for me, David, it's a combination. They've been very rapid, but they've stayed out of trouble. They've uh, not done anything self-inflicted at all. 
and they've just been metronomically reliable. Yeah, if you were looking to try to attract a manufacturer, that's that, th that, this has been the perfect calling well, card. They, frankly, you know, they couldn't make it more obvious if they didn't write sign here on the side of the car. Well, and, indeed. And that's, but, the, that's the case with Jota, it's the case with United, it's the case with TDS. And what they're that, doing there. This doesn't look 100% right. Uh, they can't get... Oh, they, 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 was that the airline stuck in it? Something was stuck underneath the car. That's because uh, that stint was only seven laps, so it was out of sync. Number 31. Yeah. Couldn't work out what that was. It wasn't the airline. No. It looked like it, it could have been a lighting board or something. There was a square yes. thing attached yes. to the cable, and it's lost its class lead through all of yeah. that. So the pit stop took a minute and 20. Certainly lost time. Just going back to WRT, uh, take that little incident aside. I mean, if you were a manufacturer looking to go to a team, why wouldn't you go to WRT? It's a, it's a huge calling card, yeah. you know, as have the successes last year of United and, for that matter, what they've been doing in the, in the WC so far this year, been a calling card. Jota Sport had a fantastic race at Portimao. It's another one that shows how they can execute a great race. Here, they've been less lucky, less fortunate. Uh, car 20 reported for a possible engine cover open, we're hearing. That's the... Uh, the high-class racing car with Marcus Sorensen at the wheel, uh, just inside the top 20, but that's, uh, that's the kind of thing that could be very dramatic here. It's a big piece of bodywork yeah. to lose. Well, hopefully the word will have got through to slow down. Uh, there, if he gets ready, because he's going to take over 41 soon from Louis Delatraz. With that pit stop cycle, and particularly for that, that, uh, that delay for the 31 car, as you quite rightly say, 41 has moved ahead and into the lead of LMP2, but the 708, for the first time, I believe, has now made it a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 in the hypercar class. If that was the case, it was very early on in the race. Yes, uh, yeah, 709, Ryan Briscoe, you're right, up into fifth place. I think it did happen, but a long, long, yeah. long time ago. I have to go back to the bulletin at the end of the first hour, probably, for that. But uh, finally, we get some semblance of order. We like an ordered timing screen. We do, but isn't it interesting that of all the classes, I, I know there's only five in it, but the, these are the new cars, Absolutely. and all five are still going. Absolutely, and, you know, we're, we're firm fans in the conversations around international sports car racing that uh, sometimes get the criticism that LMP2 has become a single-make class. Uh, we've got one Ligier and amongst a sea of Oricas. It's not lacked for pace, and it's not lacked for entertainment, and these things are just ironclad. To beat these LMP2 cars, you've got to be very, very good indeed. It would be nice to have more manufacturers in LMP2, absolutely. But go with what you've got. Has it given us a good race? Yes. Have yep. you got some style drivers and good teams? Yes, yes. So very, very good indeed. So number 31, uh, as you look at the 41 car set for its... Uh, pit stop, 31 Robin Fryens, so there was something stuck under that car, that's why it lost the time. Quite what it was, Darren, we couldn't really work out. There was a, a line and then something at the end of that line, but they had to jump up on the back of the car, didn't they, to try they and did. get to, the car from underneath. It was either the... jammed underneath the car or jammed underneath... The... Well, it couldn't be the wheel, surely not the no. wheel. So something was jammed underneath the car, but it's, uh, I didn't recognise that component. So, unless it was the stop board. But it was on a line, wasn't it? It was on a hose. Yeah, but it, they came in out of sync, so there must have been yeah. something that required them to come in for enough, uh, it, after seven laps. Has he picked something up? And yeah, that's a bit what of debris done. underneath yeah, or something. Maybe that's, that's what it was. Or wedged. Well, well uh, send Duncan down there. He can go and investigate and say, what was it? And uh, hopefully we'll get a, a, a truthful answer. This might show... Oh, no, it won't show us in replay. This will show us other things, like the Jota fast food centre, the KFC Coca-Cola-backed entry. Stoffel van Dorner's car, eighth overall. And uh, now threading the way through the traffic here, down towards Arnage. That is 28, and uh, Stoffel van Dorner at the helm. Now, he's chasing Robin Freins, but he's a minute and 15 seconds back, but he's done an extra pit stop as well. And it's uh, lunchtime down at Jota. Indeed, well looked after down at Jota. Did spot them having the, uh, the Nutella on toast early, early this morning. Yes. Just adding a bit of energy when energy levels are very low at that point in the morning particularly if you've been up and about all night, and they've had a busy night. Now, let's uh, try and catch up on what's been going on in the pit lane. Um, Duncan Vincent, what can you tell us? Uh, Charles Malese uh, described it perfectly. Remember, we saw them changing front wheels only? Yeah, yeah. that's because the air jack in the back wouldn't work. So then they came in and they'd done the backs, and it just looked a little bit strange, guys. It was a perfect pit stop, but the air jack stuck at the back, so it wouldn't come up. 
That's why they've done two oh, kind right. of pit stops. So they did one stop for the front yeah. and then a second one for the rears. OK. 100%. Yeah, no, we did see just doing the fronts, didn't we? Right, thanks, Duncan, that makes sense. Excellent Panic stuff. over. But they've got to get through at least two more pit stops, and therefore that air jack issue might persist, unless they can... Can they use the one from 41? Uh, it's the onboard air jacks. Yeah, I was going to say, oh, they can't, it's, they can't, it's, they obviously uh, no. So, unless they, uh, they, they get some kind of manual jacking underneath the car... Or triple stint the tyres. Or triple stint the tyres. And I'm not sure they're allowed to have manual jacking at this point. But, well, either way, uh, thanks very much indeed to Charles Malazy, another of the... Coming men in endurance racing. Eight's just been in, as you see it leaving the pit lane. So to the computer eyes turn. Eight, eight laps. Right, so it's gone back up again. To it's gone a, back to where it was. Or, yeah, yeah it's, indeed. it's not perfect, clearly, but it's a more manageable number now. Indeed it is. Yeah. Renge van der Zander and Paul Lup have both had quickest laps for their respective cars. The 34 into Europol car after that puncture. Some 23 seconds back from Alex Lynn now in a battle for fifth in LMP2. Paul Luc Chatel is one position back from van der Zander, but he's uh, got a much bigger gap to play with. Two minutes and 44 seconds is his problem. I see no ships. Not quite. Well, there's still, uh, still a possibly a challenge there with uh, third and fourth between the Glickenhaus and the Alpine. I mean, it's only... I agree. It's only... Uh, uh, only. I mean, it's... One minute and 40 seconds, which is is a lot, but it's it's only one safety car. You know, if one, one safety, safety come, comes car, out and it's, it's in the right place. It's one small issue. Yeah. It's a partial slow lap back to, for a, a slow puncture. It's it's a whole range of things, all of which we've seen at the Le Mans 24 hours within the last few years. And at WRT, they're ready for Louis Delatraz, who's in the pit lane. If he is going to take over, and in comes second generation racer Louis Delatraz who was uh, mentored in his early days by Alain Menu, because uh, Jean-Denis Delatraz and Alain went to school together, best friends. Uh, Jean-Denis put some money into Alain's racing, and Alain repaid that faith by mentoring Louis, and, got to say, did a pretty decent job. Uh, Very good job. It did, it did indeed. Am I right Louis Delatraz won the virtual Le Mans uh, in our lockdown year? I think he I think did. He did. He, I think he did. He was also the SRO eSports champion. Yep. Beat Ben Barnico to that. Did he? Yeah. So he spends a lot of time indoors. <laughs> he did, yeah. he did, yeah. Cl clubing in the word lockdown, probably, yeah, yeah. but yes, <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> <laughs> and that car, 41, Graham, the Robert Kubis and Louis Delatraz Yiffy Ye car, uh, they've had two European Le Mans series wins as a combination this year, so yep. it's, it's gelled already before you come to this, the biggest race of them all. Absolutely, and let's, lest we forget, by the way, he just missed out on an overall podium last year here. Louis Delatraz is part of the Rebellion squad. Fourth overall he has as a finish, which is mighty for what was then a debutante here. Looking at Renge van der Zander, working another very, very quick lap in the inter europe car, dropped finally from fifth, which I think they've been in all night in the 34 with that puncture. But he's trying to close down Alex Lynn, ahead in the 23 United Auto Sports car. And there you saw next year's French Formula 4 championship intake watching the race. <laughs> <laughs> yes, increasingly we're getting younger and younger talent aboard, aren't we? And with F4... Not in here, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> Darren's looking offended. Yeah. I'm not in my 50s just yet. Yeah. You will be, son, you yeah. will be. <laughs> What did he say? Oh, uh, we've got <laughs> Ringo van der Zander. We've also got Tristan Gomendy doing personal best lap times. Uh, this, the innovation class car, we just ought to touch on for a moment. Uh, Nigel Bailly, who was uh, badly injured as a 14-year-old in a motocross accident, he was. left paraplegic, and uh, has done a lot of karting since. Again, specially adapted machinery and steps up to Le Mans. And the car, again, just to get to the end, that's the main aim. It's fallen back from where it was at, uh, uh, early morning, yeah. but 34th, Nigel Bay at the wheel of it, and getting it to the end would be a mega achievement. It would be the second time we've seen one of these invitational cars designed to show off technology, to show off you know, a concept mm. to a wider uh, viewing uh, audience. Is that Don Bastian suffering think a little? I think it is, yes. Yeah, yes, it is indeed, it is. but uh, for a 75-year-old to do a, a, a long time behind the wheel yeah. round here, he'll know about that now. It most certainly will, but uh, the 84 car are looking to be the second car to come home after the original Fred, uh, Fred Sosay efforts with an open-top Morgan. 
the close top Orica presents all sorts of additional issues for the guys, Takamuyoki and Nigel Bai, as well as Matteo Lehe, the fully able-bodied uh, replacement for, unfortunately and possibly ironically, uh, Francois Arreo, who was supposed to be the able-bodied driver to join them, and then he injured himself. Right. Fell off a bike and uh, I think he uh, broke his collarbone. And the Duquesne team, that Gilles Duquesne. Yes. Who himself is a disabled driver. Correct. Because, yes, he was left in a wheelchair many, many years he ago, was wasn't indeed. he? Ray, and, uh, he came back to race. And Duquesne investing in and purchasing the, uh, the LMP3 programme from Norma to now bring us the Duquesne DO8, which is one of the two particularly successful LMP3 platforms you'll see around the world. There is Dom. I, think, I suspect that might back. be him uh, done for the race. Let's see yes. if that's the case. He looks like we feel, but uh, that's way, been a, 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 a tough stint. A thoroughly lovely man. Yeah. Um, I mean, just to make the point, not only is, is the guy 75, Darren, these are physical cars, the temperatures are going up as well, yeah. and you know, he's had to deliver in that stint. Yeah, I mean, there's no hiding out there no, on the no, circuit. Indeed, indeed. You, you've got six hours to do, um, and the pace has got to be there uh, to fit the criteria of the regulations. Um, so, you know, to be out there, and, and I don't know if they've been doing single stints with him or double stints, but um, still, he's done six hours of this race in the last 24 hours, and it's, uh, it is physical in these mm. cars. It, the, the circuit is, is quite kind to drivers in one way because you've got the long straights, so you can yep. relax a little bit. Um, but the temperatures inside the cockpits, I'm sure, have been sort of sitting around the 28 to 30 degrees. That's generally where they are. Six hours and 13 minutes uh, for Don Bastien. And I can tell you, uh, he's not the slowest. Not, no, by, not. not by a long chalk. Yeah. Uh, average, uh, best turn laps average of 404.809. That's impressive stuff from a now 75 year old man that uh, doesn't do a huge amount of racing. He's raced as well, by the way, here this weekend in the One Make Porsche uh, Challenge race in a Porsche Cup car to get some additional time in that car. But, uh, and not only that, his, his, well, his 10 lap, best 10 laps, 404.8, his theoretical best, 403.3, which means his consistency is very good. Yeah. So he's driving to his own limits. Um, it's by no means outrageously slow. Uh, and I've not seen him cause a single problem. No, no, he's got on with the job, hasn't he? Not very well. And when you look at it, it's like the best 10 laps are a 408, yep. uh, 4.8. Uh, and then the best 20% is only a 5.7. Yep. So, you know, very, very consistent Absolutely. throughout his stint. So, uh, a great effort there. It's good to see Christian Reed investing in young talents. It's uh, been an excellent performance, an absolutely excellent performance. Delighted to see that he has delivered on his dream. Two years now, 74 years old last year, became the oldest driver ever to start and finish this race. We'll do the same again this year and extend that record a little further out of Mark Patterson's reach. Let's hope he enjoyed it as well. Um, by the look of his face, I think he did. Once, I think once he's uh, rehydrated and had a bit of a sit down, then I think he'll have thoroughly enjoyed his event. And that's, at that level is exactly what this is about. Meantime, more fast laps coming in LMP2. We've got uh, the 85 and 95. We saw that, didn't we, yeah. at Marshall Post 3. That's the Sarah Bovey and Ollie. Hancock, Hancock yeah. mm. that's under investigation. This is the f this is the second and third. It's the, it's the first place car and the third place car, um, and this in, in GTM. And this is Rivera putting a lap on the 80 car. So it's now two GTM cars on the lead lap. Mm. Alessio Rivera now almost three minutes ahead of Ben Keating. So Keating is not that much further down the road here, is he? It's a difficult one for TF, wasn't it? Because I thought you said uh, Ben only had like maybe 29 minutes left that he, he had, had to do. He's, he's, well, the, and the problem there is, what do you do? Do you let him complete a full stint, mm. uh, or do you bring him in and potentially leave yourself with a splash at the end of the race? So they'll be counting back to see what the best strategy is there. That's the 51 car, the lead car in GTE Pro, Alessandro Pierre Guidi. He is just eking and edging away, isn't he, Darren, from uh, Antonio Garcia? Yeah, that gap's gone up a, a wee bit in this uh, last stint uh, that they've both been doing. It was around 30, wasn't it? 35 before. It was. So it's, it's just been gradually uh, yeah. eking out the uh, the quick shot we had there. By the way, the uh, follically challenged gentleman on the left-hand side was uh, Antonio Fer uh, uh, Ferrari. Amato Ferrari, my apologies. Antonio Ferrari, a completely different racing team owner. Uh, the piercing blue eyes of Antonio. 
of a motto. It's been a long day. Should we try this again? I Who was that phonically challenged gentleman in that shot? That was a Marta Ferrari. Right. <laughs> he's got piercing blue eyes. He has, hasn't he? Right. And he's also got a car that is leading each of the GT classes. He does indeed. And, and he'd be a very, very, very happy Bonnie if yeah. it uh, ends that way. So we actually didn't see the, the cause of that incident between 95 and 85, but it looks like the stewards have seen the evidence and uh, both is getting a 10 second penalty at the indeed. next one. Yeah. To be served in the next pit stop as you ride on board then now with uh, Antonio Garcia back at the wheel of number 63 Corvette, but the best part of a minute now behind the Ferrari of Alessandro Pierguidi. There you can see, courtesy of the GPS, whereabouts on the circuit they are with the Ferrari having just started a lap and coming into the Porsche curves now, the Corvette. Yeah, two-thirds of a lap it is, or there and thereabouts. It's right on the limit of a safety car. If a safety car came out, it could yeah. work in the favour of, of the Corvette. Yeah. Um, but if that gap opens up a little bit more, then it could easily go the, the other way. way yeah. Uh, the last lap of number eight Toyota was about three seconds slower than the number seven Toyota. Now, is that because they're managing this problem and trying to eke out the fuel so they don't have to stop traffic uh, soon uh, it's, and or traffic? Yeah. Or is there something more sinister? Well, what we've, I think what we've seen throughout the race, and we've seen this developing in the WC this, 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 year, uh, this year, David, is that with this recalibration of the two prototype classes and the reeling back into the kind of unbelievable pace we had from LMP1, uh, they're all close together. It means it's more difficult to catch, more difficult to pass, more difficult to, to pull away. And if it's very easy for one of these hypercars to find themselves bottled in for a corner or two, and that's two, three, four, five seconds gone, Darren. We, we actually did see that with car eight. Uh, it was on the way into Tet Rouge. Yep. Um, there could have, I mean, it could have been Couldn't one pass. of those when uh, Nakajima could have mm. fired it down the inside, but the risk at that stage would have been quite high. But it was definitely he backed out and uh, followed the GT car through Tet Rouge onto the straight. And certainly for a, a hyper car, that's going to lose a lot of uh, momentum down the back, down the first back, towards the first chicane. Yeah, back down to a 332.8, not at the base we had seen from the seven car. But I think the game is different now for the eight. I think this is about just being sensible, getting the car back. 7.09, Clickenhaus from fifth position. Ryan Briscoe is on pit lane. Now, will they get this car back out in fifth? It's going to be pretty tight. Remember, yeah, it's, it's, only just tight, really, right. yeah, it's only just cycled through mm. with the latest stops for WRT to fifth place. And a minute and a half in hand. It's going to be marginal, isn't Very. it? His last pit stop was 1.28. And then, of course, he's got to get back up to speed. Into the pit lane comes number seven. So the race leader is in, Mike Conway. As you look at 22, cycling through another pit stop. This car still way, way down in 43rd place. A thankless task, trying to keep the motivation up to get to the end. But uh, the grandstand's getting busier again now as uh, people come out to watch the finish of the race. And although it's a, a smaller crowd than normal, it is so good to have the atmosphere of people back at the circuit and uh, just walk out of the TV compound to go towards the paddock. And there's that uh, urgency, that hustle and bustle of people about in the sunshine, in the, the good weather. So Mike Conway is going to stay behind the wheel. Kamui Kobayashi and Jose Maria Lopez, the other two drivers, of course. Lopez here, Graham, on target to be only the second Argentine winner of the race. Wow. After Juan Gonzalez in 1954. And unfortunately, uh, for their neighbouring nation, it looks like neither of the Brazilians that are in this race are going to do likewise. Uh, we've never had a Brazilian win this race. No, that's true. Um, but uh, second Argentine would be something, wouldn't it? Mike Conway will just uh, sweep the monkey off his back. <laughs> Uh, because it's been a long time script for Mike Conway. I remember when they came oh so close uh, just a few years ago, bumping into Mike at the Goodwood Festival of Speed, where he was driving the then new GT4 car, mm. and he was still depressed. It was still a real downer. It's a huge moment for him not to have won that race. Very easy yeah, to yeah. just get a black cloud over your head and it's all against you. Because however hard you try, there is no guarantee, of course, that no. you come back next year and it goes right for you. Absolutely but, right. Poor old Bob Wallach is the example of that. So many efforts, so many second places, but it never happened for him. Uh, looking at 91 Porsche as it bounces over the kerb, 92, more news about that car. They've been struggling for the bulk of the race with the balance of it as well. And, of course, that's a legacy of the hyperpole accident because they it just didn't indeed. really get enough time to get the car exactly as they wanted. You see the damage on the back of 91. It was the other side that clattered against the wall earlier on, wasn't it? It Coming was the other the side. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Fred McAvicky mm. uh, just going rather wide and 
lucky to keep the mirror on that car, to be honest with you. At 91 on pit lane, uh, 36 seconds back from the team car as Rickard Leeds brought it in, down off the jacks, or up on the jacks, rather. It's like someone's taken a big bite out of that body. It does. Yeah. We think it was the, the Alpine, don't we? We, we think it might, might with our um, investigation. Yes. Forward investigation. I think forensic. could be that high. Forensic. <laughs> I think right. when we, when you finally decide to kind of stop racing, Darren, I think you've got a, you've got a career in crime, criminal investigation, NCIS. I do, Turner. I do. I, I believe this is correct. I think that's right. <laughs> Accident damage investigation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, either that, maybe the guy on the other end from that call centre saying, "I understand you had an accident." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tonight on ITV, new crime busting, <laughs> Turner. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He did it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Turner and Hooch, though, means something completely different in Darren's life. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, like all TV detectives, you've got to have a cool car, so if you yeah. go and ask Ollie Gavin for a Corvette, there's a discount on one. <laughs> you said cool, didn't you? Oh, sorry, sorry yeah, you did mistake. say cool. My mistake. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I know where to go for a cool car. <laughs> <laughs> Now, in terms of sectors, Will Stevens is still pressing on, Graham. He's done a personal he best in sector two as that car runs fourth in LMP2. And into the pit lane comes the Alpine, which should, again, be able to hang on to that third place overall and in the hypercar class. Uh, yeah, one minute and 46 seconds, the advantage he's got at the moment over Pipa Durrani. Uh, Palace Racing, by the way, they're just hanging on in there. And I guess at this stage, hoping that someone else ahead of them has a bad day. Mm. Uh, they're sitting fourth and sitting pretty for a podium if things go awry for either of the WRT cars or the 28 Jota car. Uh, 28 Jota, by the way, 51 seconds back now from the second of the WRT cars. 36 pits, the team goes to work then, so the first thing to do is to try to clean the, the, the next wave of French flies off the windscreen and uh, also to put some fuel in the car, but it looks as though Nicola Lapierre is going to stay behind the wheel. The Goodyear blimp makes its way over the circuit. Getting some great shots of uh, Le Mans, looking down onto the pit straight over the paddock, which is still a very, very busy place. And although, as you can clearly see, there's nowhere near the number of people that would ordinarily be here, it is still good that the event has been structured around a, a limited number of, of, of fans, and they've responded. It's great to see uh, the fans back at the race circuit here. It makes such a difference. Um, cleaning the screen with only two hours to go the Alpine looked like it had plenty of uh, rip-offs mm, left yep. on the on the screen available so uh, I guess they're trying to save some money and uh, not with, go with that with an exception of that dramatic spin from Mathieu Vazivier at the first chicane they've had a remarkably drama free run yeah they just had an injection of oil so yep. we gather into that car as well as the, the, the fuel in that stop uh, but yeah apart from spins uh, Vazivier was in the gravel wasn't he last night uh, yes he was yeah, first chicane right. yeah um, just spooling back to the WRT uh, yes. story with the car uh, unable to deploy the jacks, we did get the point that that was an inflatable airbag, yes? Yes, yes, yes. Point. So they had to do the two stops, one for the fronts, one for the backs, yep. and use that inflatable, which then hadn't deflated enough to yep. get it out the other side. So that clearly they can use that to get the car through the pit stops. Yep. Uh, we've got Neil Yarni back into number 92. I wonder how many teams have actually got an inflatable bag mm. ready for that. See, I've never seen one around. I've never seen one around. Yeah, so the fact they had one available. The, the issue, I guess, there... Shows you the good teams, doesn't yeah, it? Absolutely. Well, it does. the, other, the other thing to say there is it clearly hasn't got a quick release because that was why they only tried to release the car from it. So it'll go up. It won't necessarily come down quite yeah. as quickly. If you've, uh, Need a sharp tried, knife. Well, if you ever tried to tackle an airbed in any way, shape or form, you know exactly how they felt. <laughs> Darren's knowledge of inflatables is a completely different <laughs> yes, uh, path completely going to different go down. Code. Yes. Let's just talk maybe about it, the race. Maybe it was an inflatable uh, airbed. Maybe that's what they just <laughs> fired. It's, it's a lilo. Yeah. Fired it under the car. That'll work. Let's get it up in the air. You tell Darren was a boy scout, can't you? Absolutely. Got to adapt. <laughs> exactly. I bet, I bet not for long. <laughs> <laughs> Be prepared. There you go. Pit stop for car 33 is under investigation. So that's the TF Sport Aston Martin, yes. isn't it, Van Keating? And that came in a while ago. So something has gone through the system from the officials in the pit lane to go to race control to then be investigated. Could this add further spice to it? So Ben Keating wow. will be coming to the end, towards the end of his time in that car now. Uh, let's have a quick look. Where is Ben on this list? He must have done the uh, required time by must now. Must be very close yeah. to it. It's a bit further down. Getting a replay here of 64 in GTE Pro, which uh, is Alexander Sims 
persevering, but so far back, it's now 56 laps down on the race leading car. So the answer is Ben has done his six hours now, so whenever this is the optimum time for them to come in and switch, and uh, he's, well, actually, no, he's been, he's another one that's had a bit of staccato recent past in this car. He's on a fourth lap of a current stint after doing just six laps. So that car has had an car did have uh, a, a, a engine misfire, we understand, through the Porsche curve, so they brought the car in quick rather than risk it doing another lap. So a, a precautionary pit stop, if you like, but it might be that on the next pit stop, you find them addressing that problem again. Yeah, they're clearly trying to get that car to the point where it's in a fuel stink back mm. counting now from the finish. But with a margin such as it is against the Ferrari of a minute and 43, it's the Ferrari having problems that's the lifeline for a category win there. Replay here of incidents down at the second chicane as the Ferrari... That's the 60 car. ...goes straight on. And who's aboard the 60 car for Iron Lynx Claudio Schiavone. Yep. So uh, the Iron Lynx entry skips the chicane effectively, carries on. No harm done, thankfully, as you ride on board with Garcia, who is, for the moment, 52 seconds back from the class-leading Ferrari. Lapierre, by the way, has rejoined after that stop and kept that third place. And that next means that we expect the Glickenhaus number 708 to come into the pit lane. 30 seconds with the pit stop still to come is the gap third to fourth. But that gives you an idea, doesn't it, David, of the, the real world gap should there be a problem for a car ahead. It is effectively a pit stop and change. Uh, yeah, I mean, if that Ferrari has a problem, the Corvette is absolutely close enough on a length of, yep. of lap like Le Mans has to pounce. It's just waiting for that problem to strike. Absolutely right, Caster. At this point, not going to win it on pace, but can win it by forcing the error. Glickenhaus yep. 708 into the pit lane with Pipa Durrani. And therefore, because the Alpine had long since left the pit lane, further evidence of how it secured that third place now, because initially, remember, this morning they were trading on the pit stops. Absolutely. Now the Alpine pits rejoins and is well clear. And I think eight's just come in as well. It has. So number eight is in after how many laps this time for the and second place that, Toyota? Five. Five laps. Is it? OK, interesting. Right. That is interesting. Now, that they can't be the door again, can are it? Are they back counting? and needs to be pushed back into its stall. Let's, Let's see. keep an eye on what work goes on here. Passenger so, door open again. Yeah, but they're working inside the car, aren't they? Yeah. Lights cleaned. Nakajima sits and awaits instructions. Nothing he can do, nope. so he's just got to sit there and wait. He's off to drink, takes door that. open is literally for the drinks bottle, but that yeah. said, a technician is now back in there. The oil bomb going on the side. Yeah. So that car losing further time against the leader. And they're watching down pit lane, and I think they're looking at what's going on with the Glickenhaus as well. Away they go. That was an untroubled stop from the 708. Yeah, I mean, the, the task there is to get to the end now, so they're not really racing anybody. They're yeah. just getting to the end. And I don't mean that rudely, but that is the main focus, and they've done a ripper job of getting this far. Well, don't blow I, it now. I think there's, there's two headlines in Hypercar, aren't there? It, it, at this stage, it could well be Toto win Le Mans. Glickenhaus beat Le Mans. And mm. it's... Uh, I'm looking for the words here, David, an extraordinary effort to get these two cars in these positions to this point with such limited running before. Totally agree. It is perhaps the most impressive element of the race. I know they're not going to win, but the reliability, find wood to touch, has yeah. been remarkable. And you're right, it ought to give optimism to other teams slash constructors yeah. that, that hypercar might be actually something you can go and do competitively. Well, well, no, there's almost a question to be asked, how cheaply can we do it? Mm. You know, and I think that's a, that's a great question to investigate. It's very easy to be diverted down a cul-de-sac of all these major brands are coming. We know who's coming. Porsche are coming, Audi are coming, Ferrari are coming, Peugeot arrive next year, Acura in the States, BMW in the States, and potentially with customer cars to come as well, and more, Lamborghini. Bentley's still looking at it. Beyond that, what, what about McLaren? And they're looking at it. You know, we did a quick assessment of this uh, in the week before the race. You know, and you've got to look at 15, 20 brands to decide who's doing what. We might see a Dodge version of the Peugeot. We might. You know, there's lots going on there. Perhaps the bit that's been not given the caretaking it needs is to think about how easy it might be for some challenger brands that will add a bit more spice to this. Mm. So. 
from number 88 now. has just pitted, and that the team me. was somewhat surprised about that. Julian Andlauer arriving in, as you see the damage done here to the uh, Dragon that's Speed car. Yeah. That's Certainly the super slow mo that you that catch was that. wobbling along, along mm. wasn't it? Uh, the 88 car, by the way, that's the car that came in fairly recently. It uh, sounds to, from what Duncan is telling us in pit lane, that might well be a single a single tyre change for a puncture for the 88. That was a car that stopped not long ago for Don Bastien to complete his run here at the 24 Hours of Le Mans. We move David into the 23rd lap, and that is smoking again. Still smoking the number 70 car yeah. and smoking heavily. That's that's bodywork. It's more at this side of the circuit, isn't it? Yeah. But it's yeah. becoming a little bit more pronounced. It's Norman Nato at the wheels, Very still pressing consistent, on. Because it's in the same place yeah. last time as well, wasn't it? Yeah. Out of the S's and coming out of Tet Rouge. But the team will have the, the data to look at and assess whether it's oh, a problem. It's a very tired car, doesn't it? Yeah. It's, it's definitely done a 24-hour a race or getting close to uh, yeah. achieving that. It's grimy, it's battered, it's dog-eared. Yeah, the punishment that all the components go through is outstanding, isn't it? As uh, on board now, 29. So this is the Racing Team Netherlands entry that's had its dramas over the course of the race. And the spectacular Hido van der Garde rattles over the kerb there. Absolutely on the limit, isn't he? Early, when, wasn't it this car that we heard the radio communication from the team saying, please stay away from the kerbs? Yes, yeah. that's right. <laughs> so yes. obviously that's uh, that's changed <laughs> that, what the, uh, the team are are allowing the drivers to uh, to get away with now. Exactly, and Guido van der Garde then comes up over the timing line, so goes through that car down in 29th place overall, 13th in class, but third within the pro-amp element of LMP2, which is really the main focus for that It squad. is definitely for Fritz van Aert, yes, that's, yeah. that's absolutely... And he was one of the driving forces of, of pro-amp happening. And for Guido, it's let's keep off the kerbs and please don't drive all the way across the grass sideways, kicking dust up and nearly clattering the car off the barriers. He had a massive lose, didn't he, about two hours ago. Mm -hmm. And it, it was a wing and a prayer whether he was going to end the race then and there or not. So, it's, yeah. It was similar to the Toyota incident through practice, wasn't it? Yeah. The same part of the circuit, yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's a, it's a favoured going off place for prototypes, mm. LMP2s particularly. <laughs> LMP3s were all going off uh, in the Road to Le Mans races as well. Um, as you get over that crest, the thing just sort of starts to float and walk. Mm. And if you're not right on line, there ain't much walking room. So still Hello, we've got David. these short stints being done by number eight. Hello, Martin. <laughs> finally, Hello, finally, for the first time in the race. I know, I know. Well, it, it, you it guys does, missed it, each other. It doesn't... We have. All right. <laughs> it doesn't op often happen that we work together, but it's always nice when we do. 88 coming back in. That's been slightly the problem child for mm. Dempsey, hasn't mm. it? Yeah, they just had to try and sort out a, a bad vibration. Now they've got a, a, a splitter they are concerned about as well. So That'll be another bad vibration. <laughs> precisely, yeah. precisely. More and more pit stops, more time lost. But you know, now you're getting to the point in many a case where you, you shrug as far as looking at the timing screen and a result is concerned and you just want to get to the end. You've There's got this far. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. If it's going to break down, kindly break down in the first hour or at least while the pubs are still open. <laughs> but, you know, don't get to hour 22 or 23 or 24 and then think about lunching yourself. And, you know, and that's the slight worry with real team, having seen what happened to the Risi car, which is identical in every way except mm. for livery, same chassis, same tyres, same engine, you do slightly worry about that. And, and there's been a few oil-based frailties in the LMP2 category. And uh, definitely real team will be worrying about that. You don't want a car that is chucking out oil, not out of the exhaust anyway. Now, the Magnussons, despite their travails, are still going in 18th place overall, the high-class mm. racing car, uh, and uh, soldiering on, sorry, 18th in class, I should say, to 30th overall, 18th within LMP2. Uh, and uh, bearing in mind that early this morning, we heard some on board with Kevin Magnussen saying to the team, the engine's dead, it's got one lap and it's going to go boom. They've actually done quite a, a yeah. good job of, of getting this far. I think uh, that's possibly a slightly Formula One informed. <laughs> it's just very fractionally, you know, 0.1% suboptimal, right? It's a write off. Yes, possibly so. <laughs> Whereas his dad is saying, if it's still got more than one wheel, 
bring it back uh, to the pit. Uh. And if it hasn't, carry it. Yeah, I think, uh, having had that radio message, Kevin was out of the car, they did a driver change. I think he genuinely thought that was it done, but yeah. let somebody else go and have the last hurrah. Or yeah. was hoping it was uh, done. Precisely, yeah. yes. <laughs> when yes. uh, you're that far back, sometimes you do want the, uh, the car to eventually die and uh, everyone can call it a day, but yeah. uh, if it's still strong and going, then uh, hey, you've got If to you've got to lunchtime on Sunday, then that would, you know, can we not just kill it? It then turns around into, I think we have to keep this alive as long as we can. Yeah. Corvette 64, the last running car in the GT category, leaves the pits again with Alexander Sims. Every time I've looked at, at that car or talked about it, I think Alexander yeah. Sims has been in it. That car has had all the misfortune. Uh, in fact, it's the last running car, not just in GT, but in the race, because yes. the Risi Competizione car in 48th place on the timing screen behind it, 46 rather, I don't think that uh, is ever leaving the garage again. Having gone in chugging smoke out of the exhaust, that is a sure sign of an engine failure, if ever yes. I saw one. So. 77, the other Dempsey Proton Porsche, Matt Campbell at the wheel of it, that's having a new front splitter as well, we understand, so mm. that car's been dropping and dropping and dropping, but again, you know, you're getting late into the race now, where all of those bangs over the curb, they're, they're coming home to roost, aren't they? Yep, absolutely. And, and it's really hard, Darren, isn't it? I think for, for any category to have a fast lap here that's also a clean lap. You have to ride over the curbs, you have to run wide, you know, in the chicanes and so on. And that's before you factor in traffic that you have to avoid or that, that is sort of easing you offline. There's a number of curbs that you can use to, to gain lap time, but the biggest one is this one that we're looking over over now, the Ford Chicane, the very last section of the of the circuit. Mm. It's brutal on the curb, uh, on the car, or as you go through there. And it's one of those corners where if you don't get the line exactly right, it really does hurt the car. Um, and you can come through the first part of the forge cane slightly offline, try and get the car turned in. You've got the wrong attitude to the corner and then you strike the curb and it, and it does feel like it's about to pull the wishbones out of, out of the car itself. So yeah, th there's some brutal curbs around this circuit. And uh, one of the things that we always got told in the test day was attack the circuit as if you're going to be doing that for the whole 24 hours. Right. So the teams can learn about the for any uh, uh, fatigue that may come yeah. into the car at a later stage. So, um, Try and work on that durability. Yeah. yeah, work it out and then maybe you'd have to dial it back uh, for the race itself, but they want to know where the weaknesses are. Still getting quick laps, Martin, because Tristan Gomondi now has done a personal best, or the car's best, in 15th place overall, 10th in class, and going for points in LMP2. And, and that Duquesne car, uh, you know, we've said it several times, I've said it several times, you wouldn't have given tuppence for its chances of making the dark after the first couple of hours. Right. The same with the uh, 48 car, you know, that, that was, was just off so many times, the remaining IDEC car. Mm. You thought, OK, well, they lost one in qualifying. The other one's not going to make it to nightfall. And, and yet they're both still there and they're both just creeping their way up. And, and the other thing, of course, that, that you've talked about recently is that we started the race with five hypercars, and for the first time, probably literally since lap one, they're now still going in the top five. There are no LMP2 cars in between them, and there were even, at the end of lap one, LMP2 cars in between them because of the issues that the cars had on the first lap. Yeah, indeed. And I know there's only five in the class, but the entire class is still going. You can't yeah. say that about LMP2 or GTE Pro Anything. or AM. No, no. And yet all these hypercars, these new cars, all racing here for the first time in, in this trim, well, there they all are. And, and to come back to the point we've been making, and I think you have as well, the Glickenhouses, outstanding effort because yeah. you know how they looked at the start of the season was a bit unconvincing. Well, the, the only car really in good. that category that has raced at Le Mans before is the Alpine. It raced before as an LMP1 Rebellion. Yes, yeah. So that's the only car that anybody's got any, any experience of running at Le Mans. Yes, Toyota have tested, they've done 30-hour tests and so on, but again, you can drive around Paul Ricard all day and all night and all the next day and be bored rigid and still not learn one iota of what the Le Mans track this year is going to throw at you. So that Toyota is not last year's car with a different suit. No, sure. It is fundamentally not. The entire hybrid system is totally different. The chassis is different. The way it manages the power is different. The body is different. The weight is different. It is a new car with some old component in. Predominantly, the internal combustion engine is most of the carryover of the car, mm. plus their experience. 
But then you look at the Glickenhaus and you go, okay, it's a chassis builder, uh, pole engineering, that ha podium engineering that has never done Le Mans before. It is a team that didn't exist 12 months ago. It is an engine manufacturer with an engine that didn't exist 12 months ago that has also never done Le Mans. And all these disparate parts have come together to create one car which on its debut in Portimao, because they missed Spa, a single car had all sorts of issues with the electronics talking to each other. GCU, ECUs were not conversing in the same language. They had brake issues. Two cars then came to Monza, both had issues, and the portents for them surviving Le Mans you know, to nightfall and through the night and to the chequered flag were not wholly great looking from the outside, but somehow this thing is, you know, turning into greater than the sum of its parts, and they are still in a battle for a podium finish. Uh, in the pits is WRT. This is the 31 car of Robin Freens. Yiffie is still leading in LMP2. And these cars, fifth and si sixth and seventh overall. Now, what we need to look for here is what they do with the jacks, because we, we understand that the onboard air jacks have failed. So the last two pit stops, the most recent was to do the rears. The previous stop was to do the front. And they're right. having to do this now, or were, with an inflatable Bag. bag underneath, lift the car up. Now, let's yeah. see what they do here, Darren. I don't think they're going to have to lift it up because they'll just run that set of tyres again. Yeah. So, for this pit stop, um, it's not going to be a problem, but maybe the next time mm, sure. they're going to have to try and get the and car th and up. And those are the, the sorts of issues when you've got two cars equally well-driven run by the same team between which there is barely a cigarette paper. Mm. You know, when, when you're in a two-car team, and Darren, you'll know this, Ollie will know this, when you're in a multi-car team, you know that if the other guys don't have a mistake, and you do, or a failure, then, you know, they've got to have a brake disc go as well for you to just get back onto level pegging, or one of their guys has got to drop it off the road. Any tiny little difference between the two suddenly becomes almost insurmountable because it's, there's nothing to choose in performance. I mean, normally you're fighting over a couple of tenths between the cars. I mean, you'd really have to be unlucky to start a race and have a, a balance in the car that's going to be a second a lap. But it does happen yeah. between between the teammates and, and team uh, team cars, etc. So uh, if that isn't the case, then you are always going to be fighting for a tenth or two um, each lap. So then it comes down to who doesn't have a problem, yeah. um, who has the cleanest run through the pit stops. It's the basic story here, isn't it? Don't hit stuff, stay out the pits. Now, you know, that, that's the rule of the mob. Yeah. And, and that's what makes you go quickly. Okay, saying it is one thing. But keeping out of trouble and giving it maximum attack, and it's yeah. that fine line that's yeah. the really interesting bit, isn't it? Well, we saw in Hyperpol, didn't we, with mm. Kevin Estra. You know, he's dominated all the qualifying sessions this year. He's been absolutely shatteringly quick, and he was just a fraction too shatteringly quick in Hyperpol. Yeah. Wrecked the car, destroyed the car. And, and they had to start from ground zero with a brand new shell. And they were saying, you know, you can bolt all the bits on, but it's fine tuning all the aero elements. That's the bit that's mm. going to start in the race. And Neil Yarny is quoted as saying, we've struggled all race with the balance. Yes. So, you know, they went into it on the back foot. Now there Ooh, is a, a slow dragon, dragon speed, speed entry. So is that Ben Ben's, Hanley? Yeah, it is. Oh dear, oh dear, the car was running in 11th in class in 16th overall and leading Pro-Am, yeah. and again, not for Ben, not for Juan Pablo, for Henrik Hedman, that's the key. So it's another LMP2 car inexplicably going slower. The good news is it's not trailing white smoke. The bad news is it hasn't apparently got a puncture or anything else wrong with the running gear. Is it a little low on the right front, Darren? It doesn't look like there's a, a suspension or, like you say, a punch or anything. So it's a bit strange. He's got drive, obviously, but it's uh, yeah. it's uh, it's not exactly getting back right, quickly. Is the right it? front corner just above the splitter? Is there just a bit missing there, or is it no? It's just I the colour. It's, it's still got dive planes and everything. Yeah, yeah. So he hasn't hit anything. They're not low on fuel, are they? They've not got the figures wrong. <sighs> trying to look at the screen edge on yeah. the data hang to on see. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I'm going to have a look done. at the magic computer and see I, how many I, laps. I almost daren't touch this because if I frazz it then McNish will kill me and, and I'll be more killed than a killed thing. Hang on, let's see. You look at that, I'll waffle about Hanley limping back. He's keeping out of everybody's Everyone's way. There. And the team is ready to spring into action. This is lap 11, his previous 
every stint they've done, apart from a two-lap one since, I don't know, mm. time immemorial, has been 11, 11, 11, okay. 11, so. 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11. This should be his in-lap. Well, it will be, but for the wrong reason. <laughs> yeah. So it could be fuel. Maybe there was an issue on the last, uh, last yeah. stop, didn't get the fuel yeah. in or the amount of fuel they're expecting. And again, you know, that's a that, that could be a slight issue. You know, every second counts in the pit lane. If the fueler, you know, tired, shattered, yeah, he's been up for 36 hours already, probably nearly. If he just pulls it off a second too early, half a litre too little fuel, suddenly the car's going into limp home mode. Mm. The car speed's too consistent for, for fuel. Yeah, I think you're I'm right. I'm fairly sure yes. it's, yeah. it, he wouldn't be travelling back at that speed. Um, Stuck in a gear? Yeah, could be. Could be something like that. See, fuel is more fixable because you can slosh some more yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. Missing gears, much harder to slosh a few extra gears in. Now, in the pit lane, when you have to turn it off, turning it off and on again is less of a gamble maybe than doing it out on circuit. Mm. Do you want me to stop and recycle uh, and cycle through? If you're still going, no, God's sake, get it back yeah, here. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. then if we need to hit the electronics with a big hammer, at least you're with us. I mean, the pace, although it is a slow car, clearly, it's not a snail, is it? This is going oh. at a, a, a half decent pace for a car with a problem. It looks it's, like it's, it's slow zone speed, isn't it? And uh, is, it a, is it possible that the limiter might have it looks about 100, 120k, so yeah, it's, it's out of a, a slow zone 80k. Yeah. So limiter. now, what is his advantage? What have they got in the in the bag? What are they going to lose? He is. It's about a lap, isn't it? 30. It's nearly a lap ahead of mm. real teams Norman Nato. Well, he's going to have to come in, come what yeah. may, and yeah. then we'll see what they do. I mean, it, it could be that they refuel it and send him out. It could yeah. be that they have to do something more. Uh, there uh, is Nato. And real team, this is the car that's smoking a bit more than anybody likes the look of, isn't it? Yeah. So then, third place racing team Netherlands, no wonder they want him to keep off the kerbs, because the car in second ahead of racing team Netherlands is smoking a lot. We've got an hour and 45 minutes to go. It's a full Grand Prix distance, basically, still to run. Yeah. Well, here he is, Ben Hanley is in the pit lane, the team ready to receive him, and what can be done? They'll have had a good dialogue on this inlet, won't they? Mm. Team to driver, Darren, so they'll know what to uh, expect. The Gibson engineer, we understand, has been waved away down in the pit lane, so for the moment it's fuel, but you would do that anyway. Yeah, yes. fuel's always the first thing, but there's no jockey wheels getting no. ready, so it doesn't look like they're going to take the car back into the garage at this point, so maybe it is just a... Uh, the, uh, the other thing, of course, is, is they've got all the warning lights in the garage. Mm. They can mm. see what the car is telling him. And if the car is going bing, 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 you've got no gas, they may be pretty calm about it. But, again, it's turned off and turned on again. The key will be, if and when it fires up, what happens mm. then? Well, it's fired up all right, yeah, because in the background awesome. I can yeah. hear it uh, accelerate away as, as we got okay. to put the pit lane, so off it goes. So all they've done is put fuel in, as far as we know. Yep, Hanley stays in, and the, the car is up. Now, the question is, does it make it up the hill? Does it make it round the next lap? Does it go when he releases the speed limiter? Yes, it does. That's, yeah. that's a, driving at a normal pace. All right, so come back to Darren's point. It was too consistent a speed to be fuel, so... I could be wrong. Well, <laughs> it, it, it's interesting, uh, though, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, because it was a long, a long lap he was yeah, at that speed, wasn't yeah. it? So, you'd... Wow. so Duncan tells us it was fuel from the pit lane, that, that it was a, a fuel issue. So I suppose having identified that, they said, right, go at that pace, yeah. that will get you back. They right. got the figures to be able to relay that to the driver. Ben yeah. Handley probably arrived on the vapours, but Ooh. he arrived. Is this two WRTs, nose to tail, nose to tail? It is, yiffy yi, is. just out of the pits, and Robin Freens hooning up behind him. Did Freens get by? No, is I don't that think he did. It is 31? 41 ahead, so yiffy has kept the lead on his outlap, and now Robin Freins has got to try and go for this. So this is because of the extra stop that 31 has made, costing it the time by having to come back in to right. do the other tyres. So remember, he did one stop for fronts, one for rears, and it's lost time as a consequence of that. That's why 41 is back in the mix. So now we've got a proper battle for position for the class lead, and it's this inter Nissan fight between the WRT cars. A hundred minutes, and there's not a hundred feet between the two cars. You know, that's 10 meters maximum. This is going to be pretty spectacular. 
And this will age Van Van Vos. If he had much hair left, he would may, may well be to be tearing it out later. Because if you've got two cars, you want a one-two finish. But with 100 minutes left to go, you don't want to start going, OK, guys, stay where you are. You don't, Darren, want either of these drivers starting to sort of nod off a bit. Now, and I know that seems silly at the speed they're going, but if some of that adrenaline goes, then suddenly mistakes come in. I don't think the adrenaline's going anywhere at this stage. No. When they're that close together, they're, they're fully dialed in. And it was about 10, 12 hours ago, it was exactly this gap yep. we had, wasn't it? Under a second, they were fighting yep. it out. For um, about four or five hours through the night, they, and they were literally pitting on each other's back bumper, and it was coming and going and coming and going, depending on who was in the tar car and what fresher tyres they had. Would you want to be Van Sam Voss right now? I oh. think that's a, that's a yeah. tough one. Uh, number 33 Aston is in just quickly. Ben Keating, who did a, a shortish stint earlier, so it might be that that car's got another issue. And uh, Felipe Fraga will replace yeah. him in that car. A and I think that's now Ben Keating has completed all yeah, his time right. in the car, yeah. and bang, let's get Felipe in. And we're back timing, end. hour and 40 minutes. Um, Three stops, two, three stints, two stops. Is that why they will have come back in at that particular time? Is that it's now a complete set of stops to the end and no splash required? I think so. Yes. It's you know, we're, we're in that zone, aren't we, Darren? Where you're now, you're now working back from the ultimate target, which is the checkered flag. Yeah, Fraga's going to go out and then he'll have one more stop and then that's that'll be the checkered flag and. I think now, with the way that it played out for Ben, he must have done about six hours and 30 minutes, 35 yeah. minutes. Um, so more than probably most of the, uh, the bronze drivers in the Pro-Am uh, GTE. Well, they all have to do at least six hours. Correct, yes. um, and what you don't want to do is put the car off kilter by going, right, you've done six hours, I've only done three laps in my stint. Yeah, come on anyway. Mm. You know, mm. let, let the stint play out, let the driver, I mean, you know, these guys are paying to race at Le Mans, don't hoik them out the car the second that they've done their six hours. But they're racing at Le Mans and they want the result. Yes, they do. So yeah, they, yeah, yeah. they are always aware that, you know, minimising their time to the six hours is going to be the most efficient. Um, there, are, there are two or three drivers in the AM class, Ben Keating is one, Francois Perodo another, absolutely, and Egidio Perfetti, although he's no longer in it in this race, they are as quick as half the silver drivers in that field. Leader is in, incidentally. Yeah. Uh, just to mention, Mike Conway has brought number seven back in. We were saying a little while ago that uh, Jose Maria Lopez could be on here to be only the second Argentine winner of the event. Yes. If, uh, things go as they are at the so moment. It's another Jose. Seven. Yes, Ronin Gonzalez in Indeed. 54. With? A Ferrari. Driven also by? Mike Hawthorne. Morris Trantingham. Morris Trantignon, was it? Oh, good stuff. You You've go. looked that up. Were you <laughs> both uh, commentating back then? Is that how you know? Uh, yes, well, oh, I was you listening were, to Martin. Your as alter I, I, ego, I was in you? my pram. <laughs> <laughs> this is your opportunity. No, it's no, no, no. It no, is no, your no, opportunity. No, no. Come on, Nev's got to invoice us. Oh, that's true. Uh, possibly in a moment. We'll, we'll, we'll mm, see whether yeah. we can um, raise Neville Hair. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> swine, Haven, swine. Uh, so, yes, Mike Conway back into the race. Now, is he going to stay behind the wheel to the very end here? Do you think he's got another hour and a half to go? He's been in it for a while anyway. Yeah, how in, long's he been in? This is his first stint since getting back in the car, isn't it, at this stage? Because it was just over the two-hour mark, maybe no, two hours is, 30. Uh, this has is he his, done one already? He's done three now on the, on the bounce. Oh, has he? And then Pachito did four before that. And I, I, actually, do you know what? I've, I've got to say, Toyota being Toyota and this being a hypercar in the first race of the hypercar era, Japanese Toyota are going to put Kaz Nakajima in. Yeah, they yeah, are. Yeah. And this car's never won. The number seven team have not won either. And Nakajima yeah. has had four consecutive poles and zero wins here at Le Mans. Yeah, Mike, Mike's in his fourth of four. Prior to that, Pachito did four. Mm. So, I mean, it should rotate round to Kaz anyway, and I would think that he's the man they're going to put in. And Kazuki is in the number eight car now. Uh, where is he? He is... This is stint number four coming up for him. And they're short stints in car yeah. eight. Yeah. I mean, that's a seven. They've had a, an eight, a six, an eight, a six, a seven. Well, nine, uh, seven, seven is coming down as well. You know, from 13 and 12 for Pachito's first couple of stints, then it's been 12, 10, 9, 9. So they're still managing a, a, a fuel pickup issue of, or fueling yeah. issue of some kind. It's not as, as 
debilitating maybe as, as the number eight car. Uh, just going back to seven, when we're talking about maybe a Japanese driver at the end, mm. we're thinking Kamui Kobayashi, aren't we? Because Nakajima's in eight. Yes, I, yes, did I say...? You did say Kazunaki right, no, okay, no. I, I knew what you meant, because yeah. the, the Japanese driver for the, for the glory, for the headlines and all of yeah. that. Well, and, and because, because, it, because of the home audience, it, it obviously there's no translation. It translates very well, obviously, if you've got the, your Japanese race winner. But also because he's the guy who's put it on pole. And actually, because it's his turn. Yeah, that's yeah. more to the... It's part of the schedule, isn't it? Yes. You know, yeah. if they're all Conway started, four. Yeah. And, and they're cycling through, and uh, this is Mike's last of four, and to go to the end, he would have to do a seven-stinter, basically. And, and so it is... Um, yeah, it is Kamui's turn, and I, I think that they will very like... You know, they're, they're fairly methodical in the way they do these things. Looks like Mike's still in the car, though. That's because yes. this is his fourth stint. So this will be his last hurrah. I would think this will be his last, yeah. And then they'll possibly put Kobayashi in for the very end. Good it's not his blimp. fifth, is it? Looms over the circuit. No, it's his, well, it is no, it's his, his fourth, He's yeah. done for it, it's his fourth. Yeah. So, yeah, so, you know, it, it, normal patterns... If this was 12 hours ago, there'd be no question that he'd get out after four and then you'd put in Kamui and, and so on and so on. The fact that the chequered flag is possibly looming, they won't mind. You know, obviously, each of them would love to be the driver that comes across the line in tears, and, and whoever's behind the wheel will be in tears, and so will all, all stout men. However, frankly, in the greater scheme of things, if you win Le Mans, you don't care who was the guy who actually no, finished the race no. because you race as one. And Darren, again, like Ollie, you know, when you're with your teammates, and especially when you get to the end of something as tortuous and, and you know, and harrowing as a Le Mans 24 hours, you are a band of brothers, you are one. And, and whoever's driving a car is whoever's driving a car, you are one. You race for each other as well as with each other. And every driver gets a part of the race, you know. Uh, I've done the start many times and had a go at qualifying, and I've never finished the race when, when we've won in 07, 08 and, and 17. It was Brabham both times in, yeah. in the GT1 car and, and Johnny Adam in the, uh, in the GTE car. Um, but I was lucky enough to get the shout for, for qualifying. So yeah. as long as each driver gets something personally from the race that they were able to do for themselves and as a collective... And the trophy. Yeah, you've, uh, you've had a trophy. great... You know, we, we had that in 17 with, yeah. with the, the last stint by Johnny, oh. uh, me doing qualifying and yeah. Daniel Sarah walking away with the lap record that year. It was each of us all picked something from there that was... Yeah. Uh, really special for and, us and as individuals. What, yeah, what, a, what a final stint battle that was. Uh, we could be seeing the same from WRT for the win in LMP2. And this battle for fifth in class is building up because Paul Resta is on the tail, or almost on the tail, of Renga van der Zander. It was just under two seconds when they came over the timing line, and Paul Resta still trying to salvage something better than sixth out of the event in 23 from United Autosports. So that car pushes on and the gap continues to come down. So De Resta, Alex Lynn, Wayne Boyd, Ooh. much was expected of that car, but can it get one more place before the end as van der Gaarde comes into the pit lane here? Third in Pro-Am, tyre change, he's staying in. I think he will stay in until the end. Go, 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 go. So waving him away. That car third in Pro-Am, Real Team's Norman Nato has just left the pits, second in Pro-Am. Ben Hanley in the Dragon Speed car with that half a slow lap. His own personal slow zone following him around. Oh, he was in. He, um, that is still the Pro-Am leader. Just ahead of Ben Hanley, the Duquesne car is coming in. So the 22 car also comes in from United Autosports. And interesting news from Duncan Vincent in the pit lane there, David. Which is that Ben Hanley did miss the pit in. The team was ready for him. He missed the pit lane entry and he had to do another lap and that's why he was low on fuel. So yeah. it was an error, a communications problem. But uh, good research, Duncan, well done. So it was a mistake. Ben Hanley missed pit in and had to do an extra lap. I would love Duncan to go down to WRT and ask, or get, get Van Sam Voss on the mic and say, how tough a final hour is this going to be? He's been in this position before, that races like this part 24 yeah, yeah. hours, numerous times, but this is a new venture for them, a new adventure for them. And it's not just, can we win it against, you know, BMW and Mercedes and whoever else. It's how do you manage the two cars? And that's the real question. 
how is he going to manage the battle and how long can he let them get at it? So that's your task, Duncan Vincent. Get Van Zandt Vos on the mic and say, OK, listen, you know, we can speculate for, for a million years, but what are you yeah. actually going to do? And Vincent Voss is a great character as well. And as yeah. I think we were saying last night, he's got pretty much most of Belgium working for him now. Any Belgian racing driver that's achieved anything, you've got Thierry Tassin, Pierre Giordone, Kurt Mollikens, they're all involved in the team yep. uh, and uh, doing a, a great, great job. And so uh, Vincent Voss here to try to win, to try and get a 1-2, to try and cement a factory deal for the future for his prototype team. And knows all about Le Mans, because he raced here in the FIA GT period. That's in right. GT1 in, in, Vipers, in Vipers, you know, so he yeah. knows the race. He knows how to how to race this as a driver, and he knows how to race it as a team manager. He's learning how to race it as a team manager. So, and he also knows what results to deliver when to um, help with balance of performance in certain categories, <laughs> and, and when to keep one's powder dry. Well, I, I always go back to to the uh, GT1 era, where Mercedes dominated the FIA GT Championship. They won all 10 of the regular races, and Porsche had their backsides handed them to them on the plate. They barely got a sniff of the podium. Porsche won one race that year. Ask Alan McNish which race he wanted to win. <laughs> and, and, the, and the same with Mercedes. Mercedes won the FIA GT Championship. Porsche won Le Mans. I know which sticker looks better on the back of a car. Indeed, yes, yes. Can you imagine the sigh of uh, relief by Ben Hanley? Uh, when he, he did it, make yeah. it back to the pit lane, yeah. having made that error of going one extra lap from doing 11 lap stints to 12 lap stints. And uh, now that makes more yeah. sense. He would have had a high gear and just low yeah, throttle yeah, yeah, yeah. and just kept the momentum going Basically all the way around. on idle, yeah, on yeah. cruise. Yeah. 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 Uh, but I, I can now understand why possibly there was no team radio replayed there, because <laughs> most of it would have been fairly fruity effing and jeffing from, uh, from the driver behind the wheel. So... Uh, OK, Ben, just calm, calm, calm. <laughs> Imagine that was Seb Wemmy. It would be just like a, a lap-long string of invective. Or Guido van Lagarde. <laughs> uh, sorry, or uh, Fritz van Eerd, I should say. Fritz van Eerd yes. after the, the, yeah, the well, last it could have been. Hours. He would have gone twice to speak. It would have been powered by, <laughs> by cuss words. That's exactly a fair right. point. Exactly right. So we have got just under an hour and 28 minutes to go. It is still looking good for Toyota, even though the cars may not be quite as bulletproof as they were uh, a little while ago, but they're still in the box seat, of course, for yep. another win for a 1-2 and to make history by being victorious in this first hypercar year. Yes, absolutely right. A lap between them, number seven car leads number eight by a lap. There's a lap back to the Alpine in third place. And then there is a, well, on the same lap, in fact, is the fourth place Clickenhouse of Olivier Platt. And then there's two laps back to the fifth place Clickenhouse, uh, currently being driven by Ryan Briscoe. So the hypercar field of five is covered by four laps. That's not a big margin if you have a problem. If you're in, the, in Toyota right now, you have everything crossed. Hopefully, everything's under control, but they've got issues now that they didn't have at midnight last night. And you don't want things to escalate. Absolutely. So. You know, keeping that under under control is going to be absolutely critical. A good reminder is the number of grey lines on the timing mm. screen, all those retirements, which has, now they've all been confirmed, has become a longer and longer and longer list uh, over the last uh, half an hour to an hour or so. So that is uh, just a reminder of, of the mortality rates of yeah. the race. Darren Turner has completed his last double-double, so we welcome back to the booth Ollie Gavin. Ollie, get, getting down to... The nitty gritty last 90 minutes. This yeah. is this is really nervous times when you're not in the car, isn't it? Uh, it? It is, and it's the business end of the race. You know that uh, you know this is what it really all comes down to. This is what all the engineers, all of the the, the team managers, the crew. The drivers have been working towards, and this is also when any tiny little slip up is absolutely punished. And, uh, you know, it's make or break for, for a number of teams here. And, yeah, the pressure mounts. And, uh, you know, you really get to see the metal of some of the guys, whether that, like I say, the, 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 it's the engineers making those decisions for that final set of tyres that's going to go on the car or the driver that's driving that final stint or all that, the crew for that final really pressurised pit stop. Yeah, it, it is that. This is really where you earn your money. So we, we just saw a picture of Alex Brundle sitting in the pit lane. That's his car being driven by Renga van der Sander, half a second ahead of the United car of Paul de Resta. So... At what stage 
is Alex going to be able to relax? You know, he's sitting there, keyed up, ready to go, trying to hang on to this top five finish for Inter Europol in LMP2. But, you know, when you're waiting to get in, are you really charged up or does that not happen until you actually slot yourself into the seat of the car and then the heart starts to pound? For me, it was always that I was more nervous before getting in the car than, than when I actually got into the car because it's like when you get in, it's your environment, the environment that you've done all those miles of testing. It's your happy place. It's the place that you're mo most, most comfortable with. And so, you know, I, I always found that I was just amped up, really amped up in the pit box. And it was only once I got to the car, I was like, right, now I'm going to go. Yeah, yeah. Our GTE AM leader is in the pits, Alessio Rovera. He is in the 83A of Corsa car. You've seen that on pit road. He's done an outstanding job this yep. season because he's come from the Italian GT Championship in which he was the champion, but it's not one that necessarily gets a lot of kudos. Yep. And here he is on a much bigger stage and he's delivering and he's error free. Yeah, no, he's been very, very impressive. And, and as a world endurance rookie, mm -hmm. you know, he comes into a into a well-proven team. The car works well. It's well financed. It's well set up. It's well run. So he's got everything going on his side to be allowed to show his ability, but he hasn't slipped up. He has absolutely delivered on that. And, I, I, had a, I had a couple of messages from Tom Ferrier uh, a few hours ago, and he was sort of Never saying... Can, can, yeah. <laughs> he, was, he was saying, can you see a chink in the armour with the 83 Ferrari? And I was like, oh, I'm not sure that I can. Mm. You know, they have been rather relentless in that car. Great driver lineup, really executing with the pit stops. But, uh, yeah, it's, it looks like it's a... a tall order if TF Sport in their Aston Martin 33 car is going to overhaul them to, to take the victory in GTE AM. But, you know, it's still an hour and 23 yeah. minutes. It's the same situation that the Corvette's got against the AF Corsa Ferrari and Pro. It needs to have a problem. Yes, no, it it's not it, going to happen on pace. You no, know, it's not. And, and, and uh, you know, I had a couple of messages as well with the, with the Corvette boys and, and, you know, they're giving it all and they're, they're try, they've tried everything with the strategy. They've got Antonio in the car, fully primed. Uh, but it's just not quite enough, and it looks like, if anything, that the 51 AF Corsa Ferrari just has that little bit more performance on tap. Well, the, the question is, who has got tyres left? You know, have Ferrari burned all their tyres? Are they going to run well, into that problem? Have Corvette got a little... You I know, think... we, we think about... Darren talked about 2017, that GTE Pro chicane jumping last half hour with, with Johnny Adam, and who was in the Cor Corvette? It Jordan Taylor. Jordan. Yeah, I mean, you know, what an epic finish. But an hour before that, it looked like it was all fairly stable. Yeah, but, uh, it, and but that had been unravelling for, yeah. for a number of hours. Yeah. yeah they, they, they started to have an AC problem inside the, the number 63 car. All the drivers were, were slowly being cooked. And unfortunately, Antonio actually got fully pretty much fully cooked before the end of the race, and so he couldn't finish. See, that much is not evident from the outside, and that's something the team don't go, oh, well, actually, you know, our drivers are really knackered because the aircon's not working, so, you know. So so all of that is being managed internally, and, yeah, and, yeah, absolutely. and we, you know, we don't yeah, see like this, that. Like this, like this issue with Toyota, the, mm. the, the problem that Toyota yeah. have. But maybe debris on track exiting Marshall's post 13, just quickly to mention. But that was yeah. one of the things that they really focused super hard on with the C8R, was to make sure belt and braces with the AC unit in the car, that this that would never happen again. Yeah. They learn from their mistakes. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and that's what motor racing is. It is a constant string of mistakes that you must learn from yep. because you can't go repeating the same errors. But it does look like that 51 car has just got that tick more speed. And yep. they're taking left sides, the, the 51 car is at most stops. And the last stop they took left sides. Yeah. I think Antonio's trying to go to the end on the same set, I think. But it seems to be a good year in terms of endurance success for Ferraris, doesn't it? Spa, yep. Le Mans times two, two class wins here. So uh, often you think Ferraris are, are fast on, but fragile. They're, they're on Michelin, so. Leo? I was just letting, I was giving you the same response that you've given me for the last 20 hours. <laughs> that, that's tumbleweed <laughs> blowing through. <laughs> Duncan, pick up for God's sake! <laughs> it's, all, it's all getting harder. Rather, it's been a decent year then for Ferrari, <laughs> with a Spa 24 win and two Le Mans wins coming up. Potentially, potentially. yes, yes. absolutely. In, in, and on their Michelin tyres.
And in fact, if anything were to befall TF Sport, then suddenly Ferrari are looking at an AM class clean sweep mm. because they are first, third, and fourth. TF Sport is the only car that's breaking up that domination. Here's the 80 car. This is the Iron Lynx car that is currently in third place. Was that Mateo damage on the, on the right front of the nose? Was that's that from the contact with Sam Bird? No, because it was a different Ferrari. It's been there for a while. Yeah, Sam yeah, yeah. Bird tripped over the Inception car in the night. Ah, oh, that was it. But that has, uh, we don't know how that happened, but it's been there for a while and it doesn't seem to have affected the pace yeah. at no. all. It's like one of the old Formula One little little winglets that they yeah, used yeah. to have, those appendages on the, on the side. Used to have. Well, they, they're not as ugly now as they were, let's put it that way. Well, the, the car is now 99.9% .9 appendage and 0.1% <laughs> driver, isn't yeah. it? You know? <laughs> However, looking here at our battle, Renga van der Sander, United Autosports, when is this going to be interrupted? I'm going to answer my own question now. Alex we saw, ready to yeah, go. We saw him in the garage, didn't yeah. we? Ready to take over. I still find it strange that um, in autosport he was uh, regarded as a LMP2 stalwart. You don't think Alex is old enough to be a stalwart, as they're way out wide goes Felipe Fraga in the Aston Martin, and Paul Deresta threads his way through the traffic. But That's such a this... tricky part of the yeah. racetrack, and it's always one where I'm breathing in and... Right, uh, it's... Martin, it's interrupted now, um, as I interrupt Holly, because into the pits comes 34, Alex Brundle to take over from van der Zander. Yes. Yeah, this is the end of his 11th lap, so the final full stint for... Our DVZ, whatever, Renga van der Sander. <laughs> That'll do. <laughs> yeah. I don't, you know, if Renga, you have to explain it. But... Renga and Kuba Gamaziak, just uh, Schmikowski, just don't fit spreadsheets very well. You have to make the driver entry list much too wide. <laughs> you know, and then you get Rob Bell. First world problems. <laughs> I know. Yes. <laughs> right, driver change here, Martin. So yeah. uh, Al Brun is going to get in. The boy Brundle. Yes, that's the one. <laughs> Young Adders, that's the boy Brundle there. <laughs> <laughs> and he'll take the car to the end. Yes. We heard from him earlier talking to Duncan, and if you close your eyes or you, you forgot which, which race you were at, mm. it could be Martin talking, yeah. couldn't uh, it? That apple didn't fall very far no. from the tree at all, did it? No, indeed. No. Thoroughly charming, very fleet of foot, and talks a good game as well. Mm. Right, so uh, Alex Brundle will take it to the end, and RVDZ gets out, takes his seat, and uh, goes and... Yeah, watches the rest of the race. Yeah, Rango's done a solid job in that car. He's, he is a uh, solid performer in the US, in the IMSA Championship, driving for Chip Ganassi in the Cadillac. And, um, you know, he's now become quite a, quite a name in the US in, 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 uh, in that class, in the DPI, and uh, quite spectacular at times. And, uh, you know, there's another name that we should be seeing back here at Le Mans as well in years to come. You know, we saw, we saw uh, Cadillac power in our Legends race, but to have a factory Cadillac program back here again... He will be know. in something, yeah. there's no doubt. Yeah. You know, he is, he is sort of like of this current era of, uh, of, of prototype drivers. He's, he is one of the best. In the frame, isn't yeah. he? No yeah. question. Be great, great to see a Wayne Taylor racing car back here oh, as well, and yeah. you know that's devoutly to be hoped. I'm not sure what Cadillac's program plans are. I'm not sure if they're sure yet, but it would be very good to see Wayne Taylor racing back here at Le Mans. Race leader on lap 351, incidentally, with an hour and 16 minutes still to go, and still we have the five hypercars locking out the top five places within the order. And Vincent Voss does not necessarily want to talk to us because he's a bit focused on what's going on in his class battle. But what is happening is that the gap has stretched because a couple of laps ago it was 10 seconds. Now it's up to 15 and a half as uh, Yiffye, former resident of Le Mans, pulls clear of Robin Frins. Tom Blomqvist is third, still fending off Will Stevens in that duel that they've been having really all day. Yes, uh, that's, that's pretty spectacular, actually, that those two have been going at it for that long. And, uh, you know, both of those cars are pretty equal in, in pace. And then maybe Tom's just got, got the edge over Will, uh, you know, to take the, the third place. But, oh, it's been a, a real battle for all of them. And brilliant, again, it's a brilliant class. Yeah, and yeah, again, you know, you've all you can do is keep driving the car on its door handles and hope that nobody else's accident comes to find yeah, you. Yeah, and also you hope that, that, that all of your team keep delivering, yep. you know, with all of those bits and pieces we've been talking about, you know, whether it's that pit stop or it's that set of tyres or, you know, it's the, the driver himself executing and, you know, being advised on certain things. And if you've got a, you've got a spotter that's telling you, you know, where certain things are, are happening. 
So Ranga van der Zander, fresh out of the car, and he's done a good job uh, for the Inter-Europol competition team. Ranga van der Zander in the pit lane with Duncan Vincent. Ranga, you've done a very good job there, very good job. It's uh, a cracking good stint for you. A good stint for you there. You must be happy with how the, dra the drive has gone for you there. It was really powerful. Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, you know, we struggled kind of in the beginning of the race, and uh, the, the track is rubbering in again after the rain. And that's really suiting our car well. Um, you know, these guys, big compliments to them to, uh, to you know, put, put a team together here um, in the WEC. New drivers, new team, new engineering, new everything. And uh, I think we were pretty fast out there, so I was, uh, I was enjoying it. And thoughts on the end of the race, that you look quite strong in a good position? Yeah, I mean, I haven't seen the timesheet yet, but uh, there was a car just behind me, I think it was United, and uh, I think that's the one we're fighting. Alex Brundle is in the car now, he, uh, he knows what to do, he's good enough to... Uh, to you know, he has, this done, he has this, done this race so many times, so he knows what to do, and... Uh, you know, I'm going to sit back, relax and watch, but uh, it's exciting, man. It's such a cool race. It's Hi. nice to see some fans out there again and uh, see you guys um, here at Le Mans. I mean, it's, uh, I'm enjoying it, but uh, so far, I think we can be very proud of what we're doing here. We can see the smile under your mask. We can see that big grins there. Well done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You can hear it in his voice as well, can't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And actually, he's starting to get a mid-Atlantic twang. That's going to work very well for him, is it? <laughs> awesome to be here. And actually, you know, just before we went there, we were seeing some shots of the crowds, you know, a few jupilers being opened and a little bit of warm Sunday afternoon being enjoyed. And uh, it is just really nice and the, the slight feel of the beginning of normality returning yeah. to have fans at the race hopefully it, next year will be much more open because i know there's an awful lot of people watching at home in the uk across europe in the states mm. you know wherever else who would normally be here and, and are desperately missing their week-long holiday with like-minded friends at the end of which they hold a motor race absolutely you know and it was it's something that with a lot of US car owners wanted to come over and, mm -hmm. and, and see this event. They, they make, regularly make the pilgrimage to come here and, you know, with, a, with certainly I'm talking again with my Corvette racing hat on, but, but you know, the, the C8 are debuting here. They, they wanted to see that car coming out yeah. onto the track. And I know the date's been announced for next year as, as June, but I wonder whether the August date in some ways hadn't been a, a good thing for the ACO because it would be in school holidays. Does that bring more people here or is it a problem? It, it, do you need the tradition of June? Does having it in August with that slightly extra element of darkness help or hinder the event? You know, I know tradition says it's in June, but mm. does it have to be? Well, it always has had because that's where there is least darkness. Mm. I, th I think that's it. It's always been the week of the longest day. But now we've proved it can run in August or September. Yes. Well, lighting being marginally better than it was in 1923, <laughs> you yes. know, I think that's... You know, I don't, yeah. without wishing to be facetious, I think that's entirely possible. Kamu Kobayashi, yeah. as it, predicted, takes the car to the end. It, you know, as, as routine as night follows day, it's his turn to get in the car, and yeah. there's no good reason why you wouldn't, and lots of good reasons why you would. And lots of enthusiastic Toyota fans mm. there with flags old and new, ready to cheer the car home. See, and you thought that once he'd driven the Alpine, Fernando Alonso would just go home. Yes, I did. No, he's yes. been there with the fans, <laughs> with his old race suit on, looking as trim as ever. Uh, and divided loyalties here, because, of course, he is an Alpine driver, mm. Alpine in third. He's a former double winner for Toyota, Toyota first and second. So, actually, no divided loyalty at all. Whatever happens, you know, he's happy. He's happy for his former teammates. He's happy for his current yeah. employer. Yeah, indeed. Right, so out onto the road again goes number seven. And Kamui Kobayashi now with an hour and 11 minutes on the clock set to bring that to the end and finally, finally, finally find wood to touch. I um, know, I know. car number seven which was a, a, a lucky years number, a very unlucky Toyota number, seemingly. Looks like it's going to, at long last, exorcise those demons. Well, the, and the Yost story is a funny one, isn't it? Because uh, uh, Reinhold Yost, before the Audi era, won two pairs of Le Mans in back-to-back -back mm. seasons with the same chassis each time, repeating the next year, and on all four occasions, numbered seven. So there is a little, and you know, seven is is a lucky number. Actually, in in a lot of Asian cultures, eight is the auspicious number. But a lot of a lot of Westerners feel that seven is a lucky number. 
So, you know, maybe it is time for, for luck to be on their side. Certainly, it won't be for want of trying. And 92 has not had a lot of luck in this race. I mean, they, they've almost been... Um, quite sure what the adjective is. I mean, they've tried as hard as they can, but they have never looked totally at the races. Right, mate, still, really, aren't they? still the legacy yeah. of, of the crash in Hyperpole. You know, but it's not quite been right. No, I don't, I don't think either car has been. I'm no, not sure the no, Hyperpole yeah. thing has had too much of an influence on it. It's just, it, maybe it's just taken a slight shine off of it. But I just don't think either car has had that level of performance mm. that the 51 clearly, well, the 51 and 52 clearly went to. Mm. They were really taking the race to Corvette, and Corvette has just been nibbling away all the time at the heels of the of the Ferraris. But really, the Ferraris have controlled the race. Indeed, number eight Toyota was into the pit lane. Yeah, I mean Ferrari didn't do much shouting during qualifying or practice. Saved itself for the race and got it absolutely spot on. 38 has just come down the pit lane. The Jota. LMP2 car, but significantly so too. Number eight, there it is, out of second place. I think Roberto Gonzalez will bail out of the 38 car. I'd be surprised if he's got any more time to do. So who would you put in? Well, Antonio Felix da Costa, probably. Yeah, I think he would go to the end. There goes number eight car, no dramas. But what? <laughs> Ollie's playing with the laptop. Uh -oh. uh, seven laps now is all they can go on a stint. The last for Mike Conway was a seven lapper. The last for Kaz Nakajima was a seven lapper. In fact, they'd done two seven lappers before that, a couple of eights and a couple of sixes. Yeah, that was because of the door problem on eight, wasn't it? That yeah. They had to do a, a shorter stint and repair the door. Well, that was one of them, but they were able to do that because they were having to do a shorter stint because yep. they're fuelly issue anyway. So. Yes, it's it was a bit chicken and egg, that pit stop, really. Yeah. Who you believe. Yeah. Uh, did they sort out the door because they were coming in, or did they come in because they had to sort out the door? Well, the legacy of the stop is they never got back to 11 lap runs. No, 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 indeed. So no. They've been but they did get back up to eight, which was what they were doing before <laughs> yeah. six. So there's a kind of yeah. positive. You have to go WRT, with it. WRT, here. here we go. Penultimate round of stops. Robin Freens stops first from second place. And that means that Yiffa Ye should be in next lap. Now, just remember the air jack drama for this car. So yeah. let's see, because the uh, car didn't change tyres last time. Can they? Well, they've got tyres ready, haven't they, Ollie? But uh, let's see what they, yeah. they do here. It'll be the fuel first. That's yeah. part one of the pit stop process. They're going to do tyres. They're going to yeah. do tyres for sure. So let's see how they do it and how much time this is going to lose. There's the, the, the inflatable just at the back. See the mechanic with it? Yeah. Oh. And, and you Maybe go, well, why weren't... don't they use a jack like they do in Formula 1? Because they don't have them. They have their no. own jacks on the car, so you don't bring things that you'll actually, never use. Actually, I'm not sure that they are going to do... Oh. 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 They're ready. They're ready just what in case. What do I know? <laughs> it's, maybe it's just left sides? Let's see. Well, there are... I can see at least oh, three tyres. Yeah, no, look, so the inflatable bag, you just see it at the back, you see it expand, the car goes up, Martin. Well, they did they not do rears once and then fronts the next time? So now they're back to rears because they don't want to spend too long squishing oh. it down to get the bag to deflate because you don't want to leave it under the car as it tries no, to leave, no, like high, calf, high class, class did on the grid on the with grid, the number yes, 20 car. Yes. Uh, so they've done the rears, so on the next stop, we assume they'll have to do the fronts. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That, that's... Uh... That's an unusual way of doing it. It is an unusual way of doing it, but needs must, you know, and at least they haven't materially altered the car. Remember, who was it three or four years ago where they had a starter motor issue? They had to take the rear body off, hit the starter motor, put the rear body on, and then the car would start. Yeah. And then they ended up drilling a hole above the starter motor so they could whack it with a pole and got excluded right. for changing the bodywork. <laughs> Yes, I do remember that happening. I can't was remember there the one team. of the LMP2 teams? Was it United? I can't remember. I don't, I don't remember the team, but you know, so you can't. Was it the Jackie do... Chan team? Might have been. Might anyway, have been. but it did happen, you're quite now, right. The question now is we've been talking about how we're going to manage WRT's battle for supremacy. Question really is with 66 minutes to go. What about Tom Blomqvist? He's the fly in the ointment. Yeah. How far behind is he? 25 seconds. And the air jack and may have going asked, to take answered the question. 10 or 15 seconds longer if they change tyres. And maybe they can't not change tyres. So suddenly, there's a very slender window. Mm. Yeah. Very slender. And that's come down from a minute to less than half a minute. 
uh, are having to manage the tyre wear, aren't they? And, that, yes. and, and the usage, because if you can only change two on the stop, then those fronts now are being given a real workover and they've got to get to the end of another stint. Yeah. You, you don't have the time with the facility available to do all oh, sets. And we've got damage on fast. 91. It's got rear damage. It's had a, a drama somewhere. It's gone off backwards. It's, it's had a big, big the... bite. Did it, oh, how did we not again. hear that? Can I see Daybreak? Oh. Has yes, that not gone off at the Ford Chicane? It, it has. has. It's left the rear bodywork on it the grass on the inside. Pop out and get that, would you? I, this I is how it looks. Oh, he's gone straight over that first part. And it's a big hit. Oh, the front fender guard is coming off as yeah, well. Yeah, this will be a, quite a launch here. Oof. So that's the diffuser just being yeah. ripped off. And, and actually, it's not being ripped off from the back, it's being ripped off from the front edge. So it's like torn the floor out of yes, the car uh, as well. Yeah, the diffuser And gone. where the floor goes, the mountings will be ripped to pieces as well. If he leads in LMP2, he is in. And are we going to get a slow zone for the debris? Let's hear from the 91 Porsche team. I am no break at the Porsche team. I had no break on the Porsche chain. Wow. Uh-oh. Scary moment, so that's yeah. why he was well, across the grass, there's and a, that's the legacy. There's a, ch there's a chance that if he ran wide, coming off of karting in the Porsche kerbs, yeah. the way that, that those cutouts work, it causes big knockoff on the brakes, and then he's maybe not tapped the pedal before he's come to the brakes into the Ford chicane, yep. and as he's gone for the brake pedal, it's gone all the way to the floor. I tell you what, he only just made the Dunlop curve there as well. Because he didn't yeah. know he'd lost his diffuser. Yeah, he, he does was now. way oh, yes. out there, wasn't he? Yeah. Now, now he does know. <laughs> yeah. So that car will have to come in, and we're going to have a yellow coming up, aren't we? Another slow zone to yep. get rid of all of the debris, which straddles one corner and another. So with an hour and three minutes to go, we are going to end up with a potential slow zone. On standby, on standby. Well, they need to have it at the Ford Chicane, Something which is Marshall by. Post 22. Is that, is that a... Right, standby for, for a slow zone. So it'll be a double slow zone. It'll be the last on the lap, which is from the Porsche curves through to the start-finish line, and then the first on the lap, which will be up to the S's. Yes. So it'll be a significant slow zone. Now, if you needed a stop, for WRT's Robin Freens, this is two laps too late. That Porsche is stripping itself, isn't it? Yes, and it's limping on at yeah. reduced pace, partly because of the damage and partly because of the brake drama. Mm. Yeah, and, and, and the unusual thing is that he's... OK, he had the problem going into the four chicanes with the brakes, but it doesn't look like, with the way he's driving the car, that he's got a brake problem no. now. Per se, no, yes. I agree. Because if, he, if, he, if there, one of the lines had gone or it, it, something had started to leak, the, the, the pedal would be consistently going to the floor. Yeah, he'd be crawling. Yes, that was a wild old ride across so the grass. Look, look at, at the fuse ago. Yeah. That's a huge bit of bodywork. Yes, it? it is. It's just going over yeah. that grass and that little hump, and it's just ripped it off. And when you see the back of the car, you realise how much has gone. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's only sort of the white wraparound bit. It's <laughs> how far yeah. under the gearbox, transaxle, and, and under the, you know, the main monocoque of the body. Look at it moving around. Yeah. It's going to feel horrible, isn't it, on the way yeah. out to the yeah. very, very, very sketchy. flighty at the yeah. back. Prepare there full course yellow. At full course yellow oh. is anticipated. Thirty. At fourteen fifty-eight thirty, we go full course yellow in twenty-five seconds. So yeah, Eduardo Freitas, the race director, tells the teams, and some of those teams now prepare a different pit stop strategy. But there's no real option with seconds. the amount of debris all over the road, is there? Yeah, no, it, about a third of the circuit Ten, needed to go nine, yellow eight, just for that seven, one incident. Six, He's carrying five, on. Four, he is, interestingly, three, yes, you're right. Two, one. We are under full Why? course yellow. We are <laughs> yeah. under full course to yellow. To try, I guess, to stay on their pit strategy. We have Marshall picking up debris mainly at 35 and in the area. And it clearly is. That's three, but we are also having marshals at other places on track picking up debris. It is drivable, but he's 10 seconds slower than he would mm. be with a car that had some aero. 
He did a 4.02 compared to a 3.50, and it was a lot quicker through the chicane than he would have been otherwise. Porsche has a plan, though, so they will have computed this quickly and decided what the best strategy yeah, is. And I suppose, yes, it is that keep the car on track. He knows the conditions of the car now. He knows yeah. what it will do. Black, orange, flag, car 91. Yeah, Black, like they orange, had a choice. It's going to be brought in anyway. Yes. Black and orange flag is that mechanical warning flag. So much damage has it been uh, subjected to. The scrutineers want to look, so the officials are saying, even if you don't bring it in, we'll bring it in for you. I, I, I think it's even less that. It's the fact that it is shedding so much debris. Yeah, they don't it. want the to stay yellow just because it throws more bits off. Let's hear from them. Okay, can you repeat? You want to fall off, right? Yes. In order not to do another stop, we would need you to do four more laps. Is that possible? Don't take any risks. You don't have to. I will be slow, but I will be the... Four minutes, but it's not to do. Okay, copy that. The next car behind is 13 laps behind you. It's not an issue. Right, so... But that didn't date well, did it, that message? Because no. that was before yes. they were told to come into the pit. So they're saying, yeah, you've got to continue. Yeah, but I can't drive it. You have got to continue. I mean, continue. Uh, it's, it's a little bit of an odd one for me, just because of the amount of damage on that car. Yep. And OK, yes, they've got a decent lead from, from the cars behind, but and I suppose the only thing that they're going to be looking at here is if one of the other cars in front has some form of catastrophic failure yep. Yep. that they could just keep circulating around seconds, and just pick up you know, one of those positions. Mm. But the car is significantly different. Yeah. to what it's designed to do eight, and how it's designed nine, to drive. Eight, so we're going seven, back to green. Six, and the race director five, has instructed four, 91 to come three, into the pits two, for mechanical one, repairs. Full course so the Thank continue you. option has been removed from the team. And Fred Makoviki will not have to, a uh, big pun, I yeah, know it is Fred, will not have to drive a 911 that is trying to spin on him every single time he gets it anything other than yeah, straight. I, th I think... Uh, I think that they will uh, fit it, uh, fix it as fast as they can and, and just get it together just so they can get the car out there to run that final lap. Yeah. yeah. As long as they're out there. The only problem is, you know, if they're trying to fit a diffuser, it will attach under the floor. And what's left of it under the floor yeah. may not be entirely no. clean and, and attachable. Then that, and that's going to be the thing, isn't it? What else is... Well, how? Yeah. How is what's, that all going to What can you fix it to? Yes, yes, yeah. You can't just gaffer it on. Not at the speeds we're doing here. You know, this is not messing around. These things are doing north of 250 kilometres now. Yeah, it's going to have, have to go up on the hijack so they can get fully underneath it to, you yeah. know, get a, a full... You saw Mike Conway high-fiving his team. His job here is done. And it is now in the hands of his teammate, Kamui Kobayashi, to take the car to the end. So... Waiting down at Porsche GT is Duncan Vincent. They are currently lying third and fourth in GTE Pro. AF Corsa lead from Corvette Racing in GTE Am. AF Corsa, TF Sport and Iron Lynx. Ferrari, Aston Ferrari is the top three. And there is a good battle going on in each of our classes. In fact, there are several good battles going on for position now, not just for the lead of LMP2, but for the uh, Pro-Am lead as well. Dragon Speeds, Juan Pablo Montoya leads in Pro-Am from Loic Duval at Real Team and Job van Oetert in uh, Racing Team Netherlands. And then fourth and fifth, next up, Ricky Taylor and Vincent Capillier. All the top uh, Pro-Am cars are within two laps of each other. And again, even that's though there's less than an hour to go, two laps is no margin if something goes wrong. Yeah, it's pretty amazing considering how much carnage and how many times so many of those cars have actually visited yeah. good sort of guardrails, gravel traps, had some pretty significant incidents, yep. and they're still running around. Roman Rusinov back in the 26G drive car, so he had a brief respite while Nick de Vries <laughs> took the car over. Yeah. Fall asleep in a garage at your peril. I mean, that you know, that's rules for life, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> he has no idea that he's been tie-wrapped to the chair. He's nobody's going to wake him up and tell him. <laughs> and he's not wearing a headset, so nobody can suddenly shout him awake. So he's, he is just going <laughs> to eventually find that he can no longer move. Yes. <laughs> Very good value. So Roman Rusinov going back out in the G-Drive car for the final hour. Pit stop also for Panis Racing, their fourth place in LMP2. Will Stevens ahead of Paul de Resta and chasing Tom Blomqvist. 
That's the battle for third place. And it might become possibly the battle for second place because Blomqvist in third for Jota in their 28 entry is not far behind, 27 seconds behind WRT's Robin Freens. The gap is coming down as 91 comes into the pits to head to, uh, towards Duncan. The gap is coming down. WRT have got a pit stop issue. Their onboard air jacks don't work. They are likely to have to change tyres at the last stop or risk running out of front rubber, and that might cost them almost everything in the second, third place battle, Graham Goodwin. Uh, hi there. Um, do we know if that car has another problem other than the tyre issue? We think it's just the jacking up that, that is it's, costing it's them so much time in the It's pit. losing time in every sector. That's because they can't change the tyres the way they want to. Yeah. They did rears two stops ago, they did fronts one stop ago, they did rears the last stop, so it's on a very mismatched set of tyres. Miss matched and mishmash actually set of tyres into the garage goes 91 unsurprisingly really it's it's gonna have it had to go there to get get this work done it is looking like a car that's had a tough life isn't it i mean yeah, it is. when you had the rain earlier on everything acquires a nice thick layer of grime and then yeah i think that the days of manufacturers polishing le mans winners to a high sheen have gone you know now they they just lacquer on the dirt and the flies and the muck and the rubber and the uh, should say in class, by the way, fifth in the class at the moment is the 52A of Corsa car, but that is how many? 12 laps back. Yeah. So they won't. They won't no. get a catch. Half an hour. Yeah. So their chances of uh, getting on the podium in the next 10 minutes need two of the three car, three of the four cars in front of them to retire. Which is possible, but there doesn't seem to be that much rain in the offing. So yeah, I wonder when like uh, when Antonio, well, when everybody will start to make their final pit stops in the in the GT classes. Uh, we've just seen the 64 car come in, and I think that that's ultimately the range that they've got that they'll be able to to, to get to the end from here. Oh really? Okay. Yeah, I think so. I think so. And um, so I think Antonio will go by at least one more time. So Everybody works yeah. going on. Let's sit on. Diffuser back on underneath. Well, right, that's quick work. They clearly have rehearsed a lot of this. Yeah. Well, and actually, from from racing in the US, they did develop some really quick sort of release bodywork and, and and quick fixes. Because yeah. you know, racing in in, in IMSA. You know, it's, there are some pretty aggressive racetracks, but there's also... <laughs> some pretty you know, aggressive driving. Pretty, pretty aggressive driving. And, yeah. I, and, and I know I knocked off at least two of their diffusers. Yeah. In, uh, by in accident. Oh, of course. What, yeah. Just leaving the grid? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the way, on that front, um, the, uh, happy to say there was a tweet, a tweeted apology to Nick yeah. Tandy from James Gallardo. Uh, windscreen fogged, apparently, at the start, which was the impact on the grid as they left the grid. Oh. So, public apology from James Canardo for that uh, hit. <laughs> and now he's woken up. <laughs> no, he's been woken up and then immediately realises, OK, OK. Yeah, it's me this year. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's, That's it, exceptional work for the Porsche team. Really impressive work. Which then makes okay. me sort of wonder, why did they what not now? do that immediately? Why did they try to get him to carry on? Yeah, what now is going on? OK, so it didn't have tyres before going in. They're giving him the last set of fresh air uh, tyres. Duncan saying that, oh, they're getting the wrong set. So uh -huh. is it a 92 set or that's just good, some really old ones? That's a good catch, because otherwise it would have been set that? out and it would have gone through the beacons at the end, yeah. the Michelin beacons, and then, and then they would have been... Excluded. Yeah, flagged up, and it would have been a penalty for sure. Yeah, yeah. that's the reason for that uh, slightly, and it is only a slightly extended stop. Straight line, the, the chicane after outbreaking himself, ripping off the rear valance and the diffuser in one hit. Right behind him, 30 is in. Tristan Gomedy setting the fastest lap for the Duquesne engineering car about half an hour ago, so... Still plenty of life in the car that was throwing itself at the scenery and, and in and out of the pit lane at an unmitigated rate early in the race. Would you like a little stat that is more extraordinary than it really should be? Go on, then. They, of course, have never won in GTM at Le Mans. That is ridiculous. Isn't it? But how they can they have. not have, really? how can they they just not have won? They've not won in GTM, they've not won in GT2. They've assisted other teams. A couple of SP Racing had some input. I believe at least one year of Racing Competizioni had some input. They have never won wow. as AF Corsa in GTEM, and they look like getting a double win 
as they sit they at really the threshold do. of their next adventure, which is, of course, as the major service provider for Ferrari's hypercar team in 2023. Yeah. Well, that would be a good way to come back, wouldn't it, as, as you know, double winners in 2021. It Fantastic. certainly would. And, of course, it then gives both teams a massive vault in the championship battle as well. Uh, you know, James Cardo, Alessandro Pierre Guidi champions two years ago? Yes. You know, and, and, Super the, uh, season. and, and the 50 points here will suddenly vault them right back into contention that's, with anybody and everybody. That's usually impressive to see the 91 car back out on track and it's rebuilt. Five yep. minutes. Five minutes, that's 16 seconds on pit lane for the number impressive. 91 car after... What you've got to say, Ollie, in previous years, that would have been a retirement. Yeah, yeah, it would have been. But it's uh, interesting that you've got uh, 15 lap old tyres on the front and two lap old tyres on the rear. So this is going to be a little bit sketchy for this first half a lap to a lap where he just feels everything out, yep. just gets everything going again. But it's, um, yeah, and I'm, and I'm sure that the car will definitely will feel different. They didn't bother sort of tightening up the front guard at all. That 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 body gap wasn't there before yeah. he went running yeah, across. For sure, the, 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 uh, yeah. the, the front part of the floor will be tweaked as well. Yeah. There'll be some alignment stuff, so the car is going to drive in a rather strange way. Yeah. But, but this, this is going to be about championship points for Porsche, the manufacturer's yeah. championship, the driver's championship less important for them, but with double points, that's critical for the championship in the FI World Endurance. Yeah. Uh, they, they were not going to be on the podium after that issue unless there's dramas ahead. Yeah. He said that out loud as well. Here comes the Corvette. 63 in for its final stop. Minutes and two seconds behind Alessandro Pierguidi. That answers the question I was going to go. Do you stop a full stop away from the expected end, or do you run to the end of this and then short fuel it a little later? Yeah, no, I think it's it's all about just getting the fuel in the car and seeing if there is a safety car, then you mm -hmm. can you stay out on track and you try and take advantage track position. of it. Track position. Eight Toyota in the pits from yep. second place, and well, conservatively bringing it home. 49 minutes to go now. The biggest battle I can see emerging here, gentlemen, of note is for podium positions in LMP2, and it is the 31 Team WRT Orica that uh, it's in trouble. It's it's rather... Yep. <sighs> it's it's uh, Robin hobbled, Freens hobbled, being I chased by Tom Blomqvist and potentially Will Stevens and maybe even Paul De Resta as well. Yep. You know, yep. you, you put the three of them together, there's quite a big gap, but not if you have an issue. 63, what's the issue there, Ollie? Did, did it take tyres? There were tyres out there ready to go, but I don't know whether they went on or not. See. If they have fresh tyres, you would take them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The Porsche, by the way, came out of the garage on the tyres with which it came into the pit lane. It took tyres. But because they were 75% sand, they basically just said, OK, we don't want to send those tyres out again. So they got another pair and another pair. So I assume the two-lap pair might possibly have done hyperpole. That's yeah, possible. Yeah, there go the tyres. Yeah. And that's a fall for one of the team members. So to Tom. get across the line. Tom Dix. So now it's, it's the number of people across the line with tyres. In, in theory, that might possibly just be a penalty, but hopefully... Hopefully the engine wasn't running. Yeah. Will Stevens, a fastest lap of the race for the Panis Racing car, still chasing hard, trying to force an error. Yep. In the Tom Blomqvist as well. You know, uh, Baker Pond pulled the rest as well behind him. Another fastest sector. Just to loop back to that Corvette. Pit stop. Uh, as long as the car didn't get dropped to the ground, then the engine wouldn't start. There's a yep. system on the Corvette to, to make sure that he can't start in the air. Uh, in the air. And so, uh, as long as they didn't pull the wand out and get the car on the ground, then the, in, then it would. So sophisticated the systems now. You know the auto kill thing, where when you stop the car, it automatically cuts the engine so it doesn't keep running on or push you into the, t the team or. It's Never trust the driver. Never trust the driver, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, like, it's like, don't let the general public have a say. Never trust a driver. Yes. It, it should be a, a rule, shouldn't it? It should be written in the statutes. The Ex 11th commandment. Excellent results uh, in sight now for into Europe or competition. Sixth place. They finished higher than that in other WC races, but third in the points in the WEC because the, a couple of the cars ahead of them are not full season championship cars. Manage Brundle's only 15 seconds behind Paul De Resta. I think that gap is coming down a little, isn't it? Mm, a little. Um, it, it's, it's doable, isn't it? it it's not going to take it, imagination to see that that could happen, and we've still got another stop for each of these cars. Now, yep. Will Stevens is on a bit of a charge, a 65 car, Manage Racing. You know, he's done the fastest lap of the race. 
and he's just done first and second sector personal bests. Have they told him which setting is full power, do you think? <laughs> <laughs> that, it, you know, it's the sniff of a podium yep. in the final hour. You, you're going to drive the car until it yeah. falls apart. Yeah. And, and, you know, he's done, he's done plenty behind the wheel today. Yep. And, you know, he's not going to be that fresh, but he's still pressing on. Impressive. Yeah. Well, again, you know, it's that fine loud that once the adrenaline pump starts going, yeah, you're it's... feeling no pain. No, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's, it, yeah. It, it, it manages to do an awful lot. So Jumping. Will Stevens has done nine hours and 13 minutes as we've got the 29 yop, car. Yop, 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 oh. yop, yop. Got away with that oh, one. Has been through so much gravel today, hasn't, hasn't it? Hasn't it? They've all had a go at it, hadn't they? You know, Fritz yeah. got caught out by rain. Renga's been in the gravel. He's been across the grass. Um, not Renga van der Zand, um, Guido. Guido van der Garde. Um, but that is the first off, I think. Uh, certainly the first off I've seen for Jop van Eiter. And he's been under real pressure to be quick and fast. Final stop for TF Sports' Felipe Fraga. Is this going to be a GTE AM win for Aston Martin? Will Ben Keating be on the top step of the podium? Will it be a first for Felipe Fraga? And yeah, will they get their hands on those trophies? He and Ben Keating and Dylan Pereira, or will the Ferrari hang on to claim what I... I I, I know you've checked it, and I, I don't have. doubt it, but it just seems incredulous that somehow AF Corsa have never had a class win at Le Mans, but they could end up with two here. Ferrari's leading in GTE Am and in GTE Pro. It's back-to-back -back fastest laps of the race for the 65 car for Will Stevens. Uh, and you say they've been in the car a long time. We've got, well, how many is that? One driver that has done more than 10 hours, 10 hours and 41 seconds, Norman Nato wow. uh, in the 70 car. Ross Gunn, nine hours and 53 minutes. Nine hours and 31 minutes for Antonio Felix da Costa. Nine hours and 16 minutes for both Mathieu Lahaye in the 84 uh, innovative car and Jerome Bleekermolen, uh, Ben Barneycoats uh, with nine hours and 12. Well, Stevens, 9.16. Um, they're Iron Man efforts, all yeah, of they them. Are. Absolutely. When you're getting up to the nine hours or ten, hour, ten hours around here, you really are. It's almost like doing a commentary shift. Yeah, isn't it? Nice. Nearly. 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 <laughs> Some strange noise the noise from the, the pit lane. Pit lane. Somebody, I think somebody's left a so microphone it's, open it's, accidentally. It's like a whining noise. Yeah. It's almost like a starter motor, but less effective. Into the pits comes United's number 22 car. This was the car that was hoping to get through into Hyperpole, hoping to claim pole position, hoping to defend their Le Mans 24-hour win, hoping to defend their World Endurance Championship LMP2 victory, hoping to defend their ELMS victory. I mean, United won everything they tried last year, and this year has just been... It's been a pretty wretched weekend, actually. In Road to Le Mans, the LMP3 cars did not have much in the way of, of good fortune going for them, and that sort of haunted them here as well. Every purple patch, Ollie, comes to an end, yep. but, boy, it's come crashing down around their ears this yeah, weekend, I mean, of all weekends. It's, it's been a little bit of a perfect storm for them, you know. The, the, the contact between the two sort of sister cars... Um, you know the one that, that happened up at uh, up at the Dunlop chicane. Yeah. Uh, with uh, you know, those two cars. 32 and 23. Yeah, it uh, was just remarkable. Remarkable. Just looking at the driver times as we get into the last 40 minutes uh, uh, soon. Uh, Satoshi Yoshino in the next two laps should yeah. be through and fine. But okay, Henry good. Hedman. Uh, Does he need more time in the car? Dragon he has five speed. hours, 59 minutes and nine seconds. Okay, he Ooh. needs to get in yes, because he does. they will exclude him. They will add time. Nuno's going on 22. Regular service for our GTE Pro leader. Yes. Of course, as there'll Alessandro. be an awful lot of eyes, awful lot of eyes from uh, Corvette Racing on this. Yep. Mira Konopka also needs to get back in. He's done another six minutes to complete Fans his six hours. In the grandstand. And isn't it great? <laughs> sunshine. The sunshine is here. The grandstands are filling for the end of this race. The traditional crowd at the end of this race. No, it's not as big as usual, but they are here in significant yep. numbers Full and enjoying set. it. Full set of brand new tyres in the final 40 minutes, just in case. Always have one round left in the chamber. Yeah. So Tom Blomquist, 17 seconds now from the back of Robin Schweins. 
Leading our innovative class is uh, the only car in. It's actually our Garage 56 entry, if you will. And uh, that car currently running in 32nd overall. Uh, Mathieu LaHaye is at the wheel, but it does look as though we were expecting a driver change. Was that Takuma yeah. Aoki who was getting ready? Look, look, like Takuma Aoki to meet yeah. both uh, Nigel and Takuma, by the way, have both done over six hours. Yeah. Extraordinary stuff. So Takuma Aoki getting ready to do the final stint in this car run by Frederick Sose and his crew. And fantastic perseverance by them to keep it clean. Have you seen the car have any dramas or any? No, no. there's been a couple of occasions we saw uh, one car almost stumble over it through the Porsche curves, yep. but uh, they were keeping the line. They were doing exactly what they should be doing. It's very clear from the rear of that car with a broad LED stripe at the back exactly who they are and what they're doing. Yep. So no real excuses there. They've been pretty They've faultless. Been, but you know, oh, we it, did have, no, apologies. It, it did have a stop up at the at Dunlop. Okay. Had a spin. Yes. One spin. Keep it on the island. Don't visit the pit lane unnecessarily. They have followed the cardinal rules almost to the letter. And that is the way you get a result here at Le Mans. Then you have to have a little bit of, of good fortune that other people's accidents don't find you, like they did for the Richard Mille racing team. But, you know, with a bit of luck and a following wind, you can, you can do quite remarkable things here just by really keeping your nose clean. This battle, by the way, for second in LMP2, in the same way as we were talking a little while ago about the inter Europol car, this makes a 14-point difference in the World Championship between the Jota car and the Team WRT 31, which is the full-season wet car. Rinaldi Racing, uh, we talked about them being out of the race early on there, Ferrari. So if you are doing Spotter's Guide, Marker of Doom, Connect 4, we are one retirement away in three different lines from getting a full house of Connect 4. Saying goodbye to Alan McNish and Son Finlay. Been a delight to have them as ever with us. Look forward to the very next time. And of course, the World Endurance Championship campaign continues in Bahrain with two races in 10 days. And uh, for David Addison as well. It's a uh, mass evacuation here. Yes, the, uh... yeah, final, final, well, we're in for the final stint. Louise Beckett as well uh, is uh, heading off, so the thank Manish, you yeah. to all of them. The Manish been... family Chinook will be lifting off any time now. <laughs> I think you'll find it's a uh, jet ranger. Uh -huh. <laughs> There's still some whiny Wine noises is, from... Yeah, it's that a starter motor I can hear in the pit lane. That is Duncan the... Vincent remains in the pits for the final stint. And uh, everybody, that's my toothbrush leaving there. I'm like this, it doesn't need to go there at all. He's got a, he's got a very active eBay business. <laughs> uh, the driver change underway at uh, the SRT 41 crew, as towards us comes Olivier Pla yep. in the 708. So the uh, lightweights have left, the gentlemen drivers are gone, and uh, the pros will <laughs> bring it to the line. <laughs> Oh, dear me. Yeah. We're, we're down to only five times uh, wins in this booth now. Are we? Yep. Yeah. Between the three of us. All oh, right, OK. How many have you won? Uh, yes. Same as me? Yeah. No. Oh, yeah. So Ollie's done all the, all the heavy lifting on that front, has he? <laughs> Jim Glickenhaus. I think the nerves are twitching now. I think Do you know what? He's had that sit, same still stare right from the beginning has of the week. Has he actually moved from that seat? He has, because he spent a lot of time in the last few days standing right in the opening of the garage. Yeah. And it wasn't until sort of later in the race that he could actually trust himself, I think, to move to the Pratt Perch and look at things. He was just oh, okay. zoned away. Imagine, imagine for a moment you're in, not in the first flush of youth and more of your life behind you than you've got ahead. What's and that the opportunity, like, I don't know. Okay. Um, I'm going to be 173 by the time they carry me out. Uh, but uh, that you get this opportunity. This opportunity presents itself to do something you've always dreamed of at the very, very highest level. Uh, something really tough, really difficult. Uh, on a world stage in front of millions of TV viewers, yep. in front of thousands of people trackside, and the internet starts to laugh a little, the internet starts to pour doubt on it, and then all of a sudden the opportunity arises, 
and still there's uncertainty and here we are 36 minutes from the end of the 2021 Le Mans 24 hours and both those cars have run like trains. I think it, I, I think it says everything you need to know about the Glickenhaus programme at the moment that we're 30 minutes from the end not wondering if one of them is somehow going to creep to the line. Yeah. It's or both it's of them are it's... still running yeah. and still doing or, fast or... times. And in fact, Olivier Pla, on the very lap that Graham started that sentence, has done the best middle sector of the race for that car. So not only are they still going, they are still going as fast as they were on lap one. Absolutely. Yeah. Faster because right. it was wet. Ollie, you've been part of hugely professional teams here um, for, let, let's, let's put it straight, decades. Yeah. You've been here a long I'm, time. I'm, I'm that old. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. But you know how tough it is. You know how tough it is to bring a new car here. Yes. You've done that repeatedly, and you've had a team operating at the level that Corvette Racing, Racing have that has delivered as we watch the final pit stop underway, or about to be underway for the 36 car. Can you put into words how, how huge an achievement this is? Well, it's, it's, it's tough to put into words. I mean, it is, it's, a, it's a monster, monster effort, and, you know, You've got to you've got to really hand it to, to Jim and the whole team for their whole their, this massive effort, this gargantuan effort to, you know, just even take on the might of, of Toyota, and and also Alpine and and have this sort of I suppose balls to to, to actually do it and you know put his money to where his mouth it. yeah his money where his mouth is and, and to create it yeah, yeah. And, and 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 to hire the drivers that they've hired and the and the engineers and the uh, you know the, the, the different partners he's had to put together for this is it's pretty extraordinary and not I th you know, I th yeah I mean, it really has I, I think the the cover there on the rocket launcher on the Alpine yep. that they need to work on that because if the if the where the rocket comes out is is exposed it's no longer a secret as I you go on to the final lap. was the hit on the rear of a car we thought it might be the 91 Not was it just rubber a stone or a bit of rubber yeah could it could easily be a it's bit a of pickup perfect. you know the size of your fist yeah. is just bone it's a perfectly out. round hole yeah dangerous day the producer reckons that that was sort of there in the middle of the night because you see it better when you've got the lights on um the car that we were referring to, where they drilled a hole in the bodywork so they could run a long ratchet down and bang the starter motor, that was the Rebellion. Yeah, it was the Rebellion. Um, so uh, so the, the, the same car, in fact, that the Alpine Elf Matlet is currently, it is based on that LMP1 Rebellion. But as uh, we it was head a P2 into, car. It was a P2 car. It was a P2 car. It was the part. year that they had the two P2 cars for Rebellion. Uh -huh, OK. I, I had, in my head, it was LMP2. So uh, there we go. Bruno Senna, Julian Canal, and Andrew Bowley. And I actually think Richard is in the 709 mm -hmm. Glickenhaus. And in that last stint, I think he did the outright fastest sector in sector one. The yeah. outright fastest sector? Wow. Yeah. It's quite impressive. Final stop for our race leader. 33 minutes to go. Nobody in Toyota needs reminding that it isn't over till it's over. 33 minutes and 17 seconds, and you then have to get to the chequered flag. But for the crew of number seven, who have been the bridesmaids so many times here at Le Mans to the number eight team for various reasons, political and mechanical, this could be the one. And you know, Ollie, you came here with the C2, the C3. <laughs> yeah, it was it? <laughs> the circuit wasn't paved when I started. <laughs> but when you have struggled against, you know, rivals who had a better, you know, better luck, better equipment, better whatever, when you've been beaten by your teammates, when it all finally comes good, does that make it all the sweeter, do you think? No doubt. I mean, there are. You know, when you have those really great disappointments to then finally come away with getting that, that ultimate goal and winning that big race, the Le Mans 24 hours, standing on that top step, you know, it does taste extremely sweet. And, you know, you, you, you're you thankful for your, for the teammates and the crew that you have around you. And everybody it really builds that bond that you were talking about it earlier, you know, with, with the, the teammates you share the car with, but also the crew that you work with. You know, you've got on this, this you know, it's a bit of a cliche, but this journey with them, you know, you've been, you've been working towards this 
all season or for many seasons to, to get to this chance to to race at such a great race like this and to be able to to, to execute and come across the line as a, as a winner is very, very special. This LMP2 battle for second position developing nicely, 31 and, third, and 28 on pit lane together. Rounds yep. uh, leaves first, came in 13.8 seconds apart and leave. The, uh, Tom Blom comes out behind him. Does. Should also Took on plenty of fluids, didn't he? 13.8 seconds behind. He did. Um, Eric Edmund has got climbed aboard the yeah. 21 car to complete his driver time and go to the finish. Mira Konopka is also aboard now. He will be fine. I think yeah. that's the last of the bronze car. drivers we were a little worried about uh, because I'm pretty certain that Satoshi Oshina has he's completed his uh, Final stint, and it will be Andrew Watson to the finish in the triple seven car. They'll come home, but looks in a very good sixth position. Here's your leader in GTE Am, the AF Corsa 83 Ferrari, Nick Nielsen, Alessio Rovero, the new addition to the team this year, and Francois Perodo, the driving force behind it. AF Corsa also leading into the final 30 minutes in GTE Pro with former world champions Alessandro Pierre Guidi, James Collado uh, steering that car. Yifi Yi is in the LMP2 leading at number 41 car from uh, Team WRT and leading overall and in the hypercar class is Kamu Kobayashi for Mike Conway and Jose Maria Lopez in the number seven Toyota Gazoo Racing. I should say, uh, if a yay is only 20 seconds back from the fifth place Glickenhaus after that fact that the uh, last... Let's hear what the number seven Toyota team have to say for themselves. Can we will stop once more after that? Will be a two short runs. Okay, well they can't do long runs any longer, so it will have to be two short runs. There's probably two, maybe half dozen lap runs. That means they're carrying less fuel each time, Ollie. Yeah. That means the performance is a little higher, and if they're not trying to stretch it to the full to the full tankage that they not they can't they know they can't pick up then they're less likely to run into problems so that, that shot on board as well we just saw there it looks to me like he's got some vibration back through the wheel i mean yep. it could be possibly pick up it could be yep. a bit of a flat spot but it could also be this vibration that yep. they have been talking about both cars have been talking about it since the darkness hours p2 leader on pit lane now and it's been a real haul for these guys the uh, last Chinese flag driver to win at Le Mans. Hope it's on. Oh. Does he carry the Danish? Or does he carry the Netherlands flag? No, no, that would have been. He would have been a Chinese flag driver. No, that's a very good shout. I was thinking maybe you think he might be the first, but that's a very strong shout. It's a sister car that has the problem with the, with the air jacks, isn't it? Yes. yes. And by the way, in that pit stop uh, sequence with the other two cars involved in this battle, uh, that gap has gone up to 27 seconds. Mm -hmm. So Yiffie leaves the pit lane as the race leader in LMP2. Absolutely right. Another well-rehearsed pit stop from WRT. No tyres for Robin Freens. It was fuel only, I think. One minute and two. Doesn't sound like they had the bags out. So he's going with whatever he's got. Tom Blomqvist in third place, 27 seconds back. Will Stevens fourth for Panis. Paul De Resta fifth for United Auto Sports in their 23 car and into Europol's Alex Brundle in sixth place, half a minute behind De Resta. And then the top Pro-Am car, Henrik Hedman, back at the wheel of the Dragon Speed car. 25.8 seconds ahead of real teams Loic Duval. Now that is going to be a massive battle for Henrik Hedman. 27 Absolutely. minutes, he's 25 minutes ahead of Loic Duval, for goodness sake, in that... equal cars. If he holds on to win it, Henrik, that's a massive, massive win. So the answer on uh, on Hope in Tongue is, it was 2017, of course, when we had the two Jackie Chan DC racing cars yep. on the overall podium, both Chinese flagged, of course, and operated by Jota Sports. Uh, Hope in Tongue did indeed win LMP2 in second LMP2. overall, but was running under a Dutch flag. Was he? He has okay. a Dutch racing license. OK. So that... I in which case makes, well, it will make Yifei Ye the first Chinese-born Chinese driver, because Ho was born in the Netherlands. So that's, yeah, that's a massive, that's a massive deal, Huge. isn't it? You know, suddenly you start the potential of waving the flag uh, uh, of this race to 
What is it, 1.6, 1.7 billion people? Well, you know, you've got to see the kind of numbers that you're drawing for the audiences that we have for the Asian Le Mans series, which are extraordinary, dwarf some of the things we see from major series uh, in Europe, principally because of the draw of, uh, well, again, doing the, the, uh, yeah. the commentary, of course, that's, uh, that's one of the major selling points. But we are talking about very, very substantial marketplaces, including, of course, uh, the People's Republic of China, but uh, other major marketplaces, Malaysia and Indonesia, yep. drawing very significant audiences. Yep. And Absolutely. great to see that that's beginning to have the activation. Look at some of the teams that we've got here uh, this year mm -hmm. with Absolute Racing. Um, you know, with the Hoboto racing guys, with uh, Eurasia operating with the... Team India, yeah, the, absolutely. The racing team I, India you know, thing. Again, 1.2 billion people on the subcontinent. If you can get them even one iota as excited absolutely. about sports cars as you can get them excited about cricket, then suddenly you've got a market that dwarfs almost every other. Indeed. So, you know, I'm sure everybody involved in the WC and in the Asia Le Mans series can't wait to get back. Imagine what a Tata flagged hypercar would do for the exposure of motor racing in India. I think there'd be certainly Tata on the engine cover of a Jaguar would be almost a dream ticket, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, wouldn't it in no. terms of the return on investment that comes with that. It's, there's, there's so many chips on the table, Martin, um, that it's difficult to overstate how big the opportunities are coming forward. Just the, the steps now need to be taken carefully, gently, and to allow the market to decide some of these things. Random fun stat from Stephen Kilby, formerly of this parish, said Alpine are looking to be the first French team on the overall podium since... Peugeot, 2000... Peugeot in 2011. A decade there you since go. there's been a French flag. And they're team. back next year at some yeah. point. Whether or not they'll be back here, we don't know. We haven't had that confirmed yet, but it's all shaping up for not just 2022, but particularly 2023 and the centenary of this amazing race. And there, there are all sorts of uh, known knowns and other prospects. And if you need to book off your, your holiday early, do it now for 2023 in June. And I've been saying to friends in America this week, yeah, just yeah, do it. Book now, start saving, just do it in style. It will be, I believe, the biggest motor racing event in history. Yeah. I genuinely believe it. I think so. Cycling through our GTE Pro Field, you saw the 91 Porsche in fourth, the 92 Porsche in third. You were just watching the Corvette Racing entry number 63. Antonio Garcia on board in second place. The gap's out to nearly a minute now, though, to this car. The car of Alessandro Pierguidi and James Collado, joined by Com Ledegar. It's the first time he's been a teammate with these guys, and that has worked very well for everybody involved. Ledegar has absolutely done his fair share and his fast fair share of driving in this car as well. Nothing yeah, they to have choose been. between them in pace, has there, well, Ollie? Not really, but the, the 51 is most probably just executed just that little bit better. It hasn't got caught up in those little bits of incident that uh, the 52 did. And they've just been fast yep. in every condition. And uh, they've had a clean race. 49 high-class car comes around the outside. That car's had a troubled run, but is back into the top 30. Jan Magnussen, the yep. dad of the dad and lad with Kevin aboard the car. Both of the high-class cars have had a troubled week, haven't they? Oh, it's been a tough one. Yeah. Ricky, Ricky Taylor, we barely mentioned his name, but he's been pretty solid through this race through the troubles for the number 20 car. He's inside the top 20. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's uh, Ricky is, is is one of the stars in the US in the DPI class and, uh, you know, accurate driver. And, yeah, he, he's going to be certainly a, a featuring here for many years to come yeah. in, in prototypes. Class act. Yeah. Looking to see whether or not anything is developing in this LMP2 battle. The gaps are closing first, second, yeah. and third, but by tenths at the moment. So keep an eye on that over the next couple of minutes to see whether or not we start to see any drivers with fresher tyres, we think, on the Jota car. Yeah, it had a full set of fresh tyres, didn't it? Tom Blomqvist, 24 seconds off second place. This is the third place car from Jota Sport. Not Mighty 38, the car that started on pole. That is in ninth place. Antonio Felix da Costa and his teammates have had a pretty wretched start to the race. 
They were going very strongly, leading comfortably, while Antonio was at the wheel, and then Ant Davidson made a, well, once-in-a-decade mistake for yeah, Ant Davidson really un and threw it off into yeah. the gravel in the Dunlop turn. He said afterwards, uh, completely my fault. I was distracted by the spinning car in front, but... And also the conditions yeah, as well were yeah. really tough. And very the amount slick. of P2 cars that went off in those conditions, it was extraordinary. Six, seven, eight cars? Yeah. Four different incidents? And, and, and he was very honest and very open about it. Robin Freens, you just saw there going by the Pro-Am leader, Henrik Hedman, which reminds me to look at the gap. Loic Duval has gone from 25 to 18.6 seconds behind Henrik Hedman. The battle for Pro-Am honours. Dragon Speed lead and real team racing with Loic Duval are closing. 21 minutes, 18, oh, 16 seconds. Look at look, Jan Panuta, though he's closing as well. He's closing on Loic Duval. It could be, that could be the battle at the end of this race for well, real meaningful positions. Henrik Hedman chunks, needs he? Jan Van Eyten to catch Loic Duval faster than Loic is catching Henrik. I mean, it's hand and over start fist holding right him up, yeah. yeah. So just to give you the kind of the, the lap time was last time around, it was a 3.44 for Henrik Hedman, 3.37, so seven seconds uh, dragged back by Loic de Val, but it was a 3.36, a further second still grabbed back by Jopp Lutert. And this is why how you manage your gentleman driver's yeah. minimum drive time can be so important. Don't... If, a, if there's a full course yellow, right, we'll take a fuel stop now, we'll get them out, we'll, we'll get them in for the last 20 yeah, minutes a, they need later. This is later. a high-risk strategy from Dragon yeah. Speed. Well, they had to put him in. There was, yeah. They had no option. Yeah. There, was no, there was no strategy. They had to put him in. He must finish his drive time. Well, that was LMP2 Pro-Am. In LMP2 overall, the chunk is beginning to come. 3.35 from Tom Blomquist. That gap has come down by four seconds in a single lap to Robin Freens, who is not making any uh, impact on the lead car. Just saw Sophia Dave. Flourish there, sorry, uh, Graham, in the yep. left of the shot, who had, uh, who was the victim of, of two major shunts uh, in the number one Richard Mill racing team car. She's OK. She had to be taken to the medical centre because the uh, medical crash lights had come on on the car from a second impact from the uh, racing team India car that hit her amidships. She is OK, but unfortunately, because she had to be extracted from the car, the car didn't get back to the pit lane to be repaired, and they were out on the spot. 33. This is our second place car in GTE Am, Felipe Fraga. Yeah, he's been absolutely solid all day, and, and mm. Tom Ferrier's team has done another excellent job. And it just it looks like they're just going to be a tiny bit short. The uh, that 83 AF yep. Corsa Ferrari is just that little bit too strong for them. It's and been strong is. all year, this yep. car. Uh, excellent effort put together by AF Corsa. Last Sup year's champions yep, in support, World Endurance. Yeah, supported, of course, by Francois Perodo and yep. They've been a factor in the European Le Mans series and the WEC, where they're running a double programme this year. Patrick Dempsey watching action from the Dempsey Proton Garage. Matt Campbell is their lead car in fifth place in the GTE Am series. The GTE Am race. But this car has been... The, the battle sort of withered a little during the night. It was real cat and mouse between A, of course, and TF Sport. It does look like the Ferrari, as in GTE Pro, just made better use of the cool conditions and the tyres they had seemed to work a little better. That's when the flip-flopping stopped in the dead of night yeah. and A, of course, stopped losing the lead to TF Sport during the pit stop turnarounds. Van Oetert is catching Duval quicker at the moment than, he's, than Duval is catching. Headman, that will be, I'm sure, traffic related. Yep. We'll keep bringing those gaps to you, but it's 20 seconds between the top three in MP2 Pro Am. In the if... Dragon Speed Garage, they're egging on Yop. Come on, Yop. Absolutely. Come on, Yop. Blomquist. Get stuck in. Blomquist pulls out another second of the advantage from the second place car. I think they're going to go from P1 to P3. Yep. Yep. The Dragon Speed guys it, are. It's possible. It's possible. The, the, the question is, though, in the yeah, are we going to get the Johnny Adam, Ricky Taylor last lap in LMP2 in the Pro-Am battle with them like jumping the chicanes and all over each other and, and, and literally you just beating never know. each other? Well, yeah. there you go. Loic Duval, previous race winner here and of course uh, ex-world champion yep. versus the coming man that is Jop van Utrecht. And we're assuming at the moment that Henry, Henry McEdmond can't take advantage of traffic somewhere. 
as the cars remember this the end of this race starts they're going to form up for whatever photo finish they're looking to get that uh, that we've seen some stumbles in that kind of those kind of conditions as well uh, yeah. through comes Tom Blomquist by the way the gap across the line it was 18.9 seconds through the last timing sector what's it going to be here 17 seconds yeah. with 17 minutes left it is a second per minute remaining of this race depending where the leader is when they cross the line. Yes, because they might get another 12, 13 kilometers Correct. rather to, to, to race if they just are ahead of the leader. So that battle is shaping up for third in LMP2. In Pro-Am, they're all LMP2 cars as well, but it's a separate podium, a separate trophy they're all fighting for. Henrik Hedman is now... Punnett pitted. Eight points. Punnett okay. pitted. Well, that really leaves Henrik Hedman very exposed. He's only eight seconds ahead of Loic Duval, and Jörg van Oeyter pitting. Well, he is two laps ahead of High Class Racing's number 20 car driven by Ricky Taylor. So third is not in danger. That podium finish for Racing Team Netherlands. Also in Panis Racing from fourth in LMP2. So okay. Will Stevens stretching the envelope there as well. And that means that Tom Blomqvist will not have to worry about what's going on behind and only try and attack Robin Freens for second. They are we going to get a flurry, though? Are we going to get a flurry of yeah. pit, pit stops? Well, I don't know. Uh, have a look. Strategy computerists. Uh, type your type your way away. What we could have is Freens and Blomqvist, rivals in Formula E. Again, ding dong battle. Last few laps, last couple of minutes for second in LMP2. Will Stevens looks like he's dropping out of it. How far does he come back to the Paul Deresta Alex Brundle battle? Brundle is 21 seconds behind Deresta and took six out of him on the last lap. So Deresta did not get breaks in traffic. Another couple of laps like that, and suddenly Brundle will be able to smell the car in front of him, never mind see it. And there's the Panis Racing entry of Will Stevens. Quite a lot of damage there on the right-hand side of the nose. Yeah. That's what you want. You want the car to look like... Uh, you want it to look like it was the hardest 24 hours anybody can possibly imagine, because that's what everybody feels like once the adrenaline goes. Yeah. Win, lose or draw, finish or retire, whether you're racing, whether you're driving, engineering, whether you're supporting the teams, whether you're an official, a marshal or whatever, it's a pretty body-destroying business, this 24-hour racing lark. Whoever came up with this as an idea definitely had a very warped sense of humour. It's going to be... What's the news? It's 11 laps at the moment for the lead cars on these stents. The cars are going to need a splash. Yes. Wow. So that might decide it when you have your splash. Is everybody playing the yellow? I mean, this is American racing. Right. This, you know, this is exactly Feel what safe. you've grown up with. Yeah. Just you go with track position and then pray for the, the caution. Pray for the yellow. We need a yellow. We need a yellow. We need a yellow. A slow zone or a full course yellow. Or... It's got to be, yeah, it's got to be a full course yellow to, to, for two or three laps to save them a lap. Yeah. Remember, and if they're beyond that, then no, it's going to be a splash. No it's going to be a splash. Yeah. 15 seconds with 14 minutes remaining now, the gap for second place, uh, 31 to 28. So That's... that little TDS logo, they're jiggling away. <laughs> there's, there's some definite Christian Horner leg action going on there, isn't there? Run into it back into the fray, but he's now 50 seconds back from that battle. But do the other two need to stop? And the answer to that question, I can give you in a moment, Dunno. is yes, they do. Yeah. OK, OK. Um, do they? We've got the 84 car coming in, the 70. Just before we get really down into the craziness of the final 12 minutes, just want to say hello to Peter Dumbreck and family. Absolutely, Peter, we miss you. Uh, yeah, he was due to be here. Luckily for us, Darren Turner was available, having crashed his car, um, and so he could join us. But Peter is listening to us, Ollie. He has paid I, for the app. Paid. I, I, I saw that message. Did and you I nearly leave your fell, credit card at fell his house? off my chair. <laughs> I think that's definitely fall off territory. OK, so Duncan, say again, what were you saying? Sorry, we were just being 70 frivolous. on pit lane. 70 on pit lane, so it is. There it is, real team. And 70 got held up coming into the yeah. pit lane by 84. Yeah. So, so that means is... that the battle between Jan van Utrecht and Loic Duval might well be still back on. I'm slightly struggling to get this uh, 
quickest thing to tell me about the 21 car. OK, do you know what? Let's be like we didn't have a strategy laptop and see how it develops, because that's what everybody else is having to do. You're looking to us for information, but we can't get the information from our source. Final ripple of applause from... There's Frederick Sose in his uh, wheelchair in the background, the quadriplegic who raced here at Le Mans two or three years ago and has started this... Just amazing. ..this group, this team, to help other uh, less than able-bodied drivers compete. Final stop for number eight, Kazuki Nakajima. Does that mean number seven needs a final stop? Come to that in a moment. Yes, Henrik yes, Hedman has got six laps left on this stint. He can go to the end. OK, wow. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. So, so... They were the smart ones. And, wow. Uh, and Job von Utter has already gone through and into second place. It was two seconds quicker on the pit stop, and it was the in-lap and the out-lap. But uh, Dutch head... driver ahead of Loic de Val, the 29 car, is up into second in Pro-Am. It's 52 seconds back from Henrik Edman. 11 minutes to go. Can't and do Henrik it. Surely Hedman can't has do got a 50-second advantage. And he doesn't need to stop. He doesn't, he need, doesn't to stop. need to stop. Oh. Unless they have a last lap fuel issue, unless it goes one longer than they need to, and he can't slow down enough to, to stay behind the, the race winner, then suddenly three, there could be three, heartbreak. Possibly four laps from here. Seven is in. And we're waiting to see what happens with the second and third place cars in P2. That gap is down to 12 and a half seconds with 11 minutes remaining. Crikey. But I think they have to stop. So I think um, keeping the eight car there. So they can go out nose to tail in yes. photo formation finish. Well, we've seen in years gone by the number seven car having to make nope. pit stops for random deals. No, 31 does not need Dragon's, to stop. 21 Dragon Speed, say, will go to the end with no dramas. No, Freins and Blomqvist are good to go. OK, seven leaves the pit lane, eight should follow. Toyota looking for that photo. Final ten minutes. When you do things like that, there's just somebody holding their breath, closing their eyes and crossing everything until they hear the engine fire up. Absolutely. Don't stop a racing engine if you don't have to. I don't recall Toyota ever doing this before. No. Well, this is a new era. They weren't in a position to win the LMP1 era's opening Le Mans. They are in a position to win the hypercar era's opening Le Mans. And this is going to be, without question, a golden era of endurance racing. Right, it's Brundle on pit lane from sixth position, not under any pressure from behind. As far as this LMP2 battle is concerned, nine and a half minutes remain, 9.6 seconds the gap. I think that's Yifei isn't it, with the yeah. Toyotas? Might be. Uh, let's have a look at that. Is that him between them or just in front of them? No, I think he's just one back now. Right, because we are on board with the number eight car. Well, let's see what uh, what does our tracker tell us. So yeah, there close. is it's seven. Um, it is 31 behind. It's so the leader, correct? No, 41 is the leader. 41 ah. is the leader. That's 31. Robin Freen's behind. 41 is at the second chicane. So 41 is about uh, where well, there's a third of the Mulsanne ahead of the Toyotas. The, the next question, by the way, is, well, 31, where is 38? And if they're behind the leader... Where's 28? Because Blomqvist is in apologies. third. He's right eight there. seconds back. He's closing and closing rapidly. 8.9 seconds back. Is he in the queue here? No, yes, he he's, is. He's, he's in is the, he behind he, the Toyotas? Yes. OK. Just coming out of... 41. 41 exits Mulsanne. For 41... I think this is done. For yeah. 31, there's danger. This might be done as well. He might be done over. Eight and a half minutes to go. Inside the final, eight and a half minutes. And, by the way, uh, on the last lap, Jean Panuta took nine seconds out of that 54-second... So, 53-second lead. He's now 43 seconds. Yeah. And change back from Henrik Edmund. He's not given this up. It's eight minutes to go. It'll be an extraordinary effort for the better part of a minute to be pulled back in the, in the last 11 minutes of this race. Well, Henrik Hedman will be driving that car with every ounce, every iota of speed he can find. Absolutely. And Yop is more used to doing that on the ragged edge than Henrik. 
and, and that that's perhaps the balance you know after racing for 24 hours you've got a young pro who is desperate to recover some of the ground that he's lost this year in in his confidence versus a, a man who is desperate to hang on as you say tired at the end of the 24 hours there's your FAA behind the two Toyotas yeah. now are they going to get the message to let him go why would they yeah because and what you don't want is a desperate LMP2 driver potentially losing a second place if he is not Desperate, it's Robin Freens. Oh, right, sorry, excuse me, it's one. Robin Freens that's behind them, yeah. isn't it? It's Robin Freens. My so apologies. Freens is lapping in 339s, they're lapping in 330-31s. He's not going to be knocking on the back door of the number eight. Unless, if, in, unless they decide to slow right down on this very last lap. That's the point. But then Freens won't want to do another lap if Blomkust is catching anyway. It's Rob how quickly he's catching him. Yeah. The problem is, if they're in the way, he needs to go by. Right. If he can go by, he's won the, well, won the race, effectively. If, if they get to the last lap and then they are slowing right down so they don't have to do another, he can go by anyway. Yeah. He they can, he yeah. can, but yeah. it's going to complicate the matter, isn't it? And it's yeah. 7.6 seconds the gap, six and a half minutes to go. But then we've seen the danger, Ollie. On the pit wall, they'll be very alert to that danger. They'll just go, right, slow down, pull over, let him go. Yeah, Make him go. Not even let him go, make him go. Seven and a half seconds now, Blomqvist is behind Robin Freins. And McEdman has seen the danger and has uh, upped his pace. 3.35, what is it, 3.44 to 3.35 last time around. Two race leaders in shot, Yiffy Yi, 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 who's leading for Team WRT in LMP2, and the uh, red Ferrari of Alessandro Pierre Guidi, RGTE Pro leader. Here's RGTE AM leader, also run by AF Corsa. Nick Nielsen. There's Francois Perodo in the middle. He's breathing. <laughs> he hasn't turned blue. Look, that's the Chetelar blue behind. He's not the same colour. Well, he's enjoying He's feeling now. fairly sanguine, isn't I he? I think he is. There's no risk in terms of time. It's only Felipe real Fraga, half a massive lap misfortune that could get in the way now yeah. of what's been a well-earned win. You said that, did you? I did. Seven, seven seconds, the gap between Blomqvist and Freins, five and a half, and it's getting away from him here. Mm -hmm. Blomqvist not closing enough. But know. he is, but oh, I don't know, I don't five know. minutes, just, two just laps, he take, is closing enough. It is, it's just going to take a little bit of traffic or one little slip up. Well, listen, the pressure, the pressure is going to yeah. be intense. WRT are likely going to win LMP2. The question is, are they going to get a 1-2 result at their first Le Mans? Yeah, I mean, that's the ultimate result. Isn't, isn't it? it? I mean, what, you know, what an underlining of the talent and the grit and the knowledge and the know-how of WRT that they're in this position, whether it comes off in the next five minutes or not. Two laps left, left, I think, for these battles as the Totas with still with the WRT car well yeah, behind. It's not closing on them at no, all, it's is not. it? They're still going at race pace. They're doing 330s, 331s. So the gaps as things stand for second place uh, between Rhines and Blomqvist, 5.7 seconds, four and a half minutes to go uh, in the LMP2 Pro-Am battle. That gap has come down now to 38 seconds from 53 seconds. It's not coming down quickly There's enough. There's the Jota car in the background with the gold nose. Or is 38 the gold nose? Or is that 28? Was that Blomqvist? We're 38. Has he now got sight of it? That was just coming out of Mulsanne corner. Too many cars all together. Look, Seb Buemi, just with his arm around Jose Maria Lopez. Buemi's not going to win this race, but he's won the last three massive. in a row. This is massive for this crew. He knows what it feels. And massive. for the whole team, you know, it's a new baby. It's a whole new car. It's a whole new way of going racing. So much to learn, to develop, to perfect. See Lopez there, had tears in his eyes. Yeah, well, why wouldn't you, you know? Might been be as well. the teeth a few times here for various different reasons, not least one of which who was driving a Formula One car here on uh, Saturday morning. Yeah. But, you know, fate hasn't always been on their side, as well as politics not always being on their side. But this time, they are a lap away. They can't slow down enough to do no more laps. It will be four o'clock Central, Central European summer time in just three minutes from now. They will eight. go on to their final lap. 4.8 seconds to get, 4.4 seconds to get, three minutes to go. Oh. And he's still tapping those buttons on the steering wheel. Yeah. It's going to be huge emotion for everybody involved in this project, right from the very start. Don't huge be afraid of showing emotion, emotion my no. friend. 
It's Dear a big, Lord. big deal. Oh, oh no! Oh, it's a number of It's a 41 It's 31. It's the 41. It is the 41. It's the leader. It can't be. It's the leader. It oh, can't be. Word. He's turning it off and on again. Oh, boy. It can't be fuel. Last lap. It can't be fuel. It's gone. It's fuel, isn't it? It's the, it's the leading car on the final lap of the race in LMP2. Well, and they're going to, to lose. Fries is through. If Fries is through to take it, Tom Blomquist 2.8 seconds behind oh on the very last lap. Unbelievable Once for the again. 41 crew. Once again, this race. Look on the laptop. Have they, have they had to stop a lap too soon? It is the no. last lap of the race. No. There's the battle, Toyota 1-2. There is your leader, WRT, the 31 car. The second car in the queue, that is Blomqvist. 2.8 seconds, 2.9 seconds. Car between the pair of them, it's the three cars, it's the first and the third car no, in this order. No, that is so, no. so cruel. Panis Racing, because they've got to cross the line, are going to be on the podium. That's ridiculous. Well, listen, so you know, if you'd offered it to them on Wednesday, you can win Le Mans, but the other car will retire. OK, you know, that's a fairly reasonable outcome. But to go from a 1-2 on the final lap, I can't even begin to imagine what Yiffy Ye and his teammates must feel like. 2.1 seconds, the gap There's between Charmy Tom Blomqvist. This is for the, for the win in LMP2 at the Le Mans 24 hours 2021 as the two Toyotas come through Arnage as they cruise towards what looks like a photo finish, but behind them there's going to be desperate scenes oh. here. Here comes the leader in P2. There that is the is second place Robin car. Robin Freens and the green car with the gold nose in the background. That is second place Tom Blomqvist. There are 1.8 seconds between them. They could. If they, these guys slow down for a photo finish, it could be all about whether or not they've cleared the line before those two P2 cars at full racing speed arrive there. 25 seconds on the clock. It's 1.8 seconds is the gap. Wow. Astonishing scenes. Oh, my goodness. This race does it every year to somebody not always quite as dramatically as this. The Toyotas are taking no chances going by the Inception Racing Ferrari, but they will pass him. They don't want to go that slowly. Out of Arnage now comes the LMP2 leader, Robin Freens. Still 1.7 seconds, only a tenth gained by Tom Blomqvist. The last lap of the 89th Le Mans, the first of the hypercar era, is going to see Toyota Gazoo Racing claim a remarkable 1-2 result with all five hypercars that started still running at the flag. Equally remarkable. Toyota 1-2, Alpine will be third ahead of the pair of Glickenhaus, but huge drama in LMP2 for sixth overall and victory. The WRT 41 car stopping at the beginning of the final lap. There is our GT Pro winner. Fries has got traffic. Fries has got traffic, I think. Not too much, hopefully. Hopefully, it'll be the Inception Racing Porsche. We will see the Toyotas win, and we will then go back to look for our LMP2 battle. There's Fries, and there is Blomqvist behind him. It's going to be one of the closest finishes. He oh. wins through traffic and takes it by two car lengths. Seven tenths of a second. Seven tenths of a second. That was oh, border. Oh, that, wow. was, that was Joy breathtaking and stuff. and heartbreak in WRT. One car retires on the final. There's Ferdy Habsburg, Charmy Lacey there with a with a red mop of hair they are absolutely ecstatic but for their teammates Absolute. utter devastation Absolute Alpine, heartbreak. Alpine come through to take third place uh, to take a position on the podium both of the click yeah. houses will come home it will be Panis racing on the podium because the team WRT cars the second car the 41 car has not crossed the line and that is absolutely a must 51 has come through to win in GTE Pro the A, of course, a Ferrari through as well. The C8R Corvette, 63 cars come through, and it will be the 92 Porsche to complete the podium in GTE Pro. In GTM, A, of course, are not yet to cross haven't, the line. Haven't got to the line yet, but yep. there are your winners. Finally, they make it. Mike Conway, Kamui Kobayashi, and Jose Maria Lopez. So the TF Sport car about to cross the line in second. The 83 car has gone through to start another lap. So as long as it comes yep. around, we'll do that. And it will be Iron Links to complete the podium there well, in the LMP2 AM category.
They've come home. Dragons yeah. beat, take oh, it. And Henry Mick Hedman, Hedman. Wow. held off Jopanutet, but uh, lost almost 30 seconds in a charge for yeah. the young Dutchman. I'm trying to hear from Duncan and Mike Conway in the Toyota garage. Yeah, Mike Conway, what a day. Mike Conway, congratulations. Finally, the winner of the Le Mans 24 hour. Mike, congratulations from everybody. How do you feel? How are you feeling right now? Hard to put it to words, to be honest. Um, hard to put it to words. Uh, there's been so many uh, setbacks over the last few years. It's just to bring it home now is just amazing. Yeah, a lot of emotions. Fabulous to see for you. We're so happy for you. Congratulations and enjoy the moment. Thank you. Cheers. Kind of hard almost to enjoy. You can hear his absolutely choking back the tears. Oli Gav, you know what that's like. Yes, it's it's. Oh, for Mike, it will just be a, a, an amazing feeling. I mean, it has been heartbreak for so many years for him. He's always been, you know, the, the bridesmaid and never the bride. And, and now finally the day has come for him to get that first Le Mans victory. We're and watching congratulations on TV as the 82 car is coming through, 82 car is coming through the Pretty second. Pretty much on his own. What yep. a way to have your final lap to win your first Le Mans in GTE Am. Nick Nielsen comes through. Valedictory performance. The last lap of the race for the GTE Am winner. TF Sport takes second with the Aston Martin. Felipe Fraga bringing it to the line. Matteo Crisoni for Iron Lynx on the podium. Iron Lynx have really emerged like a rocket in sports car racing. They have just produced the goods since we first heard their name two years ago. Through comes the 83 to take the win in GTE Am by a full lap. Yep, there and it is. Ahead of them was the 92 car to complete the podium in GTE Pro. Also, both the Glickenhouses are through. Yep. So Paul Paul Duresta Duresta there team. crossing the line. He's the last car to take the chequered flag, Paul Deresta. And remember, a first ever GTM class win for AF Corsa. Well, extraordinary oh. scenes at the end of this race. Um, it wasn't about who was going to win it eventually, but LMP2, astounding. Astounding. Who makes this stuff up? Uh, Team WRT, we keep saying it. We keep saying that drama always comes in the, the dying uh, moments of a endurance race, and every race it seems to produce just something. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. There's the uh, Iron Dames, the Iron Lynx Ferrari, Rahal Frey bring it to the end. They had their share of problems. Yep. Yeah, Vance and Voss, look, you know, they know how to win. There was never any question that they would come good, that they would end up doing what WRT have done for so many years, being really damn good. And finally here, they get their first World Endurance Championship win. What a place to do it. And nobody's going to forget it because of that last lap drama. And this was extraordinary stuff. There go the totas, but the cars behind were still battling. Yep. Right. And I think the yeah. checkered flag man jumps out of the way. As you would. Exactly. Because the Toyotas are coming past you on sort of idle throttle, and you can hear full fat racing engines exiting the Ford Chicane coming to the line. Well, uh, what a great well who, is the, who is the famous starter of the French Grand Prix? Toto Roche, who was uh, famous for his florid flag work at the start and at the finish. He spent a lot of time leaping out of the ways of cars that were racing for the line in the, in the 60s and 70s, and uh, there was a degree of that going on well. WRT Charmi Lacey there with Ferdinand Habsburg and with Robin Freens coming out on top at the end of a hell of a dramatic final I mean, lap. The P2 class it was just unbelievable the whole race. Yeah. Oh. Well, let's hear from Toyota team number seven. Wow. Hi, Daddy, man. Thank you a lot. Thank you really a lot of hard work to all the team. Wow. I still, I, I can't believe it, man. <laughs> the fastest yeah. men ever around this yeah. track becomes a winner Can at we, this track. And we're with you great. on that. No words. Can't believe that happened. That's, that's a remarkable uh, result for them. And to add insult to injury, the uh, WRT number 41 car that led LMP2 onto the last lap has dropped to the tail of the field as a retirement. 
Well, a few facts and figures. That is Mike Conway's 10th win in the WEC. He's the third British driver to take a win at Le Mans in the WEC era after Alan McNish and Nick Tandy. Nine wins in WEC for Kamui Kobayashi. And uh, well, there's been a rich vein of form for Japanese drivers in, uh, at Le Mans. Fourth dri Japanese driver to win overall. Eighth win for Pachito Lopez, the second Argentine driver to win. The first since Jose Froilan Gonzalez in 1954. Amazing stuff. Yep. The Pampas Bull, Froilan Gonzalez, and Jose Maria Lopez adds to that. First win, by the way, LMP2, the first win in the WC by a Belgian flag team in any class. Whoa, OK. It's the uh, Habsburg becomes the first Austrian to win in LMP2. It's Malaysia's, of course, first win. 15th French driver to win in LMP2. 31 jumps to the lead of the WC LMP2 standings. First what? brown win of the season for Dragon Speed. I'm going to say one of the happiest men in the place will be Henrik Hedman because... He could so easily oh, yeah. have succumbed to the pressure of being hunted down by a genuine top gun. Well, we were all sitting here going, oh, what are they doing? What are Dragon Speed yeah. doing, putting him in for the finish? So they obviously had to complete his, they his had time. To. They but had to. they had that strategic advantage. Yeah. They had done their final stop. Absolutely. Yeah, everyone Excellent. else had to. Yeah. And we didn't, we didn't fully uh, appreciate that. But I, blame, they, I blame that laptop. Oh, I blame winning. Graham, yeah, 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 absolutely. But, you um, know, but fair play, even so, just, you know, the, the ability to just get in there and grind it out to the end, that's fantastic stuff from Henry Hedman, and, and you couldn't be happier for him. He's such a nice chap. I do wonder whether or not Juan Pablo Montoya, who, lest we forget, has won the race in that class, might be on the phone to... Uh, Fernando Alonso and asking whether or not a class win rates for the Triple Crown. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because he's won Indian Monaco, hasn't he? Has. He? he has. He has. So, yeah. what an extraordinary finish in that race. And uh, my overriding emotion, other than, to be blunt, joy for that Toyota crew, they've come so close so often, yep. is I can't imagine what it must be like to part, be part of that WRT crew right now. They are at an official retirement. At the yep. either ends of the spectrum. Absolutely right astounding. What do you do with yes. your close teammates and friends to celebrate that one? That's very, very tough. Very tough. Well, you saw the you saw the Iron Dames there. They did a great job last year on their debut. They stayed out of trouble. They didn't hit anything. They didn't get caught up in any dramas. They had a great finish. This year, the other side of the Le Mans coin came for them. All the bad luck. Not just one of somebody else's accidents, two of somebody else's accidents at the same time took Sophia Flush and her teammates out of the race. So, you know, they've they've played the same game, but Fortune has dealt them a different hand. And for, for these guys in number seven, they've been quick all year. They were quick all last year. They are the quicker, it seems, you know, aggregate team over the number eight car. They just always haven't had the Fortune this must make it all the sweeter, Graham. Jose Maria Lopez and Mike Conway have been waiting on the grid for Kimmy Kobayashi for quite a long time. <laughs> he's <And definitely, laughs> getting sunburned. He's enjoying it now. He's, he's you can see really his eyes. It. It's, yes. it's, it's beginning to dawn on him the momentous nature of what's just been achieved by the three of them here. Yeah. Um, oh, it's absolutely delightful. take your time. You know, these opportunities just mm. so rarely come in anyone's career. And just being able to just soak it all up, take your time. Spend that time waving to the crowd, especially and as a it. finishing driver. Actually, yeah. again, you know, talking about this to surprise, we did did a podcast last year. There was a couple of drivers, Yannick Dalmas, saying that one of the greatest bits of Le Mans was was driving around slowly afterwards and just waving to all the marshals because all the marshals from all the marshals posts, all the campsites, yep. all flood out. There's this colourful array of all the flags, and here he comes. But, he's, but you know, he said all those men and women who have allowed us to race and said, I wanted to give on the, on the slowing down lap, I wanted to give something back to them. Well, you saw it from Kabui as he came round to Arnage. He uh, went and honoured them mm. at the flag post, came off yep. the track uh, proper Three and went... Three Porsche curves did the same. Absolutely. Yep. And quite right too. He's Classic. about to join, very, he's very about to join his teammates and this is going to be a very special moment for these three racers. Yep. Top four or the top driver rather and team and car in each class will go under the podium 
our hypercar and overall winners, which weren't necessarily guaranteed to be the same, guaranteed to be the same. It has worked out a lot better for all the hypercar teams than we expected. There's our Pro Am winner, so indeed colour that five different cars. Absolutely. Henrik Hedman, what a big day for him. Team WRT, the 31 car will go under the podium. So will the 51A, of course, a Ferrari that won in GTE Pro. So will the 83A, of course, a Ferrari that won in GTE Am. And they, of course, are with double Le Mans wins in the two categories they entered. And who on their Le Mans bingo card would have had positions one to five for the only five hypercars that started this race? Well, I did say in the rain earlier on on Saturday afternoon, slightly facetiously, if the LMP2 cars don't stop crashing, there is a, a reasonable chance a hypercar might win this. Yes. Not sure anybody would have confidently no. bet a lot of money on all five of them, A, finishing, and B, finishing in places one to five. That's Absolutely. just not what you expect from brand new cars in a brand new category. And this will only get better. There's no doubt about that yep. now. There's, it'll only get better with more cars coming, more factories coming, more talent coming, so much more still to come from the hypercar class with the LMH cars that uh, we've got here this year <laughs> Degree and the LMDH cars that are coming in 23, 23. Degree of confusion here. The marshal's all saying, yeah, pull up here, mate. And uh, the Le Mans Endurance Management America, no, no, this way, this way, don't stop, don't stop. Keep coming round. Because they, like we know, that this is where you want your winners. You want them underneath the podium. Alessandro Pierre Guidi, what a happy boy. And there's Robin Freens out of the car on the left. Ferdy Habsburg on the right, Charles Milesi, a first Le Mans win for all three. Uh, special times, very, very yeah. special. Yeah. Can you remember those? <laughs> I can. Oh, oh, oh. See, there's a bus <laughs> along every few minutes, Ollie. You're going to have to learn that. <laughs> <laughs> Darren Turner also complaining he didn't crash his car. No, I, he didn't crash it, he broke it. He did break it. That yeah. is fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Crashed it over curves, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, delighted to have. You with us at the finish, delighted to have Darren with us in the booth as well. And uh, have thoroughly enjoyed watching what has been, from start to finish, a riveting... People often say, well, it wasn't a classic, was it? Uh, I don't really remember when, when people go, well, that was an absolute classic. And I, and I can't really judge how you judge what was a classic. I tell you what, it will be memorable because like the first Group C race, like the first LMP1 race, we know we're on the dawn of something. Absolutely. So there's that. LMP2, last lap, that will be memorable. Yes. No 100%. question at all about it. Your first ever wins for AF Corsa, you've got to think of that as being a memorable Absolutely. moment as well. And a real battle, a real battle throughout in GTM mm. with the Aston Martin. It ebbed and flowed with different strategies. Uh, the, the, sub, the, the first hour, Absolutely. Well, the chaos that the weather brought, yes. Not Absolutely. just the first hour, but, but basically until sort of, you know, getting on for midnight. It, uh, it will be remembered, this one. Without down. a shadow of a doubt, it's the transitional year to something special. Yeah. It'll be remembered because it marks the end of perhaps an unhappy era at Le Mans for this crew. Yeah. And what glories await for this trio, already world champions, now Le Mans winners. And that's been the missing link in the chain for them. Can't turn the steering when it's stationary. Kamui Kobayashi can't get out of the car. No. But he's, they're no. trying to park it, aren't they? Help. They're trying to line it up. Help. Yeah. yeah. Here we go. Yeah. yeah, you don't want them sort of stranded behind a... You just need a couple of mechanics down there. Random GTE AM car out, yeah. on the, out on the on the straight, and you want them under the podium. Still, by the way, just a, another example of just how long this lap is. Francois Perodo is only now making his way to pit lane. Well, again, I don't think he's been rushing. No. He's been savouring it, and rightly so. Yeah. But apologies, not France, Nick Nielsen. Nick Nielsen. Yeah, Nick Nielsen. But uh, amazing there stuff. There you go. Right. Under the podium, there it is, the 83 car. Those are your four overall class winners. And there will be a GTE and podium as well, I understand. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Uh, yeah. Certainly the, the dramas at the end. I wouldn't have wished that on anybody. No, definitely not. You it's, never do, do no, you? But no. there's, you know, and, and you know, and even when it's not, you know, a car failure that takes it away. Again, you know, we think of that last lap battle between the Corvette and the Aston back in 2017, and neither of them deserved to lose that race. Neither of them no. deserved to not win. But, but this race you chooses you. You can only you. have one winner. Yes, it exactly. Does, it really does. And we've, I think it, we've all said it that it, it does choose you. Yeah. 
And it obviously, just with Team WRT, it was the 31 car. Le Mans can be a cruel mistress. Absolutely. Let's face it, we started with 61 cars, five of them won something. It's not a high hit rate, is it? You know, you've got, you've got to have everything going for you. Everything you bring and everything that comes towards you has to work out well. Now then, let's talk a little bit about history. OK, no, it's, it's, your, it's not your bus, this one. <laughs> <laughs> Ollie Caffin looking worried. Oh, God, here we go again. <laughs> Just because I'm the oldest man in Christendom. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is Michelin's 24th consecutive oh, wow. Le Mans 24-hour victory. Now, that... OK, 25 quarter century, that's always a big thing, but because it's 24-24, that is a big deal. Who won the very first one? Right, guess yeah. who knows about it to hand me a note in the commentary box. Was it Darren Turner? It wasn't. Even older than Darren Turner. Uh, 1998. Oh, it's David Allison. Of course yeah. it is. Alan McNish. Is it really? Oh, no. Do we have wow. to talk about Alan McNish? Stefan Hortelli were the first of the string of were 24 really? consecutive Michelin. Where is he now? I think he hoped at the tram stop. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, his way to the that's, train. That is an extraordinary... I, I see the jet just taking off, actually. Yeah. yeah. Well, they oh. must do, because the helicopter from here to there, to put him on the jet, must have left by So, the 24th, 24-hour Michelin win here at Le Mans. Mike Conway, Kamui Kobayashi, and proudly waving his flag, as he did so many times in his career, from Argentina, Jose Maria Lopez, only the second Argentine driver to win outright at Le Mans. And it's been a while since Froilan Gonzalez achieved that. 67 years. Were you there that, that night? I was, but that's before Pachito's dad oh was my born. Oh, life. Wow. That's before Pachito's dad was born. So, yeah. You know, it, it's, it's granddad remembers territory. I'm delighted for these drivers that we've got something a little less weird than last year. Uh, one of the sad aspects of the, the great race last year was that there wasn't really the podium atmosphere yeah. that we'd normally expect. The, pat yeah. the, st the stands here are still full. The tribunes here are waiting to celebrate with these drivers. And the entire paddock has assembled under the podium, as is yeah. their want. Absolutely. Patty? Yeah. <laughs> Saw Tom Christensen down there interviewing the winners. Working here with Eurosport. Uh, L'Equipe are here as well in number. Yep. Good and, to see uh, full French coverage of this race again. Yep. And the WC. You're right. And of course, being delighted again to be part of the ACO's in house production. And if you think winning Le Mans is just another day at the office, and these are offices that I've never been to. Ah, uh, you go. Francois Perrault don't knows what it is to win now, and yeah. he's coming back because he likes that feeling. And yep. that's wonderful to see. High quality efforts. Sanjo Pierre Guidi just taking a moment before the helmet comes off. Yeah. yeah. Well, Francois Perrault, by the way, it may be to some people the least glamorous of the titles here at GTM, but this is where you get the real passion yeah. and a firm individual backer of other racing efforts and the efforts of professional racing drivers and a and actually, thoroughly nice bloke to boot. I was going to say, actually, to, to, uh, to steal a phrase, bloody nice chap. He's a very, very nice guy. Always an absolute delight yep. to talk to about racing and other things. Yep. And um, Fun, open, absolutely. friendly. And actually, you know, there's barely a person in the paddock of, of whom you could not say that. This is yep. such a warm and welcoming place to work and to and to race and to have fun. To AF Corsa crews. Yeah. That's, that's fantastic to see. I mean, they've, they've both, both crews have, have performed brilliantly, executed, faultless, been fast, great strategy, great teams behind them. I'm sure that they're, they've got some of the lowest time in pits um, yep. in, 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 at times for, for any of the cars, and that's, in the end, how you end up winning this race, staying out of the pits. Just saw Henrik Hedman sort of legging it out of shot behind, didn't want to photobomb their moment of opportunity. 
And again, you know, another great supporter of the sport, Henrik Hedman, with that Dragon Speed car. He and Ben Hanley particularly have been a really solid outfit, and it's great to see the reward going their way. And it's Racing's trio there, and they'll be appearing on the Le Mans podium in the wake of their first LMS race win. And Last here is up. one of the most exclusive waiting rooms on the planet. This is the room, this is the glamour, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, of the pre-podium room. Ollie, you've been in there a few times for the top step, for the other steps. It's it's never a bad place to be, is it? No, it's not. It, it, it's it, it's full of joy. Yep. There's lots and lots of extremely happy people in there, lots of celebrating, lots of stories being swapped, lots of back slapping, lots of hugging. Yep. Um, it's also a little bit smelly. Yes, <laughs> it always is. You go up the dusty concrete staircase at the back, don't you? In, yeah, in, in, in... It's usually up at the top of those stairs. That's yeah. where you get some... See, if, you've been, if you've finished in the car, that's usually where you end up seeing your, your crew chief mm -hmm. or your, you know, the, the team manager or, or the programme manager for the first time. And that's when it all really starts to sink in. There's the explosion of joy on the left-hand side of the garage at WRT. And tears for both reasons at WRT. Van San Vos, yes, big sigh of relief. I don't know big he... disappointment as yeah. well, though. You know, a one-two was... result robbed on the final lap. That's brutal. I'm not sure what UFA is going to be feeling right now. Well, oh boy. I'm pretty sure it's not going to be any kind of good as their engineer. But for Toyota, one-two. Look at that. Look at that. That was the win. That's how close that got. One more lap, Jota might have been robbed, or, I mean, uh, WRT might have been robbed by Jota of even one car finishing on the top step of the podium. Brendan Hartley having a, a little chat. And our, the famous voice of Le Mans, Bruno Von Destique, waiting to welcome our winners out onto the podium. Double points here at Le Mans, 50 points for Jose Mir Lopez, Kamui Kobayashi and Mike Conway. Put them into a slender nine-point advantage over their teammates who finished second. So they're just creeping away a little bit. Andre Negrao, Mathieu Vassivier and Nicolas Lapierre in third place for Alpine. And then in fourth and fifth positions, and sixth and so on are the drivers who have not completed all the races so far for the Alpine team and also for Glickenhaus. Tortugazu racing with a handy advantage now over Alpine. Of course, they score with both cars, Alpine only with one, Glickenhaus with one, then with two, and again with two here at Le Mans as their season continues. And in our GT Drivers' Championship, Alessandro Pierre Guidi and James Collado, the reigning champions, now 12 points ahead of Kevin Estrett and Neil Jarni. Jimmy Bruni, Richard Leach, third for Porsche. Michael Christensen on his own as a Porsche driver in fourth position in the standings. And Ferrari have a slender point advantage over Porsche. That turns around yeah, from how it was coming in here. And there are the WRT crew, man, woman, and child. And swapping hats around. Van Sanfos doesn't have a uh, tyre manufacturer sponsored flat hat. Pierre on there in the uh, dark jacket. It will be the prized Michelin podium caps, I'm sure, for all on the hypercar podium. Could Goodyear well be, caps, of course, for the LMP2 teams. Yeah, could well be 24, 24, 24s. You see Norman Nato and his teammates, real team racing. They finished in third place on the Pro-Am podium, second for Racing Team Nederland, and victory in Pro-Am for Dragon Speed. And Henrik Hedman and Fritz van Ed have really been you know, part of the driving force behind having something for the gentlemen drivers for the Pro-Am crews. Uh, in LMP2 to battle for as well as outright honours. And they are very delighted, I'm sure, both of them to be on the Pro-Am podium here at Le Mans. Excellent stuff. You're seeing all the drivers here just swapping stories, yep. just talking about how the race finished, what's, what, was, what, was, what was going on, you know, because they're all trying to piece it together because you've been so focused and in your bubble with just your car. I mean, we've got this great view of all of the racing, but when you're in, a, in this race and in your class, you have only headspace for your race. 
But so you, so you're trying to piece together now yeah. when you're down there at the podium. Yeah. Okay, how did how did P2 finish? Yeah. And how did GTM yeah. finish? What, what car are you in? Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> no, genuinely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 one of the things I wanted to ask you and Darren about actually post-race is what it's like to watch a Le Mans. <laughs> Because you don't, when you're a racing driver, you don't watch it. No. You don't see the race. As you said, you only see your car and a few little yeah. other items in close proximity. Well, you see that there's an awful lot of very, very good teams here. And it's a, the, the, the driver talent is so deep. And there's a, this, it's, it's so rich at the moment. And that's, that's certainly one of the things that really comes across. But there's also these crazy things that happen that are, you know, you think, oh, you can't, this, it can't happen again, or there can't be another story like that. <laughs> and, and, and somehow yes. this race each year manages to, to, to produce this amazing piece of drama. Yeah. And there's something just special about this racetrack and this race that somehow manages to generate that vibe and that feeling and that atmosphere and ultimately these these very emotional results. Yep. And it's funny to be on the outside looking in, I guess, as well. It, yeah, it, yeah. It, 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 yeah, it really is. Yeah, to answer your question, it is very strange to look after 20 years to yeah, you, actually you, watch one. You come into the same place for the same time, all the same faces, and then you're leaving them and yeah. going somewhere else and doing something different that doesn't involve you being in the car and being in the garage with the team and, and talking to the mechanics and debriefing yeah, yeah. and all the other stuff, yeah. It's, 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 it's far less pressure. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's certainly one thing. And it's, you know, I've, I've had 20 years of, you know, dealing with a very pressurised situation. But yeah. this, it's been great fun. I've really, really enjoyed it. Well, and, and I think, I always think the good news is, you know, people say, you know, what was the race? Like? I don't know, I enjoyed it. And I think if we enjoy it, then hopefully we enjoyment and enthusiasm carries on to to the fans at home who are tuned in because they know they enjoy it anyway and we're just kind of it's just it's just a big happy club and we're all enjoying watching the racing podium coming yeah. together here the Signatech Alpine the Alpine endurance team team the uh, Philippe Signo there with Mathieu Vazivier and Vinder Grau and Lenica Lapierre but what a what a year for him to be presented with the spirit of Le Mans as well, and they Absolutely. get an outright podium in this brand new category. And there's no question that he is swinging as hard as he can to try and land a factory hypercar deal. We're missing a driver. Yes, uh, we are. Seb Boemi, I think, is there. I think Kazma Nakajima's there too. Yeah. yeah. Um, on the podium, we've got Pascal Vassalon and the winning crew, but I think we're waiting for one of the drivers for. No, they're not going to wait. <laughs> I don't blame them. Was Brendan Hartley not there? Brendan Hartley was in the in he the, was. He in was the, the pre-podium room. Has he gone for a wee? I mean, without being facetious, you know, because it's Brendan. Brendan. It's, it's Brendan. It's Brendan. It's it's um, Kaz. It's Kaz Nakajima. Surely he's not been taken off to do the random wee in a bottle. Yeah. Now, he may well have been. He may well have Surely been. Surely they wouldn't have tried. You'd have to go to the podium first. Yeah. Technical director yeah. Pascal Vasselon joins the team. I think he's there. Is he? One, two, three, four. Yes, we've got them all there. Yeah. No, exactly. As we no, no, we haven't. No, we haven't. No, we haven't. No, Kaz Nakajima is not there. The Japanese national anthem for our winning team, Toyota Gazoo Racing. And the most mournfuls of, of national anthems, I always think. But, uh, refined, dignified, and very appropriate for the Japanese team. And there is the big trophy. There is the one that everybody has been looking for. In third place, Pierre Fion presents the trophies to the Alpine team, the president of the ACO. 
to Andre Negrau, to Mika Lapierre, to Mathieu Vazivier, and to Philippe Signo. The man on the left hand side, whose senior tech team has run so many drivers to victory in Formula 3 in sports cars and at the greatest endurance race of them all. Derek Bell will present the trophies to our runners up from Toyota Gazoo Racing, the number eight team. Sebastian Buemi, Brendan Hartley, and finally joined by Kazuki Nakajima, who had been grabbed, if the uh, body language is any interesting thing to show by, I think possibly by Japanese TV, but he had definitely been grabbed out the back. Derek Bell, the Grand Marshal. And our victorious team waiting for their trophies. And this has been more than a 24-hour wait for these guys. This has been a four-year wait for this crew. And after a run of three, this is a fourth in a row, the major trophy kept by Toyota last year. Handed over to them late in the evening of the race. Pachi Belen, who is the prefect of the Department de la Sarthe, that's the river that runs through this region. Our proud Sartois around here. And Circuit Permanent de la Sarthe is the official name of the Le Mans 24 hour circuit. Circuit de la Sarthe. Circuit Permanent de la Sarthe is the Bugatti circuit. So there are your winners overall. And one of their touchstones, Alexander Wurtz, never far away, is he? No, he's not. He's been a, a huge part of this. Yeah. Tells the story of when he was testing, when he was a young Formula One driver, seeing the first Peugeot Group C cars testing and going, I want to drive those. Not Group C cars, LMP1 cars. He'd, he'd grown up in the Group C era. His father, of course, was a rally crosser, Franz Wurtz, and uh, had grown up in a motorsporting fraternity. And he just thought he saw the LMP1 car and he said, I just thought it was the sexiest thing ever. And I phoned the boss of Peugeot Sport and said, I want to drive your cars. He said, but Alex, you've just signed for Williams. You're a Formula One driver. He said, yeah, but I still want to drive your cars. And after that initial contact, when he got the opportunity, he did exactly that. And he can't leave it alone. And you understand why, don't you? Very early in his uh, driving career, he was exhibit, uh, part of exhibits at one of the racing shows, and his racing car takes him alongside, I think, was I right? It was Franz Conrad's Group C car. Right. I might be right. And that was what lit the fire. <laughs> and there Big is trophy. the massive trophy for victory in the 24 hours of Le Mans. Took one home and kept it last year after did three consecutive. Yes, I did. Uh, three consecutive wins. Something tells me doing that again is going to be altogether more tough. But what a start they've made! Absolutely, they have taken the first steps for a major motor manufacturer in the hypercar. They win the hypercar class with their Le Mans hypercar Toyota Hybrid. A strange year. Last year, they rounded out the LMP1 era with victory, and they opened the dawn of a new sports car racing era in hypercar, also with victory here at Le Mans. Last year, parked the fastest sports car in history here. That uh, career was over at the end of 2020, 2021. They start this new era with, well, Already the most successful car, 100% record for Toyota this year. But that was not a cakewalk. That needed to be earned after the dramas at the start of this race. Yes, it's going to be interesting to, to, to hear in the, in the post-mortem exactly what was going on with the car as well, why it wasn't able to use its full fuel allocation for half the race for the number eight car and, and a little less than that for the number seven car. So there's definitely things that they will be working on, things that obviously did not come up in all the testing they did. The motion there for Nico Lapier uh, on the podium with Alpine, but remember, for a long time, a part of the Toyota squad. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. Satake Murata, Toyota team president, with... Uh, I think he was complaining that he didn't get a bottle of champagne to spray <laughs> them all. No, he got a <laughs> bottle to wear. Yeah. <laughs> he got, got the contents of several bottles to wear. Yeah. Well, 
There's one of the mechanics running off with one of those bottles. Absolutely. Here we go. Uh, don't waste it spraying on the guys. They are all thirsty and tired. They would all like a little swig from yeah, the they... bottle. COVID era or not. Oh, I was going to say. Yeah, no, I know, I know. Well, there's Yiffy Ye. Oh, my goodness. He still hasn't been able to take his helmet off. I wonder how long it's taken to get back on the flatbed. Mike Conway with a word for the crowd. Jose, Camus, and uh, all the guys in our car. Thanks for everything, all the hard work. We love you, boys. And uh, yeah, let's enjoy this one. Oui, un grand merci uh, à tous pour cette course vraiment uh, incroyable. Et, uh, must be very hard, Ollie, to, que, que vous, uh, to kind également. of encapsulate Jose all the emotion Lopez of a 24 hour race, the build up to it, the lead up to it, all the hard work and everything that's gone in, and then as you sort of let all the adrenaline out, and there's that relief of pressure. Your mind scrambles. It just turns to mush, right? Yeah, you, I mean, you, you are thrilled, delighted, but trying to put those thoughts into words are oh, pretty difficult, you know. You're exhausted. Even you, after all those wins. And then, <laughs> and then, and then some idiot like Martin or I puts a microphone on your nose or ask you a, ask you a question. Martin's fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Oh. Look at the background there. That's a, that's a sizable crowd for this. And they've stayed yeah. and they will stay. And you can see the paddock has come together in pit lane. Yep. This is a bit more like it, isn't it? Yeah. It, do, it does They're start trying to, to have the feel. They're trying that. to organise that, that selfie. Yeah. yeah. Get the crowd in, get everybody involved in, all the drivers. So be a keeper. Brendan Hartley, a winner for two different major manufacturers now here at Le Mans. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> have to take a picture. OK, can't wait. Can you wait? Yes. <laughs> that is brilliant. I love that. Yeah. There you go. That's the picture. Masks off. Yeah, everybody with a chinny. Yeah. Marcel, come on, it's a, yeah, you're in the same bubble together. <laughs> Very hard to coordinate selfies, especially when you're actually trying to take a selfie, not just have a, a photo from a photographer. Yeah, Mike's just checking it. Yeah, he no. wants to keep it. No, and rightly so. No. Absolutely rightly so. Yeah. Oh, it's going to take some time. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the 21st century. <laughs> and again, <laughs> and again, never trust a driver. Mm. If you want a photo, there's well, Somebody a else was taking it, though. It wasn't a driver taking <laughs> it. <laughs> but they all want one on their phone. Yeah. That's what I hit drops for. Exactly right. <laughs> you might have to explain a few things to them. I'm going to flurry of champagne here around the team from Alpine. Joy. I'll be very happy indeed. Oh, yeah. After so many difficult, difficult months for so many difficult reasons, just mm -hmm. moments of joy are somehow even more joyful, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> Get the camera out of the way. Hashtag squad goals. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Andre the ground. Yeah. <laughs> On the podium. It's for them, so and it's amazing. Yeah. And thank you for all the fans being Push here heart. again. It's it's a pleasure for race for you guys. So yeah, thank you. Merci André. Philippe Sino, pouf, podium au général là cette fois. Overall podium. Philippe Sino. Je l'espère. How's it feel? Uh, Alpine aime Le Mans. Alpine loves Le Mans. Effectivement. Merci à Pierre Fillon et la CEO d'avoir pu organiser cet événement. I was just saying thank you so much Merci to ACO, to Pierre Fion for being able to organise this event in the conditions Vega. that we find ourselves in at the moment. And voilà. lots of thoughts for the late Jean-Pierre Josso, winner for Alpine Renault, back in the 70s. There was a little tribute to him before beaucoup, the start Philippe of the race. De vainqueur, un man petit who understands his motor racing, but who has a great feel for his history as well, Philippe Signor. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I think finally I made uh, the winning. I had so many pole positions, always, you know, had a good opportunity to winning, but I never won this race. But finally we won. I think, of course, I think the team did a great job. All the mechanical engineers, this is a great effort, but sometimes 24 runs make something uh, giving bad luck to me or to us, and uh, we're struggling a lot. But finally we made it. So. I'm very happy, and for especially my teammates, uh, that we work really hard. 
And uh, finally, uh, you know, it's no easy race even, I think, this year, but still, to be on a winning finally, it's, it's a great feeling. Uh, thank you very much for uh, everybody. And of course, I think we see spectator in Le Mans, it's amazing. Thank you. Voilà, le mot pour le public est des 24 heures du Mans avec Kamui Kobayashi, un très, très, très grand Kobayashi, merci. I think something up why everybody in the crew feels. On va également. Allez-moi passer le, le micro à un des pilotes de l'équipage de la Toyota numéro 8 qui termine en deuxième position. So on number 8 team in second place. Bravo, Sébastien. Uh, C'est une victoire de la numéro 7. Well, if anybody understands what's going through the crew of the 41 WRT car, it is the folks at Toyota. They know what it's like to lose a win on the last lap because of mechanical frailty. Yeah. For WRT, just heartbreak for those guys. They won the race. They won the race. Yep. And then Le Mans beat them. And yeah. it beats them hard when that happens. Yep. And that late, there are a handful of people on the planet that know what that feels like. <laughs> yes. Fortunately so. Yeah. Fortunately so. And I'm not sure whether or not that's worse being the car in the garage. Uh, I don't think that, that there's no degree. There's no degree of worse. No. No. Yeah. Yeah. This race is so hard to win, and when you get that close, and to have it yanked away. Three minutes. Voilà, merci la France, merci à vous. C'était le rêve de l'équipage numéro 7 de gagner Pascal Vasson. Il y a eu des moments très difficiles, énormément d'émotions, mais bravo et encore une fois, merci aussi à tous. And waiting now to head up onto the LMP2 podium. The guys from Jota, the guys from WRT, Panis Racing will be there as well. And this sort of strange moment of anti-climax. I wonder how many messages have been to Voss's head on his phone. Raise your trophy again, raise your trophy. And look at the fan and all the photographers. I ask you all to bien vouloir reprendre vos trophies, de bien vouloir les brandir encore une fois. So there is your race classification for the hypercar class. First, second, third, fourth and fifth. Overall, as well as in the category. That wasn't it's always the case. The house is both dropped back early on. And particularly the 709 car had to claw its way back over sort of 14 hours, probably or more, back ahead of all the LMP2 opposition. And gradually make it up into fifth position overall. So it is the class that has dominated in terms of performance and the result. All five new uh, cars finishing this race. Overall podium is completed. A little bit of sweeping up and mopping up. Making sure and they don't forget their Rolex watches. Yes, indeed. And then we go to our GTE Pro class classification. Victory for the 51A, of course, a Ferrari for most of Saturday. They were running 1 2. Corvette Racing really took the battle to them in the night. And then the Porsche GT team. I still don't quite understand how 92 caught up all the way that they did, but they did and ended up in third position in the class ahead of the sister car. And the 64 Corvette team just being classified as a finisher. It was, in fact, the final classified finisher. Tommy Milner coming across the line, 313 laps. It's very, very close in the LMP2 point standings. One point of the 28 Jota ahead of the 31 team WRT car. And 38 Jota now third. United Autosports after a tough, tough race for them. Still in touch, 13 points back for the 22 car uh, into Europol, getting a hat full of points, and they're in the hunt as well with yep. two races to go. Two races to go, both in Bahrain, consecutive weekends in November. But boy, United Autosports need to knock it out of the park on both weekends, and their rivals need to have trouble, because that's, that's going to be tough to defend that title. However, however, there's an awful lot of racing still to be done. There's Henrik Hedman in the cap on the left-hand side. Couldn't be happier to see that crew finally having some of the success they richly deserve. They've had a few knockbacks. Think of the big crash for Pietro Fittipaldi in that car in Spa a couple of years ago. They've had their share of disappointments and disasters. Norman Nato with Real Team Racing. On the podium, yep. third. Uh, looked like they could do it at one point. And Henrik Hedman, lest we forget, uh, one of only two men in WC and recent LMS history to take an overall race win 
as a bronze-ranked driver in an LMP2 car. Mm. The only other person to do it uh, was uh, Fritz van Ed. Okay. Uh, yes, that's right. One, one in WC, Fritz, yep. one in LMS uh, with yeah, Henrik. Yep. And again, Henrik Hedman, you know, learned his craft in European Le Mans series before stepping up to the World Championship. Sort of lost a bit in the height stakes in the Corvette, Diani, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I know Jordan's doing his best. Save, <laughs> Nicky Katzberg's trying to, you know, bring a bit of, uh, bring a bit of height yeah. in, but... They've saved yeah. a lot on the fabric on those uh, race suits. <laughs> is that what it is? <laughs> they no, hire no, their drivers by the way yeah. they've cut their cloth. <laughs> yeah, no mix, no mix bill's gone down by a oh, huge percentage. <laughs> oh, just good. lining them up. <laughs> <That's great>. <laughs> <laughs> Polk. <laughs> Yeah. And what's so, the camaraderie like between these factory teams, Ollie, these moments? It's, it's generally not bad. I mean, um, in the US, we got on pretty well uh, with, with everybody. And when we came to Europe, you know, there's, there is a, a lot of respect, a, a massive amount of respect between the teams. And we know that the driver lineup, sorry, you know, first rate, world class. You know, these guys in the 92 car. Kevin Estra, Neil Yarny, Michael Christensen, they are all world-class drivers, you know, world champions. All three of them. Jordan, Nicky and Antonio. Mark Marini there just following up, the team manager. And this will be this will be tough, you know, to take that second place. And, um, you know, every team that comes to this race, they want to come to win, and, and Corvette's goal was to win this race with the CATR first time out. But listen, they didn't even get to come here last year, you know, and the car, they knew coming in, you knew coming in, you explained why, it was always going to be struggling through the night time, through the cold, and it was colder longer. Yeah. I think actually, that's a heck of a, that's a, heck of a good result for that car. It is, it is and, 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 and actually I think somewhat, Sadly, is that the 64 car had been... Of a motorsport. It is, yes. Yes. It's, a, it's, a, it's a joyful thing, isn't it? It is. And uh, the Italian anthem for our winning team in GT Pro, AF Corsa, running the uh, factory blessed Ferraris. Uh, congratulations to them. They, have, yeah. they, they ran an absolutely faultless race. All three of them were super fast. Great, great pit work. Great team. And the first win at Le Mans for Comrade de Gart. Yeah. So. He stands alongside the crew from the winning Toyota as first time winners here. And leading the championship standings again, Alessandro Pierre Guidi and James Collado. And for Patti Pregliasco, who runs there, of course, as Myriad Racing Operations. Racer told himself. me they've got something like 70 cars or something dotted around the world. Ridiculous numbers. Dr. Wolfgang Ulrich, who knows a thing or two about being up on this podium. Permanent consultant to the ACO and advice on a whole range of matters, including, of course, how to attract and how to keep factory interest moving forward. Well, do you know what I mean? You know, and that may possibly be his single greatest contribution, apart from just being such a genial chap, is he knows what boardrooms want. 
and he knows how to deliver it. You know, he kept Audi fully engaged here for 13 seasons. So that is information that the ACO really, really need. So the trophy is presented to our race winners here in the GTE Pro class. 51 Ferrari. You were about to say something about the 64 car. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say that the, the, it, let's, let's just celebrate this moment here yeah. for, for, for Ferrari and for 51. A marvellous achievement. Every victory is so special here. Yeah, fantastic job. And to get cars to the top of both GT class podiums, a really big weekend for AF Corsa. Amato Ferrari, the man behind the whole operation. Yeah, I was just, I was just going to say, you know, the, putting my Corvette hat back on, you know, that the 64 car had been faster than the 63 all week. And I think that they would have really taken the fight well and truly to Ferrari and possibly even been able to get it to the top step if they had not had that that bump at the start yep. from that car. And, uh, yes. And uh, that then sets the ball rolling for a number of things to go wrong with the 64 car, and it just snowballed for them. Yeah, you never know where, what sets wheels in motion, right, do you? Right, exactly, and that's yeah. the thing. And, um, that's the tough That's the tough side of it. But, yeah. uh, you know, it shows the 51 car today. Yep. They were, they were the ones who were chosen to win the race. Exactly so. So there's your podium in GTE Pro, and of course there's Ferrari. The 63 Corvette and the 92 Porsche GT team. <laughs> Henry Hedman, pretty starry lineup, Ben Hanley, and one Pablo Montoya in that Pro Am class winning Dragon Speed USA car. A bunch of very happy, smiling faces. Yep, great to see James Collado up there, BRDC yep. member, very proud. Yeah, proud Brit, and uh, you know he's been a, a part of this very, very successful Ferrari operation now for a number of years, and yeah, he's he is really one of the uh, the stars of the show here. Yeah, he and Alessandro Pierre Guidi taking another step closer to defending their world championship title. Kevin Esch and Michael Christensen, the uh, previous champion, previous years champions, heading off just in front of them. Uh, wouldn't be defending it. It was Aston Martin last year. Uh, two years ago. Yes, you're yes. right. Sorry. It's yes. A weird, weird kind of mixed calendar we yeah, had. It yeah. does. Oh, it's my, it's my mixed brain cells. I'm afraid. En tout cas, et belle carrière à toi, le pilote et le chef d'entreprise que tu es aussi. Merci beaucoup, très cher Comme Le Dogar. Mesdames et messieurs, nous allons. Comme Le Dogar, little uh, shorter words there. Just want to say thanks to the ACO for uh, making the race happen. I think actually every motor racing fan thinks exactly the same. Yes, I actually probably shattered. He ended up doing a lot of the running today, didn't he? He did. And uh, I'm sure, as Ollie was describing, the emotional response when it starts to download, when it starts to go quiet, when you've had that big up crashing down and uh, time for a sit down and think about it. Yeah, you do, you do, you, you are, you know, so elated, but you're also a little hollow because you've just used yeah. so <laughs> much that you are just wrung out emotionally, physically. Wait, wait till we switch the microphones off in here. Uh, you'll never have known. Oh, it's the, 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 so, like the, so, it. the soaring high when you can go home and leave us behind. <laughs> Tell you what, I need a really stiff drink. That's what I need. Uh, oh, I, thought, I thought we talked about that. <laughs> oh, yes. Confirmation. But see what's driven me to it now. <laughs> Confirmation, by the way, the 41, the WRT car was not lack yeah. of fuel. It was power. Ah. It just died. Absolutely gutting. Goodness me. So an electrical failure, I mean, there was no clouds of smoke. No. If it's not smoking, it's got all its wheels and it's not upside down in the gravel, it's electronics these days, isn't it? Well, their despair leads to joy for this trio. Yeah. Julien Canal on another Le Mans podium. Yeah. Juju Canal has just had quite a good history with this place, hasn't he? Yeah, he really has. Well, Stephen, extraordinary. And James Allen, by the way, who featured so heavily in last year's race and lost out right at the end. Olivier Panis. Last Frenchman to win a Formula One Grand Prix. Before. Hats off to Will Stevens. Yeah. Absolutely top effort today. Last, former, last Frenchman to win a Formula One Grand Prix in a French car. All right.
It's going to be Opanis there with them. And the uh, Jota Sport car in second place. 28, perhaps the lesser fancied of them. Stoffel van Dorn, Tom Blomqvist there. Tom, Tom Blomqvist, top, top effort today. Yeah. <laughs> he's a character, isn't he? He is. Yeah. He's, he's great. He's a... Racing and sport needs people with that yeah. level of yeah. exuberance. No and doubt. And 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 yeah, he is. Proper he, height. he is a proper height, actually, yeah, for a race car driver. Yeah. And Vincent Voss, and the first ever Belgian winner in the WC race. Tape from the CD kept behind the podium here. It's the, full, <laughs> it's the full thing, and quite rightly so. Proud moment, I'm sure, for Van Zandt Voss, yep. as well as for those three drivers. Goodness me, I wonder how many national anthems the band rehearse. <laughs> well, I only think... the teams remember, yep. so that yeah, it couldn't, it wouldn't have been that bad. But uh, Turn to page 53 of your hymn books. <laughs> Sharma Lazy brings home a win at 20 years old. Charles, the, well, depends who you ask. Is he a Johnny Rotten look-alike? Is he an Ed Sheeran look-alike? I think it depends on how old the person you ask is. <laughs> Julian Canal on the right of your picture, James Allen in the centre, and Will Stevens on the left there is Olivier Panis. Still a fierce competitor yes, in San Aurelian race in the Trophy Andros every winter. Boy, don't be in the way when he wants to come through, <laughs> is all I'm saying. His elbows are no less pointy than they ever were. And as a team owner and a team boss, First with Fabian Bartes, and now under his own Panis Racing banner. With the Aberdeen yep. um, brother and sister. Sarah so and Seaman Aberdeen of uh, Tech One. Yeah, that, that's a great technical group, and that's a great liaison. Good, great stuff. That was a great race at LMP2, yep. and a dramatic, it has to be said, unwelcome finish in one regard. Yep. You don't like to see that lost like that but you want to see it one with class, and it was. It was indeed. It was indeed, and a, and a frantic battle right towards the end. It was a proper scramble to get it over the line, wasn't it? It was indeed. Pierre Giudone in the background there with the white hair. Yeah, part of the Brains Trust at WRT. Yep. And uh, always glad to see him. Thierry Tassan is part of that uh, yep. outfit as well. Kurt Mollikens, as you mentioned, you know, every Belgian racing driver pretty Ever. much, Mark Duers, that you, you've... Uh, Heard of in the last 30 years is kind of involved. Hey, Pierre, Jackie, of course, first hey. came here. We had Jackie Hicks as well. Jackie is locked up at night. Pierre, Pierre first came here with, uh, well, I first met him here with Master Speed, with whom he spent many years working with Hugo de Schoenach and Orica, running the Master Speed program, which culminated in the first ever victory for a Japanese manufacturer overall at Le Mans. And still the only Japanese manufacturer to win GTP at Le Mans. Absolutely. <laughs> Record unlikely to be beaten. Panis goes early and goes hard with the champagne spray. But he's wearing tracky bums, so unfortunately he's going to be carrying a lot more off the podium than anybody else, I think, probably. So a very happy Olivier Panis. That's a fantastic There's addition. There's Sarah Aberdeen. There you go. Fantastic addition to the WRT history book. Yep. Already has plenty of glittering pages, doesn't yeah, it? It really does. Yeah. Winnie and Jota aren't strangers to the podium, but uh, first timers here, WRT, and the top step is their first, first visit to the step to the podium at Le Mans. <laughs> Pan is racing again under their own banner. Vincent did all he possibly could to run off the podium to avoid yeah. the, the champagne shower, and then Ferdinand Hatzberg has saved some, something specially for him. Good lad. Yeah, exactly. 
Joseph Boys are going selfie. Yeah. And a day of, a day of joy here for Belgian motorsport after a sad day yesterday. Funeral of the CEO of the Spa Francorchamps circuit, Nathalie Maillet. And uh, this gives them the kind of headline I know Nathalie would have liked to have read. Goodness, yes. One of the things that I do find very curious is that the size of the trophies, they get smaller and smaller and smaller with the further along you get with the with the podium presentations, yeah. which I think is wrong. Although oddly, not in the WEC. The championship winning podium, uh, championship winning trophy in the WEC for LMP2 is vastly bigger than any other trophy. That's because you've got to put an LMP2 car in it to take it home. True. Absolutely true. <laughs> it's absolutely it's, vast, yeah. It's almost as, as, as tall as a normal human being, so, you know, about you, you, could fit, uh, you could fit a Charles Malaysia or a Will Stevens yeah. in it. Well, you'd have to bend to look in it, but, uh, but, uh, but it's, it's, uh, in it, you're right. If you want impressive trophies, you want to remember this with pride. Yeah. Well, because it's no harder to win overall than it is to win in P2 or in Pro or Am. Will Stevens there, and uh, you can guess what uh, lies ahead for teams and drivers. Sean Malaisi there, and the <laughs> <laughs> super and Fernie Habsburg. Well, a long-term and long-time member of the commentary team, not just in the ACO and WEC commentary crew, but also uh, in my years at Eurosport, Jamie Campbell-Walter, could well have joined us, but he had a couple of drivers in the race who he's managing. Um, Merci à vous. And so he, he thought, OK, Panisse, um, chose, maybe my guys kind of Panisse. need me just to be around. I think Ferdy Habsburg needs him right now, but, uh, but definitely you know, a great moment for him. Great moment for Olivier Panis as well. And what everybody has done today, a fantastic team. Thank you to everybody for coming. Cet effet Covid, mais en tout cas, merci à tous. Yeah. Et Vincent, on voudrait rajouter un mot. Je vous en prie, cher Vincent. Vincent Voss. Évidemment, euh, un mot pour... Euh, Being Belgian, of course, doesn't speak French. Euh, pour lui, et pour Robert, c'est très difficile. C'est très difficile à faire passer, mais euh, well, ils ont vraiment fait again, une chose incroyable. Again, he's saying just a moment to think about ça, Nathalie. He said this has been a, a very difficult jour. week. Merci à eux et félicitations. Voilà, ça ce sont des mots de grands hommes et de yeah. femmes aussi euh, du sport automobile parce que c'est vrai que mesdames vous occupez aussi une place très importante. Merci. Major figure in Belgian Merci motorsport, of course. And very well known, very well regarded, very well liked. There's Ben Keating offering his congratulations to the guys that beat him there in the podium for the AM class. In fact, that was the Iron Links guys that finished behind him. But here is your uh, FI Endurance Trophy in LMP2. 28 Jota Sport car leading by one from WRT. And it is an eight-point spread over the top three. It's going to be fun in Bahrain, Graham. It most certainly is. Two great cracking races to look forward to there, I'm sure, as we get the GT Am podium underway. The Iron Links team yep. coming on on the podium on his debut. Yeah. Never a bad thing, is it, to be on the podium in your first race in the car? Ben Keating. With the 33 yeah. team, Dylan Pereira, Felipe Fraga. They run a great Tom race. Ferrier. That'll be Tom. Yep, yes, indeed. Is this the first podium for Iron Lynx? Uh, I think it might be. I, I think so. But it won't be the last. No. no, those guys are good, aren't they? Those they, of guys course, are good. A cracking effort here. Yep. Let's hear Rivera. Nicholas Nielsen, I mean, in, in Le Mans, I Lamont. mean, yeah. Yeah, uh, no, and Francois Perodo from uh, AF Corsa, and yeah. their first ever, the team's first ever GTE and Le Mans win.
Trophy's being presented to our second place team. There's Tom Ferrier with his crew. And Keating, his seventh Le Mans. Seventh different car. That's some sort of a record. Oh, yeah. What's he going to come back with next year? Sort of hypercar program, is he? <laughs> One can only dream. One can only dream, but he's loving his racing. Yes, and he just. And the trophy, the third of which goes to Francois Perodo. The team, they have quarters, 83 car, who claim victory in GTE Am. A popular victory. Well respected crew, well res a very well respected team, and under the patronage of Francois Perodo, have many, many friends in this paddock. So, the established star teams, a team that's been battling away and winning with TF Sports. Coming giant, I think that is Iron Lynx. We'll see a lot more of them at this great race and others in the future. One more podium to come, Martin. Mm. Yeah, po possibly, well, the newest and possibly one of the most important, I think, for the ACO as well, recognition, as in the GT category, so in LMP2, that the gentlemen drivers who are the backbone of racing in ACO rules get their recognition. Lesio Rivera, uh, Francois Perodo and Nick Nielsen now with the points lead, comfortably ahead of Ben Keating, Dylan Pereira and Felipe Fraga. Antonio Fuerco, Giorgio Senna, Giotto and Roberto Lacorte down to third place after their Chetelar racing car failed to finish. 36 and a half points, yeah. the gap now, and 50 points earned with that win. Yeah. They are still ahead of, by one point, of the 54 AF Corsa Ferrari. Air of course, his 83 car leads the team's trophy from TF Sports 33. Chetelar in third. Again, that one point ahead of 54. Iron Lynx and Aston Martin's 98 car not far behind. There's a, a tight grouping there, actually, just outside the top three. With only a few points covering them. And we've got uh, points and a half and points and three quarters. Uh, no, it's points for points. the six in our race. And, and is it points, points and, and a half? half. Interesting moment right. going to be coming up with this LMP2M uh, podium. We've not had that many Swedes on the podium at the one. And Nick Edmund mm. carries the Swedish flag. Stephanie Hansen, I think, the last one I can remember. Goodness, that's a good shout. But also, uh, Juan Pablo Montoya, his second uh, podium finish, it's a win here, it's one with United Autosports, has never appeared on the podium because it was because of his qualification post race. So he never got to stand on the Le Mans podium when he took third with United Autosports. Right. One of his two previous finishes. Right. So podium finish post race. It's sort of like being posted your Olympic bronze medal, isn't it? Yeah. You, you never get the ceremony. Merci beaucoup, mesdames et messieurs. Un grand bravo à François Perraudot et à l'ensemble. Yeah, of course, the team. Very happy with that. Merci, uh, Very happy with their weekend. Rightly so. Yeah. Uh, Henrik Hedman on the left, uh, Juan Pablo Montoya on the right, and Ben Hen Hanley in the centre in the uh, uh, white and blue uh, star uh, overalls. Uh, you know what, I'm only halfway joking. It's significant. It's a class win here for Juan Pablo Montoya. Yeah. Stellar career he's had in motorsport. Yep. I don't think he's finished either. Oh, no. I think he absolutely, and in fact he makes no, no bones about it, he absolutely is positioning himself to be a... LMDH or hypercar driver, you know, he's had a lot of success. Went to Daytona 24 hours for the first time, he said he got, a, I think he said, got an email um, from Chip Ganassi saying, by the way, you're doing Daytona in two weeks. To, really? Um, and won his first two Daytona 24 hours, missed out on a third consecutive by. 14 thousandths of a second or something in the closest ever finish at Daytona. Esteban Garcia comes out, uh, played a full part in this, and yeah. they nearly, nearly, nearly coulda, woulda, shoulda done it with Mike Duval and Norman Otto. There will be another chapter, by the way, in the Montoya story in sports car racing. Bahrain and the rookie test that takes place after the final round. 
uh, Dragon Speed will be joined by Sebastian uh, and Pablo's son for the rookie test. I was going to say, he's not going to do the rookie test like Jan Magnussen did last year no. or the year before, was it? <laughs> they, they blend into one another, don't they? Jumbo surprise, Fritz van Aert. He looks a lot happier yeah, than he did when he was in the car. <laughs> well, but look at the energy, he's ready to do a 24 hour race now. Henry Hedman won Pablo Montoya and Ben Hanley. Winners at Le Mans in Pro-Am, yes. <laughs> Might be a Swede, but there's, I only know there's some Viking in there. There is a little. There he is. No doubt. Spiky Viking. Nice stuff. Big passion, that's and, great and, to see. And those two, he and Fritz van Aert, that's what it's about. National Anthem for Dragon Speed, the winning team in LMP2 Pro-Am. Henrik Hedman, Juan Pablo Montoya and Ben Hanley victorious. I wonder if Juan Pablo is the first ever Colombian winner of a class here. That's a pretty decent I shelf. can't think of another. Uh, I, yeah, not sure. Oh, we're going for uh, second place first. No, 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 give me that back. Sorry, not your turn. <laughs> is he of the automobile factory family, Darak? Le Mans, in, Le Mans at, the, at the beginning of the more automobile era was quite a major manufacturing base because it was a big industrial town. It had got massive bell casting foundries and so on. The bells for Notre Dame were cast here. And... Uh, a number of the early car manufacturers were based here in, in Le Mans. Darak was very definitely an early French car manufacturer, so it is a famous name. Whether he is a scion of that dynasty or not, I know not, but if you were in motoring 100 years ago in Le Mans, your great-grandson is part of the ACO, that wouldn't be a big surprise, would it? So the real team racing team take the trophies for third place, second place, Big smile on the face of Jupp van Oetik closest to us there. I'm not surrprised. Peter van der Gaard and the ever-ebullient Fritz van Aert. Enjoying the moment as well they should. Yep. Car once again presented impeccably, but it's the winner's trophies. Yep. And Pavel Montoya. Yep. Henry Kedman and Ben Hanley. So our final podium here at Le Mans for the Pro-Am top three in LMP2. <laughs> A lot of passion there. <laughs> There's more bands on that podium than there is at the commentary <laughs> boxes. <isn't there? laughs> There's a lot going on there. Henrik Hedman and actually, I have to say, Fritz van Aert, you're looking at two men there in the early stages of fairly major hangovers. Yeah. I think they are going to really enjoy this moment and the rest of their weekend there will be a big party there possibly the early part of next week there might be a lot of you know i'm not in hold my calls yeah yeah definitely Out it's it's days. gonna be one to remember yeah. it really is right. well done as well and julian and the dragon yeah. speed team it's all about yeah. the drivers on this podium but it's all about the team getting them there as well bringing a car to this race they could go the distance yep. and do so at speed. And Oli, you know, I was almost going to touch on that a little bit earlier. We, we 
we talk about the drivers because they're the tip of the iceberg, but it is a massive, massive team operation just to get a car on this grid, to keep it in the race, to get it to the finish. You know, for every one that we see on the podium, there's 10 down there who have made it happen. And, and that's the thing, you know, there's just such a, a, a massive group of people that help get the car there. You know, whether that's you coming from a team like Corvette Racing, or whether you're coming from a, a, a smaller team like Dragon Speed, or you know a, a, any one of these teams, you know someone like Hub Auto, uh, who have come here, and there's there's this really core group of people that are working night and day yeah. to get this car on the grid, and it's thanks to them that this success does happen. Well, next year's Le Mans victory begins Monday morning, 9 a.m. in every office that's hoping to be on the podium. That's it. Here are our Pro-Am drivers podium points leaders. Ben Hanley, Henry Hebben, Juan Pablo Montoya just sneak in front of Fritz van Aert with Esteban Garcia and Norman Nato. Norman has been with Esteban in every race. Fritz van Aert has been the only constant in that car for the season so far. So it looks like essentially a three horse race in that battle but again lots of points up for grabs in the two bar rain races dragon speed lean racing team netherland and real team with just nine point spread covering them for the teams and that brings us to the end of the 89th running of the le mans 24 hours so on behalf of everybody i'd just like to say thank you very much for joining us for alan mcnish and graham goodman we will be back in bahrain for the final two rounds of the world endurance championship with louise beckett and duncan vincent in the pit lane and our thanks go to as well to david addison to ollie gavin and to darren turner for joining us and for making the weekend so much fun on behalf of the automobile club de l'ouest the world endurance championship le mans endurance management olivier denis our director and our executive producer, Natalie Farge, I'm Martin Haven, saying thank you for joining us. Next year, we hope to see more of you here at Le Mans. Whatever else, let's hope that the 90th running is as epically entertaining as this one. Au revoir and goodbye. <laughs>